at OOB, which, as everyone knows, is the University of the Occult, the Outre, and the Bizarre. Nature, they say, abhors a vacuum, and in a similar manner, evil always seeks to overcome good. Yes, good seems to attract evil the same way a flame intrigues a moth. But in this case, so much of the time, it's the moth that consumes the flame. Our mystery drama, Stitch in Time, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Leon Janney. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. When you say Budweiser, when you say Budweiser, Like choicest tops, rice, and best barley malt. The Budweiser ingredient, listed proudly right there on the Budweiser label. There are less expensive ingredients, but you won't find them in Budweiser no way. There's a lot more that goes into the brewing of Budweiser than just ingredients. But it's what comes out that counts most, and that's the Budweiser taste. And that speaks for itself, loud and clear. Hear it talking? There is no other love. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Hey, Mom, what's for dinner? Hey, Mom, what you got? What's for dinner? Check your nearby shop right for a sizzling pork sale featuring center-cut pork chops, just $1.39 a pound. Save two on ShopRite Franks, just 79 cents a pound, and ShopRite hot dog rolls, three packages of eight for one dollar. While you're saving on your food needs, check the low prices on ShopRite selection of holiday needs, from toys to trims to wraps and bows. There's a lot more for a little less at ShopRite. <laughs> the country, people are switching to Digel. And here in New York, it's no different. Why? Because Digel is different. Because no plain antacid, liquid or tablet, can do what Digel does. Digel contains cymethicone, the only ingredient found to be safe in the treatment of the trapped gas, which often accompanies acid indigestion, heartburn, and sour stomach. So if you would rather switch than fight uncomfortable gas and acid, switch to Digel, tablets or liquid. Use only as directed. Dye gel. It's deliciously different. A woman's laxative should be as gentle as she is. That's why so many women use Correctol, the woman's gentle laxative. Correctol's special formula combines a mild laxative with a softening agent. Its gentle overnight action helps you feel like yourself again. And Correctol's gentle enough to use after childbirth and at those times of the month when gentleness is especially important. Read, follow label directions. Correctol, the woman's gentle laxative. There 
are some people who are there, but they're not there, if you know what I mean. That is, you never notice them. Uh, They're a part of the scenery, the background. We're aware of them, but uh, we don't pay any attention to them. And such a person is Miss Amelia Fitzroy. Miss Fitzroy is 50. She's prim. She's proper. She is unbelievably efficient. As indeed she must be, since she is the secretary to William Big Bill Rawlinson, the sole owner of Rawlinson Industries. One of the things that Rawlinson Industries manufactures is a weapon for our government called the J system that is so secret, I refuse to say another word about it. Well, one morning, Miss Fitzroy said to her boss, Mr. Big Bill Rawlinson... Mr. Rawlinson, um... Yes, Miss Fitzroy? Uh, May I discuss a most... a personal matter? Miss Fitzroy. Sir. Well, I'm so pleased. I mean, here for almost 20 years, you have been my most efficient Miss Fitzroy. I, uh... I didn't think you had personal matters. Well, it has to do with a a dream. Yes. And it... it concerns you. Oh, Miss Fitzroy. Mr. Rawlinson, as your secretary, I know all about your attitudes toward women. I've never approved of your... your loose conduct. I am well aware of that. I can see it in your face whenever one of my lady loves calls on me. Now, please, hear me out. I I realize I I may be speaking out of turn, but this dream... I've been dreaming about your niece. But you don't even know my niece. I realize that. I hardly know my niece myself. (laughs) I haven't seen her since she was ten, and she must be... mm, nineteen by now. Well, I have a dream. And in this dream... I see this young lady, your niece, and she is in danger. Now, please, Miss Fitzroy, don't you go flaky on me. But I I must For almost two decades, you have been my... Well, you have been indispensable to me. You have made it possible for me to run this incredibly complex, well, I I should say crazy business. You are the only person in the whole world who has never failed me. Now, now don't go to pieces on me now. I am perfectly all right. Perhaps you need a vacation. All I'm trying to say... You're trying too hard. Now, take a vacation as long as you like. And you can have my yacht. Yes, yes, indeed. Fully equipped and staffed. Mr. Rowlandson, please, listen to me. When I took this job, I determined never, never to say anything more personal than good morning. I made it a rule. I should never have broken it. Well, tell me about your dream. Is it recurrent? Yes. I dream it every night. What happens? Well, in my dream... Someone is trying to kill your niece. Who? I don't know. How? I don't know. Why? I don't know. Then how can you say that... I just have this feeling, this... this dreadful feeling. Well, can you give me any details? Well, she's on the plantation where, where she's living in South America with her mother. Yes. And I see the faces of men. Hard faces. Cruel faces. Yes. And I know those men intend to kill her. But... What makes you think so? I can't say. It's, 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 it's a feeling. No, no, it's more than a feeling. It's a conviction. Miss Fitzroy. I know, I know it sounds insane, neurotic. Miss Fitzroy, let me account for your dream. I, I'm sorry I even spoke about it. Now, let us face facts. You are in love with me. Please, Mr. Rawlinson. You may even be unaware of it, but consider that you have given me your entire life. Mr. Rawlinson. My problems have been your problems. Your entire existence has been subordinated to my needs and conveniences. I should never have started... You know how precious Donna, my darling Donna, my dead brother's child is to me. I I don't see where this can possibly... Donna, my greatest joy, but also the source of my greatest sorrow. Her mother, who despises me even more than she hated my poor dead brother, has taken the child away, back home with her to South America. Mr. Rawlinson, I don't know where you're headed. I am forbidden to see her. Now, hopefully, when Donna is 21, she will want to come to visit me. Let us pretend I I never said anything at all. But that would be a lie. Because something is really bothering you. Now, this girl is all I have in the world. And I'm all you have in the world. And so Donna has become important to you, too. And you worry about her. You fear for her safety. You pray for her well-being. And so, feelings of trepidation. I I have things to attend to. I notice you don't deny what I'm saying. You know the secret of my success. It's my supreme and sublime self-confidence. You saw me parlay a $10,000 investment into a billion-dollar corporation. You know, I always know what I'm talking about. Oh, I... 
I have never been so embarrassed. And I know you always know what you're talking about. Look, putting the call to South America. Get my dearest sister-in-law on the phone. Hello? Yes, Cayeta. It's me, Bill. Indeed. Listen, are you and Donna okay down there? Yes. Now, you're telling the truth. It's just that we read things are a bit unsettled in your part of the world. So, I was thinking, why don't you two come up here for a visit, eh? I swore an oath. I would never set eyes on you as long as I live. Now, is it fair to deprive Donna of an uncle, her only living relative? Have you called to reopen an argument you cannot hope to win? Well, next year she will be of age. She'll want to come to see her Uncle Bill. Have you anything more to say to me? Well, not now. Goodbye. Just a minute. Let me say hello to Donna. One moment. Uncle Bill. <laughs> That's a sweet voice. Did you get the sweater I sent you? Yes, it was gorgeous. I'm knitting another one, plus an afghan, all for you. Well, instead of knitting so much, can't you convince your mother to bring you up here? Oh, every day I try to tell Mama that you're really very sweet. But I'll see you next year. Honey, is, uh, is everything okay down there? Okay. Well, I mean, I, I, no, nothing. And oh, just put your mother on again, will you, honey? Oh, sure, Uncle Bill. Well, listen, Estrellita, how would it be if if I sent some men down to your place? Why? Armed guards. For what reason? This is a law-abiding country. Well, it 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 would make me feel better. This is just another of your tricks, Bill. No, the law says that I have complete control over Donna until she is 21. And there is no way you can ever get to see her before then. Estrellita! Estrellita! Uh... Well, Miss Fitzroy, I spoke to both of them. And <laughs> everything's just fine. Now, does that make you feel better? I don't know how I feel. She's sending me another sweater. So where am I going to put it? The closet's full now. I only know. I have this dream. Well, I would prefer the gold-colored cotton. Now, do you hear that, Marie? In this voice tape, concentrate on the O sounds and listen to how many of them there are in gold-colored cotton. Gold-colored mm -hmm. Cotton. Donna still has a very pronounced American accent. Oh, I've got her voice down. It's no problem. I worry about the looks. Uh, the looks are absolutely sensational. Dr. Ezran did a fantastic job on your face. I'm still worried. Remember, it isn't essential for you to look exactly like Donna. You only have to resemble her picture. What, what else do I need? The history of the family. Oh, it's as if the tree grew in my own backyard. Ask me anything you want about any of the ancestors. Mm, I believe you. Hobbies. She needs, as you know, and so I had to take up that stupid pastime myself. It is not a stupid pastime. It's a serious part of her entire personality. All right, Cesco. I look like her. I sound like her. I need like her. I know everything that's supposed to be going on around and around in her brain. Mm. Now what? No. We wait for precisely the right moment. No, 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 don't. We, we have to save her. We, we, we have to... Oh, oh, that dream. That dream again. What's the matter with me? What's the matter with me? Oh, I can't do this. I can't call Mr. Rawlinson at three in the morning because of a, of a dream. I, I can't. I'm going crazy. I can't help it. I must call. I must. I, I have to call him. Hi. Uh, hello? Oh, M Mr. Rawlinson. Oh. Uh, it's you, Mrs. Wright. Well, what's the problem? Uh, that's a problem. The... Good Lord, it's three in the morning. Are you still at the office? Oh, no, sir. I, I'm home. In bed. Uh, yes? And I... I just woke up. I... I had this... this terrible nightmare. I had it again. You know, the, the one we talked about. Well? Well, uh, 
That's all I can tell you. Well, if that's all you can tell me, Miss Fitzroy, I I suppose this has to be the end of our conversation. Mr. Rollinson, I, I realize this sounds crazy. What we should do is get a tape of it so you can hear just how crazy. I, I'm not a particularly psychic person. At least I never thought of myself in that way. Well, now, it is, it is very interesting, but uh, why don't we talk about it in the office tomorrow? Uh, sir, what I think you should do is call the police station in Porto San Diego. Where? That's the town nearest your sister-in-law's plantation. Oh, but that's in South America. I know. Now, ask them to send a squad of police over to the house. Why? Because my secretary is having a bad dream? No, sir. Because you are frightened for the safety of your sister-in-law and your niece. But who'd want to harm them? Please. But I'm, well, maybe 10,000 miles away. Sir, you're William J. Big Bill Rawlinson. When you talk, people listen. Will you call the police now? All right, all right, I'll handle it. You're, you're not saying this just to quiet me. I said I'll handle it. Do it now. It's the only way we can save them. There's a little bit of ESP, extrasensory perception for you. Premonitions. Don't hold them cheaply. And consider this one, which Miss Fitzroy is having. Is it true? Is it false? Is she having it at the right time? Or perhaps too late? By the same token, too early. A full load of questions. But you know we do get around to answering all of them. Starting with Act Two which I shall bring you in just a few moments. Isn't it nice to know you're free To see the things you want to see The touch to hide you there to reach To know you're all that you can be Based on EPA tests, Buick's mid-size Century, with available automatic transmission and the Buick V6, got 17 miles per gallon in the city test and 25 in the highway test. Of course, those figures are only estimates. The mileage you get may vary. But what it means is this. Buick's V6 Centuries with automatic transmission got better overall EPA mileage ratings than any other U.S. midsize with automatic transmission. Nice going, Buick. In California, see your Buick dealer for EPA figures. Let's hear it from Martin Payne! We've got decorative lumber, lighting fixtures galore. We've got tiles and bulbs and brushes. We've got covering for the floor. Rollers, paints, and spackles, wall covering till you'll faint. Martin's Home Decorating Sanders, it ain't just paint. You can still decorate in time for the holidays and save. Pay Martin's regular low discount price for the first gallon of paint and get the second gallon of the same paint free. Choose from a selection of ceiling paints, enamels, wall paints, porch and deck paints, kitchen and bath paints, second gallon free. Everything else in stock is 25% off. Paint sundries, lighting, floor covering, wall covering, decorative lumber. Sale ends Saturday. We've got decorative lumber, lighting fixtures galore. We've got tiles and bulbs and brushes. We've got covering for the floor. Rollers, paints, and spackles, all covering till you'll faint. Martin's Home Decorating Centers, it ain't just paint. Howard, Eunice. Yes? I'd like you to meet Josiah S. Carberry, the world's most traveled man. My <laughs> pleasure. Mr. Carberry, we're the world's least traveled couple. Oh, we want to go to Europe. We don't speak European. Oh, where to stay? What to tip? Oh. American Express. American, American Express? Express? American Express vacations in Europe, the escorted way, are better than ever. Really? They take the worry out of looking and booking and arranging. Ooh. Good hotels and escort to show you the sights, American Express style. Expensive? Great value. Expensive? Europe, the carefree way, really stretches your dollar. Terrific. <laughs> or if you want to spend a bit more for truly first class hotels and little luxuries, there's Europe the priceless way. Yes, yes. Either way, you can spend two weeks, three weeks, even a month. With American Express, we can go to Europe this right. summer. Certainly, mon ami. Oh, Howard, he's speaking European. Yeah. You can American Express yourself to Europe in new ways you may never have thought of. By jet, by ocean cruiser, by car, by private yacht, by river barge, by your own imagination. Find out about this new approach at any office of American Express Travel Service. one of those highly dignified, super-efficient executive secretaries who are found in the offices of giants of industry. She's handsome rather than beautiful, 
all enamel and steel. But she wouldn't know it if you could hear her on the telephone right now at three in the morning. Why, she sounds just like any terrified, hysterical, middle-aged woman. Miss Fitzroy, I said I'd handle it. Now, we have a district manager. That is, our copper company has a man nearby in Dos Cruces. Now, Miss hasn't... Fitzroy, I said I would see to it. You're, you're not just humoring me. Of course not. Now, why don't you get off the phone so I can start the wheels turning? <laughs> Go. Let's go. Now? Tonight? Right now. Oh, l- let me get my raincoat. You don't need it. Come on. Oh. This, this is... This the... is where it happens. Now get inside the car. Oh. Hold on, Cory. When we get there, we'll break in. Oh, the, the, the servants. What servants? There's a housekeeper, a chauffeur, a gardener. All three of them are our people. Oh. This mission has been on the drawing board for five years. Yes, see, si. This is the chief of police, Puerto San Diego. Who? Oh. Who? Oh. Senor William Rollinson? No, we have no Senor William Rollinson here. No, you must have the wrong number. Oh, you are the Senor William Rollinson. Oh, well, si, senor. What? Huh? Send the squad to the finca of Senor Estradita Rollinson, your sister-in-law? But why? You say there's trouble? Oh, there might be trouble. Well, see, si, senor, but it's raining. No, 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 senor, it is not necessary to telephone the presidente. I will make the necessary arrangements. See, si, senor. Oh, see, si, see. Si. No self respecting bandito would go out on a night like this. Crazy Norte Americanos. Hola, Sanchez, Luis, wake up. Get the girl's body out of here. You know where to get rid of it. Donna? Donna, I'm talking to you, Maria. Huh? From now on, that's your name, Donna. Now listen, we have to work fast. Don't worry about me. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what I'm supposed to say. Mm -hmm. I am a trained operator. You young kids, you think you know everything. You had better get out of here. It is my show now. Our show. I'll be in America to supervise. Now listen. We have provided for absolutely every contingency. Nothing, absolutely nothing can go wrong. Oh, it was... It was horrible. I I was frightened and there was such terrible thunder and lightning. Oh, Uncle Bill. Now, now, honey, everything's going to be all right. I was so scared. I thought I'd spend the night in Mama's bedroom, and we had just fallen asleep when we were awakened by by these men. Uh, can you describe these men, Senorita Rollinson? They, they they wore masks, and they just burst into the room, and they demanded Mama's jewels, and Mama told them to get out. Oh, Uncle Bill, you know how Mama was. Yes, honey, yes, I know. Those men, those terrible men, they just started to, 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 to shoot, and I fainted. And when I woke up, the police were in the house, and Mama, poor Mama, was dead. Yes, yes, you, you're, you're going to come home with me to America. Yes, Senor Olson, how did you know? How did you know there would be danger? Uh, do you need Miss Rawlinson, my niece, for anything else? Uh, no, senor. We have her statement. Uh, can she leave the country? Oh, si, senor. But tell me, how did you know? How did you know? And this is my secretary, Miss Fitzroy. How do you do, Miss Rawlinson? I'm so happy to meet you, Miss Fitzroy. Anything you want to know about anything at all, you just ask Miss Fitzroy. Oh, I shall. Don't worry. Uh, do you have a ruler, Miss Fitzroy? Of course. Here you are. I want to measure your shoulders, Uncle Bill. What for? Well, I'm knitting you a new sweater. Donna, honey, I have a million sweaters. I can't help it. The doctor told Mama I was a compulsive knitter. Mama. Poor Mama. Yes, yes. At least you were spared. You, uh, don't like my sweaters, Uncle Bill? Oh, I love them. 
It's just that you've made me so many. See, I'm wearing one right now. Uh, why don't you knit a sweater for Miss Fitzroy? Would you wear it, Miss Fitzroy? Of course she would. Now, tell me, what would you like to do today? Oh, I, I haven't even started on the museums and the, the shops and... Oh, there's so many plays I've just been dying to see. Miss Fitzroy, why don't you arrange a kind of itinerary for Donna? Uh, plan the next week or so for shopping, sightseeing, make reservations for tickets, restaurants. Yes, Mr. Rawlinson. I'll do it immediately. You're going to love it here, Donna. I know. Did your mother ever tell you who I am? Of course. You're my daddy's brother, my Uncle Bill. Mm -hmm. But what else did she tell you about me? I'd uh, rather not say... You know how Mama felt about you. She insisted you turn Daddy against her. Mm, I didn't. Did she tell you how much money I have? She said you're a very wealthy man. Do you know what that means? It means you have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And power. I influence a great many things in this country. And one day I'm going to be out of the picture. Oh, please don't talk about dying, Uncle Bill. Not, Please not now. Well, death is a fact of life. Now... Everything I own will belong to you. How will you use it, I wonder? Oh. Oh, I'll use it where I think it'll do the most good. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that kind of an answer. Uncle Bill? Hmm? This Miss Fitzroy? Yes. Who is she? Well, she's been my secretary since the year one. And she's a very nice lady. Why doesn't she like me? What are you saying? I, I have this, this feeling that she doesn't like me. Now, how can you say that? She, she loves you. She does? Yes, take my word for it. Well, if you say so. Knit her a sweater. She deserves it. May I share this table? If you like. Well, I was wondering when you'd show up, Jesco. I want a report. Oh, I don't have time now. I have to meet my dear uncle in 30 minutes. He's taking me to a baseball game. How will I manage to sit through it? Do your knitting. How are things? Oh, this Miss Fitzroy may be a problem. The secretary? Oh. I, I, I think they're in love with each other. Oh, nonsense. She's been his secretary for 20 years. We know for a fact they haven't had or are now having an affair. I am talking about love, Jesco. You can see it in the way they look at each other, talk with each other. None of our intelligence has ever verified what you claim. Oh, neither he nor she are really aware of it just yet. But one day, it can flare up. Uh, let it. No, because it means they will have to marry. And I will not be the only one to inherit then. Therefore, the holdings will not be ours to control as we wish. No, if she becomes a threat... Well, you, you can't solve everything with a gun, Chesco. What is your suggestion? I shall be the poor, persecuted little niece. As a matter of fact, I have sown the seed already. Mm, that's that. Yeah. What else has to be cleared up this morning, Mr. Troy? Well, you have to look at some top-secret reports on the J system. You have them? A colonel from military intelligence placed them in my hands in the outer office. Now, they're for your eyes and my eyes only. He's waiting for them. Then we better check him out right now. Mm -hmm. Hi, Uncle Bill. May I come in? <laughs> sure, honey. No, no, Donna, you cannot come into the office now. Uncle Bill. Mr. Rawlinson, what are we reading? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. No, honey. Uh, could you excuse us for just a couple of minutes? Of course. I'll excuse you for as long as you want. Oh, Donna, it's your imagination. <laughs> Uncle Bill, she is good as threw me out of the office. It's because we had this top secret document. Oh, sure. Honestly, and I, 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 I had forgotten. It's her job to remind me. She doesn't like the sweater I knitted her. Oh, she does. She told me she does. Well, then why doesn't she wear it? Because it's red, and she never wears red. Her color is blue. Well, she'd look a lot better in red. I know, but that's how she sees herself. I wish you'd fire her. Now, she's been with me for 20 years. Why doesn't she like me? What did I ever do to her? The agenda for the board meeting will consist of... Mr. Rowlandson. Hmm? Oh, yes, Miss Fitzroy. Uh, would you rather discuss this another time? No, no, no. The meeting's tomorrow. We have to do it now. Oh, all right. 
No, the financial report, the analysis... Miss Fitzroy. Yes, sir. May I discuss a most personal matter? Oh? Why, why don't you like my niece? Oh, no, 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 that isn't true. But what makes you say I, I don't like her? Well, for one thing, you don't wear the sweater she knitted for you. <laughs> the weather has been quite warm, hasn't it? Yes, but, but the girl has a feeling that you dislike her. Oh, Mr. Rowlandson, I can assure now, this you is that... it's embarrassing I... for both of us. She's been through a terrible ordeal. You realize that? Yes, Mr. Rollinson. Well, she's probably not herself. Yes, sir. I, uh... Well, I would consider it a personal favor if you, you'd smile at her. And, and you really should wear her sweater. <laughs> I will, Mr. Rollinson. <laughs> I can always depend on you to do the right thing. <laughs> now, where were we on the agenda? Let's see. The financial report, the analysis of the research on... Hmm. Uh, yes, Mr. Troy? Mr. Rawlinson, I, I'm bound by the truth to, to, to make a confession. Confession? If, yes, your niece has this feeling that I dislike her. Well, it, it, it isn't that I dislike her exactly. No, no. What does that mean? Well, she, she probably senses something I feel. All right. What's that? I, I, I don't know how to say this. Well, you generally manage to make yourself understood. Perhaps, but this time I. I'm not sure. Miss Fitzroy, what are you trying to tell me? Well, what I'm trying to tell you is that I have this, this feeling, and it, it keeps nagging at me that, that this girl is not your niece. Not my... What are you saying, Miss Fitzroy? What are you saying? I believe we all heard her. Well, we know it because we were all witnesses to a scene which proves it. But how does Miss Fitzroy know it? Or if she has a feeling, what has brought it about? After all, she has no way of knowing. Or does she? Well, you're in this deep. Stay around for the expose, which happens in Act Three, which I shall bring you in just a few moments. And now a word from the Nederlander organization. For laughs, thrills, and music, there are three shows on Broadway that each in its own way provides one of the best evenings of entertainment. First is Habeas Corpus, the new comedy which just opened at the Martin Beck Theater. Walter Kerr called it the best new comedy this season. Habeas Corpus stars Donald Sinden, Gene Marsh, Rachel Roberts, June Havoc, and Celeste Holm. At the Palace Theater, Scott Joplin's Tremonisha has been delighting audiences with its fabulous musical numbers, prompting the New York Times to call it a triumph. Tree Manisha winds up its limited engagement this coming Sunday, so you only have a few more chances to see it. Sherlock Holmes at the Broadhurst Theater is in its second exciting year, and it continues to be the most suspenseful play in town. It'll only be here through January 4th, then it's off on a nationwide tour. So for laughs, see Habeas Corpus at the Martin Beck. For thrills, see Sherlock Holmes at the Broadhurst. And for ragtime, don't miss Tree Manisha at the Palace through this Sunday only. Gift ideas? May I help you? Oh, I hope so. I work for five men, and guess who's stuck with their Christmas lists? Wives, businessmen, college kids. Rockwell calculators. Huh? Get them all Rockwell calculators from Rockwell International. You know, the Apollo Moon Project, the space shuttle? All that technology is yours for as little as $1688, or up to $2,400 manufacturer's suggested retail prices. Look, this 8R is perfect for a housewife, and here's one your businessmen will use for everything. The college kid, is he in math or science? Then he'd like a slide rule, maybe this 63R. Anyone on your list deal with fractions or metric measurement? This one's perfect for him or her. And this one makes a great family gift. Sounds like Rockwell has something for everybody, including me and my Christmas list. Now, where's the candy? Rockwell makes it easy to choose the right calculator gift, one you can be proud of, at a leading store near you, from Rockwell International, where science gets down to business. Here's a special announcement from Northwest Orient Airlines. Although another airline is on strike, Northwest flights are operating as usual and space is available on many Northwest flights. It's recommended, however, that you secure your advance reservations by calling Northwest. Reservation lines are less busy early in the morning and in the evening. So if you're planning to travel by air, make sure of your reservations in advance by calling Northwest Orient Airlines. Repeat, although another airline is on strike, Northwest flights are operating as usual and space is available on many Northwest flights. There are 
are those people who have very little to say. And when they do speak, it's brief and to the point. And each word is a bombshell. Such a person, as you have already witnessed, is our Miss Amelia Fitzroy. And when she speaks, she is a woman who is not to be taken lightly, especially by her employer. But this time, what is she saying? She is not your niece. I'm afraid I don't understand. I know it sounds crazy, but I... Miss Fitzroy, I always hold everything you say as serious, logical. I know, I know. Well, maybe I shouldn't have said it. But you did. I, I just... Well, it was out before I knew it. Well, let's get to the bottom of it. Why? Why do you think Donna is not my niece? Oh, it, it's just... just a feeling. And... Since I also had a feeling that your sister-in-law's plantation was going to be attacked, and, and it did happen... We accounted for that. It was the normal, well, what I mean... Well, we have feelings of anxiety, and when something happens... I understand all that, Mr. Rowlandson, but I have this feeling that that she's an... She's an imposter. Miss Fitzroy, let us consider the situation rationally. That there's nothing rational about it. It's just, just this crazy feeling I have. Well, if she is not Donna Rowlandson, my niece... The child of my dead brother. Who is she? I don't know. You do know. Oh, why do you say that? I, I can Her assure you that... Her identity has not yet surfaced in your fantasy. I am merely anticipating it. Uh, that's been another secret of my success, as you well know. My ability to anticipate. Yes, but what, what fantasy are you talking about? Part of this fantasy was your feeling that my niece was in danger. Uh, by coincidence... Her mother was killed by bandits. But Mr. Rollins... And so she comes here. Now you fantasize something else. But why do you insist that I fantasize? You are sublimating. Sublimating what? If she's not my niece, who is she? Now, now please, I, I know how this must sound. She is a foreign agent. Oh. <sighs> All right, for the sake of argument, I'll agree. Why? Why? Hmm. Among other things, the J system. Now, suppose a foreign power wanted to gain control of it. You are this company, the sole stockholder. Continue. Your niece is your heiress. She gets all of Rawlinson Industries, the entire far-flung, diversified... But she looks exactly like my niece. She looks like your niece's picture. Now, you haven't seen the girl since she was ten years old, and so... In order to gain control of Rawlinson Industries and the J system, foreign agents murdered both your sister-in-law and your niece, and this girl is in person. I must say, when you fantasize, it's a beauty. Well, I feel it's my duty to let you know. No. Now, let me tell you again what this is all about. Oh, please. You are in love with me. That is not true. It is subconsciously, perhaps, and I'm sorry about that, but it's one of the hazards of your job. And... It's the love of a truly idealistic, unselfish woman. All you want is my happiness. Mr. Rawlinson, you are the most egotistical... Of course! Man. How else can you account for my success? Now, you thought I needed my niece to make me happy. So you fantasized her danger. But now that she's here, you see her as a threat to your own position. That is untrue. But you have no cause to be jealous. I'm not being jealous. And, and you're the one who's fantasizing. Very well. Now, now let's, let's put the thing to rest. Pick up the telephone, please, and get me the chief of police in Puerto San Diego. Si, sí, senor Rawlinson. Now, you're sure the young lady is actually Miss Donna Rawlinson? Well, who else could she be, senor? Would you swear she is Donna Rawlinson? Well, uh, senor, I was not acquainted with the senorita personally. Well, the servants. I want you to interview the servants. And make sure. But, senor, the servants are gone. What do you mean, gone? The finca, the plantation has closed and they are gone. I see. Well, thank you, Chief. <laughs> All right, now, Miss Fitzroy, the thing is ridiculous. The uh, receptionist said I was to go in. I hope it's all right with you, Miss Fitzroy. Well, of course it's all right. Oh, uh, will you excuse me? I have these reports to work on. I told you she didn't like me. The minute I walk in, she walks out. She can't stand the sight of me. Dear, she's very busy. Well, she didn't even say hello to me. Yes, she did. She nodded. And she never wears the sweater I knitted for her, and I worked so hard on it. Honey, it's a hot day. Oh, Uncle Bill, I wish you'd get rid of her. Now, why? Well, she... 
She frightens me. Honey, don't worry about it. There are times when she frightens me, too. Problems. Well, what do you mean, Jessica? Cody tells me the police down in Porto San Diego are asking questions. They're trying to track down the servants. Why? To make sure you're the real Donna Rollinson. Uh-huh. That's some of Miss Fitzroy's work, I'm sure. Well, uh, I can take care of Miss Fitzroy. Oh, that's all we'd need. I have a better idea. Hmm? Let the police find our man who was working as Astro Leader Rawlinson's chauffeur. Good, good. And they can send him up here to identify you. Eh? No, no, we can do better. He can tell the police about my boyfriend. Boyfriend? Donna didn't have a boyfriend. Of course she did. All the servants knew about it. His name was Jasko. Oh, I see. I'm so happy to meet you, Mr. Chesko. You certainly picture yourself a handsome young man, Donna. Oh, I'm so glad you like him, Uncle Bill. I'm so anxious for you two to get along. How long have you known each other? Since Donna was 16. Well, what are your plans, Chesko? I, uh, I must go back to my job in Porto San Diego. What do you do? I am an engineer. Hmm. How'd you like to work for me? Oh, Uncle Bill! What? What, I need a visa and permission These to... These things are no problem. Arrange it, please, Miss Fitzroy. Yes, sir. And meanwhile, Chesco, till you get settled, you'll stay at the house with us. Oh, Uncle Bill, how can I ever thank you? Just by being happy. Oh, you're an old darling. Take us to lunch. You two run along. I'll see you tonight. <laughs> Bye, Uncle Bill. Goodbye, sir, and thank you. Well, Miss Fitzroy, convinced? Of what? Of the fact that she's really and truly my niece. Why? What has occurred to convince me? Her boyfriend. How do we know he's her boyfriend? Well, the chief of police back home says so. No. He says one of the servants says so. Well? How do we know the servants were not in on the plot? Oh, I give up. You investigate the acquisition of a company more thoroughly Miss than you... Miss Fitzroy. Now, I, I appreciate your deep interest. But I must tell you that I would like an end to this discussion for all time. Why are you so afraid of Miss Fitzroy? I don't know, Chesco. She scares me. You were right. You have to get rid of her. But I thought you said she that... She is the one factor that couldn't be foreseen. She'll keep sniping away until she hits something vital. Mm. Get rid of her. How? Well, it, it has to be an accident. Oh. She takes the subway home every night, and it's during the rush hour. Right. Excuse me, lady. Oh, you, you look familiar. I got to take a train to this address, but I can't make it out. And your voice. Could you read it for me, please? Oh, well, let me look. What does it say? to you, Miss Fitzroy. Uh, are you feeling better? It, it, it was a miracle. Uh, Do you know, I, I fell between the tracks. In, in that depression they have, the, the train just passed over me. You worked yourself into a state of exhaustion. You had a dizzy spell and fell under the tracks. But I didn't fall. I was pushed. Now, do you see what I mean? By, by that young Chesco. Now, Miss Fitzroy... You are taking a vacation on my yacht if I have to Shanghai you on board myself. But, Colonel Dawson... Miss Fitzroy, we've checked out Miss Donna Rawlinson very carefully. And you're satisfied she's who she says she is? We have no evidence to indicate anything else. Her boyfriend, this Chesco, what about him? He's a clean-cut young man, good record back home. Then why did he try to kill me? Off the record, why are you so antagonistic toward Mr. Rawlinson's knees? Uh, I see that story has been carefully circulated. I understand she goes out of her way to be nice to you. She, uh, she even knits you sweaters. But I tell you, I... What, what did you say? Well, what I'm trying to say is it, it sounds as if you're jealous of a new female in Rawlinson's life. No, no, about a sweater. She, she knitted me a sweater. Colonel... I'm going to have your evidence. Uh... 
Oh. You know, Mr. Rollinson, Donna's mother didn't like me. Oh, she liked you? She just wanted you to wait five years. <laughs> Honestly, Uncle Bill, the arguments we used to have. <laughs> well, I want you two to be happy now. Good evening. Miss Fitzroy, I didn't hear you come in. Something new at the office? No. There's something new here. Oh, Mr. Tesco. <laughs> I'm sorry your attempt to murder me failed. Now, see here, Miss Fitzroy. This young man is a guest in my house. Uh, Miss Fitzroy, what, 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 what are you saying? I am saying that you and this young lady are imposters. The real Donna Rowlandson is dead. And you, Miss, are posing. I must ask you to leave, Miss no. Fitzroy. You'd better ask me to prove it. And I can. Now, both of us are wearing sweaters knitted by your niece. Yours was sent to you about six months ago. Mine was just... Just last week, they were not knitted by the same person. And what are you driving at? No two human beings knit exactly the same kind of stitches, the same size, the same intervals, because the tension in the fingers differs she's, from one... She's crazy. Oh, sure. Of course I'm crazy. I was crazy to work my life away from Mr. Rowlandson, but that doesn't mean I'm wrong about this. Amelia. Oh. That's the first time you, you ever called me Amelia. Just look... Look, examine the stitches. Your sweater and mine. You see the difference? That's the one thing they couldn't foresee. Just let an expert examine those stitches. Everybody, stand still. What? Let's go. You idiot. Did you have to panic? Did you have to pull that gun? We'll have to arrange for something. So far, nobody knows except us in this room. You still inherit the estate. Everybody knows, Jessica. Oh, Colonel Dawson. Everybody who has anything to do with the J system has a constant tale. Well, Chesco, and you, young lady, we have enough people here to handle everything. Let's go. But I can't. Let's go, I can't. Chesco. Go. And you, oh, miss. Oh, no, I didn't. Please, don't. Please, don't. Please. I'm sorry. It's all right. Especially for your niece. Yes. Poor Donna. Well, I'm grateful to you. Tell me, how did you know about the difference in stitches? Oh, I didn't. I made it up. Amelia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I learned it from you. When something sounds reasonable, ride it for all it's worth, because it may be true. Amelia, both of us have been sublimating. <laughs> I know. About that trip on the yacht. Hmm? How about if I came along? <laughs> I've waited 20 years. Although I, I didn't know I was waiting. And I didn't know I was keeping you waiting. <laughs> well, what are we waiting for now? Nothing. Sublimation. Sometimes the greatest deeds are performed by people who are only performing them because they would much rather be performing something else. That's because people are uniquely crazy, which is all to the good. Because if that weren't so, whatever would we do for stories? If you want to know, just wait a few moments, and I shall return. Well, good old Uncle Sam has done it again. If you know anybody on Social Security, listen to this. People who get Social Security checks will never again have to worry about them being late, or lost, or stolen. If you just fill out a simple form at the Lincoln Savings Bank, Uncle Sam will automatically deposit your Social Security check directly into your account at the Lincoln every month. No more waiting around for it to come. No more lost or stolen checks. No more standing in line to cash them. Every month, the day your check is due, the money is there in your account at the Lincoln. Waiting for you to collect it or write payment orders the way you write ordinary checks or earning interest for you in a Lincoln Savings account. Uncle Sam and the Lincoln do it all automatically. You don't have to do anything except fill out one form at any Lincoln branch or telephone 7826000 and the Lincoln will mail it to you. The Lincoln Savings Bank, 7826000, member FDIC. What's a country fresh flavor like Nuco doing in a city like New York? Nuco's bringing country to the city. Big city now, but it wasn't always that way. I sure used to miss that back home country fresh taste of just big peas and carrots, 
corn and beans. Oh, my. But then Elsie Sue, she's really big city. She put me on to Nuco margarine. It comes in both stick and soft forms, you know, and Nuco's got a real country fresh taste that makes anything you put it on taste country good. So now it's Elsie, me, and Nuco margarine. We're in a big city to stay. Nuco's bringing country to the city. Yeah. Nuco puts a smile on your face. If you saw ten members of the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, eight of us would be women, a lot of us supporting families. We'd have a pretty hard time on our own, but with the union, we can live decent lives and pay our own way. The ILG has been working for the working woman for 75 years. That's my union, and that's what our label stands for. Look for the union label. When you are buying one coat dress for balls, remember somewhere. Mr. Chesco and the false Donna were consigned to whatever limbo captured spies are sent to, and Amelia and Bill lived happily ever after. Most experts, uh, that is, knitting experts, agree that knitting is as distinctive as handwriting. So we're on sound ground there. And you can always be sure of resting on sound ground if you tune us in seven times each week. Our cast included Leon Janney, Bryna Rayburn, Rosemary Rice, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... The preceding program is furnished by CBS Radio. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station. It's 8 o'clock. Here's John Scott with the news. delegate of this union of demons, devils, shades, and spirits, plus other assorted practitioners of the ultra and the macabre. The truest maxim, perhaps, of them all is the one that says, you can't get something for nothing. Not only is it true from the ethical point of view, it is also a demonstrable scientific fact. Well then, with both science and morality on its side, why is this self-evident principle so universally disregarded? Why do so many of us try to make a full-time career of reaping without sowing? Our mystery drama, You Can Change Your Life, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Ralph Bell. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day. The lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lee. The plowman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. As it happens, the darkness is not only left to the poet. Darkness is available to whoever cares to make use of it. 
By their very nature, some deeds can only be performed in the darkness, such as the one you're about to witness. Maria Concepcion Valdez gets off the bus. She stands on the dark, fog-shrouded street corner. Where is Arturo? He always meets her here when she works late. Neither he nor she is happy that she must walk a long, lonely block at this hour. Maria smiles, and her smile is something to see. At 40, she is still slender, trim, and beautiful. Perhaps Arturo has forgotten. But how could he forget? He didn't. Arturo, did you fall asleep? Oh, oh. Excuse me, I, I thought you, you were in my husband, Arturo. Uh, excuse me, are you Mrs. Maria Concepcion Valdez? Oh, that's Maria Concepcion. Oh, I stand corrected. My name is Eugene Parmenter. Yes. And, and I wonder, Ms. Valdez, do you remember me? Oh, do I remember you? Mm-hmm. No, I, I cannot say that I do. This would go back 11 years? Eleven years ago? Mm -hmm. Oh, my. For me, that would have been another world. For me, too. Well, uh, Mr. Parminter, what what is it you wish? Well, it's... uh, I find it inconceivable that you wouldn't remember me. Well, sir, perhaps if you were to tell me... You changed the entire course of my life. Oh, me? Yes. But how? You judged me. Oh, no. No, that cannot be. You, you are making a mistake. You are confusing me, perhaps, with someone else. No, 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 no. There, there's, there's no mistake. But I have never been a judge. Uh, Indeed, I, I would never be a judge. Think back. Eleven years. A night filled with music, with laughter, in a great hall with brilliant light. I, I, I really... Parmenter. Parmenter. Eugene Parmenter. Do you remember me? Huh? Think. Oh, please, sir, if you will excuse me. You judge me. I, I, I must be on my way. Say my name. Eugene Parmenter, say it. Uh, Eugene Parmenter. Now, do you remember? I, 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 do you remember judging me? I, I and do you remember condemning me? I never condemned anybody, never. And now it is my turn. Oh, you please. My turn. Please, don't, don't kill me. Not in the knife, no. Help <laughs> 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 What do you want? I want Mrs. Gussie Valkowska. And now that you've found me? I'm Police Lieutenant Weiss. And you want to come in and talk to me? Well, since I can't stop you, let's get it over with. Leave me, save me a lot of time. You want to talk to me about the murder of Maria Concepcion Valdez last night? It happened just down the street. Now, uh, did you hear anything? I didn't hear nothing because I wasn't home. Well, where were you? What's the matter? Do I need an alibi? I only wanted to ask you... Who killed her? Go ahead. Ask me. I thought you said you weren't here. It's open and shut. What are you talking about? I know who killed her. Her husband. That Arturo. Why do you say that? Why do I say that? Listen. Hear that? These walls are like cardboard. I think they are cardboard. You can hear every word they say next door. I used to sit by the wall all night. A cup of tea, some fruit, some cake, and just listen. To what? To the arguments Maria and Arturo used to have each and every night. What about? Well, you got another background, Captain Weiss. I'm only a lieutenant. You're going to get promoted because you're about to solve this case. And it's the old story. What old story? They come here from Cuba 12, 15 years ago. He was kind of rich, but he was lucky to get out with a shirt on his back, you see. Well, I I don't know. He couldn't seem to get started up here. Everything went wrong for Uh, him. Mrs. Valdosco, all I want to know is why you say he killed him. Like I was saying, the only work he could get was the kind of thing that was... uh, It was considered beneath his his station, like it says in the book. Meanwhile, she got a job and she started making more money than he did. How did you know? I've read the books, too. (laughs) So, 
he gets jealous. He says, I won't have you working in that place with all those men at night. What kind of a place was it? A bank or a stockbroker. He said he was dishonored that his wife worked at night in an office with men. And she asked, why did he feel dishonored that his wife had to work? Period. And he accused her of being sweet on one of the guys, and she laughed at him, and he said if she didn't quit, he'd kill her. He said he would kill her, those words? Those exact words. When did this argument take place? The argument, in the sense that they was having a difference of opinion, had been going on for years. But it didn't start getting hot till she got this new job. Let's see, uh... Last month. And you distinctly heard him say, I'll kill you. Yes, sir. And I even said to her, listen, Maria, this guy sounds like he could do it, too. But she only laughed and said, poor Arturo. And then she sighed and, and said, I may have outgrown him. Thank you, Mrs. Valdowska. Thank you very much. But, Lieutenant... Why would I kill Maria? Why would I kill my wife? Mr. Valdez, is it true you fought? Yes, we fought, but all married couple fight. Continuously, bitterly? I... We... we what did you uh... fight about? There are those things between a man and wife which need not be discussed with strangers. We are investigating a murder. Investigate? But why question me? Mr. Valdez, your wife was murdered near the bus stop. By, by some some subhuman monster, some thief who... Her money was still in her purse. She still wore her rings and bracelets. We must discount robbery as the motive. What did you fight about with your wife, Mr. Valdez? I am not required to tell you. All right, shall I tell you? She was making more money than you. You resented it. And she was beginning to resent it, too. Your marriage was coming apart. That's a lie. I, I was a very wealthy young man back in the old country. We were allowed to take nothing with us. I never learned... Uh, I never learned how to make a living. She said, you must change your whole attitude. You must go to school, learn a trade, a profession, anything. I could not do it. Do you understand? Frankly, no. Too many generations of blue blood. Uh, but she learned. And she was becoming another person, a stranger. I I tried to keep her, but she... she... And so you killed her. No, 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 no. You would meet her at the bus stop every evening? Yes. The last night you didn't? No. Why not? I must have fallen asleep. I was awakened by the police who, who rang my bell... To tell me yes, that I she... know. She... I'll tell you what sounds more logical, Mr. Valdez. Last night you went to the bus stop, as usual, to meet your wife. And you had the usual argument. And in a fit of anger, you killed her. But it's not true. I wouldn't. I, I, I couldn't kill Maria Concepcion. Where were you? I was home. I told you I had fallen asleep. Had it ever happened before? Had you ever missed meeting her at the bus stop? I was... I was very tired. I, I just... Fell asleep. Which means you have no alibi. No, no, no. no. You, you must believe me. Now, Mr. Valdez, you could have gone to the bus stop last night. What I did. You could have waited for I had the fight, the usual fight. But I tell you, I, I reached was... that terrible point where you lost control and killed her. No. When you realized what you had done, you became horrified. You ran from the spot. But I was You raced I... back to your home to the security of your room. No. Now, you went to sleep. Because you wanted to believe that you had been asleep all the time. It's a lie. Well, you ask me, Mr. Valdez. I'm telling you what happens to many people who commit murder. But I... I people I like you I... who are not professional criminals who will only kill perhaps once in their lives and only when they're driven beyond all endurance. No, no, I didn't kill her. I tell you, I didn't kill her. Yes. You probably believe you didn't kill her. <laughs> Lieutenant, what am I going to do? If I were you, I'd get a lawyer. Well, Mr. Palmer, I can promise you, in less than one week's time, you shall be an acceptable bridge player. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> yes, indeed. The Borden School of Bridge guarantees results. I mean, 
provided you can count to 13. Oh, I, I think I can handle that, Miss Borden. <laughs> oh, good. Well, it's been a pleasure to meet you. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, yes, darling. Well, I'm closing right now. The new student is here. Oh, well, I just have to get his name and everything. Now, I won't be long. Sure thing. Bye, dear. Well, now, just let me fill out this form. You said it's been a pleasure to meet me. But we have met before, you and I. Oh, have we? Oh, yes. And I remember you very well. Are you sure? Oh, yes. It was 11 years ago. Eleven years? Oh, that's ancient history. Well, to you, perhaps. But to me, it's real, living, vital history. Mm. I'm trying to place you. Uh, remember me now? No. <laughs> and my name? Eugene Parmenter? Means nothing? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I suppose I should. You... Uh, you, uh, changed the entire course of my life. Oh, well, how can you say that? Yes, you sat in judgment. Now, I, I'm afraid I can't follow that at all. You judged me and found me wanting. Well, how is it I don't remember any of that? To you, it meant nothing. Oh, no, no. But to me, it was my life. You condemned me. Oh. Mr. Parmenter, are you sure you, you have the right... look at me closely. Look at me. Now, look uh, at me. Uh, sir, I I'm afraid I must ask you to leave. Now, look at me, you stupid woman. Now, see here. <gasps> no, don't. Please. Please don't point that knife at me. I'm going to kill you. Why? Why? Because you sentenced me to misery for ten years. You won't get away with it. Or perhaps I wouldn't if I used a gun. Help! You Help know me! as well as I do there's no one here. You'll be caught. With a gun, they can identify bullets. A knife leaves no trace at all. Why? Why? Look at me closely. Now, do you remember? Eugene Palmenter. Yes, I remember. Good. Now you won't die in ignorance. But I didn't do anything. You condemned me. No, no, don't, don't. <laughs> That's twice Mr. Eugene Parmenter has committed murder. The first time, the police found someone who could conveniently be blamed, showing that sometimes even murderers can have fringe benefits. Will Mr. Parmenter be lucky this time again? That will depend on Homicide Lieutenant Charles Weiss. As you can see, quite a second act is building up. And I shall be here with it in just a few moments. Mr. Eugene Parmenter has been busy recently settling what appears to be some old grievances. What makes this of interest to the police is the fact that he has been settling them with a knife. Of course, the police don't know about Mr. Parmenter yet. Indeed, why should they? His first murder has a logical suspect, and as for his second... Now or later, Terry. Now or later, what? Are you going to make a statement? Hey, what do you mean, a statement? Telling us how and why you killed her. Lieutenant, are you crazy? I mean, have you lost your mind? Terry, you've been cheating on her. Oh, okay, all right. You've been robbing a blind here at the school. What are you talking about? She's got you in court. She's got a lawsuit against you. Well, let me explain well, that. Well, what's to explain, uh, Terry? It's more than just a civil action to recover money. You could be up against embezzlement, fraud. You could go to jail. Lieutenant, let me level with you, huh? Okay, she was mad at me. Oh, come on, Terry. Let's stick to the facts. These uh... are the facts, Lieutenant. Sure, I robbed her blind, but I was entitled to all I could get. I gave her what she wanted for exchange. All I know is you have the strongest of motives. She's thrown you out into the street, you're on your way to jail. But don't you understand, Lieutenant, it happened all the time, regular, like clockwork. This time it went a little further, because she was a little madder. But she calmed down like she always did. She couldn't do without me. Both of us knew it. All she was doing was letting off steam. Try that story in front of a jury. You might be lucky. You were the last one to see her alive at a club. No. 
No, that isn't true. The killer was the last Witnesses night. saw you in that building at 6 p.m. Well, I don't deny I was there. I'd come to make up with her, and I did. We did. And she said, run along and meet me at Larigo's restaurant. Somebody's coming by in a couple of minutes to sign up for lessons. And I did. And who was this somebody? I don't know. But he must have been the guy who killed her. Terry, you have to realize that we only have your word for the fact that you and Miss Borden had made up last night. And that you no longer had a motive. And that, uh, that there was a mysterious visitor to her office. But it's true. M- maybe there is a mad killer running around. A mad killer. Okay, uh... A couple, three nights ago, this dame was murdered on the street corner. She was stabbed, wasn't she? What are you trying to tell me, Terry? Okay, last night, Elizabeth Borden gets stabbed to death. Now, the same guy could have done it. And what was his motive? What was his motive for killing the other dame? Now, come on, give me a break, huh? Don't close it up. I know I'm hip deep in circumstantial evidence, but I tell you, I didn't kill her. Okay, Terry, think about it. No, you think about it. She was the goose who was laying the golden eggs. Why should I be crazy enough to kill her? Homicide, Lieutenant Wise. Yes, Doctor. Right. Uh, This uh, Miss Elizabeth Borden uh, was murdered the other night. Is there any way at all we can tell if it was with the same knife that killed the Valdez woman? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, then, the uh, wound. Uh, is there anything about it that could tell us if it was administered by the same person? Uh-huh. You say the position was exactly the same. I see. Yes, I know it's not conclusive. Well, okay, Doc, thanks. <laughs> Mr. Valdez, I'd like to talk to you. Why, Lieutenant? I may be able to offer you a slight ray of hope. Hope? For what? The evidence is all against you so far, but there's a chance you may not be the killer. No, I am the killer. What? You see, after you had left me the other day, I thought and thought for hours. And of course, you were right. I killed her. Are you sure? Oh, yes, yes. She she no longer loved me. That's because when we came here, she began to grow into someone else, and I had refused to go at all. I struck out at her wildly, blindly, and so I, I killed her. You confess, then? Then I must have killed her. Who else would have? But you don't actually remember doing it. Oh, no, I must have blotted it forever from my memory. Another woman was stabbed to death last night. <sighs> Unhappily, there is never a shortage of maniacs. Well, it could have been a random killing, or it may be a pattern, or... Uh, uh, tell me, uh, the name Elizabeth Borden, is that familiar? Elizabeth Borden? Did you ever hear your wife mention Elizabeth Borden? Uh, yes, yes. In what connection? I, I, she, uh, Mary, I said, oh, it was months ago. She said, you will never guess who I ran into today, Elizabeth Borden. And? And that was all. What else did she say? Nothing. You see, women are, well, they are a race unto themselves. She said, I ran into Elizabeth Borden as if I knew who she was. Elizabeth Borden and your wife were both stabbed to death. Possibly by the same man. No, Lieutenant. I am sure I killed my wife. What do you want to look in the apartment for, Lieutenant? Ain't the case closed? Did you ever hear Mrs. Valdez speak of an Elizabeth Borden? Elizabeth Borden. Say, ain't she the one that was murdered? Hey, you figure the same guy... But, uh, 
Well, I could have sworn old Arturo was the culprit. You never heard her mention Elizabeth Borden? Never. What are you looking for? Anything that might give me a lead. You ain't happy with Arturo, huh? As long as there's a possibility that... Hmm. You think she was good looking now? Here's a picture. I can tell by the hairstyle and the dress. It's got to be 10, 11 years ago. Look at her. Wasn't she gorgeous? Who are these other two dames in the picture? Oh, wait a minute. The one in the middle. Why does she look familiar to? The one in the middle? Yeah. I've seen that face before. Yeah, so have I. Wait a second. In the paper. Just recent. Oh, she's a good ten years younger, but it... It's got to be. Elizabeth Borden. The two of them. They're connected. Sure. The one on the left, that's Maria Concepcion. The one in the middle, that's got to be Elizabeth Borden. But the third one, the lady on the right, who's she? Hello? Are you Penelope Simpson? Oh, uh, well, my name is Eugene Parmenter. I hope you remember me. Oh, you don't. Well, uh, look, we're having a get-together of uh, the You Can Change Your Life alumni. Well, I guess alumni is not quite the word. Oh, hey, do you remember any of the other girls? Uh, look, I happen to be at the Rathskellers. It's uh, just a block away from your office. and Well, I know this is short notice, but uh, it's uh, 5 o'clock. Could you meet me here for a drink on your way home and we can talk about it? <laughs> oh, don't worry. No, I remember what you look like. How could I ever forget? Now, Mr. Valdez, I know you told me you never heard of Elizabeth Borden. Now, this is her picture. Does she look familiar? No, Lieutenant. The other woman in the photograph? No, 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 Lieutenant. Mr. Valdez, this is a picture of three women. Two of them have already been murdered. I have to find out who is the third lady. But, Lieutenant, you have convinced me. I must have killed Maria Concepcion. Oh, no, no, no. Now, evidently, there is someone who was out to kill your wife and this Elizabeth Borden woman, and now maybe this other. You don't know how much I wanted to kill her. You see, I am no longer a man. She supported me. Look closely at the picture. Do you know where it was taken? I don't remember. Isn't there anything about her that's familiar? <laughs> I shouted at her. I yelled at her. What do you mean? The dress. What dress? You see the dress in the picture. She bought the dress. It cost too much money. We were poor. Why did she want a dress? Because she's a woman. And women are vain. Okay. Now, this is maybe ten years ago. You had an argument with your wife about a dress. But she bought it. And she's wearing this dress in this picture. Oh, please, please. I try to remember the argument about the dress, please. Why, why did she want the dress? Why? Uh, oh, oh, yes, because she said millions of people would be looking at her. Where? Where? On the television. That's where. It was a program, uh, how do you call it, a uh, giveaway program. It, uh, it was called, like, uh, I don't remember. All right, tell me everything you do remember. Yeah, yeah. She had written a letter. I did not hold with such foolishness. She had applied to be a judge. What kind of a judge? Uh, a judge. A judge who would judge the people, the contestants. And she was accepted, and that is why she wanted the dress. Is it possible that these women were also on the program? Is it possible? Here, let me look again. Oh, let me try to remember. She was sitting behind a huge desk with two other women. And she was wearing this dress. Yes, it could be. These might have been the other women. Hold it a minute. Lieutenant Wise. Yes. Oh. What's her name? Penelope Simpson. Same kind of wound, huh? All right, 
Bud. I'll get right on over there. The name Penelope Simpson, Valdez. Does that mean anything to you? Uh, no, no, Lieutenant. Are you going to put me back in my cell? Now, Mr. Valdez, how many times must I tell you you did not kill your wife? You're free. Now, there's no point in your coming around here anymore. Nobody's going to arrest you. She had... had called me. She said... she had a date for cocktail. Did she say with whom? Well, no. But, but you see, she, she was in a hurry. Mrs. Simpson... I have a photograph here, and I wonder if you No, I couldn't. Well, I want you to identify, if you can, two other ladies who were posing with your daughter. I'm sorry. I can't help you. But uh, why not, Mrs. Simpson? Because I'm blind. But you... you... Because I'm in this room, which I know so thoroughly, every square inch. I see. Well, this is a photo. It's very good. Must have been professionally done. It's in color. We have here your daughter and a woman named Maria Concepcion Valdez. Is that name familiar? I don't think so. And the other is Miss Elizabeth Borden. Would you know of her? Oh, Elizabeth Borden. No. Oh, Wait. Oh, I I should remember Elizabeth Borden. Why? Why should you remember Elizabeth Borden? Had your daughter ever mentioned that name? I... I think so. In connection with a television show? Oh, a TV show. Oh, no. I think... uh, Well... Perhaps if you were to tell me the name of the show... Oh, I don't know the name. It was a uh, giveaway kind of thing. What, what were they giving away? I don't know exactly. Well, what were they doing on the program? This is rather peculiar, you know. You're the police officer, and I'm asking the question. Well, sometimes you find out more that way. I... Don't know what they were giving away, but it had to do with judging. Judging? Oh. Oh, I remember. It was called... You Can Change Your Life. Thank you, Mrs. Simpson. Thank you. I'm so sorry we didn't know all this much sooner. What is it that we do know? We know that three women who may have been on a TV program more than a decade ago have come to a violent end. And the perpetrator is a gentleman who considers himself an aggrieved party. The name of the show, You Can Change Your Life. Really? How? How was it supposed to work? Why don't you meditate until I return with enlightenment? in just a few moments. Three women of completely different backgrounds murdered. Offhand, there is no connection between them. It could have been a mad random killer. But Police Lieutenant Charles Weiss realized that there is always a method to madness and an order to randomness. And he has succeeded in placing all three women in the same place at the same time. And your daughter was on this program, Mrs. Simpson? Yes. She had written in and she had asked to be a judge. They paid each judge $500. Oh, the floodgates have opened. I remember everything. But what does this... You can change your life. Now, now, who was the... uh, The star. Oh, 
You don't remember Ted Tinker? No, I, I can't say that I do. The show went off the air, oh, eight, nine years ago, because Ted Tinker had a stroke. Oh, he was such a lovely person, so gentle, so kind, so humane, so involved. Well, Lieutenant, it was a great show. You know, there's a sucker born every minute. Would you uh, remember these three ladies, Mr. Tinker? Oh, look, I was on 15 years, 790 shows. I'd be on today if I didn't have to be in a wheelchair. Is there any way you could identify... It could be a terrific gimmick, you know what I mean? The wheelchair bit? Look at the career Lionel Barrymore had for himself. Bad, but the agencies don't buy it. About these three ladies... Look, Mr. Lieutenant, I'm organized. Organization, that's how you run show business... Each one of my judges, she gets a picture, $500, a smile, a sincere thank you. Uh, there's a letter and a number on the back of that picture. Uh, yes, K-1. All right, in back of you, that row of drawers, the one marked K. All right, I got it. Now, there's a folder marked 1. Take it out. All right, hand it over. So, what do we got here? K is 1965. Now, uh, here we are. And one is the first show. Judges, your three ladies. Maria Conception Valdez, Elizabeth Borden, tall skinny dame, and Penelope Simpson. Uh Uh-huh. What was their uh, function on the show? They gave away 25 grand every week. And every week we had three new judges. And uh, this particular week they were the judges. How did it work? Wow, it was a sob story program. E- you mean you never watched it? Uh, no. What were you doing? Living in exile someplace? You know the ratings I had? What did they do? Every week, two creeps would come on a show. You think you run into weirdos in your business? So, these two characters each week would say how they could change their lives for the better if they had $25,000. And? And that was it. It's the gimmick. It was good for 15 years till I got sick and... And the judges, I would suppose, decided who would receive the prize, eh? Yeah, but don't brush off the genuine, authentic, grassroots appeal. I mean, these were folks who wanted to change their lives, to become something greater, something better, to be a credit to their country and their community. Uh, Don't try to sell me. I'm not a sponsor. K-1. We had these three women as judges, and the contestants were... Oh, you should have seen the neck on this guy. He was one of the contestants. I called him Ichabod Crane. The audience broke up. What was his name? Uh, Jerry Dawson. And the other guy, a very quiet-looking creep named Eugene Palmer. Who was the winner? The jury decided in favor of the neck, Jerry Dawson. And the loser was... Uh... Eugene Palmer. On what basis did the ladies decide? Well, they're all three dead, so I guess we'll never know, eh? Well, what kind of stories did the contestants tell? Stories? Do I know? Do I remember? Great tragedies, a chance to begin anew. Are you saying I had a sore loser that night and he was mad enough to kill the judges? It's only a hypothesis. So why does that crumb wait ten years? I don't know. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. I remember. He went to jail. For what? It was a month after the show. I remember it was in the paper. He stole a lot of money from some company he worked for. And he went to jail? He got ten years. Which means he just got out, and just in time to kill those three ladies. Hey, sure, it figures. He was sore at them. Ten years. That's a long jail term just for stealing. Well, there was some assault wound up in it, too. You see, when the cops come after him, he put up a fight. Pretty violent guy. I remember he started a bad scene after the show was over. I had to call the cops. Parmenter. Eugene Parmenter. <laughs> Lieutenant Wise. Yeah. Okay. Inspector, we got a tape of that show. We got a great description of the guy. We've circulated it all over. Every cop has an eye out for him. All we can do now, Inspector, is wait. Yeah, I'm staying with it. I knew this was the right place. 
When I heard your voice, Lieutenant. Oh, Mrs. Simpson. Here, uh, let me help you to a chair. Thank you. What can I do for you? It's been a month, Lieutenant, hasn't it? Since the murder of my daughter and those two other ladies. I'm sorry. We're doing the best we can. Crimes are solved by routine. I don't think you will ever find Eugene Parmenter that way. That's the only way we have. Why were my daughter and the others killed? Because some psychotic held them responsible for his failure. Precisely. And he had to have his revenge. Why shouldn't he drop quietly out of sight, even leave the country, disappear forever? We hope that won't happen. I have a suggestion. You have? Yes. Why should Mr. Parmenter believe his work is finished? Well, because he's already murdered those three women who he believes had wronged him. Yes, but suppose he can be convinced he made a mistake. I don't follow them. Suppose it should turn out that he had killed them for nothing. Then what? I still don't understand. Suppose he were to discover that the judges on that program were only figureheads, window dressing, that the decision was really made by Mr. Ted Tinker, who secretly conveyed the verdict to the judges. And that would make Mr. Parmenter so furious that he would attempt to murder Mr. Tinker? Yes. You could guard Mr. Tinker night and day and thus catch Mr. Parmenter in the act as he attempts... Uh, Mrs. Simpson, we can't do that. We are restricted by various constitutions. Very well. I shall do it myself. Oh, now, Mrs. Simpson... I shall tell the reporters that my daughter gave me the inside information that it was Mr. Tinker who really made the decision. But that's not true. How would anyone know? I say my daughter told me. Can you prove she didn't? Well, Mrs. Simpson, we can't stop you. I'm so glad to be on the evening news over your station. Penelope told me everything about that old-time show. They were not really the judges. They were just there to look pretty. Mr. Ted Tinker told them what to do. That's not true. That is not true. Mr. Tinker decided in advance who the winner would be. That is a lie. And the girls, of course, were willing to go along with it. You're lying. I suppose it can be told now. This poor, demented man, he killed them for nothing. What, what do you mean I killed them for nothing? I killed them because they wouldn't give me a chance to win. Kill him for nothing? Me? Oh, no. No, it was Ted. Ted Tinker. He fooled me. He was the one. He was the one who could have changed my life. He was the one. I am going to sue your station for every nickel you've got. And that stupid reporter. I never said who the winner should be, and I can prove it. I got witnesses, my director, my scriptwriters. You're in bad trouble, baby. The next voice you hear will be my lawyer. Hello, Mr. Tinker? What? Who are you? Huh? How'd you get in here? You don't remember me? I'm Eugene Parmenter. No. No, you ain't. I remember what you look like. I changed my face just enough. But people who stare hard... Can Listen, write... I don't care what you heard on TV. It was the dames. They decided I had nothing to do with it. You should have overruled them. After all, my case my case was so obviously more worthy. Now, look, don't do anything crazy. I said I, said I, I needed the money in order that I may not drop into the searing fires of shame. Now, I said I needed it to right a wrong, and everybody laughed. I didn't laugh. Believe me, I was moved. I cried. Then... Then why didn't you help me? 
Why didn't you give me the money that could have saved my reputation and kept me from prison? Because the game had to be played by the rules, and the judges said... You were the judge. No, no, no. It isn't true. Believe me, she's a senile old lady. Can't you see what she's doing? She's setting you up. Hey, look, put away the knife, beat it fast, and you're in the clear. I won't even say you showed up. I don't know. Not until you pay the price. You're crazy. Hey, no. no don't, don't come near me. Don't you right. uh, Let go of the knife. Uh, Palmetto, let go of the knife. Uh, let go. Drop it. <laughs> That's but better. he was the one. He, he was the one I had to kill. The others, they were a mistake. I, I, I'm sorry. They... Yes, we're all sorry. There they, Jim. Get the cops on him. All right, take him down. I'll, I'll come out of jail one day, Ted Tinker. Oh, you'll pay the price. Hey, Lieutenant, did you set this up? No, Mrs. Simpson arranged it all by herself. We simply had to protect you in case of danger. I'm going to sue her in the station for every nickel that... Oh, no. You want to know something? She guessed it. She's right. I did call all the shots. That fool... He killed all those poor dames for nothing. Which is what most murders are done for. Nothing. Considering death is so final, couldn't there be a better way? Well, I have suggestions for many better ways, but first you listen to some messages, and then I shall return. My name is Ebenezer Scrooge. Have you got a candy for me? Our name is Shrafts, and have we got a candy for you. So roll your eyes and set your tummy. Lick your lips, cause yummy, yummy, yummy. Have we got a candy for you? A chocolate cream and a cherry dream. A jelly slice and a drop with spice. A crispy nut and a coconut. A caramel and a non Have we got a candy for you? Whether you like your candy sweet or sour, hard or soft, crispy or creamy, Schraff's has it all wrapped up for Christmas. From a little bag of Schraff's Starlights to a gold chest of Schraff's Chocolates. Well, pat my tummy. Have we got a candy for you from Schraff's? Jock Full of Nuts, the heavenly coffee, comes in just one grind. Makes perfect coffee every time, no matter how you make it. Whether you use the old-fashioned percolator or any of the new automatics, Mr. Coffee, Norelco, West Band, Bun, or any other coffee maker, Jock Full of Nuts is the only coffee that gives you that perfect heavenly flavor in any of them. Jock Full of Nuts all-method grind coffee is a blend of the world's most expensive coffees in one grind that makes heavenly coffee in any coffee maker. Something for nothing. A change of the entire direction of your life in one grand moment. Manna from heaven. No, it doesn't happen. And yet, how many hopes are based on it? How many people wait breathlessly for the big win? The long shot. The lottery ticket. And thus do their lives flow silently away. The only thing you should wait for regularly is this program, seven times each week. Our cast included Ralph Bell, Earl Hammond, Bryna Rayburn, Robert Dryden, and Martha Greenhouse. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater... 
for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tonight's Mystery Theater was also brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program was furnished by CBS Radio. 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 The preceding program was furnished by G. Marshall, major domo of this mansion of the mysterious and the macabre. We complain that so many of the old values are lost on this new generation, and it may be true. But consider some of our old values. We were told to look before you leap, but we were also told he who hesitates is lost. Obviously, there has always been a problem in communication. As the philosopher said, we must simplify. Simplify and clarify. Our mystery drama, Marry for Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Luden's Medicated Cough Drops and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. And if we want it badly enough, perhaps we might visit the office of James Kellogg. James is a private detective, and he specializes in finding things for people. On a philosophical level, we might speculate to whom does Jim go when he has to find something for himself. Well, where does a doctor go when he needs an operation? What does a barber do when he wants a haircut? Anyhow, I've been described as a private detective, and right off, I would like to straighten everybody out on some basic facts. Fiction has made a pretty good thing out of my profession. You know, the luscious blonde with the inviting eyes who enters the office all afire with passion. I don't get cases like that. I don't get sapped on the skull and wake up in the arms of a gorgeous redhead. You want to know what I get? I usually get what just walked into my office this morning. Fat and 50-ish. And what do you think her problem is? I want you to know, Mr. Kellogg. I investigated you thoroughly before coming here. As indeed you should, Mrs. Melvin. An influential member of the family personally discussed the matter with the district attorney and asked him to recommend someone. Your name was suggested. Now that you're here... I shall explain exactly why we deemed it advisable to engage a private eye. One moment, Mrs. Melvin. I am not a private eye. I am a private detective or a confidential investigator. Please continue. Here is our problem. Our problem? I am acting for the family, my two brothers and myself. We decided this would be the wisest course of action. We have a sister who is about to make a dreadful mistake. Yes? Anne's husband died a year ago. He was in the hardware business and left a large amount of money. How large? Is that germane to this discussion? One never knows. After taxes, two million dollars. That's large. Continue. Anne intends to marry again. This is the dreadful mistake? Yes. How old is your sister? Oh, just 40. Well, isn't she mature enough to know what she's doing? Oh, she's a babe in the woods. She's always led a sheltered life. She knows nothing of the world. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the man in question is younger than your sister. 
How did you know? Well, Mrs. Marvin, this is not a unique situation. Well, I... Uh, the family wants this thing broken up. Why? Because you're afraid her money will go to her new husband and not be available to you? Now, see here, Be Mr. realistic. How can I or anybody break up this romance if she's determined to marry him? By exposing him for what he is. What is he? A thief. A confidence man. Well, if you know this, then he's already been exposed. But that's just it. We don't know it for a fact. Then how can you say it? Because it's true. It must be true. Why? A fellow like him, smooth, sneaky. Oh, and he seems so much younger. Is your sister attractive? That is not the point. Walter Jones is too glib. That's his name? Walter Jones? Yes. What does he do? Oh, he says he's come to town to open a sales office. What kind of sales office? Well, I don't know. He's obviously a swindler and a sharper. And if so, he must have been in trouble with the law at one time or another. Have you discussed this with your sister? Oh, she's so thoroughly infatuated she won't listen to a single word against him. But if if you could come up with solid evidence of a criminal record, I am convinced we could nip this thing in the bud. Well, suppose he has no criminal record. Impossible. One look at his face It and could you... take a great deal of my time and your money to find out. I consider that money well spent. It's an investment in my dear sister's happiness. On the other hand, even if this evidence does exist, it may not do you any good. What do you mean? Well, suppose your sister's so much in love with this man that she decides to marry him anyhow. You just find that evidence. Well, I'll need... Uh... I know what you'll need. I've prepared a sheet of paper listing this infamous person's address, the places he frequents, and so on. Here's his photograph. It's an excellent likeness. Mm, you've come well prepared. I'm paying you for your time. I won't have you waste one single moment. I expect a detailed report of your progress. That's one thing you can be sure you'll get out of all this, Mrs. Melvin. A report. A nice, neat, concise, leather-bound report. <laughs> Up the motor, Walter, oh, it's so lovely out here. Let's drift for a while. Let's lie back and look up at the sun and not go anywhere. Yes, why not? Mm. Isn't that really what we're doing? And, dearest, what do you mean? Aren't we just drifting, not getting anywhere? I know. Let's get married. I want that, dear, more than anything in the world. Well, then why don't we get married tomorrow? Where? Anywhere. There are enough judges, clergymen. No, dear. You really don't want to marry me, do you? Now, what you're saying is let's go off and get married. Well, yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and your family will say, aha, we were right. About what? You know about what? Right in thinking there's something shady about me. See, he stole her away. No, I want us to be married properly. Oh. And you do, too. You know, dear, you're really a very old-fashioned uh, conservative girl at heart. <laughs> no, I'm not. Oh, yeah, you want a formal wedding surrounded by your family and friends. Let my sister and her brother say that they won't come. Very well. We gave them their chance. Uh, darling, a marriage should be forever. Even though we both had previous experiences that, that might deny it. However, this is the real one for each of us. Oh, yes, darling. It is. I know it is. Then let's be patient. Perhaps for just a little while. Oh, I've been patient with my stupid sister long enough. Well, let's give them a little more time. And when they get to know me better... I don't care. Darling, I'm doing this for you. If it were up to me, we'd be standing before a justice of the peace tonight. But your family means so much to you. You want their approval. So, let's wait a little while. All right, darling. But that's going to be a very little while. Greetings, Lieutenant. What can I do for you, James? Well, I'm looking for a baddie. That is, he may be. Walter Jones. The name ring a bell? No bell at all. Walter Jones. Hmm. But, um... Edgar. In the big file under J. Jones. First name Walter. See if there's a make. Yeah. Name could be a phony. What's he supposed to have done? Well, I don't know what he's done exactly, Lieutenant. I only know what he wants to do. He wants to get married. Has that become a crime? Well, maybe it ought to be. 
Outraged prospective in-laws, blushing bride with two million bucks clutched in her hand like a lollipop. And friend Walter, out to snatch it away from her. Hmm. Well, some guys have all the luck. <laughs> Lieutenant Martin. Yeah, Edgar? Oh, thanks. Sorry, James. How about the listing from the Federals? A blank. And Edgar checked. The all states wanted full to two. Well, can we cross file him, Lieutenant? It means we'll have to look at a lot of pictures. Well, you might want him one day yourself. Now, what's this guy's M.O.? Well, if he has one, he's a confidence operator. Makes a habit of marrying wealthy widows. This uh, mugshot here on the file. Here's your guy in the picture. Walter Jones. It's his real name. Age 33. Did two years for stock swindle. That's the only rap they ever got him on. But look at what he beat. Yeah. Suspicion of homicide. Carolyn Jones, wife. Released lack of evidence. Tried for murder. Julia Jones, wife. Acquitted. Yep. And now does the mad wife killer strike again? Now, Lieutenant, suspicion will get us nowhere. And the time that he was tried for it, he beat it. I don't know what we can do. The fraud thing he's already paid for. The suspicious stuff... Neither here nor there. Legally, he's innocent. So he cannot be arrested. He can't be stopped. I'm not out for an arrest, Lieutenant. All my clients sent me to the store for was information, and I got it. Thanks, Lieutenant. And thank your department for your courtesy and cooperation. This piece of paper is even more than I dared hope for. Not only is he a thief... He is also a murderer. Now, that hasn't been proved. What do you plan to do with this information? Hmm. Rest assured, I shall use it in a manner which I deem to be most effective. Well, then I'd say the case is closed. You'll receive a bill for my services. Hmm. And I'll wager all you did to earn your exorbitant fee was to go down to police headquarters and ask a few simple questions. Well, Mrs. Melvin, it's not just a question of who you know. It's what you know. <laughs> Phyllis? Oh, yes, Andy. How are you? Phyllis, I want to invite you to my wedding. Oh, do you? No, I don't want you to go into an entire three-act play about it. Walter and I intend to be married this coming Sunday at St. Maurice's at four. You and the rest of the family can come and give us your blessing, or not as you see fit. I asked you. Darling, what makes you think we wouldn't come? Phyllis! What are you saying? Four o'clock, of course, we'll be there. And then we'll have a reception at my house. Phyllis. And, darling, I'm so happy for you. Now, let me call everyone. Goodbye, dear. I'll talk with you later. What, what do you think of that? What is it, Anne? They're coming. My family is actually coming. All of them? Roy and Bob, everyone. <laughs> Phyllis calls a shot. I told you they'd see the light eventually. Now, aren't you glad we didn't run off somewhere and have this most meaningful and beautiful ceremony performed among strangers? You were right, dear. You're always right. Stick to your own point of view, dear. Eventually, people come around. Oh, Walter. I don't know what I'd ever do without you. Don't worry, Anne, darling. You'll never be without me. Phyllis? Yes, dear? What's keeping him? Oh, he, he may have been delayed in traffic. He's late. Now, dear, you must calm yourself. Something's happened to him. Nothing has happened to him. You did something to him. Me? <laughs> Why, what could I possibly do? I don't know. Something I can tell by the look on your face. Oh, no. Anne. I know that look since we were children. Uh, You've had that wise, superior, all-knowing look. I don't know what you're talking about. Whenever you were trying to put something over on me. But what could I be putting over on you? You're at the bottom of this. Of what? Of Walter's disappearance. Who says Walter's disappeared? But why isn't he here? No, Phyllis, you did something. You swore that you would break this up. But that was before I got to know Walter. This is your doing. It's not going to work, though. Somehow, some way, I am going to find Walter if it takes me the rest of my life. And... and every dollar that I have in this world. I'm going to find Walter. Nothing can keep us apart. 
Nothing. Nobody. Well, there's a ringing endorsement for you. But what did happen to Walter Jones? You know perfectly well he's not going to show up at the church. But why not? Assuming the information on him in the police files is correct, isn't that his thing? Doesn't he marry rich women? Obviously, we have a lot of ground to cover, and the second act will be with you in just a few moments. Some men can marry for love, and some can marry for money. And happy is he who can marry for both. Walter Jones, now. He appeared to be in an ideal situation. He seemed to be in love with Anne. And seven figures are required to describe Anne's fortune. So why did Walter leave Anne at the church? What does private investigator Jim Kellogg think? I didn't think anything about it, if you must know. Actually, as far as I was concerned, the case was closed. I'd already forgotten Walter Jones and Mrs. Melvin and her sister Anne until one morning when my secretary came into my office. Uh, in case the mention of the word secretary causes you to conjure up certain romantic fantasies, I must disappoint you again. My secretary wears pince glasses and has snow-white hair, and the only reason I hired her is because she is the most efficient human being I ever encountered. Yes, Mrs. Haskell. And Mrs. Train is here to see you. Oh, in reference to what? I believe it will concern a missing person, mm -hmm. but I, I am somewhat puzzled. You puzzled, Mrs. Haskell, by what? Her face. It seems quite familiar, but I just don't know why. Mrs. Trainer entered my office. Looking at her, I'd say she was somewhere between 35 and 40. And still looking at her, I'd say she was one of the most attractive women I'd ever met. But that was beside the point. Mrs. Haskell was right. There was something strangely familiar about this woman. But I couldn't place it either. I... I don't know how I feel about all this, Mr. Kellogg. What do you mean? I was walking down the street and it started to rain... I stepped into the lobby of this building just to get out of the wet, and I glanced at the directory, and there was your name, James Kellogg, private investigator, and right then and there I said to myself, why shouldn't I hire a private detective? Why do you feel you need one? I, I'm terribly worried. My fiancé has disappeared. Yes? I don't know what more I can tell you. How long has he been gone? It's three weeks. He, well, the truth is, he left me waiting at the church. Sorry to hear that. I went to his apartment. I, the superintendent told me that he, he had moved out. No forwarding address? None. Did you talk to his friends, his family? He ha has no family. And I never met any of his friends. You see, Mr. Kellogg, it was one of those whirlwind courtships. We were just two people who met and fell in love and decided to get married. Mm. Well, you know, there are certain people, as the wedding date approaches, who just... Well, they just become frightened and take off for a little while. No, I refuse to believe that Walter did that. I am sure something terrible must have happened to him. Well, we'll see what we can do, Mrs. Trainer. Uh, were you widowed or divorced? My first husband died. I see. And uh, what is your fiancé's name? Walter Jones. I beg your pardon? Jones. Walter Jones. Yes. Walter Jones. That's why she looked familiar. She was the sister of that impossible Melvin woman. Same shape to the face, same color in the eyes, only on Mrs. Trainer it all looked good. However, this was not the time to admire the physical attributes of Mrs. Trainer. I was now confronted with a problem which seldom, if ever, troubles most fictional detectives. A little matter of professional ethics. He just disappeared suddenly without a trace. And your first name? Anne. You have a family? Oh, yes. A sister and two brothers. Mm -hmm. well, what was their attitude towards your fiancé? 
They were violently opposed. They thought that Walter was after my money. But that's impossible. Are you sure? Of course. And talking about money, I have plenty of it, so you needn't spare any expense in looking for Walter. Excuse me? Yes. Yes, precisely. And it concerns uh, an allied matter. Oh? It will therefore be necessary for us to adopt an attitude toward the situation, Mrs. Haskell. But don't you bother. I'll come out to see you. You'll take the case, won't you, Mr. Gibson? Would you excuse me for just one moment? My secretary has a most urgent problem. Guess what she wants. I would assume she wants you to find her fiancé. Obviously, her sister, Mrs. Melvin, didn't tell her that she hired me earlier to dig up Walter's past, nor any of the specifics of that past either, or she would have mentioned it. The question is, can I accept Mrs. Trainer as a client? Oh, why not? Well, wouldn't that be the same thing as working both sides of the street? But not at the same time. Mrs. Melvin hired me to break up the marriage. Did she? Well, maybe not. I mean, I never agreed to do that. Oh, of course not. How could you? All I was required to do was to secure certain information concerning Walter Jones. Exactly. And your client was satisfied. Now, another client, quite by coincidence, also wants information concerning the same Walter Jones. Specifically, his whereabouts. Now, is there any legitimate reason why I shouldn't take the case? None that occurs to me at the moment. Only one thing puzzles me. Yes? What can a woman with her looks and charm see in a phony like this Walter Jones. Tell me, Mr. Kellogg, is that a legitimate area of curiosity for a private detective? Well, I'm... I'm talking now as a man. <laughs> Mrs. Trainer, tell me everything you know about Walter Jones. Well, I don't know very much. I only know I, I love him. Well, shouldn't marriage require a firmer foundation? Such as? Well, I would assume knowing something about each other's habits, tastes, attitudes, so forth. And how much did you know about your wife before you married her? I've never been married. Well, then you hardly qualify as an expert. Still, it would seem that a successful union is based upon mutual interests, knowledge of each other. You keep saying it's important to know all about the person you intend to marry. I say nonsense. Pure, unadulterated nonsense. Love at first sight. That's what it was between Walter Jones and me. Love at first sight. It's the only real way. Mr. Kellogg, have you begun work on Mrs. Trainer's case yet? Yes, Mrs. Haskell, I have. Well, do you suppose you have any operational reports for me to type? Seems a shame to turn a man like Walter Jones loose on Mrs. Trainer. That's not our problem, Mr. Kellogg, is it? No, no. Uh, do you want me to hire some temporary operatives? Mrs. Haskell, do you believe in love at first sight? Oh, I remember 45 years ago, I was standing on a street corner. A young man drove past and splashed mud all over my legs. I didn't think women showed their legs in those days. Oh, I had lifted my skirt to step over the puddle. And the young man apologized profusely. We looked at each other. Then and there, we knew. We both knew. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Uh, I'll be leaving town for several days, Mrs. Haskell. With whom did you fall in love at first sight? Now, that is a ridiculous question. <laughs> I didn't have to ask. Sergeant, I understand about seven years ago you were the arresting officer in the Julia Jones murder case? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, as it turned out, it wasn't a murder, so it never even got to be a case. What happened? Oh, she was an older dame. They went out in their boat. She drowned. He claimed she fell overboard. Pretty heavy insurance there. And so the relatives started pointing fingers. How'd it work out? Well, I just booked him on suspicion. The DA figured he didn't have enough for an indictment. The thing just dissolved. Mm -hmm. And what do you think? Well, I guess we'll never know, huh? 
Mr. Thorpe, I understand you're the attorney who prosecuted Walter Jones a few years ago for the murder of his wife, Betty? I was the assistant, and uh, that little case may have cost the DA his job. I never saw anything fall apart the way that one did. Did he murder his wife? You haven't murdered anybody until the jury says so. How did it go? She was his second wife. He claimed she'd been acting nutty, and uh, so on that night she came at him with a revolver. So he grappled with her, it went off, and killed her. Hmm. That doesn't sound like the strongest story in the world. No, and especially since it came out that his first wife had died a few years before under what might have been suspicious circumstances. Drowning? Yeah. Well, my ex-boss, the DA, was politically ambitious. He saw a chance to get publicity. He figured there'd be no trouble getting a verdict of first-degree murder considering Walter Jones' past record. Well, what went wrong? Everything. Turned out the wife had been psychotic. She had threatened to kill him in front of witnesses. There was so much doubt, the judge made a directed charge for acquittal. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think? Well, if he married my daughter, I don't think I'd sleep nights. Well, Mr. Kellogg, what have you discovered? I've discovered that we can't take a chance. Oh, on what? No, that should be on whom? On Mr. Walter Jones. How do you mean that? He may or may not be a murderer. He may or may not have murdered his previous wives for their money. Is this what your client is paying you to find out? I was under the impression she wanted you to find him. And if I do, she'll marry him. Oh, it's a free country. But I can't take that chance. I mean, suppose he kills her, too. She's very rich. Well, why not show her the record? No, that won't stop her. She'll say he's being framed. Then what do you propose to do? I don't know. She's a woman who has a terrific sense of loyalty. Hmm. Then why not drop the case? No, I couldn't do that. Why not? Because she'd just go somewhere else, find somebody else to find Walter Jones. Well, what happened to Walter Jones? No, oh, he'll turn up. What makes you so sure? Anyway, right now, I have a really pressing problem. Oh, what? When it suits his purpose, Jones will show up to marry Ann Trainer. There's only one way I can save her. How? I have to make her forget Walter Jones. Once again, Mr. Kellogg, how? How? Well, there's only one way. By making her fall in love with me. Well, here we have private detective James Kellogg, who may be somewhat out of his depths. From what you know of him, he's not the swashbuckling romantic hero. And yet, he is proposing a most swashbuckling romantic ploy. Well, he's never done anything like this before. Which means that Act 3 should contain surprises for all of us. the conflict between desire and duty. For instance, duty compels Jim Kellogg to find Walter Jones. Desire would have Jim make sure Walter never shows up at all. Most people finally decide to yield to desire or heed the call of duty. Jim, on the other hand, has decided to do both, which means he will try to find Walter Jones and not find him at the same time. I'm not really sure I heard what you said, Mr. Kellogg. I said I would make Mrs. Trainer fall in love with me, Mrs. Haskell. Is that an ethical procedure, Mr. Kellogg? How can I permit her to marry Walter Jones? He, he may be a killer. Why don't you give her the facts and allow her to make her own decision? Being a woman... She'd only be confused. Really, Mr. Kellogg? Oh, I meant nothing deprecatory. I have every respect for a woman's intellectual capacity. Oh, thank you. But a woman in love is a strange creature. That's because love itself is not a rational state. A revelation of the facts would only make her fall more deeply in love with Walter Jones. Why? Because it'd also give her a chance to be a martyr. She could say, you see, the whole world is against him, but I shall stand by him. From a practical point of view, Mr. Kellogg, how do you intend to make Mrs. Trainer fall in love with you? Well, I hadn't thought about that, but... There are 
several difficulties you would have to overcome. For instance? Well, Walter Jones is uh, quite tall. You are, oh, average. Height isn't everything. Mr. Jones is strikingly handsome. Where is he? Well, you? people are like fruit. It's not the outer husk or the shell. It's the kernel, the meat, the true substance inside. Well, from the conversations I have had with Mrs. Trainer, I understand Walter Jones talks beautifully and romantically. Mrs. Haskell, Mrs. Trainer will fall in love with me because it's the right thing for her to do. <laughs> I've been trying to reach you for these past few days to see if there's been any progress. Oh, I was out of town, Mrs. Trainer. I'm so worried. Is it possible for a person to disappear without leaving a single place? Look, it's noontime. I'll take you to lunch. Oh, I'm not hungry. I can't think of food. We might be able to discuss some important matters. Oh. If we're going to talk about finding Walter, then that's something else. I think that this is the first full meal I've had in weeks. I've been so nervous about everything since Walter disappeared. You know, you look very attractive when you eat. <laughs> yes? Oh, my goodness. Do you realize that was what Walter said to me? Walter? I was sitting in a coffee shop having lunch by myself when the stunning-looking man said to me, Do you know that you look very attractive when you eat? We both laughed. It was as if we had laughed together so often in the past. He was the kind of man that I wanted all my life. Oh, Mr. Kellogg, you've got to find him for me. You've got to. Promise. I promise. Good. Now let's hurry back to the office. The office? Yes, it's the most important place in my life right now. Why? Because it's the brain center, the place where the strategy to find Walter is being formulated. The phone should be ringing. Undercover men should be coming in and out. Well. I've no patience to do anything else or be anywhere else, and I... I want to help. Help? Please. Let me. I, I could answer the phones, take messages, assist Mrs. Haskell. But... Please. Let me be a part of it. I see I have an assistant. What can I do? She's the client. How is your campaign coming? Which campaign? The one that's supposed to make her fall in love with you. I don't know. Mr. Kellogg... My husband and I agreed that I would work here because we felt you were an unusually ethical man. Well, I try. Is what you're doing now ethical? What do you mean? You are being paid to find Walter Jones. I'm looking for Walter Jones. I am your private secretary. If you're doing any investigating, it isn't apparent to me. Well, what should I be doing? You should be out looking for Walter Jones. Well, by the same token, I could be in looking for Walter Jones. There is every possibility that he is a murderer. And I can understand your feelings. But you should confess to him. Mrs. Haskell, I'm doing this my own way. And it's the only way that has a chance of success. And what is that way? It's a line of investigation that has to be kept confidential. Even from you. I hope you understand. Oh, I understand. It probably has to be kept confidential. Because it doesn't exist. Oh, I don't think I could concentrate on tennis, Mr. Kellogg. Well, fitness, that's a must for a detective. And right now, you are a detective. Well... Come on, come on. You need some air, some sun, some exercise. That's right. I must be strong for Walter. Yes, it was. That's game. Set. <laughs> match. You beat me. Oh, it was all I could do to even score a single point off Walker. Oh. <laughs> what a marvelous tennis player. And he had a killer instinct. He did, huh? Even if he was playing with me, he couldn't let up. He had to play all out all the time. Tell me about, uh, about Walter's killer instinct. You know anything about his past? Oh, I don't care about his past. He was honest with me. He told me he'd been married twice before. Mm -hmm. What else did he tell you? Not important. Well, suppose it should turn out that he hadn't led a very exemplary kind of life. That's a very 
stuffy way of putting it. That's exactly how my late husband Edgar would have said it. Oh? Mr. Kellogg, if only you could learn how to relax. You and men like Edgar. Why don't you call me Jim? Oh, no. You're the Mr. Type. The correct, formal, proper Mr. Type. Good morning, Mr. Kellogg. Good morning, Mrs. Haskell. I don't mind telling you that however lofty your motives, I thoroughly disagree with your tactics in this case. Ordinarily, I would have resigned in protest. I assure you, Mrs. Haskell. However, sir, you are about to receive your comeuppance. What do you mean? Mrs. Trainer is waiting in your office. Hmm? And I would say she appears to be somewhat miffed. Miffed? Surely you knew you were headed for trouble. Well, sir, it has finally arrived. What are you talking about? Why don't you ask her? Good morning, Mrs. Trainer. Mr. Kellogg? May I have the bill for your services rendered to date? Why, Mrs. Trainer? You've been very pleasant. You've taken me to lunch, to dinner, to tennis, golf, theater. You've done everything but look for Walter Jones. But I have been looking oh, for... Oh, please. I was married to a businessman for over 20 years. I know when things are being done in a business-like fashion. No work has been done in this office on Walter Jones. There have been no phone calls, no reports... It dawned on me that you're not looking for Walter. I asked myself why, and then I realized. You're in love with me, Mr. Kellogg. Do you admit it? Yes. Well, it's impossible. Why? Because I love Walter. It's quite possible he murdered two wives. It's impossible. I can show you the record. I have seen the record. Walter was completely honest. He told me the police were suspicious, and he agreed that they had cause to be. How did he account for his first wife's drowning? She fell overboard. It was foggy. He couldn't find her. You believe that? The authorities believed it. They refused to prosecute. One accidental death I might accept, but two? He was terribly lonesome. He needed companionship. He married in haste, and... Oh, she was a psychotic. It was obvious. And how will they account for your murder? I think that's despicable. All right, Mrs. Trainer, I am in love with you. See what I mean? You're in love with me, and you call me Mrs. Trainer. You weren't trying to find Walter Jones. But I was. Excuse me. Yes? Mr. Kellogg, I want to apologize. You were looking for Walter Jones after all. Billy Smith just called and said he's living at 19 Gladstone Oval. His phone number is 555-8308. Thank you, Mrs. Haskell. Now I want to settle up our account. Send me a bill. I shall hire another detective who will really look for Walter. That won't be necessary. I just found him for you. What are you saying? You want to know how? Your sister hired me to dig up his past. And I found his past record. I gave it to her. She obviously decided to confront him, scare him away. She probably paid him off. It doesn't make sense. It... If she has this record, why should she pay him off? The scenario. She shows him the record. He says, Anne won't care. She says, can you take that chance? Settle for a little, Walter. Take a few bucks and beat it. So he takes it. But he's going to keep coming back and taking more and more. And when he's drained her dry... Then he'll show up and claim you in a main fortune. This is a most despicable lie. How do you think I found Walter Jones? I had a man watching your sister's house. Walter's been calling on her. I refuse to believe it. You don't want to believe it. Where is his phone number? Here, on this pad. Finally. Finally. And listen to me. He doesn't love you. He's alive. He's safe. Walter. Darling. Anne. Why did you disappear? Oh, Anne, I, I began to worry that you might begin to think about my record and, and have doubts. Oh, you fool. You wonderful fool. Do you love me? Oh, Anne, I love you so much. Please come to my apartment. I'll be home in 20 minutes. I love you. I am so grateful to you, Mr. Kellogg. Send me the bill. 
He doesn't love you. He does. I can prove it. How could you prove such a thing? It's impossible. You don't want me to prove it. It can't be done. Walter and I are completely in love. All right, you're afraid. And I don't blame you. What would I be afraid of? Afraid to put his love to the test. What test? I say that all he wants is your money, and I propose a test that can prove it. But you're afraid. Now, I am sick and tired of the cynicism showed by you and my sister and my brothers. And everybody wants to brand Walter Jones for life. I'd like to wipe that self-righteous smirk right off your face. You know, if you have a legitimate way to put his love to the test, I'll give you the chance to go wrong. Oh, uh, is uh, Mrs. Trainer at home? Oh, uh, she just stepped out for a few minutes. Oh, uh, she's expecting me. My name is Walter Jones. I'm Mrs. Trainer's fiance. Oh, well, won't you come in? Uh, thank you. Uh, are you a uh, friend of Anne's? <laughs> I'm afraid she wouldn't think so. Actually, I've been appointed a receiver by the court. What did you say? Well, since you're Mrs. Trainer's fiance, surely you should know what's going on. Say, what is going on? Who are those men? What, what are they doing? Easy, boys, easy, will you? For heaven's sake, don't chip that table. Well, it should be obvious, uh, Mr. Jones. Hmm? I'm the receiver in bankruptcy, and the men here are removing the furniture. You can put two and two together. No, no, wait. I, I'm not sure I understand. Well, it'll all be in the papers tonight anyway. It wasn't generally known. But Mrs. Trainer's husband left the company in bad shape when he died. They declared bankruptcy. We've been ordered to attach Mrs. Trainer's assets, too. Mrs. Trainer's? Yeah. You know, her bank accounts, jewels, spurs furnishings. Yeah, yeah, she was on the books, you see, as an officer of the corporation. Now, wait a minute. According to the law, an officer of the corporation is not responsible for... I see you know your law. That's true, ordinarily. But in this case, we have reason to suspect fraud. Oh? I think she'll be stripped clean. But she's lucky. She had you to take care of her. Me? Yeah, you said you were a fiancé, didn't you? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you misunderstood. I said I was a friend of her fiancé, and I was passing through, and I... I just thought I'd uh, say hello. Well, sit down. I mean, she'll be right back. I'm sure she could use some cheering up. Oh, I wish I could do that, but I have a plane to catch. Hmm. Well, I'll tell her you were here. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, goodbye. Jim. Walter Jones dropped by to say hello. So I heard. I'm sorry. You win. And they've won the battle. Lost the war. No. When I saw the two of you side by side, I realized that I was really very happy with my first husband. I'm not a very exciting guy, Anne. Well, at least I can be sure of one thing. You'll never kill me for the insurance. And no woman who married Walter Jones could ever make that statement. <laughs> that we should all be grateful for small favors. Walter Jones is presumably still at large, happily married or happily bereaved. And yet, why are we coming down so hard on the man? All of it is circumstantial. He could be as innocent as a newborn babe. But don't bet on it. Don't bet on anything except uh, perhaps on my coming back in just a few moments. We look down, perhaps, on a beautiful girl who marries an older man for his money. But do we ever stop to consider why he marries her? True, she wouldn't marry him if he were poor, but would he marry her if she were old and repulsive? Why do people marry people? In retrospect, we have presented a story of marriage, and the moral is anyone you care to take away with you. We present these cautionary tales complete with morals seven times each week. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Patsy Bruder, E.V. Juster, Arthur Anderson, and Dan Ocko. 
The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Luden's Medicated Cough Drops. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tonight's W.O.R. Mystery Theater was brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program is furnished by CBS Radio. This is Barry Farber. Join us immediately following the 8 o'clock news right here over W.O.R. New York, the talk of New York. Governor Carey and his aides will be busy this weekend trying to avoid a default by the state. The city of Yonkers today narrowly avoided default. Westchester Congressman calls for another look at the welfare system. It's 38 degrees in cloudy mid-Manhattan. The man says cloudy and cold tonight with a chance of a few periods of light snow or drizzle. Below 30 to 35. Variable cloudiness tomorrow and tomorrow night. The high from 40 to 45 tomorrow. The low around 40 tomorrow night. This is John Scott with the 8 o'clock edition of the news. Aides of Governor Carey and state legislative leaders will be busy this weekend trying to agree on some sort of plugging that disputed hole in the budget. The reason for the rush is this. As things now stand, the Housing Finance Agency and Dormitory Authority don't have the cash to pay off debts due on Monday. And Carey says the bank off debts due on Monday. And Carey says the bank off debts due on Monday. And Carey says the bank off debts due on Monday. And Carey says the bank off debts due on Monday. And Carey says the bank off debts due on Monday. And Carey says the bank off debts due on Monday. And Carey says the bank off. Come in. Welcome. I'm E. G. Marshall. In the year 1692. An American town went mad, or at least that part of it known as Salem Village, beginning with accusations of ten young girls that a West Indian slave had bewitched them. Hysteria ran like a rabid dog through the village. Within four months, hundreds were arrested and tried, 31 of whom were hanged or burned, and one pressed to death with stones. And the man generally blamed for the hideously bigoted persecution of the innocent and the helpless was a name reviled in our history, Cotton Mather. Hear me, witch maid. If you do not confess your unholy wickedness, you shall not even be accorded the mercy of being hanged. Instead, we will burn you alive. Oh, no. Or perhaps hands and feet tied together. We shall lay you on the ground, while the villagers shall come and heap stone upon stone on you, until the life is driven from your body as you are pressed to death. No, no! Merciful God, please! No! Our mystery drama, Burn, Witch, Burn, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. At the time of the witch hunt, no man in our country was more feared than Cotton Mather. The picture of this dark, imperious, infamous man who led the persecution, who in his perverted zeal and fanatic puritanism saw men, women, and even children condemned on the flimsiest of evidence, who swept down from his Boston pulpit like a scourge, and whose blind conviction in his righteousness in the name of the Lord spread terror like a plague is strangely... Oh, but then I should say no more. For what I was about to say is a large part of this story. Burn, witch! Burn! You 
should welcome the fires of hell, since he would not repent. The abomination of the body you defiled remains to be purified, while the flesh is consumed and returned to the earth and ashes, while the bones melt and run into the fire. Sisters, brothers, let us lift up our voices in prayer. Let the mischief of their own deed fall on their own heads. Let hot burning coals fall on them. Let them be cast into the fire that they never rise again. The righteous also shall give thanks unto thy name, and the just continue in thy sight. Amen. 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 Now let ye all return to your homes and meditate upon the grace of our Heavenly Father and return tomorrow so that ye may see the other witch perish as she deserves. The fire has almost burned itself out. Yes, Judge Sewell. And the evil it rings. Would it not have been more humane to hang her? Humane? Speak you about a witch? This is a pestilence whose deadly poison spreads as relentlessly as the pox itself. Ah, this witchery business weighs heavy on my soul. Why? The women were both guilty in your mind, were they not? They were so found by a jury. Well, then, what choice had you? I don't know. The times are running at such fever, I cannot breast the tide even if I wanted to. What worries me most is that I cannot see an end to it. Or who will be next cried out against? The truth will ever out. Where the evil lies, the finger will point, and justice shall meet out the rest. Come, come, I, I must get to the tavern for a flagon of wine to cleanse the taste in my mouth. Who will you join me? Shortly, good judge. For the moment, I think my good officers may be needed by a young member of the cloth who appears to be ill. Know you him? The great hulking fellow in the long coat with a thick cape and the wide-brimmed hat? He is a papist, think you? Nay, nay, but near as bad. An Episcopalian, quite recently here from England. Were it not for his formidable strength and his skill as a blacksmith, he might have fared badly here in the Salem village. Go to the tavern. I shall join you shortly. I would speak with this young man. Uh, do not anger him. He has superhuman strength. I am clothed in the Lord's armor. I have no fear, and I have no intention of angering him. I only want to help him. Have it your way. I shall meet you at the tavern. Shortly. I shall not be long. You appear in trouble, good sir. May I be of help? I can find no help, kind sir, except within myself. And from my God, I pray. The second with the strongest staff to lift you up. I speak as a man of God. As you are, I understand. I pray I still am, or can be, after what I have witnessed today. Have a care what you say. It has the reek of blasphemy. There is another kind of blasphemy in theology, sir. The crime of assuming to oneself the rights of God, as the people of this town have done. By trying a witch and burning her? Do you not believe, when the devil has taken possession, that the evil must be purified by fire or destruction of the diseased body and soul? I think there are other ways of casting out the devil. You were at the trial? All through the long horror of it. And you did not find these witches guilty? I found the evidence circumstantial and more than easy to comprehend two ways. I looked upon the face of that sweet young woman and upon the dignity and breathing of the older one, her grandmother, and I could see their innocence. What? Will you claim us wrong in our trial and judgment? Is it because you are not either a true colonist or of the true faith? As to being a colonist, this is my chosen country. I have left England behind me. As to the true faith, my religion is a matter I prefer not to argue. There are many faiths, but most of them lead to God. You are a strange young man. What is your name? Gilbert Caton. And may I ask yours? The Reverend Cotton Mather of Boston. You? If I'd been in my right senses, I would scarcely have passed the time of day with you. What does that mean? Turn around, sir, and look at your handiwork. A few smoldering ashes containing what, what once was the body of another human being. Are you proud of your work? I did not find this woman guilty. 
That was for the court to decide. I believe in justice as firmly as I do in the threat of Satan. But where the fiend is proven to flourish, he must be stamped out. But where was this fiend and these women? What were they guilty of? I am but recently here from Boston. I am not familiar with all the transcripts. But would you question the word of a man such as Sir John Jameson? Does his title give him immunity? The facts do that, Mr. Caton. That these women drew his body from his bed in the night, brought him by occult means to their cottage in the forest, to try to lure him into lechery and original sin with the younger of the two witches? Is Sir John so good a man? Has he led so good a life? Is it not possible? Quiet, sir! You do yourself no service by even thinking such a thought. Have a care with your words, or fingers may go pointing your way. <laughs> Gad, I'd near given you up, Reverend Cotton. I believe you have the acquaintance of Sir John Jameson? Your servant, sir. The Reverend Cotton Mather. He needs no introduction to me or any man of goodwill. It was an honor to have you with us for the witch burning. You were not here for all the trial, I believe. No, just for the last verdict. Uh, it was with a heavy heart that I had to bring the charges. But the evidence was monumental. Is it not so, Judge? Mm, there was enough of it brought... But I cannot banish the woman's cries from my ears as the fire reached to her. Ah. And the face of the young girl we condemn to die tomorrow has troubled me for nights. Must we then, because of a round cheek and melting eyes, shrink from doing the Lord's bidding? Evil is the way of such a maid, and more to be dreaded than all the hags in Christendom. Strange rumors are afloat regarding her. This woman she called Granny, who was burned this morning did pray not for her own life, but that the witch may be saved. An uncanny thing that one witch should desire good to another witch. But if they were kin... Fool! Can you not perceive the work of the devil in this? The witch who died at the stake would have the other saved so that her own black spirit could pass into the fair young woman's form. And thus, with double force, the two could continue to wreak havoc on the world. For the sake and peace of the community, she cannot be destroyed too soon. I must go visit the prison. I wish to question her more closely. Question her? About what? The evidence has all been established? The factual evidence I care little for. That is and was the court's business. I wish to find out if she will recant so that perhaps her soul might be saved. That would be a triumph supreme for me to accomplish in the name of the Lord. Are you not somewhat aged for such a job, my friend Turnkey? <laughs> 81. <laughs> Going on 82. Just the man for the job. She don't get around me with any of her witches' brandishments. Are we near the cell? Uh, most there, your reverend lordship. Then why? Let us all move as silently as possible. Is there a view hole in the door? Aye, there is. Good. Then I can look in on her and perhaps surprise her in some evil doing. Uh, there it is. I'll open it soft. Can you see the harpy? Yes. Is she weaving some spell? No. She sits on the pallet knitting. Why... She's a frail little thing. Not much more than a child. All part of the enchantery. I was taken in myself. But she is tricks, all tricks, as I learned when she tempted me to ruin. Oh, very well. Jailer, let us go in. There's a little trip to the house. Hey, my little she devil. Here's two gentlemen of quality to see you. One is of no quality. I know him only too well. The other, I believe I recognize as the Reverend Cotton Mather. You may leave us, Jailer, but wait outside. Yes, sir. It is true. I am who you say. And what would you have with me, sir? I have come to pray with you, Luna Clare, and to exhort you to confession. There is no confession. I am no witch. Will you kneel with me in prayer at least, daughter? I cannot, sir. Why not? I am not of your persuasion. 
Do you believe in God? Oh, yes. Then we have that in common and can try to pray and wrestle the demon from your bosom. No. You do not wish to be delivered? Obstinate of heart I may be, but Sir John holds me from prayer. I cannot kneel in company with him. I pray thee, Sir John, go outside and stand in the corridor. We shall see if the witch maid, relieved of your presence, will pray. I had hoped to listen on the chance that she should confess so that I might make some valuable notes. The Lord granted me a ready pen. I shall make my own notes if it be necessary. If you will excuse us, Sir John. You have only to command, Pasta, and I to obey. If you should need help of any kind, I shall be just beyond the door. Let us kneel together, my daughter, and pray to God. Minister? Yes? What shall I pray for? My life? That I may be delivered from the burning and death? Your death is already ordained by the court. We pray for you to recant. Your body cannot be saved. The only hope is to find God's mercy on your immortal soul. <laughs> On the stone cold floor, the slight figure of the maiden, a girl not yet in her twenties, sways and sags at the harsh dictum of the man beside her. He, Cotton Mather, kneels ramrod straight. His voice rasps as he speaks aloud unending platitudes, devoid of hope. Beside him, the maid prays to herself, the tears running down her pale cheeks. There is talk of God and the right and goodness and light, but not one trace of pity here. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Sir John's attitude outside the jail cell is less unconcerned than it seems. He paces only a short stretch of the passageway, always within earshot of the endless prayer from the cell. The full-voiced exhortations of the minister he pays little heed to, but he stretches his ear to the fullest for any whisper from the maid. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. You do not even say amen. I beg your worship's pardon, but I am not familiar with your prayer, and... I do not understand the God you pray to. You refuse to recant? How can I recant? I'm innocent. I beg of you, sir, to listen to what I was not allowed to say in court, and you will understand that neither Granny nor I had... It. Sir John? I, Reverend another. You may return. I, uh, request your favor, sir, but I believe I heard that your prayers had ended. Mine, sir. The witch maid was not moved to pray. I suspected as much. Tell me, daughter, what you were about to reveal as Sir John came in. Oh, I... With him here, it's difficult, Minister. And tell him, Miss Anna Witch. <laughs> tell him about Giles Corey, the old yeoman who saw you conversing with Satan in the forest near your house. If it was Satan that I was in Congress with that night, <laughs> then he was in your shape. And well, your lordship knows, the old man was frightened by your threats into lying and saying it was a black fiend, which you might as well be, seeing your purpose there. Silent woman, I was not there, could not have been, since all my household has testified that I was safe at home in bed and asleep. There is one lie, they all lie to save their skin, for surely they are more afraid of your power than the devil. May you go too far. Have a care with your tongue. Hear me, mistress, I threaten you this. If you do not confess your unholy wickedness, you shall not be even accorded the mercy of being hanged. Instead, you will be burned alive. <laughs> or perhaps, or perhaps, hand and feet tied together, we shall lay you on the ground, while the villagers shall come and heap stones upon stones until the life is driven out of your body and you are pressed to death. <laughs> oh, no, merciful God, please. And I, I, whom you have afflicted, shall count each one as it falls. I shall myself drop the first stone, and I... When the first stone strikes me, God in his mercy will take me to himself. So 
throw. <laughs> you can count the stones the others throw. But I shall never know how fast they fall. <laughs> now let us use all zeal to our ends, but let us deal in compassion as far as it is compatible with justice. To do any living thing unwarranted torture is a reflection on our manhood. One last word. Will you confess at last that you are a witch? I cannot confess what is not true. Come then, Sir John. Let us leave her to ready herself for death. This November wind whistles through the bones. It will snow soon. I welcome the walk and the wind to blow some cobwebs from my mind. You are troubled by something? This affair savors ill. Her last cry awoke strange feelings and my heart turned within me. You are a man of God and compassion, but have a care. Her powers of enchantment are strong and wicked. If only I could have reached her. No one can do that. Perhaps. Perhaps not. You intend to return to question the girl again? No, let her rest in what peace she can find in the little life left to her to lead. Ah. Are you then for your room as soon as we reach the inn? No. I have an errand I must pursue. I have my coach at the inn yard. I should be honored to take you anywhere you desire. Thank you but I prefer to travel on this one by myself. Master Mather, what brings you here? I wish to ask you a question, Master Caton. Will you enter? No, thank you. I have not even hitched my horse. I have other riding to do. Then ask your question. Were you aware that the witch maid who is to die is an Episcopalian? Yes, I was aware. Then that prompts others. Why did you not go to her to bring her comfort or to help her cleanse her soul? I would have gone to bring her comfort, but they barred me from entering the prison. If I arrange it so you can enter, would you go to her? With all my heart. Why do you extend her this comfort, convinced as you are that she is a witch? I have failed to bring her comfort myself or release from bondage. Perhaps because we are of different denominations, that is of no matter. I shall ride now to the prison and have all preparations made that you may visit her this evening. It wants but an hour until dark. Wait one hour beyond that to make sure you will be passed in. May God go with you. Yeah, all these comings and goings. Over a little snip of a girl whose heels might as well be dancing in the wind and snow already. It sounds as though you were already celebrating the spectacle. Well, a man has little enough to amuse him with winter upon us. Here. When you come out, do you lock up tight behind you? And bring me the key in the common room. It's too cold to wait upon you priests in your eternal preaching in these freezing hours. Here you go. Now you, a witch, visitor to see you. Who? Who is it? Give me the torch, turnkey. Well, how, how am I to find my way back to the common room? Tis known ground for you. Feel your way, if not else. Uh, how could I, a stranger, find my way without one? Oh, no, Lord of mercy. Well, let me hold it then a moment till I find my way to the stairs. Go then, and hurry. Have no fear. The cold will move even my old bones like the young. And so. I... Why you... Come to torture me? Hi. Look at me in the torchlight. Can you not recognize I am of the clergy? God be with you. I am of your persuasion. answered one of my prayers. Oh, my daughter, do not crouch on the floor. Come to me so that I may comfort you. I, I want to, Father, but this chain about my leg. <gasps> my poor feathered bird. Rest where you are as I come to you. Oh, my dear Lord. Lord. You are frozen with cold. And you are warm. A moment. Let me, let me brace the torch here in the scum. Now, my heavy cape off and let me wind it about you. Oh, that 
Let me touch your hand. Let me feel once again some human warmth. Let us sit on the pallet, and I will hold you in my arms with a cloak about us. Oh, you're warm. And you've brought light and companionship. How can they call so sweet a creature of God a witch? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm only a maid. I'm so scared. Well, are you really an Episcopalian priest? <laughs> Ordained in England at Ely. I come here for new worlds to conquer and to help tame a savage land. To make my life, my home, my family someday. Mm -hmm. A cold welcome you'd get from the Puritans. <laughs> They're not all so bad as they are sometimes painted. And I am young enough to wait out their welcome. How could... How could they have condemned you as a witch? I don't know. First they said Granny was a witch. And I lived with her. Did your grandmother practice magic arts? Oh, she knew about herbs that helped to heal. And she could make poultices that drew out pain. And salves that she rubbed in with her hands that brought relief to others. Is that wicked? I cannot see why. Who taught her these things? She learned them long ago from a nurse she had. Who learned them from a gypsy. My grandparents were very rich with a large estate. But the Indians attacked them. And killed my mother and father and... And everyone. And only Granny and I were left. And she was always a little queer after that. I mean, she wouldn't live in a town. Only in the country. She was very good to me. And, and we were happy enough until Joseph, the, the one servant that we had left, died. How long ago was that? Um, a few years. I, I, I don't remember exactly now. We buried Joseph and then... Granny said we must leave the house and start walking to the coast. Why to the coast? To take a boat for England. To my uncle. And we never did reach the boat. We stopped in a little house in the woods near here, and Granny was ill for a long time, and the rent was not cheap. At last the money was gone. And then Granny made some money with her healing. And she was also a, a midwife until the... I, I was at the trial. I know that testimony. Someone had a child born that was not not quite right. Yes, Sir John Jameson's daughter. That's what started it all. Oh, God. Oh, burn me. Oh, burn me. Are you kind? Are you human? Cannot you save me from them? No, first, first tell me one more thing. You mean from Sir John? Yes. He is the devil himself. You paid him rent all these years that you grew into a beautiful woman? Yes. And, and then you had no money? He, he threatened to throw you out unless... He, he talked of being possessed by the devil. He, he was the one who wanted to... to possess me. He was the devil. And you were willing to be possessed? And, and, and when the child... when that awful thing happened... He said that he would point to Granny as a... And me, too. He came to the house that awful night. <laughs> I told him I'd kill him and then myself if he tried to touch me. Oh, my poor child. Oh, please, please. I don't want to be burned. Can't you save me somehow? Save me your, somehow. Your soul? I, I do not believe that needs faith. No, no, me my body. Or if you can't, kill me here with your own hands. I do not fear death. I have nothing to live for. I feel only torture. Save you. Don't you. Save you if it were possible. But for what? Afterwards, to, to be hunted, pursued, retaken? Then kill me. No. No, never. Now, now that I have, I have found you, Father, please. Now, hush. Hush, little one. Not father. Not to you. Gil. Gil. And I am Luna. <laughs> Luna. Now, then you will swear to do everything I tell you. You think there is a way? There is hope. There is always hope. And I think... 
I think there's a way. Yes, I think there is a way if only God will smile on us. A man and a maid. And under the most harrowing and desperate of conditions, from the blackness of adversity, nurtured by the strength of their faith, the first seeds of love are planted in both hearts. But can this compassionate and tortured young man free this ill-starred maid? And even having done so, where can they find safety or sanctuary? I'll return shortly with Act Three. <laughs> the dim, dank, freezing cell, Gil Caton stands with the torch held on high, his eyes searching, his mind racing, a wild plan formulating in his mind, frustrated at the very outset by the leg iron which binds Luna to the wall. She sits huddled in the blessed warmth of the heavy cloak, watching this man who has become the center of her universe, secure in her heart that he will find a way to save her. The first problem is the leg iron. Once, once I get you to my house, I, I have forge and anvil and, and tools to cut it away. The wall. The wall is the only hope. But the ring is buried in the masonry. Not quite. In the mortar. Now, between the stones. Now, here, hold the torch. I can... I, I can brace my feet against the wall. And pull it out. The Lord must have had some reason... To bless me with this extra strength. That is starting from your brow. Uh, no matter. If this ring starts from the wall one more. Oh. Oh. Pull it out. You pulled it out. That's more than human strength could do. Never underestimate the power of prayer. Now, now listen to me, Luna. Yes. You must trust me to the uttermost. Uh, let me lift you and, and see how heavy you are. Oh. <laughs> a feather. <laughs> it can be done. What can be done? Now, I'm going to put you on my back and carry you out of the prison beneath my cassock. Oh, I see. And, uh, and I'll be very still. Oh. Forgive me now, but you must take off your frock. My frock? Uh, well, you must arrange it in the corner with a, a stuffing of straw to look like you. Oh, of course. I'll do that. Well, I take off my sash and cast it. Oh, if I can just arrange it so they'll believe it to be me, it might give us more time. Oh, what is it? What have you done? Oh, I just slipped my cassock all the way from below the waist to the neck bend to, to make room for you. How clever you are. <laughs> Adversity sharpens the brain. Now, now, quick. Now, climb on the stool. So, now, arms around my neck. Yes. First, now, the cassock. Help me slip it over our heads. Oh, that's fine. Fine. Room for us both. Now, to help support you, I, I bind my sash tight around us both. Oh, too tight? Can you breathe? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I must block the cell door. There. I must stop the torch. The more we are in darkness, the safer we are. I trust in you. And your strength. And your belief. And in the Almighty. A jailer? Jailer? Oh! God? Tanky? What to do? Is it the pesta? Where's your light? The witch has blown it out and left me in the darkness. I had to lock her back in the cell against the danger to us all. Stand me if I'll come down again in the darkness. You say you locked the cell? Is she secure? As secure as she can be. Well, then, find your own way up in the shadows to the prison door. The light there is poor. It's just what I wanted. Now, if you ever prayed, my little one, pray now. Freedom is just a few short steps away. Whither away so late in the evening, Master Matter? You still at the inn, Sir John? I should have thought you were ridden home by now. I, uh, I had some business on my mind. I should have thought you might be abed. 
I've been in my chambers reading the transcript of the trial, which my friend Judge Sewell was kind enough to make available to me. Why would you wish to read all that? The thing is set to complete. There are some questions I would ask the maid, and I, I feel in duty bound to make some last attempt to see if she has repented. Then you go to the prison. This moment. I shall be glad to drive you there. No. No, I ride there myself. No, do I think you should go near her again? For some reason, you inhibit her. As you said. But the visit is useless. By law, the die is cast, and she will hang or burn tomorrow. I have no power to free her body. I still may have hope to free her soul and bring her comfort. Good night, sir. Are you all right? Do you want rest? I could never get much. Of all the luck, I can just make the shadow of the tree. You're capable, is it not? Oh, why, yes. Yes, not the matter. I thought I recognized that giant bulk, even in the shadows. By Harry, you seem even larger than I remembered. Uh, just the, the bulk of my cape. Are you from the prison? Why, yes. Did you see the maid? Yes. Did she recant? No, sir. She will never recant. Because she is innocent. A matter of opinion, we shall see. You are bound for the prison. I am. I, uh, I beg you in the name of him we worship in our own ways to disturb this wretched girl no further. She is mercifully asleep now. Leave her the last few hours in peace in the name of compassion and humanity. I have certain questions for her, but if... But let God ask them when, when she is sent to face him tomorrow. Well, we shall see. If she be asleep, perhaps I will not wake her. Good night, Master Caton. Oh, what misfortune... Hold fast. We must make all haste now and hope all is not lost. Oh, oh, oh. oh forgive me. It's just that time may be so important. Oh, any hurt is worth being free. Strike away. Let me try the file now. And um, once my feathers are off, what then, Gil? Oh, I don't know. The hue and cry will be raised all over this bloody town. We've just gone mad. I have no horse to give you. I had hopes, perhaps, by boat. But I have neither money nor contact to see you safe away. It must be on foot. But be of good faith. Somehow the Lord will provide. How can I ever thank you with all that I feel in my heart? Oh, just let me see that smile break across your lovely face and to will be thanks enough. Strange way to meet the man I dreamed of. Oh, You're almost through. I cannot eat more. You must eat as much as possible. And you can carry a little with you. We must find you some clothes to wear. What? Oh, good Lord. Not so soon. Don't let them take me. Don't... Into the bedroom, quick. Now, if I cannot send them back, I can hold them back. Now, take my cape. It has what money I have in the pockets. Now, go by the window and, and try to make it for Providence. There's an Episcopalian church there where you will be safe. I will not go without you. You must. You must save yourself. Oh, my place is too hard. I'll never love any other man but you. All right. Now, go to quickly to the bedroom. Perhaps, perhaps God is with us yet. I'll be listening. I'm praying. Oh, forgive my tardiness, but I was at my devotion, sir. You will pardon my intrusion, I hope. Do I speak to Mr. Gilbert Caton, the parson, here? You do? Uh, dare I beg a few minutes of your valuable time, sir? I am trying to trace my mother and my young niece. My name is Clare, Leonard Clare of Clare Hall, County Devon. My father had a large estate west of here, which was attacked by Indians. All of my family were killed, save my mother and niece. Who, I am told, escaped. Since I arrived but lately in this country, I have only now, with tolerable certainty, traced them to this district. Uh, the town authorities claimed no knowledge of them, but since they were of the Episcopal faith, deemed that you might know something. Come in, sir. Come. Out of the cold. Thank you. Thank you. You have horses? Your horses and a coach, yes. 
Well, then you must fly this minute. Huh? Uh, fly? The people of Salem burned your mother as a witch. Uh, I saw her burn. Uh, Outside there, in the market. Oh, good Lord. They have fixed the burning of your niece for tomorrow. <laughs> there is to be a holiday so the folks may revel in the sight. To burn my niece, Luna? And you have the temerity to ask Leonard Clare to fly? With her. Luna! Oh, oh. heaven be praised. Oh, Uncle, Uncle Leonard. Luna, Luna, my baby. Ah, my brother's baby. Oh. What have they done to you? Nothing yet that can't be repaired. But there is no... Oh, no, no. What's the matter? Do not be alarmed. I come here in amity, not in enmity. You? I shall explain in a moment. May I meet the gentleman before I speak? This is Luna's uncle. Leonard Clare of Clare Hall, Devon, now of the colonies. And I promise you, a man of resources, a man well able to afford to fight the persecution of this town and its shame, and all your power and evil, Matt. I would advise you not to try, sir. No, hear me out. As to my motives, my honesty, my devotion to the God I believe in, and my determination to wipe out witchcraft, I will not bandy words. I do what I believe to be right, and let history be the judge. Your name will go down in it as a stench in the nostrils of any humane man. So be it. I follow where I am called. Tonight, profoundly troubled after reading the transcript of this child's trial and her grandmother's, perforce I could come to only one conclusion. A tragic miscarriage of justice had already been done. Another was about to occur. I went to prison determined to free the maid myself and to offer her my protection against the wild riot which would follow on her release. That was when we met you on the road. Yes, sir. You tried to put me off. I can see why now, but God directed my footsteps there. I must tell you that her absence had been discovered before I even arrived, and that the mob is gathering all the roads out of this town will be closed to everyone. They cannot stop me. They will, unless you have safe conduct. I suggest you get your niece into the coach post haste, and yourself draw the curtains. And I'll conduct you and your men through the mob. I will not go without you. The least I owe you for saving Luna's life. You had best join them, Master Caton. When that drunken jailer wakes up to remember you saw her last, you will be torn limb from limb. It is a good bargain, a life for a life. Ah, and you, sir? I have no fear for mine. And I have much work to do. For all his title and position, Sir John Jameson must be brought to book for his crime against you... And yours. I shall see that he is. And perhaps I may need one small breath of perfume to dilute that stench my name is to leave in history. While the account you have heard is a fictional one, it is a somewhat sad thing that Cotton Mather is painted as black as he is. Even in his obsession against witchcraft, he was a scrupulous defender of all he thought unjustly accused. He was a scholar, in some sense a scientist, and for all he was a fanatic, it was without thought of personal gain. He was also a family man, and perhaps would have allowed himself one frosty smile of pleasure at the outcome of this whole affair. I shall return shortly. The madness at Salem was of short duration, and the good people of that unfortunate town soon returned to their senses. Gil Caton and his wife Luna did not return, mostly because of tragic memories but also because the first of a long line of little Caton was well on its way. They were married in Rhode Island, one of the colonies most noted for its freedom of thought, and lived out a long and happy life together, nurturing their own children and that other larger group of children, the congregation of Pastor Gil Caton's church, which flourished in all good things, temporal as well as sacred. And so, amen. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Marion Seldes, Kurt Peterson, William Redfield, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, 
a preview of our next tale. Let me give you a hand. Oh. Don't you touch that case. What? I only wanted to help. Put it down. Well, sure. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I see it all now. Kubik arranged for my car to stall out on the turnpike. Then you happen along as if by coincidence and kill me. And take the money. Uh, that's an old trick. Will you please tell me what you're talking about? Oh, yes. It's the last trick you'll ever try. Hey, what are you going to do with that gun? You can't kill me. Oh, but I can. I kill very well. Look, mister. Because I have an instinct. A hunter's instinct. A killer's instinct. I smell, I sense death and murder. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. and illusion. Is this all there is, this insignificant speck of dust that winds its weary way round and round a tiny reddish-yellow sun in a remote backwater of some obscure galaxy in an endless universe? Are we the only sign of sentient life? Is everything else out there to the infinite frontiers of space and time, lifeless, bloodless, mindless. What are you waiting for? A reply? It's all we can do to pose such a question, let alone answer it. The money is no problem. I can place my hands on a million, two million, name it. What is the problem? Where can we go? Where? Yes. Once we take that money, we'll have to hide somewhere. Oh, that is no problem. We'll have to hide somewhere for the rest of our lives. Of course. I'm afraid there's no place in this world where we can do that. I was thinking of a place that is not in this... this world. Our mystery drama, The 11th Hour was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes and Carol Titel. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Someone were to say to you, listen, my friend, on the planet Venus, there are endless fields of platinum and gold, enormous bottomless seas of oil. The very stones on the ground are glittering diamonds and lustrous pearls. And best of all, I know a way to get there, a secret way of my own. 
I'll need some cash for expenses, of course. But believe me, you will never make a sounder, a more substantial, a more solid investment in your life, even if you have to mortgage your house to raise the money. If someone were to say all this to you, what would you answer? Well, before you say anything at all, remember, in effect, that's what Columbus said to Queen Isabella. Or at any rate, that's what she thought he said. Let us follow Mr. J. Raymond Trask, who is en route to his office. He hails a cab. Uh, where to, Mac? The Trask building. Hey, uh, you must be old J. Raymond Trask himself. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I recognize you from the papers. Uh, tell me, what's good in the market today? I never give tips. Why not? Because you might lose your money. Oh, how could I lose if you give me the tip? I've been wrong. No, I'm willing to take the chance. I'm not. Suppose you became wealthy, fabulously wealthy. You'd hate me even more. Why? You'd worry about money. You'd let money dominate your life. You'd lose your good humor, your good nature. No, no, you better not chance it. <laughs> you know something? I hate you now. May I uh, see your newspaper, please? Oh, you, you, you want to get the day started with a laugh? Huh? Read the personals column. I can't afford to waste my time with... Yeah, I, I, I guess you can't. You only read something where you can make a buck, huh? Don't you ever do anything just for a laugh. May I glance at your paper? Yeah, just, just, just read the top item in a column and, and then uh, give me your opinion of it. You know, you know, as a man of the world. Uh, my heart, my mind, my soul, my spirit... Or reach out to someone. Reach out to make contact with someone. Someone I need. And that someone needs me. If you are that someone, write to me. Please write to me. At box number 898. But now what do you think of that, huh? Oh, such nonsense appears in the papers these days. You gonna answer it? My good man, I shall add a dollar to your tip if you'll permit me to glance at the financial pages in silence. Well, don't you need someone? Why don't you answer it? Oh, I don't need nobody. I already got somebody. But, uh, don't you need somebody? I'll make that five dollars. You got a deal. And I'll throw in the newspaper. <laughs> Yes. Uh, all right. Send her in. Raymond, I'm sorry to bother you, but... But you'll do it anyhow. Very well, Millicent. What do you want? Raymond, it's about Douglas. Yes? You, uh, you're displeased with him. What are you doing, Millicent? Coming here to fight his battles? Well, you know how, how carefully he's been brought up. I know how badly he's been brought up. All right. Millicent, I bent my most inflexible rules. I hired a man, in this case a boy, on the basis of a family connection. Ray, this is how things are done. Not by me. He's your sister's boy, but he hasn't got brains enough to peel an orange. You have to give him a chance. I gave him a chance. It almost cost me a million dollars. He stupidly neglected to check oh, on the simple... Oh, please, just don't fire him. No, I won't. Thank you, Raymond. But he'll work here at his level of competence. And at this point, I can't see anything higher for him than in the mail room. Oh, no. And even that may be too advanced. You can't be serious. Why not? Your nephew, my sister's son, in the mail room. I started in the mail room. Oh, Raymond. Why does... Does he have to have any responsibility? <sighs> I don't follow that. Be reasonable. Look, you have more money than we can ever spend. We have no children. And so, like it or not, Douglas will be very wealthy one day. What are you trying to tell me, Millicent? He has no incentive to work. He told me so himself. Why knock my brains out, Aunt Millicent? Just to get rich, I'll be rich anyhow. Well, that's quite an attitude. Well, like it or not, it's what exists. This is the most ridiculous thing. Raymond, you can't change people. You know that. And so settle for second best. Find a, a tolerable or at least a, a non-abrasive way to live with him. That's how you and I live, isn't it? Tell him to show up at his desk tomorrow. He, he can't show up tomorrow, you see. He was so upset that he went away for the weekend. He went he went skiing. Well, tell him to show up when it's convenient. G. 
Geologists' reports show absolutely no traces of precious metals in the area. Uh, yes, Mr. Thad? And under the circumstances, my heart, my mind, my soul, my spirit, all reach out to someone. Oh, would you read that back, Miss Moyer? <clears throat> Geologist reports show absolutely no traces of precious metals in the area, and under the circumstances, my heart, my mind, my soul, my spirit, all reach out to someone. Uh, Miss Mulhair, what are you saying? You ask me to read it back. Now, what is this gibberish about my mind, my heart, my soul, my spirit, all reach out to someone? But that's exactly what you dictate. When? Just now. Now, why would I make a ridiculous statement like that in the middle of a letter to the chairman of the board? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I, I... Now, let us continue, Miss Mulhair, please. Uh, I cannot see how we can possibly justify committing a substantial investment to, uh... Uh... I reach out to make contact with someone. Mr. Trask, sir... Uh, yes, what is it? You, you're doing it again. What? Well, you just said, I cannot see how we can possibly justify committing a substantial investment. I reach out to make contact with someone. Miss Mulhair, please go to your desk, recover from whatever it is that seems to be affected in you, and then we shall try oh, again. Oh, but Mr. Clark, Fortunately, I... your long record of service testifies to your sobriety and common sense. If necessary, take the rest of the day off. But, Mr. Trask... That'll be all, Miss Mulhair. Kitty Mulhair. Ah, good morning, Mr. Wilson. Ah, uh, 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 now, you must call me Douglas. Now, please, sir, I have to finish this letter. Do you know a woman truly arrives at the great peak of her beauty when she's 40? <laughs> oh, sir. <laughs> you are like some glorious Gaelic queen. Mr. Wilson, Mr. Trask needs this letter. Will the world stop spinning if it's five minutes late? My world will. How is the old bear? I don't know. <laughs> you? Miss Mohair? You don't know? You don't fool me. You know him like a book. Lately, it's been a closed book. What have we here? I don't know. The man is distracted. How? Why? By what? It's hard to say. He he goes along all guns fire in his usual self. And then 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 what? Then uh, he goes away. Where? I don't know. But it's as if he takes his leave. And he starts to mutter something about reaching out. Trying to make contact with somebody or something. What is all this? I don't know, Mr. Wilson. Uh, but I'm afraid. Of what? Uh, once again, I don't know. But I've never seen Mr. Trask act peculiar in his life. Hmm. Well, I do know he's mad at me. Oh, yes, sir, that he is. Well, I'll do what I can. In what way, sir? Oh, poor guy. He's been cooking so hard it finally got to him. I won't irritate him anymore. How can you not irritate him? Uh, I guess I'll just have to turn over a new leaf. Let me go in and talk to the old boy. Good morning, sir. Oh, it's you. Yes, sir. And I got the decks cleared and I'm ready for action. Now, let's understand each other, Douglas. Your aunt and I had a serious discussion and she's right. You're a jackass, but you were born lucky. So you'll always be assured of a plentiful supply of hay. I must say, Uncle Raymond, you're not much of a flatterer. That's because I'm pretty much of a realist. So, you've got your office, your secretary, your salary, and just keep out of the way. Uncle Ray, I've done some things. That's all, Douglas. I've decided to make a fresh start. My heart, my mind, my soul. See, I've learned something from you. My spirit. The secret of success, and I'm going to make it work for me. Reach out to someone. Reach out. Uncle Ray. Hello. What's the matter with you, Douglas? Why are you staring at me? Well, what were you saying about someone reaching out Now, look, you? Douglas, I don't have time for you and your nonsense right now. I'm due at a meeting. Could I come along? What for? I want to learn the business. Douglas, we needn't play these charades. Now, go to your office and quit bothering me. If you are that someone, write 
to me. Oh, please make contact with me. Write to box number... Raymond, Miss Mulhair said there was no one in here with you, and I... What? Oh, oh. What is it, Millicent? Yet I could have sworn I heard you talking to someone. You know, it must be a plot. Everyone's accusing me of talking to myself. I want to talk to you about Douglas. Now what? He isn't happy. Why? He feels uncomfortable doing nothing. Well, that's too bad. Are we, uh... Dining at home this evening? I'm going away for the weekend with the Johnsons. I see. What does that mean? Nothing. We agreed to live this way a long time ago. We don't like the same people, the same activities, and so you go your way, I go mine. Oh, I suppose I'll see you Monday evening, huh? I suppose so. Good night, Raymond. Good night. <sighs> yes? Will you need me for anything else, Mr. Trask? Uh, yes, yes, I want you to drop a note to, uh, box number 898. Yes, yes, Mr. Trask? Uh, never mind, I'll, uh, I'll do that myself. You can go home now. Yes, Mr. Trask. Have a nice weekend. out for anyhow. Is there a side of Raymond Trask that the world is unaware of? Somewhere, somehow, somebody is reaching out for someone. Be around when contact is made in Act Two. when you get the opportunity, you might read a fascinating story by Mark Twain called Punch Brothers Punch. It has to do with a man who reads a catchy little jingle and then finds that the words refuse to leave his head. He keeps hearing them day and night. Well, Mr. J. Raymond Trask has accidentally come across a paragraph in the personals column of the newspaper and for a reason he simply cannot fathom he is in a similar situation. My heart, my mind, my soul, my spirit. Mr. Trask? All reach out. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Trask. What? Oh, yes, what is it? Uh, where shall I file this, sir? File what? This little clipping from a newspaper. It says, my heart, my mind, my soul. Where did you get that? It was on your desk. Now, look here. You had no business My to take My orders any... from you are to take every single piece of paper off your desk and find a proper place for it. And since I don't know what this means, I don't know what to do with it. Well, couldn't your own common sense tell you where to file that? In the wastebasket. Where else? Uh, yes, sir. Now, don't touch that phone. Well, I, I beg your pardon, sir. Just leave it alone. Well, it's my job to answer your telephone. Until further notice, I intend to do it myself. And I'll get back to your office. Why, yes, Mr. Trask. Hello. This is Rael. Rael? Yes. My name is Rael. And your name is Raymond. And so we have touched. Now look, I'm I'm not sure that I What are you not sure of? What? Of what of what I'm doing. Aren't you? Who are you? What do you want? We have reached for each other. We have found each other. What's this all about? Reaching. Touching. Why did you reach for me? I don't even know who you are. We need each other. And now, we have met. Ra 
Ra'el. What kind, what kind of a name is Ra'el? What kind of name is Raymond? You still haven't told me. What do you want? What do you want? I, I, I want... I don't even know what I want. You must want something. Or else you would not have answered my call. When? When, when can we see each other? We have already seen each other. Well, what do you mean? How could I possibly know what you look like? You know. You know what you want me to look like. And I know what I want you to look like. And we know what we must do for each other. I must be going crazy. Now, look, Rael, or whatever your name is, let's forget the whole thing, huh? Uncle Ray. What are you doing here? I work here. All right, all right, Douglas, don't irritate me. I have your recommendation on the Iroquois development. What are you doing with that? I wouldn't approve it. What are you talking about? Well, this goes counter to every principle of prudent investment. Douglas, why don't you take the day off and play golf? How does this group propose to develop that property? It's a nice day. There are no roads, no utilities, and furthermore, they don't even have a clear title to the property. What do you say to that? What do I say to what? This phony prospectus for Iroquois development. My mind, my heart, my soul. Uncle Ray, are you all right? Uncle Ray. Who do you think you are? Coming in here and shouting at me? Now go back to your office. Please, check through this prospectus for Iroquois again. You'll see I'm right. Mr. Wilson? I heard every word. I tell you, Kitty, there's something wrong with that man. I... I think you're right. You'd better see a doctor. I think you'd better see this. Mm, what is it? It, it? It's a clipping from a newspaper. My heart, my mind, my soul... Say, this is what he keeps talking about all the time. Yes. And he seems to be in a trance. What does it mean? I don't know. But it does sound as if... as if he's a man possessed. <laughs> oh, Kitty Mohair, you wouldn't be talking about the little people now, would you? Ah, uh, there's something here, Mr. Wilson. Don't ask me what. But something. And when the taxi what? comes, may I share it with you, Raymond? Who are you? How, how do you know my name? You know who I am. Rael. Rael? Rael, what are you doing here? I am here because we need each other. No, we, we can't be seen here, not here, out on the street in public. No? No, I, I couldn't afford to be seen with a, with a young, attractive woman. Why? Well, my, my wife. We need each other, Raymond. What? What is this thing? I read a paragraph in the paper and I can't get it out of my head. You need me, Raymond. Come to see me. No, no, I can't. I, sh I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Where? 22 Addison Road. Why? I, I don't think I can. Search your mind, your heart, Raymond. Do you have any choice? What are you telling me, Douglas? I don't know. There are two crazy things going on, both of which are completely out of character for Uncle Ray. First, he mutters some gibberish from this ad in the personals columns on the paper. And the second thing, and this is what really gets me, is the Iroquois development deal. I never heard of it. Well, he's worked on some real estate thing. It's going to take millions. Now, that's nothing new for him. It's wild, barren country. I mean, you can't sell it to anyone. I assure you that Raymond can find people to put up money for anything. But this isn't a public offering. This is something for the company to finance on its own. How do you know all this? I, I told you. I'm serious about the business. I want to learn it. As a matter of fact, I'm even getting to like it. What can Raymond be thinking about? I don't know. And I hate to say this, but... I'm afraid that Raymond is... Well, he's not competent to handle the business. Douglas. What? Something has happened to Uncle Ray. I don't know what it is, but he just isn't the same person. It's as if he's a stranger. A man who no longer has the faintest idea what he's doing in that office. Just a minute, Raymond. How did 
did you know it was Raymond? Come in. Is this how you pictured the house? I, I, I don't know how I pictured it. A house like any other house on a suburban street? I'm here. Each of us wants something from the other. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Then leave. It was wrong of you to make contact. Leave and give me a chance to find someone else. I want... I want the Iroquois project. Yes? You don't know what that means, do you? You will tell me. One day... One day I was sitting in my office and a question crossed my mind. The question was... I hope you're not going to laugh. You know I will not laugh at you. And I know you will not laugh at me. I asked myself, what am I going to do if there's a God? Yes. You see, I... I've lived my entire life as if there isn't any God. Do you understand? I understand. I have done everything. Well, no, not everything, but many of the things that God would disapprove of. I admit that flat out. Yes. And, and I won't be... I can't be a hypocrite about it, so... What do I propose to do? The Iroquois Project. It's a 100,000-acre tract of wild, undeveloped country. I want to make it a place where people can go and live and find peace. Do you understand? Yes. That's good. Because nobody else will. I'm not selling anything. I, I'm giving it away. Anyone who wants to can live there for as long as he needs to. And everything is provided, free of charge. Do you see? I see. So, if there is a God, this will square me with him. For, for what I've taken, I shall have returned. But if I'm going to be okay up in heaven when I die, I'm going to be in plenty of hot water down here on earth while I'm alive. You know that. I know. Now, in the first place, they're starting to ask questions right now in the office about the project. My, my wife is an officer of the corporation. She, she could move to stop what I'm doing. I can help you. Well, from one viewpoint... It can all look like a giant fraud. You see, from another, it can appear that I've gone completely insane. I see that. So, so what I can expect to get out of the Iroquois project is to spend the rest of my life either in a prison or a sanitarium, and that's why I need someone, someone, someone to help me. To help you do what? Escape. But so far, you have done nothing wrong. But I have, I have. I've done more than just think about the project and talk about it. I've already spent an enormous amount of money on it. Money I simply cannot account for if I would have to. That's why I must escape. And that is why you reached out for me. Yes. Yes, but why did you reach out for me? I want to go home. Where's home? I cannot explain it. Why not? You could never understand well, it. Well, it has to be simple. Just tell me the name of the place. Rael. But Rael is your name. I said you could never understand it. Everyone who lives on Rael is called Rael. But it is the way it is said. Now, look, it has to be somewhere. How many miles? In which direction? No. It is here. Here? Here? What are you saying? It is the other side of here. There is no way I can make you understand it. Just as I really do not understand the real meaning of your Iroquois project. But I believe you. And you must believe me. Will you say you believe me, Raymond? I believe you, Rael. But if you, do, if you don't come from here, what are you doing here? I... I was very young, and I was very foolish. And one day, I decided... Poor, poor, do you follow me? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. And, and it brought me here. But it does not work anymore, and I need a new one. But how can you get a new one, whatever it is? You, you are going to help me, Raymond. Me? How? What do I know about it? And from what you're saying, you're talking about a level of science that we have yet to achieve here on Earth. I know. But then how can Every I be... Every civilization has its mysterious force. The basic essence that makes things happen. I discovered the one that you have on Earth. It is money. Well, that should have been obvious. Not to a stranger. And it is money that can create my force field that will take me home again. But no one on Earth knows how to build such a... I do. 
I do. I will use the money to transform the raw materials into energy. But that'll take machinery and skill. No. You see, you here, on what you call the earth, use your money literally. The money transforms a tree into a house. But first you go through the motions of physical labor. I know how to transform the money into pure energy without wasting time or effort. Do you understand? Well, I, I think so. I, I, I'm not sure. Could I go back with you? That is the only way you can escape. What you're saying is with money, you can build a force field or a thing or whatever that will transport... Or transmit... Us back to whatever it is you come from. Yes. Do you know how much money you'll need? I have priced the values of the basic raw materials. I will need exactly... One million dollars. One million dollars. True, in these days, a million dollars is no longer an awe-inspiring sum, but it's hardly an amount to be bandied about lightly. And consider the conversation you've just heard in context. Is it possible that J. Raymond Trask is one of the shrewdest articles in the financial world? Everybody thinks so. Well, estimates will be revised, upward or downward, when I return shortly with Act Three. A man travels his merry and selfish way through life taking what pleases him with hardly a thought for either the consequences or the next fellow. And then, suddenly, without warning, one day it occurs to him that there may be a judgment and a judge, and he realizes that he owes a tremendous debt. But will he be able to pay it? One million dollars? I can convert one million dollars into the energy required for us to, to escape. Well, it, it won't be easy for me to raise one million dollars. I know. No, I'm afraid you don't. You'd have no way of understanding the complications. That is not what is difficult. Those are the mechanics you can solve them. The conflict, the true difficulty, is now within yourself. You are beginning to doubt and to question. Well, I wouldn't exactly say that I... I have but... been through this before. What do you mean? Before you and I made contact, there were others. Others? I reached out and touched others before I touched you. Do you mean you actually spoke like this? I have been here a long, long time. But in the end, they all failed me. That was because, in their hearts, they really did not believe me. Do you believe me, Raymond? Well, I, I, uh... This is the crucial time, Raymond, right now, this minute. Well, I, I... I can read your mind. You can? Yes. You are saying, what am I getting into? I, I read some notice in a newspaper, and here I am talking to, to a strange woman. And it has to be crazy. Isn't that what is going through your mind, Raymond? Maybe, maybe, but it has to be. It has to be. After all, this doesn't make sense. Isn't that why you are here? Because you are tired of making sense. That is, what passes for sense in this world. Aren't you looking for a, a different world? My world? Come with me, Raymond. Come with me. Yes. Yes, Ryle. Yes, I... I'll come with you. Raymond, I demand an answer. What's the question, Millicent? Tell me about the Iroquois project. Why? Because I am an officer of this corporation. You never manifested any interest in any of our past projects. I am interested in this one. Your being an officer doesn't give you any say in the operations of the company. That's true. I'm not accountable to anyone for the decisions I make. That is not true. 
especially when I have reason to suspect either fraud or incompetence. And what makes you suspect either? The project is an expenditure of a vast sum of money with no clear way of realizing a profit. Well, naturally, it's a non-profit venture. So I must assume that you have some scheme for diverting the money into your own pocket or that you have taken leave of your senses. Yeah, just what are you going to do about it? Go to court. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Carr? Miss Mulhair, I want you to authorize payment for the publication of the prospectuses for the Iroquois project. Uh, yes, sir, but... Uh, um, yes, what is it, Miss Mulhair? I, I don't think we can. Y you can pay anybody anything, Mr. Trask. You see, they went and got an injunction. Who? Your wife and your nephew. And until the court decides about certain things, all of the company funds are frozen. I see. Get Mr. Wilson in here. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I told them about the things in the paper, but I thought I would be helping you. Forget it. I'll go see him. Now see here, Douglas. Uncle Ray, may I present Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings? Mr. Trask. Mr. Cummings is with the district attorney's office. How do you do, Mr. Trask? What are you and my wife trying to put over on me, anyhow? We're trying to keep you from making a fool of yourself. Mr. Trask, do you know a young lady named Ra'el? Why do you ask? Well, because she's quite obviously a confidence operator. You better listen to this, Uncle Raymond. She has a criminal record? She evidently places a sort of advertisement to lure her victims, who are usually persons under some sort of... Emotional strain. What sort of proof have you? Plenty of proof, Uncle Ray. Just listen. She gives them a story of how they can escape to, uh, well, it's never quite clear, some sort of paradise, another world, maybe. And tell them how, Mr. Cummings. Well, that's never quite clear either. Flying saucer or some esoteric, mysterious method. Now, what do you say, Uncle Ray? I say it's a lie. Well, we have in the past received several complaints. But since all of them came before money had changed hands, there was no way to prosecute. Then she has no criminal record, Douglas. That's only a technicality. She has been in several mental institutions. Maybe she's not a criminal, but she's a nut. Just how much money has she asked you for, Mr. Trask? Yes. It is true. I have been placed in your mental institution. Rael. I must say, they do very little for one's mentality. Rael, tell me about this, this force field and exactly why you need the million. I have already told you as much as you are capable of understanding. Rael, I want to believe. Then believe. What is stopping you? Oh, I know. I know the habits of a lifetime. But you must believe. The, wor the world. We're going to your world. What, what's it like, Rael? What did you want the Iroquois project to be like, Raymond? A, a place of, of peace and love. You cannot have it here. Your world is not ready for it. And despite your 11th hour repentance, you really do not know how to build it either. Everyone in your world who tries to create peace and love pays a terrible price for it finally. When... When can we leave? We require one million dollars. We can leave the moment you bring it here. Mr. Trask. Your Honor, I protest this entire procedure. No one. No one has the right to drag a man into a court of law and put his sanity uh, on trial. Mr. Trask, none of your rights have been violated. Indeed, it is the duty of this court to ensure that they are protected. Then what am I doing here? For your own protection, as well as for your families and the stockholders of your company, it has been proposed that you undergo a series of tests to determine your mental capability. In other words, to have me certified insane so my wife and my nephew can strip me clean. Mr. Trask, this court has no such aim in view. It is therefore our decision that you be convinced. Oh, Mr. Trask, what, what are you doing here at this hour of the night? 
Aren't you supposed to be in well, the... Let's say I escaped. Oh. Don't be alarmed, Miss Mulher. I'm not dangerous. What, what did you come here for, Mr. Trash? I need money. Money? Yes. Well, I can imagine you would. I, uh, I have some money. It's not much, just a few hundred. But it could get you a plane ticket somewhere. No, thank you. I need a million dollars. A million? Oh, well, we don't have that much in the office. Yes, I know, we but never... I still remember the combination to the safe. Oh, no, Mr. Trask, you wouldn't. In which we have over a million dollars worth of negotiable bonds, bearer bonds, which are as good as cash. Please, Mr. Trask, please don't. Don't try to stop me, Miss Mulhair. Sixteen, right? Over to zero. Uh, so far, you're not in any real trouble. You can beat them. Twenty-four left. Do this. Over to zero. And you cross the line. I've crossed it long ago. Where can you hide? You'd be surprised. But there's no escape. And here we are. Oh, now put the bonds back, Mr. Truss, please. Out of my way, Miss Mulhair. Just stand aside. No, I'll not let you. I worked for you 20 years. I've loved you for 20 years. You didn't even know I was alive, but I didn't care. Just being here was enough. I said get out of my way. Oh, no, please, listen. Out of my way. <gasps> Cummings here. Mr. Cummings, my uncle broke out of the uh, institute. We know. He went to the office and took a million in negotiable bonds from the safe. He must have gone to that woman's place. He's there now. What? We've had a place staked out. Our man saw him go in there. Don't let him get away. The place is being watched. Don't worry. Raymond. This is the money. It's even better than money. Look. I see. Rael, Rael, I'm a desperate man. Everything I've done until tonight might be interpreted in two ways. But now I've crossed the line. I've stolen this money. But it is your money. Well, it is and it isn't. But I have to know. What Rael. do you have to know? Is, is it true what you promised? Look at me, Raymond. Look at me. We are making contact. Yes, yes. Our minds, our hearts, our souls, our spirits are touching. Yes. And now, with the money, I shall create the force that will remove us from this place. Close your eyes. Close your eyes now. Now, hold my hand. And now, do you feel the force? Well, yes. I feel, I feel as if the whole room is spinning. Yes, yes, Raymond, it is, it is. And, and that smell, that sharp smell. The forces, the life forces in flux. Ryle, I'm dizzy. I'm, I'm going to faint. Don't fight it. I'm going to pass out. No, no, Raymond, not pass out, but pass through, pass over, and pass into... The other side of the world. They're... They're gone. No one's here. Oh, they couldn't get away. They couldn't. We had the place surrounded. We've been upstairs, downstairs, in the attic, down the cellar, not a sign of them. We had the place surrounded. How could they get away, Mr. Cummings? How? I don't know. They must have gotten past your men somehow. Now, look. They can't get away. We've set up roadblocks. We're covering the airport, the bus station. They have no place to go and no way to get there. We'll have them in hand in 24 hours. I promise you. The assistant DA, Mr. Maxwell Cummings, made that promise some five years ago. So far, he has been unable to keep it. Since that evening, no one has ever seen Ra L or J. Raymond Trask. I'll be back in just a few moments with a comment on the story you just heard, plus some other assorted goodies. <laughs> Children make a lot of noise, but to me it's a wonderful sound. They have a lot of energy, a lot of playing to do before they take on the serious world of adulthood. Every day they take on a bit more of this wonderful world. I guess we're lucky, because there are so many places in the world where the children are too weak, even for play. Bangladesh, Honduras, right here at home. 
They're weak from the lack of protein and essential vitamins. Weak from the bad water and the parasites that rob them of important nutrients. A childhood of tears instead of laughter. And even if they do manage to become adults, their minds and limbs will be stunted by chronic malnutrition. You can help a child to grow up strong and independent. Maybe even be one of tomorrow's leaders. Send your contribution to Save the Children, Box 970, Grand Central Station, New York 10017. That's Save the Children, Box 970, Grand Central Station, New York 10017. They say you can't be all things to all people. We can, because our stories have something for everybody. Do you want to believe Ra'el is a visitor from another world? Such an assumption cannot be disproved. Is she a slick flim-flam artist? Well, if that interpretation makes you feel better, be our guest. It is scientifically possible to create a force field to break away from the world. It's also practically possible to elude even the tightest police surveillance. All things are possible, especially here, seven times each week. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Carol Titel, Mary Jane Higby, Don Scardino, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next the Greeks and the Romans were hardly barbarians. In many respects, their civilization was superior to our own. And in the second place, it is the height of arrogance to call anybody's religion nonsense. Are you trying to tell me that this, this silly-looking oaf that is employed in our stables is actually an ancient Greek god called Vulcan? His Roman name was Vulcan. His Greek name was Hephaestus. All right, all right. Just answer one question. If it's true, what is he doing here working for us, this god of yours? Well, with very few exceptions, a visit from the gods usually meant a great deal of trouble for the people he called on. What kind of trouble? I, uh, I just hope we never find out. The hard way. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Listerine Lozenges. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. of the flame that flickers and flares here seven times each week. The incredibly sophisticated jet crashes. The absolutely safe luxury liner founders. The beautifully engineered bridge collapses. The reason can be picky almost paltry. The malfunction of a part that might cost all of 22 cents could destroy a machine worth millions. A simple but undetected mathematical error might insidiously multiply itself to a point 
where a magnificent structure suddenly becomes a heap of ruin and rubble. Or uh, perhaps what we're talking about is beyond science. Our mystery drama, Fireball, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Kim Hunter. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We assume that we are superior to the other members of the animal kingdom. We believe that we are more intelligent. After all, look at what we can do. Certainly, animals can't read, write, build, manufacture. And if they can't, how does it happen that we can? We like to say that man is blessed with a divine spark. If, if this is true, that can only mean that God or the gods speak through us. And our works are expressions of their will. Benjamin Cantwell, or Big Ben, as he is known in industrial and government circles, comes home one evening. Louise? Is that you, Benjamin? Who are you expecting? I wasn't expecting you. Why not? You know perfectly well that days, even weeks, go by without ever seeing Now, you. Louise, you know it's necessary for me I to... I didn't say it wasn't necessary. Then why are you complaining? I wasn't aware that I was complaining. I merely stated a fact. Since you're not home more often than you are home, then your very presence is a surprise. Would you like me to begin all over again? I'll try to spend more time at home, but what I'm doing is important. The very fate of our country rests on it. I didn't say no. The fate of the entire free world. I'd like a little sympathy and understanding for my own wife. You can have all the sympathy and understanding you want. It's not my fault. You're hardly ever home to collect it. Well, I'm home now. And it's only Friday. Don't tell me, we're actually going to spend a weekend together? You know, I couldn't wait to get home here to the country. Well, we'll guests start to arrive tomorrow. Admiral Lawrence and his wife will be coming later tonight. And Senator Sullivan and his, uh, well, I assume she's his wife. And... and here I thought we were going to have a quiet little weekend. Well, it won't be more than eight or ten, all told. Thanks for telling me now. Louise, you don't understand. I'm having some important people here because... They're always important. Well, you know who I invite. Senator Sullivan is chairman of the Military Appropriations Committee. Admiral Lawrence... Oh, decide... darling, I'm impressed. I'm not saying all this to impress you. I want you to know who these people are. Why? So I can defer to them? No. So that you can discuss things intelligently. What are we supposed to discuss? It's all top secret. Oh, I give up. No, Ben, I I'd like to understand what it is we're supposed to discuss. After all, the reason you invite them is always to sell them something. That's not true. I'm not here to sell. You aren't? I'm here to help them understand our country's true need in defense material. And, of course... Since your products best satisfy those needs... This is an inference they are free to make. After you have wined them and dined and entertained them... Why do you insist on making it sound so... So disreputable. Ben, please admit it. The fact is, everything you manufacture is used to kill somebody. That is completely unfair. Somebody has to do it. Darling, all I'm doing is stating a fact. Why don't you look around at all the charities, the hospitals that I have endowed? Oh, I must say you have it down to a science. First, you manufacture the means to maim people. And then you tenderly care for the victims. Oh, Ben, you're not all bad. Before you accuse me of fattening on human misery, examine your own conscience. At least I don't drape myself in a mantle of pious hypocrisy. I fully expect to be punished. By whom? Oh, the gods. Louise, you have to take the world as you find it. Mankind, for reasons I'll never understand, insists on destroying itself. If I didn't make the means with which to do it, someone else would. Yes? You, uh, you said I was to come back tonight after supper, ma'am, to meet the mister. Oh, yes, uh, yes, Mr. Vulcan. Ben, this is Mr. Joseph Vulcan. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Cantwell. Mr. Vulcan is our new blacksmith. Summers recommended him. Oh. And had you ever worked for Mr. Summers? 
Uh, no, sir. Uh, Dick Summers uh, worked for me. Is that so? Well, you're a much younger man. <laughs> I guess I'm older than I look. I taught Dick Summers the business. You taught old Dick Summers? Yep. And it was still a business in them days. Of course, motor cars had already been around a while and all them tractors. But there was still plenty of horses. Like for deliveries in the town and work on the farm. But you look like such a young man. Well, uh, these days there ain't much work. You can pick up some money getting connected with a racetrack or on a couple of estates like this one where the rich folks have stables. Has my wife already discussed your pay and other arrangements? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Cantwell, and uh, I find everything satisfactory. Very well. That'll be all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cantwell. Louise? Yes? I want you to fire him. Then, why? I want you to fire him. Well, not unless you tell me why. I can't. Oh, yes, you can. I know you. You have sudden automatic responses. You're a creature of violent first impressions. What have you got against that man? I said I don't know. Something bothers you. Try to analyze it. Why? Isn't it enough that it bothers me? Tell me. All right. This is as good a reason as any. I... I don't like to form people. But he's not... Well, obviously, he's very lame. You see how he walks. You hear how he walks. Can this be your conscience? Suppose he's a veteran, and he was maimed by one of your instruments of destruction. For the last time, I am not ashamed of what I'm doing. It's work that is legitimate, necessary, and moral. It's sanctioned by the law. Why do you protest so much? Because I... Oh, forget it. Do you really want to know why I hired him? I hired this one because of his name. His name? Yes. It was just too delicious to resist. His name is Vulcan. Vulcan? Vulcan was one of the ancient gods. The god of fire. He was actually a blacksmith. He made all the weapons for the other gods. Are you sure you're all right? I think he was married to Venus. Now, Louise, what kind of the nonsense... The didn't work. She was always cheating on him. All right. All right, you've had your little joke. Let him catch up with whatever shoeing he has to do, and then let him go. Oh. Good morning, Mr. Vulcan. Oh, morning, Miss Cantwell. How long have you been doing this, Mr. Vulcan? Oh, a long, long time. Uh, They've always been smiths. Did you know the ancient god Vulcan was a blacksmith? <laughs> no, ma'am. I, I never was much on all them heathen gods. And you never heard of Vulcan? <laughs> I thought there might be a relationship. No, ma'am. I can't say that I know of any. Mr. Vulcan, may I ask you a, a question? Well, you go right ahead, ma'am. How did... How did you happen to become lame? Oh, I... Well, I, I don't know. You don't? <laughs> no, ma'am. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to pry. Uh, it's all right, ma'am. I... Uh, well, I understand my father dropped me when I was a small baby or something like that. Mr. Cantwell, as you may know, has endowed a great many hospitals and medical research centers. Oh, I've made the rounds of all of them, ma'am, and the verdict is this is how I have to be for the rest of my life. Well, if there's a breakthrough somehow, then then you will be able to benefit. We'll see to that. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I must say, you and Mr. Cantwell are the best folks I ever worked for. <laughs> Did you fire that blacksmith? That, uh, what's his name, Vulcan? Joe Vulcan? No. No? But I thought we agreed. We didn't agree. You merely suggested it. But he intrigues me. Why? I told you. He's a blacksmith named Vulcan. 
so was the ancient god, Vulcan. His name... So was the ancient god. Oh, please. Oh, this gets better. I asked him why he was lame. Do you know what he answered? How would I know? Oh, you really are touchy. He said when he was an infant, his father had dropped him. Oh, for crying out loud. No, no, you must listen to this. Vulcan's father, or at least his mother's husband, I'm trying to be delicate about this, uh, was Jupiter. Oh, who cares? His mother gave birth to Vulcan, and Jupiter was so angry that he seized the child and hurled him from Olympus down to the earth below. And that's why Vulcan became lame. Do you see the similarities? What I don't see is what you're really driving at. Well, they say the ancient gods would, from time to time, visit the earth, disguised as mortals. Are you trying to tell me that this... this silly-looking oaf that is employed in our stables is actually an ancient Greek god called Vulcan? His Roman name was Vulcan. His Greek name was Hephaestus. All right, all right. Quit trying to prove how smart you are. Just answer one question. If it's true, what is he doing here working for us, this god of yours? Oh, with very few exceptions... A visit from the gods usually meant a great deal of trouble for the people he called on. What kind of trouble? I, uh, I just hope we never find out. The hard way. Coincidence. Coincidence. And what is Louise's rationale for saying that their latest employee is actually Vulcan, the ancient god of the blacksmiths? Well, you heard it. And it's all circumstantial evidence. And you know what the philosopher said about that, don't you? Some circumstantial evidence is very strong, like when you find a trout in the milk. What will we find in Act Two? Every time something is made by man... Every time man works a raw material into a finished product, every time man transforms nature from a work of God into a work of his own, man approaches something that is divine. For man is now doing what only God or the gods could do originally, and that is create. However, sometimes man being man, and nothing really more, lets all of this creativity get out of hand. I thought the weekend went rather well. Did you? And I must compliment you, Louise. You were a superb hostess. Tell me, did you sell the fireball? What did you say? I said, did you sell the fireball? Uh, 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 don't ever mention that word. Nowhere to no one. It's top secret. Really? How did you find out? How did I find out? There were these papers lying on top of the dresser. Oh, oh, well, that's, uh, that's uh, inexcusable. Well, you have to read those papers somewhere. If I'm that absent-minded, it means I'd better not take papers home anymore. Besides, you talk in your sleep. Then I'll have to sleep alone. <laughs> no sacrifice is too great to make for your country. Tell me, what did you learn about, about that weapon whose name you must never mention? That it's called unmentionable. Because you merely hang it in the sky over an enemy city, and poof, the whole place is burned to cinders in minutes. Louise, you must never breathe a I single... suppose you're proud of yourself, aren't you? Louise, I will not get into this argument again. Would you rather other countries had it and we didn't? Oh, why don't we chuck the whole thing, Ben, and just enjoy life from now on? It's easy enough for you to say that, but I have responsibilities. Well, you are now going to give me what I have classified as speech number 16B. Louise, listen to me. We have just developed the, the, the thing in the lab. If it's so hush-hush, and I know too much now, why tell me more? I have to tell someone. We can do it. We can make this thing, but we don't know why. What do you mean, you don't know why? We don't know why it should work. All we know is... We can make it. So, so what's the problem? Well, there isn't any problem. Then why do you sound so upset? Because I, 
I feel maybe... Maybe we shouldn't turn this thing out. This time we... We may have blundered in something that's more than just a discovery. This... This thing is part of the process of how matter itself was created. It's almost something beyond the capability of human understanding. Then drop it. Drop it? Yes. Put a stop to the project. Forget it ever existed. You're crazy. I'm crazy? Did you hear what you were just telling me? Well, sometimes I just have to talk. But you never spoke like that before. Maybe... Maybe it's because I had a crazy dream. Aren't you the one who says you never dream? In the ordinary way, I don't. It's your fault. (laughs) You have a dream, and it's my fault. Yes, because you've been filling my head with that nonsense. What nonsense? About Vulcan. What are you talking about? You know, Vulcan, the ancient god of of fire. Ah, I see. I'm to blame. Well, aren't you? No, and I can prove it. When you saw Joe Vulcan, for the very first time, you instinctively reacted against him before you even knew who he was. Well? Well, there's some people you dislike at sight, that's all. You didn't need me to be afraid of him. I'm not afraid of him. I... I just don't like him. And I insist that you fire him. Well, if that's how you feel about it, why don't you just go down to the stables and fire him yourself? All right. I will. Oh, morning, Mr. Cantwell. Vulcan, I'm going to have to let you go. Yes, sir, Mr. Cantwell. Uh, When do you want me to leave? Well, I want you to finish up around here. Uh, Take two or three weeks. Yes, sir. Uh, Vulcan, I... I don't want you to feel badly. No, sir. It's nothing personal. You can see that for yourself. We we don't require a full-time blacksmith. That's true. And if you need references for your next job... I, uh... I don't think there's going to be another job. Oh, don't say that. Good men are hard to find, especially in the kind of work you do. Uh, no, sir. I, uh... I think I'll quit roaming all around the country. You, uh, may have done me a favor. A favor? Yes, sir. I don't spend nearly enough time with my wife. Oh. I, uh, well, uh, she's a a beautiful woman. Really? (laughs) I know what you're thinking. An ugly cuss like him, how do you ever get a beautiful woman to even look at him, much less marry him? Oh, I didn't mean to imply that. Oh, it's all right. I'm used to it. Funny. A lot of folks say she... Well, that she steps out on me. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, well, I... But uh, even if it's true, it's my fault. What do you mean? Because I'm also being untrue to her. Uh-huh. Oh, not in that way. But I'm still cheating on her. How? Oh. Well, I'm giving time and energy that you might say belongs to her. To my job. You see what I mean? A lot of fellows do that. And then they wonder why their wives find something else or someone else. Well, sir, if you don't want me on the place, I'll be going. So you did it. It's economically unfeasible to have a full-time blacksmith. The real reason you fired him is because you're afraid of him. Afraid? Louise, have you ever had a conversation with this man? Of course. I've spoken to him. I mean a sustained conversation. Well, I... This is the most frightened, timid, milk toast. He's quiet. I'll admit that. And you thought he was one of the ancient gods. I said it was possible. Never. They were men. I mean, beings of, of, of strength. He's so ineffectual. I'll tell you what would amuse you. He said, maybe being fired wouldn't be the worst thing. It would give him more time to spend with his wife. Why, isn't that a sensible statement? And it turns out he has a beautiful wife. Just like Falcon. And maybe it would cure her from, as he put it, stepping out on him. 
Vulcan's wife was Venus. She certainly had her affairs. Maybe she still does. Who can say that these gods are dead? Or that they even existed. Then you can say what you like. I still believe he is the ancient god Vulcan. And that he chose to visit our house. Why? To get you to do something. Like what? I don't know. Then why didn't he come out with it? Maybe he did. Maybe you just didn't want to understand. If he's a god, why does he have to beat about the bush? Why not just hurl a thunderbolt or something and say, do it my way or else? Because a god wants things to happen not by threats, but through enlightenment. The thunderbolts are only a last resort. What am I supposed to be enlightened about? I don't know. What's bothering you? Hello, Senator. Sit down. Ah, morning, Ben. I'm sorry to be late. Oh, it's all right. Our starting time is whenever we decide to show up at the first tee. Well, shall we order? <clears throat> no, no, I'm on the diet. Say, that's a pretty big spread on you in the post. I was afraid of that. They go all the way back to the 30s to find a phrase to describe me. Merchant of death. <laughs> Actually, it's a rather uh, philosophical article. Philosophy in the post? Well, as a matter of fact, the uh, writer calls you Vulcan. Vulcan? Yeah, you know, the ancient god of fire. Where does he come off with... Well, he calls you the modern god of fire. <laughs> you must admit there's a basis for it. A basis? Well, you're perfecting a thing for us, and it's uh, almost supernatural, really. Is this Senator Sullivan talking? Oh, come on, Dan. Whatever happened to your sense of humor? I'm too busy to have one. <laughs> they even write that you run the risk of being punished for hubris. You just lost me. Uh, well, the hubris is a kind of uh, defiance of the gods. You know, by taking under oneself one of their attributes. By challenging them in their own speciality. Is that a fact? Oh, yes, yes, yes. There was a... A girl named Arachne in ancient Greece. Uh, now, she claims she was the finest weaver in the world. Uh, this annoyed the goddess Athena no end. I can't believe this conversation. And, well, you see, Athena held a distinction for herself. So, poor Arachne, for her hubris, was punished. Now, do you know how? I can't even begin to imagine. She was turned into a spider. Oh. <laughs> Am I going to be turned into a spider, too? Well, you haven't annoyed Athena. <laughs> Your problem is with Vulcan. Oh, I see. And since you've set yourself up as a, a master of fire, he uh, just might decide to have at you that way. Need I tell you, I am terrified. Oh, and also on a personal level, uh, you may have affronted him. What did I do now? Now he was married to the most beautiful of all women, Venus, and your wife... Oh, come on. She's a good-looking woman, but... No, 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 don't say that. Louise is beautiful. You know what I think? You're trying to psych me. You have to have an edge, but it won't do any good, Senator. I'll still beat you on the course today. Let's see. This marks the third night in a row that you're home. How do I win? If I'm detained somewhere on business, I get complaints because I'm never home. When I stay home, I still get flack. I was just making a comment. Did you read that article about me in the Post? Oh, I didn't want to mention it because I know those, those things annoy you. I had my secretary clip it out for me, and I've got it right here. The Vengeance of Vulcan. It's stated as a question. What annoys me is that they're factually inaccurate. Oh? You see, Vulcan, assuming there's a basis for this nonsense, Vulcan doesn't have a vengeful bone in his body. He was the kindliest of all the gods. He wasn't jealous of anyone. He didn't mind what anyone did to him or said about him. So, he wouldn't take vengeance on anyone. And how do you know all this? Because I did some research. Why? Why should you take time from your busy schedule? Because to... I have to set certain people straight. About what? You know, if this conversation were ever made public, both of us would be prime candidates for a sanitarium. Well, so 
Even if I did have the hubris to offend Vulcan, he wouldn't do anything about it anyway. Oh. Well. Now, do you feel better? Who says I'm feeling badly to begin with? Oh, I'll get it. No, no, I'm right here. Hey, get who? Senator. Uh, oh. Oh, uh, hello, Ben. I'd know your voice anywhere. Uh, uh Ben, uh, Ben, I, I just called to let you know that uh, you can expect to have clear sailing in the Senate committee tomorrow. That's great. Yes, well, I, I thought you'd like to hear that. I certainly do appreciate it. Yeah, well, I, I'm glad. Uh, goodbye, Ben. Goodbye. That's funny. What is? The senator. He called to tell me about the committee hearings. Well, doesn't he usually? Except this morning at the club. I told him I'd be out of town. Well, maybe he forgot. He hasn't forgotten anything since the day he was born. No, he thought I wouldn't be home tonight. And that's why he called. <laughs> kind of light begins to dawn in the eyes of Big Ben Cantwell, tycoon extraordinary. And he looks at his beautiful, desirable wife, and all of a sudden it occurs to him that perhaps the phone call from the fun-loving senator was not really for him after all. This little cloud will assume larger proportions when I return shortly with Act Three. things of the gods? Probably. How else can you explain the absolute madness of the world we live in? There was an ancient god named Vulcan, god of the forge and flame. And like his fellows, he likes to walk the earth. That is, according to legend. Well, don't laugh at legends. You can never tell when you might need one. It's quite possible Senator Sullivan wasn't calling me at all. Oh, really? He may have been calling you. Me? Whatever for? What reason does he have to call any woman? I wouldn't know. Louise, what is there between you and the senator? I consider that question an insult. Are you part of the senator's collection? Another scalp that hangs from his belt? Another notch on his gun? I'm afraid you'll have to remain forever in suspense. Is this why I get such favorable treatment from the committee? Now, you listen to me, Louise. You listen to me, Ben. For 15 years, we've been little more than strangers. That's not true. How often have we seen each other? I've been busy. And I've been busy, too. With what? With whom? I don't think that's your business. You're my wife, and I'm your husband. It's been a long time since we took those roles seriously. What is there between you and Senator Sullivan? Why don't you ask him? I will. Everybody's probably laughing at me while my back is turned. She's stepping out. Stepping out. Oh, listen to me. I'm talking like that idiot Joe Vulcan. But who am I to call him an idiot? I'm in the same boat. We both wear the same hat. Look out! Look out! Watch where you're going, you idiot! Look out! It was a miracle, Louise. A miracle. You say he's all right, Dr. Corman. The car was totaled. All he has is a few scratches. Are you sure? Positive. Now come inside. See for yourself. Is it all right to see him? Come on, Louise. It was such a terrible crash, I can hardly believe. Ben? Hello, Louise, dear. How do you feel? Well, uh, I'm all right, except I... I have this terrible pain in my legs. Dr. Corman, you said... Yeah, I know what he says. But I feel this pain. Now, Ben, we've examined you thoroughly. You know that. Yes, Doctor. There's absolutely no sign of any injury. No fracture, no sprains, no torn ligaments, no swelling. I understand, Doctor, but I have this pain. Doctor, are you sure? Not only am I sure, but every specialist we called in is also sure. 
I don't... I don't like to contradict anyone, but since it's my cane, I'm... I'm the only one who can really be sure. Louise. Ben. I'm home. It uh, was a very busy day. Ben, I... I think we should have this out. Why do you limp? Why? Well, it should be obvious. My legs hurt. But the doctors say the that... The doctors are simply mistaken. But then... I, I wish I could oblige everyone. I hate to cause anyone distress. Ben, what are you talking about? Yeah, well, it's just that my work itself is so turbulent. It deals with elemental forces that... Well, I like my personal affairs to be calm, peaceful. What has come over you, Ben? I don't know what you're talking about. Nothing's come over me. What kind of a game are you trying to play with me? Game? When you got into your car and you decided to confront Senator Sullivan that that night. I don't think we have to talk about that. Oh, we do. I, I admit that he and I had seen each other a few times, but... Louise, dear, please. I, I, I don't wish to discuss this. It, it isn't necessary. But then... If you'll excuse me, I... Where are you going? To the cord. Forge? Yes, you know, the factory. Don't go. What is it? You called it the forge. Of course. Why? I'll tell you why. Because that's what Vulcan called his workshop. Vulcan? Yes, Vulcan. Now I know what's happened. You actually believe you're Vulcan. Now why would I want to do a thing like that? You've affected his limp. My feet hurt ever since that accident. And, and you can even accept the fact that your wife might be having an affair. I, is that who you want to be? Is that what you want to be, Vulcan? Louise, darling, maybe you'd better see Dr. Corman. If you want to be a god, be a Jupiter, an Apollo. You're not well, and I wish I knew what was making you so unhappy. Look, I don't want to be married to Vulcan. Vulcan? Whatever makes you think that? You're married to me. You're married to Ben Cantwell. But you're not Ben Cantwell any longer. Well, I, I got here as quickly as I could, sir, but uh, there was all this traffic. I'm sorry to spoil your holiday, Lewis. No, no, that's all right. But I feel this is the day we can finish. Finish? Yes, Lewis. Today, here, now. On, on fireball, sir? Is everything set in the firing room? Yes, sir, but... But? What's the problem? Oh, I, uh... I thought we'd agreed to abandon the project. Why? Because it uh, was really beyond our, uh, our capability, uh, our human capability to control. Uh, the final formula, there is no known mathematics to express it. And furthermore, we can't even conceive the formula. We can't? Uh, here. I'll start, I'll start the computer. Yeah, see, all, all the known data has already been fed into it. And now, uh, what? You see, sir? Suddenly, the computer stops. Well, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it? Now, we're committed to deliver this, this weapon to the armed forces. But only if experimentally we could... We can. But I don't see how. Start to build up the temperatures in the firing room. What, what formulas are you... I don't need a formula. Do as I tell you, Lewis. I, I, know, I know you're a great one for intuition, sir, but this time... Do as I tell you, Lewis. You come in? Afternoon, Miss Cantwell. Oh, Oh, it's you, Mr. Falcon. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Cantwell said to take a couple of three weeks to get all the work done around the stables. Well, it's, uh, it's finished. You're leaving us, are you? Yes, ma'am. Uh, come to say goodbye. Well, good luck, Mr. Falcon. I wish you the best. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Same to you. Goodbye. Wait! Wait! Well, what is it, ma'am? Who... Who are you? 
Well, I'm just Joe Vulcan. That's not true. You are the god, Vulcan. Who? <laughs> that just ain't cool. That's right. It's not true anymore. But it was true, and I can prove it. Prove what, Miss Cantwell? I can prove it by something you just did. Well, what did I do? Uh, come with me. Please, come with me. How did you get in here? I'm your wife, remember? And Mr. Vulcan. Where was here? It beats me, sir. She just dragged me here. Ready for firing, sir. Uh, ben, listen to me. Destroy that machine, that, that device, whatever it is. Darling. Uh... Because if you don't, then, then you really become Vulcan. Then you really acquire his full powers. Is that how you want to live? Look at him. Louise, I'm very busy. You don't want to be Vulcan. You'll hate it. Immortality becomes a terrible burden after a while. The gods themselves grow tired of eternal life. That is why they, they walk the earth. To find someone who can lift the burden from them. And that someone becomes the god, don't you see? That's the true nature of immortality. What does that have to and do with... And Vulcan has found you. He has given you all his characteristics, his, his talent, his, his meekness. It's not too late. Give them back. Give what back? Don't finish the fireball. You yourself said that the final step of the formula was beyond human comprehension. But once you comprehend it, you will become more than human. Mr. Vulcan, you know I'm speaking the truth. Well, I'm sorry, ma'am. I, I don't know nothing of a kind. I said he gave you everything, Ben. Mr. Vulcan, please walk to the door. But why? Walk to the door, please. Stop. See, Ben? See? What, what do you want me to see? He doesn't limp anymore. His walk is normal. How do you account for that, Mr. Vulcan? Oh, I, I guess it's a, a miracle, huh? He said he gave you everything, Ben. He even gave you his limp. Ready for firing, sir. Throw on the A switch. The B switch. No, 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 don't. You don't want to be Vulcan. Now, my dear. If you're to live like Vulcan, I'll have to live like Venus. I don't want that. Will you want me to block other men in your face? The senator, the admiral, e e even your assistant here. Louise. I'll do it. Because I won't be able to help myself. And you won't be able to stand it. You'll, you'll prowl the earth to find someone to take your place. Sir, if we don't fire now. Ready. Don't, Ben. Then you'll know too much. You'll become the god who knows too much. Vulcan. And that's why he limps and staggers. It's not the injury to his feet. It's the weight of knowledge he must carry. He knows more than any of them. He knows how to make and, and build. Oh, turn off that switch. Turn it off. Then. You... You heard her, Louis. Turn off the switch. Then. Then. I turned him off, but nothing happened. The reaction could have gone too far. We, well, we can be destroyed in here, sir. You were right, Mr. Cantwell. It just stopped by itself. We could never understand it. Thank you, Mr. Vulcan. And I think I... I'd best be leaving. Ben. Ben, look. He's limping again. And look at you. You're... You're standing straight. <laughs> it any way you like. Chacun a so goût, as our friends in France would say. 
Do the gods walk the earth and look for their replacements? Is that what happened to Ben Cantwell? Or was it merely a psychological seizure? Think about it, and I shall return shortly. The gap narrows. Our ancestors looked upon the gods as supernatural beings who knew everything. But now, we are starting to do what only the gods themselves could do. Little by little, we seem to be stripping the veil away from all the mysteries of life and death. And so, some say, the gap narrows. But is this also human frailty? Outward appearances to the contrary notwithstanding, is the gap really widening? In any event, let there be no gap at all between you and us here seven times each week. Our cast included Kim Hunter, Hugh Marlowe, Earl Hammond, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tonight's Mystery Theater was also brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program was furnished by CBS Radio. Dial is set for news with John Scott reporting at 8 o'clock. I'm Barry Farber, right after news. Walter Kerr not only treats silent movies, he brings them roaring back to a brand new life. Right here on the Barry Farber Show, WOR, New York. Democrats say... Democrats say... Democrats say... Democrats say... Democrats say. Democrats say. Democrats. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Our story is about a man named Will Crawford, imprisoned for a daring theft, which he did not commit. Can you imagine being confined to a cell for years, thrown in with thieves, felons, addicts, and dangerous criminals? What would you think about? How would you preserve your sanity? And what would you do if you were released? Will Crawford knew. Our mystery drama, The Corpse, wrote shorthand, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Listerine Lozenges and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. False arrest. False imprisonment. Within ourselves, each of us, in imagination, can visualize just about anything that can happen to another person. We can dream about love because it has touched us, about hate because we have hated, about success, failure, hunger, and pain. But I, for one, cannot imagine being arrested and imprisoned for a crime I didn't commit. And that is what happened to one honest man named Will Crawford. You won't change your mind, Nick. I've explained, Mom. I've... Yes, you certainly have. All right, I'll, I'll drive up alone. I'll explain you couldn't take the day off. He'll understand. Gosh, you, you make me feel like I don't care. Do you? Care? Well, sure, it's just that... Well, I'm new at this job, and I don't like to have to ask for a day off to, to drive up there. It's not so bad up there, Nick. I've been going up once a week for five years. Oh, I know. I've been up, too. It's just... It's just it makes me feel funny. Why? Because it's a prison? Well, sure. 
But I understand. You, um, you will be here when we come home. Oh, sure. I, I wish you wouldn't make me feel this way, Mom. I'm not guilty of anything. Don't worry about it. It's, it's just that it's been so awful. Mom, you, you don't know what I went through. Kids in high school, boy, they can be pretty nasty. You'd think I'd stolen the money. My senior year just fell apart. You remember. Yes, I do. And I was heart sick when you left. So was your father. We hoped you'd go on to college instead. Mm-hmm. One lousy job after another. Couldn't get a decent one. I'd say I'm Nick Crawford and that's it. You the son of the man who stole all that money from the Pendleton Bank? <laughs> well, I, I mowed a lot of lawns. No one worried I'd steal their power mowers. Oh, Nick. You should have left River Falls and gone someplace else, changed our name, started fresh. <laughs> Nick, I, I must get ready. You still believe, don't you, Mom? I know your father. He's an honest man. He says he did not embezzle money from the Pendleton Bank, and I believe him. What happens now? I don't know. Mom, why don't we sell a house, move away? And admit your father's guilt? Oh, gosh, he was found guilty. He was the bookkeeper. The books have been tampered with. Over $100,000 is missing. And someone has it, but not your father. What's he going to do when he comes home? He can't get a job in River Falls. Who'd who take a chance on him? I believe your father is innocent, Nick. That has given me the strength to hold my head up to all those customers who come into the variety store and buy odds and ends and give me pitying looks. I know you've been embarrassed by what happened to your father. So you... You don't have to be here when I bring him home. No. I'll be here. To say hello and... Then I think I will clear out. I... I just can't go on living like this, Mom. I... I just can't. Well, Mr. Crawford, you're free. So I am. I'm glad to see you get out. Not that you ever gave me any trouble. That's not what I meant. I know. I never thought I'd meet a man like you. I'm kind of miss you, Mr. Crawford. What's it been, uh, five years now? Commuted to five for good behavior. Uh -huh. What you going to do now? What would you do if you'd been sentenced to prison for a crime you didn't commit? Uh, you're still saying that, are you? It's true. Well, I'd like to believe you, but I don't know... I read up on the trial and how they proved you juggled your books. Someone juggled the books. I didn't. If you say so, Mr. Crawford. Let me ask you again. If you'd been sentenced to prison for a crime you didn't commit, what would you do? Uh, if I'd been given a bum rap and then got out, I'd go after the double crosser who committed the crime and wring the truth out of him. Mm -hmm. Guess what I'm going to do. Yeah, I can see it in your eyes. I don't care if it takes the rest of my life, Clancy. I didn't embezzle the money from the bank. I have never seen the $100,000. I don't know where it is, where it went, but I'm going to find out. And when I do, yeah, I've been labeled a thief. I've been in prison for five years. Think of what this has done to my wife and to my son, how they've suffered. I can't give them back those five years of humiliation, but I can create a future for us. All I have to do is discover who framed me. Yeah. Good luck, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Clancy. Uh, you know where the warden's office Oh, sure, sure. I'll see him and listen to his little speech. You uh, committed a crime against society for which you were tried and found guilty. You've paid your debt. Now you're a free man again. Mm -hmm. Then he'll wish me good luck and give me some money. He's performed his job. Next case. Doesn't make any difference whether the person was guilty or innocent. The warden makes the same speech. It's like dealing with a machine. It performs a function, but it has no judgment, no heart. Just punches you in or out. But he's not a bad guy, Mr. Crawford. I know that. He's just a cipher in our equation of justice. Goodbye, Clancy. So long, Mr. Crawford. If I sound bitter, it's because I am. I've been robbed of five years of my life. I can't get them back. But somebody's going to pay for it. Starting now. <laughs> You'll get us thrown out of this place. It's it, it, it just that I... I can't believe you're free. I'm not, darling. What? Now don't look frightened, Stella. You just dry your eyes and listen to me. Let me try and explain. Well, of course. First, I thank God for you. I will. No, no, let me finish. I do thank God for a wife like you. 
I know what you've gone through. I, I paced that cell every day for five years, knowing what life was like for you here in River Falls. Having to work and meet the self-righteous hypocrites who were curious about poor Mrs. Crawford. How she could hold her head up after her husband was sent to prison for embezzling a hundred thousand dollars from the bank. I know, darling. I know the embarrassment and the hurt. And still you believed in me. You're the only one who did. Does. Does. Thank you, darling. Well, you, you'll have me crying again. No, no, no. No, no more crying, Stella. I didn't make that speech to make you cry. I just wanted to say thank you, except to you and Nick. And what I've done to both of you, I wouldn't have cared if I'd rotted to death in that prison. But I love you and I care deeply about both of you. <laughs> From this day on, I have one goal in my life. I'm going to prove my innocence. I'd rather be dead. Well, don't I mean it. I'd rather be dead than be marked for the rest of my life as a thief. I didn't embezzle that money. I know that. Don't dwell on it, though. You're free. We're together. That's what counts. That, that's what's important. And that's not enough for me, or for you, or Nick. We've talked all this out before. I know we have. I know it. And? How? I don't quite know. How? I know in my heart that you didn't embezzle that money because I know you. But how do we prove it? Somebody took the money. Who? Five years ago. All this Pendleton's retired. His son is the president now. It's a long time ago, an age. I thought about it night after lonely night. Poor darling. Married to a fall guy. Honest Will Crawford set up for a fall right into a prison cell. I could kill the swine who did this to us. I'm going to find him still. I'll find him when I do. Will, let's talk sense. I am talking sense. No, you're not. Both of us are angry. Let, let's just look at the facts coldly. You were accused and tried and convicted by a jury. Yes, because some securities were found to be missing and because someone had made false entries in my books. You didn't embezzle that money. But how was it done? Now think. Well, there are two ways, at least. What about the securities? Adam Rossano. The contractor? That's right. Rosano borrowed seventy thousand dollars from the bank and gave us securities as collateral. About ninety thousand dollars worth. Mm -hmm. When he paid off his loan, he wanted his securities returned. They were missing. They'd been sold. They were traced to a brokerage house in New York, but the seller couldn't be found. You wrote that check for seventy thousand dollars. That's right. And I placed the securities in the safe. And when the investigation began, the auditor also found that your books were overdrawn by almost $10,000. I can't deny that still. Well, what happened? I mean, what do you think happened? Someone, some officer probably, stole the securities. But then what about your overdrawn books? Still, let me give you an example of embezzlement. Now, a teller can enter a deposit and put the money in his pocket, but nothing as large as $10,000. Now, it must have been a series of false entries... Well, how would that work? Well, look, let's say somebody mails in his paycheck for, say, $200 for deposit. Mm -hmm. Now, that amount is entered in that person's account. The clerk reports the deposit to me, and I enter it in my books. However, the clerk does not stamp the check for deposit. He or she steals the check and either cashes it or deposits it in a secret account in some other bank. That bank cancels the check and returns it to the depositor's employer. But what about what about the endorsement? Mm, a stamp and a number. Both look official and hardly ever would be challenged. Well, that's that's ingenious, Will. And how could a scheme like that ever be traced? Well, offhand, I don't know. Both the securities and the cash have vanished. <sighs> that's just futile. No, it's not, darling. Well, how do you begin? Very carefully. What do you mean by that? Still, someone worked this frame up on me. Maybe more than one person. I'm going to ask questions. I'll pick up a, a stray remark here, another there, and in time, I'll put them together and I'll have an indication of who was behind the embezzlement. Then I'll investigate. Oh, well, it, it seems so hopeless. Still, when I was in prison, I read something that stuck in my mind. I forget where I read it or who wrote it, and it's just a line, but what it is is, in a really just cause, the 
the weak conquer the strong. I believe that still. It may take a long time, but I'll get the truth. Those lines from Shakespeare's Othello come to mind. Who steals my purse steals trash. Tis something nothing. Twas mine, tis his, and has been slave to thousands. But he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. Will Crawford's sentiment exactly. I'll return shortly with Act Two, and then we will find out if the former bookkeeper can exonerate himself. The title of our play, The Corpse Wrote Shorthand, a provocative title. What in the world can it mean? Will Crawford was imprisoned for embezzlement. Then what's this about a corpse? And how in heaven's name could a corpse write shorthand? Well, an honest story should have an honest title. Let's find out just what this title means. Good morning, Mr. Pendleton. Ah, Crawford. Thank you for seeing me. Yes, sir. I must say I'm surprised by your visit. My father I tried to visit him, but he refused to talk to me, so I'm grateful to you for these few minutes. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, sit down. I haven't much time. Thank you. I came home last night. Yes. There was a squib in the forum yesterday that you had been released. What brings you to me, Crawford? I should think it would be embarrassing for you to walk into the bank. Not at all. I spent many productive years in the bank as your bookkeeper, and I have nothing to be embarrassed about. You don't? No. I didn't embezzle that money. I'm a forgiving man, Crawford, but I am not stupid. And arrogance makes me angry. You've made a mistake and you've paid for it. I'm willing to forget the damage you did to the bank's reputation. But when you declare bluntly that you did not embezzle, you sound demented. I'm telling the truth. You were arrested, tried, and convicted. How dare you waste my time saying that you're innocent? Now, if you'll excuse if me... If I sold those stolen securities and juggled my books for $10,000, where is it, Mr. Pendleton? Where is the $100,000? Oh, so that's your game. The money will turn up. Oh, not here, not in River Falls. Now that you've been freed, you leave town. But wherever you go, you'll be watched. And the money will be recovered. I'm not leaving River Falls. Then you're going to starve to death. Just what do you propose to do, Crawford? I have some ideas. But I was the victim of a clever scheme. Some person or persons framed me, and I'll find out who they were. You are Punish me. Please, leave. And don't come back. One question. What happened to Doris Conroy? Who? The assistant bookkeeper. She's no longer with the bank. Doris Conroy? I don't really remember her. Well, that's surprising. I beg your pardon? When you were second vice president, you worked with her a lot. A rather pretty girl, dark-haired, nice skin. You were the loan officer at the time. Oh, that girl. Yes, yes, I remember her. What about her? Well, I'd just like to talk to her, that's all. She was my assistant. I have no idea what happened to her. When did she leave the bank? I don't know. Ask Mr. Baker and personnel. He'll tell you. All right, I will. Thank you for your time, Mr. Pendleton. Good morning. Hello, Will. Hi, Tim. Hey, I really appreciate it. Hey, what... don't thank you. That's still news. There may be a story in it for me. That's my business. I, uh, I dug up the information you wanted. You know where I can find Doris Conroy? Yeah. Uh, but it won't do you any good. She's dead. Oh. oh. I didn't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Two years ago. She left New York on a cruise for the Caribbean. They found her body in the Hudson. She fell overboard. That's the story. The personnel man at the bank, Mr. Baker, said that she left the Pendleton Bank just about two years ago. Uh, what's important to you about Doris Conroy? Well, she was my assistant at the bank, for one thing. For another, why, why would she quit her job? And for a third, I'm surprised that she could afford to go on a cruise. Uh, huh? You sound skeptical. Well, maybe a little. Why? Look at it this way, Will. Everyone's convinced you embezzled the money. 
Okay, you say you didn't, but are you sure you aren't trying to create a mystery where there isn't one? Doris Conroy saves her money, quits her job, goes on a cruise. She falls overboard, she's drowned. A tragedy, but uh, a natural one. <laughs> Maybe she had too many drinks. Doris didn't drink. Oh? Uh-huh. I'd forget about Doris Conroy. I guess you'll have to at that, unless you can communicate with her in the grave in Rose Hill Cemetery in Oakton. Yes, that's where she was from, Oakton. I wonder if her mother's still alive. Oh, that's easy to find out. No, wait, Tim, hold it. I'm going to drive up and talk to her. Well, unless her mother's dead, too. Oh, I couldn't be that unlucky. Uh, the mother's name is Mrs. Fred Conroy, 800 Hillside Drive. Hillside Drive? That's a pretty fancy address. <laughs> the best. Hmm. What's that mean? Hey, pal, what are you thinking? Oh, I'll, I'll tell you later. Just a little idea, that's all. Yes? Uh, Mr. Pendleton in River Falls told me that I... Oh, could... yes. It's such a considerate man. Are you coming? Thank you. Oh, we can talk in the living room. I'm alone here. I don't get to sit in here very much. Well, it's a lovely room. Oh, such a considerate man, Mr. Pendleton. A gentleman. So nice of him to send you out. Oh, he must think my mind is slipping. I do wonder once in a while. He's so considerate to warn me. I, I, I am forgetful. Oh, we all are from time to time. Oh, ain't that the truth? Oh, Mr. Pendleton said if that embezzler called on me, I wasn't to talk to him. I see. He said he's crazy. Oh, I guess he is. Oh, he's crazy, all right. Says he never stole the money. He got out of prison, and now he's trying to stir up trouble. Is that right? Is that why Mr. Pendleton sent you out to see me? He's trying to stir up trouble, all right. Oh, I've had my share of trouble. I know you have. Your poor daughter. She got drowned. Yes, I I remember. I was awfully sorry to hear about that, Mr. Conroy. Why didn't Mabel look after her? Uh, Yes, Mabel. Well, I I really don't know. Mabel was all broken up. Yes. Mabel. Mabel. I I can't seem to remember Mabel's last name. Scully. (laughs) Now, how's that for remembering... Oh, every once in a while, my thinking has his on straight. Mabel Scully, of course, of course. Do you ever see her, Mrs. Gannon? Oh, well, she sends me a Christmas card every Christmas. I, I never see her, no. I see. Does she still live in Oakton? Oh, Doris is dead. She fell off that boat. Yes, we're all still very sad about that, including Mabel Scully. Oh, it upsets me to talk about Doris. I understand. Well, I'll be on my way. This is such a nice room. Doris liked this room. She had her friends over, and they liked it very much. Mabel liked it, too. Hello, darling. Ah, oh, well. Give me a kiss. Mm, my faithful, trusting wife. <laughs> you know something? We haven't got much, but we've got each other. That's enough for me. Nick not home? No. But well, don't worry about it, darling. Uh, I understand. He telephoned that he'd be late. I see. Well, so do I. And I can't blame him. I'm an embarrassment to him. You know, this is going to get worse before it gets better still. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, I imagine that Tim Yeager at the forum will have a story about me in tomorrow's paper. Then he was willing to see you. Oh, I'm glad. He's a nice man. Well, he's got an open mind. That's why he's a good reporter. I don't know what he'll write, but I, I'm i sure that it'll stir up trouble. You know the kind of thing. Crawford still insists he's innocent. People at the store will look at you and know we're both loose in the top story. Oh, I'm used to that. Forget it. Well, how was Tim helpful? Okay. From the beginning. I saw C. Palmer Pendleton. He let you come in? Yep. When I showed up at the bank, I caused a big stir. Most of the persons I worked with are still there, and they looked at me as if they'd seen a ghost. Was it awful? Well, it wasn't easy, darling. Some of them talked to me as if I was contagious. One or two just buried their heads in their work and ignored me, but my arrival was disruptive. That's why Pendleton saw me. And he was his old sanctimonious self. 
suggested that we leave River Falls. He'd have an eye on us, of course, to catch me with the money that I've got stashed away somewhere. Mm, that cheap hypocrite. All of that, darling. When I told him I was staying right here in River Falls, he got red in the face, told me flatly I'd never be employed again. Now, I asked him about Doris Conroy. Oh, she, she drowned, Will. Yes, I know that now, but I didn't until Tim told me. Well, I'm sure I must have told you. Well, maybe you did. But I guess I, I, I didn't remember. Maybe I'd forgotten. If I didn't know, it didn't mean anything to me at the time, and now it does. Why? First, I learned that Doris had left the bank two years ago. Mm -hmm. Then, from Tim, I learned that at the same time, she booked a cruise to the Caribbean. Now, the night of the sailing, she fell overboard. And next morning, her body was found floating in the Hudson. Floating, Stell. Keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to find out more about what happened to Doris, so I went to see her mother in Oakton. And you wouldn't believe it. Well, go on. She thought Pendleton had sent me from the bank to make sure that she didn't admit Will Crawford to her house. Now, he must have telephoned her after I left his office. She's so addle-minded, poor thing, that she thought I'd come out to reaffirm his advice. Well, now, why would Pendleton warn her against you? I wondered about that, too. Does the old lady know something that I shouldn't find out? The answer is no, but, and this is a very big but, she lives elegantly on Hillside Drive in a very fine house. Now, how can she afford it? The answer is that Doris could afford it. And with Doris dead, Mrs. Conroy has committed Doris's money. Because the setup just doesn't ring true. Then, then you think that Doris somehow was mixed up in the embezzlement? That's my theory. Now I mean to pursue it. But how? I, I mean, with Doris dead and her mother... Well, that all depends upon what happens tomorrow. Tomorrow. Doris wasn't alone on that boat. She was taking the cruise with a friend of hers. Now, I dragged the name out of Mrs. Conroy. Doris's friend was Mabel Scully. She lives in Oakton, and Tim's going to see her tomorrow. Well, what can you learn from her? Well, I don't know offhand. But if you get a person talking after the fact, things come out. At the time of the drowning, I'm sure Mabel was hysterical. The ship had left port and was sailing out to sea. Well, where was Doris? I mean, I, I can just imagine the confusion on shipboard because it wasn't until the next morning that the tragedy was discovered. Then it must have been his, hysteria. Yes, of course. Oh, what a frightful experience for Mabel Scully. Then she probably was questioned and browbeaten and then finally released. Now, that's two years ago. The hysteria of that moment has passed. Two years have gone by. Now, perhaps, Mabel Scully will be able to reconstruct what happened the night Doris Conroy drowned. Which she didn't. What? She didn't, Stell, because if she had, her body would have sunk to the bottom of the Hudson and have been swept out to sea. Now that we've established a corpse, what about that shorthand? A curious story indeed. A man is judged innocent until he is proven guilty, and here is a man proven guilty who is innocent. How can that happen in these wonderful days of law and order? Read the newspapers. On a quite regular basis, I read about persons being released from prisons who are innocent when imprisoned. Laws like cobwebs entangle the weak, but are broken by the strong, as Will Crawford is about to prove. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. One man's innocence simply must be another man's guilt. If Will Crawford did not embezzle $50,000 from the Pendleton Bank, who did? He was found guilty and imprisoned for five years. And the money still hasn't been found. And he insists he is innocent. Well, we have a corpse on our hands. One that writes shorthand. Is that the clue Mr. Crawford needs to understand before he proves his innocence? His reporter friend, Tim, is going to try. Thanks for seeing me, Miss Scully. Oh, that's all right. Uh, please sit down. You're Mr. Uh, uh, Yeager? Right. Uh, scandal monger supreme for the River Falls Forum, though uh, most of our scandal's pretty much of a yarn. Huh. <laughs> nice place you have here. Oh, it's all right. I got the stuff with the settlement. Ah, and took back your maiden name. You didn't ask to see me to talk about me, Mr. Yeager. Uh, it's almost six and I'm being picked up in half an hour. Oh, uh, 
sorry. Miss Scully, a man has just been released from prison after serving five years for embezzlement. Yeah, Will Crawford. Right. I read your story in this afternoon's paper. Claims he's innocent. <laughs> no way. He's trying to find a way, and I'm inclined to go along with him. Now, that's where you enter the picture. Me? Yeah. You and Doris Conroy. Oh, Doris. Oh, yes, that was horrible. Yeah, I can imagine. That ship was halfway down the Hudson, and I was still looking for Doris. It wasn't until the next morning that we found out. They found her body floating in the Hudson. She drowned. Yeah, that's what they said at the time. Well, that's what happened. I wonder. Apparently, she fell overboard. Her head hit something, and she drowned. That's right. Of course, uh, drowned isn't quite right. Oh? Now, she died from that smash on the head. There was no water in her lungs. If there had been... She might have been swept out to sea. Oh, it's so ugly even to think about. Yeah. Could become uglier still. What does that mean? Well, let me come to that in a moment. I'm here because I hope you'll reconstruct that night for me. Well, there's very little to tell. Now, you and Doris have been friends for a long time, right? We knew each other since high school. She went to business school and got a job in River Falls at the Pendleton Bank, and I attended junior college. I went to work here in Oakton in the offices of Hometown Insurance. <laughs> I'm still there. And you went on the cruise two years ago, is that right? Yes. And Doris quit her job at the same time, right? Yes, she did. I never knew why. I asked her, of course, but all she'd say was that she was tired of being an assistant bookkeeper. And she had plenty of money? Well, I don't know about that. But she must have. For years, Doris and her mother lived in a four-room flat above a grocery store. Then they bought that place on Hillside. Oh, that's a really fancy residential area. Those houses cost a lot. Yeah. Did Mrs. Conroy have money? Oh, no. No, no. She worked in a dress shop. Mr. Conroy died about four years ago, but... Oh, I can't imagine him leaving a bundle of insurance. So, how did Doris and her mother move into such a fine house? Where'd the money come from? Well, I don't know. And two years later, Doris quits a job, goes on a cruise. You've got to admit, it's, it's all pretty strange. Well, I, I know it is. Yeah, I think about it often. Oh, then it goes out of my head. I, I don't like to dwell on what happened. What did happen, Miss Scully? I mean, looking back now, calmly, what do you remember about that night on the ship? For instance, what do you remember about the cabin? Oh, it was lovely. Had both of you unpacked? Oh, no. No, no. We left our bags and went right up on deck to watch the ship sail. Uh, had friends come to see you off the old uh, bon voyage party? Oh, just the man I made the mistake of marrying. Adora stayed out of the way. Oh, she said hello to him, but then she sort of drifted off. That's the last I heard of her. And no one came to see her off? No. Her boss expected to, but he was in Providence. He sent a telegram. I, I gave it to the police. Yeah. Now, you also turned over to them the teeth pack watch with the engraving on it. Yes, that's right. Oh, boy, that watch must have cost a fortune. On the back, it said, With gratitude, Charlie. Oh, yeah? Uh, who is Charlie? Search me. I saw that watch uh, that night for the first time. I don't know what Doris did for him, but that watch was a lot of gratitude. Mm, so much gratitude, I'm a little suspicious of it. What do you mean? Well, had Doris become engaged to some rich guy? No. No, she didn't go with anyone. And still, someone gives her a watch that probably cost, uh, what, $800? Now, what does that suggest to you, Miss Scully? Oh, I, I can't believe it. I can. Blackmail. I'll get it, Estelle. That might be Tim Yeager. All right. Any luck? Yeah, plenty, I think. Come on in. I'll buy you a drink. Estelle, I'm fixing drinks. One for you, too. Maybe we've got something to celebrate. Hello, Tim. Do you have any news? Yeah, yeah, but it's a, it's a mixed bag. Oh, please, sit down. We're very grateful for you, Tim, for taking such an interest in Will's case. Who? I'm happy I did. Now I know he's an innocent man. Oh, Tim. Why all this wasn't gone into at the time of her death, I, I don't know. Somebody should have seen the connection. Well, wait a minute. You've lost me. Here you go, darling. Oh, thank you. Tim? Tim is just saying that... Why didn't anyone see the connection between Doris Conroy's mysterious death and the embezzlement charge against you, Will? Wait a minute. Now, wait. Now, slow down. What is the connection? Well, there are several. First. About four years ago, Doris and her mother moved from a dump over a grocery store to Hillside Drive. That means money, Lauren. Second, 
Doris quits her job just at the time she decides to go on a cruise. Third, there's a bon voyage message from Providence in her stateroom from her boss, C. Palmer Pendleton. Hey, hold it. I, I, I've got it. I've got the, the watch. What watch? What are you talking about? It's the $800 key that somebody named Charlie gave to her and engraved with gratitude. That's it. Charlie. Judge Charlie is the C in C. Palmer Pendleton. Then it was Pendleton and Doris Conroy who embezzled the money and set me up for the ball guy. Why, I never would have dreamed. Pendleton and Doris, of course. I am going to pin this on that sanctimonious moneylender and send him up the river for a really long stretch. Oh, I want that more than anything in life, Tim. But how are we going to do it? You're saying that he murdered Doris Conroy. But why would he do that? From my great stockpile of cliches, how about this one? Thieves fall out. And so do blackmailers. Pendleton split with Doris. Then she wanted more. He could stand just so much pressure and danger. He killed her and made it seem like accidental drowning, which it wasn't. That smash on her head was not made by something she hit when she fell into that filthy dockside water. Pendleton hit her with something and dumped her over the side. All right. But the telegram indicates that he was in Providence. Yeah, I know it will. Well, that's the stickler. Well, let me dig into it. The forum's got all kinds of connections. I'll go after the telegram company first thing in the morning. Uh, and what you might do, Will, is to go to New York, trace that teapot to the jeweler, uh, show him a picture of Pendleton, ask him if Pendleton's the guy who bought it. Right. And Estelle. Mm-hmm. Not a word about this to anyone. We don't want our bird to fly the coop. <laughs> Yes? Oh, is it Mr. Will from the bank? Hello, Mrs. Conroy. May we come in? Who is that? This is Mr. Yeager from the River Falls Forum. From the newspaper? Yes. Oh, well, what do you know? Oh, please, come in. Oh, isn't this nice, Mr. Will? Mrs. Conroy, I'm afraid we have some bad news for you about your daughter, Doris. Oh, she's dead. She fell off a boat. Yes. And we think that maybe it wasn't an accident. And we're investigating her death. Oh, Mr. Pendleton has always been so considerate. Well, the police now suspect that maybe somebody pushed her over the side of the boat. Doris was a good swimmer. We think that Doris had an enemy and knew it. Well, maybe so. I wonder if Doris left anything behind her about this enemy of hers. Have you kept all of her things, Mrs. Conroy? Her room is just the way it was when she was away two years ago. Could we, uh, see the room? Stell, Stell, come quickly. Good heavens, what is it? We've got her diary. Uh, Stell, Will says you read shorthand. Can you make some sense out of this for us? A di- Who, whose diary? Doris Conroy's. It's a five-year diary going back to 1970. Now, maybe someplace in this thing there's a clue to her relationship with Pendleton. If there is, we've got the factual proof to reopen my case. Yeah, and we've got to hurry, Estelle. Mrs. Conroy just may take it into her head to telephone Pendleton. We don't want him to skip. We want to confront him. Well, I, I, I'll do my best, but my shorthand's awfully rusty. She has a lot in this diary. Well, you just do the best you can. I'll telephone Providence. Maybe the paper up there has found out what I want to know about the telegram. Mark? Uh, uh, Hello, uh, Tim Yeager in River Falls. Any luck? Uh, Where'd you locate him? Doing graduate work, I see. Yeah, now he he admitted sending the telegram? Uh, Why did he send it? I get it. Yeah. Yeah, I think this just about sews it up. I, I, I'm very grateful to you, Mark, and to the newspaper. Uh, I'll, I'll telephone you tomorrow morning, okay? Yeah. Goodbye. Uh, any luck, Tim? We have got Mr. Pendleton by the throat. Great. It's here, Will. I, I, I found it. What? In black and white. That's here, Estelle. The, the entry is dated March 1970. Dear diary, after work today, I had cocktails with Mr. Pendleton at... The pub. Mm -hmm. I like him. He's such a considerate man. I almost fainted when he told me about a plan he's been thinking about. I listened with a great deal of interest because there's money in it for me. More money than I can imagine, dear diary. Mm. He's an officer in the bank, so he knows just how to put his plan into effect, but he needs someone he can trust to work with him, and I am it. We can get our hands on at least $100,000, and 
And the bookkeeper, Will Crawford, won't be able to suspect a thing. Big day for you, Will. Thanks to you, Tim. Ah, uh, just another story to me. Well, if you hadn't believed in me. Uh, let's go. Joe will get you the high sign. Now, you do the talking. It's your story. Good morning, Mr. Pendleton. But I, I was told Mr. Yeager of the Forum asked to see me. Yes, I'm Yeager. What's this jailbird doing with you? He wants to witness and record your admissions, Mr. Pendleton. What? Get out of here. If you don't, I'll have security arrest you. There'll be an I... arrest, all right. But it'll be yours for embezzling $100,000 from your father's bank and for murdering Doris Conroy because she blackmailed you. You're insane. You and Doris stole the money and made me the fall guy. Two years ago, she put the bite on you for more money, left her job and planned a cruise. You hit her on the head and threw her overboard. That's a lie. That's not a lie. You sent her a telegram from Providence. How can I murder someone in New York? No Providence? good, Mr. Pendleton. You telephoned your son, a student in Providence, dictated the telegram to him and he sent it for you. Both the newspaper and the police have checked that out. Then you left River Falls and went to New York. You met Doris on shipboard, murdered her, and threw her overboard. And you're that Charlie whose name was engraved on the back of that peacock watch along with ingratitude. You gave it to Doris. The jeweler identified you from a picture. You proved those charges. The embezzling scheme and Doris's decision to demand more money from you two years ago both are written down in shorthand in her diary. Mr. Pendleton, the River Falls police are waiting outside for you. I denied the embezzlement charges against me, Mr. Pendleton, but I was jailed for five years. The charges against you can't be denied. They're based on facts. The murder charge is based on circumstantial evidence. By that statement, you just hung yourself. You've admitted that there is a murder charge. Tim, ask the police to come in. An ancient Roman writer named Juvenal asked, what man was ever content with one crime? Mr. Pendleton and Doris Conroy connived to embezzle a fortune. She was not content with her share, so she resorted to blackmail, and she was murdered. Many crimes are detected. Persons are prosecuted for them, but when an innocent person is charged and sentenced, justice has miscarried. But... An innocent person, given time and courage, very often can clear his name, as we have seen. I'll be back shortly. Modern justice dates back to the year 1215, when the Magna Carta guaranteed that no subject should be kept in prison without trial and judgment by his peers. The Western world has lived by that precept for almost 800 years. Sometimes justice may be unjust or slow, but in the long run, it is not only the sum of all moral duty. It is also what makes each of us equal. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Joan Lovejoy, Russell Horton, Joan Shea, and Barry Kroger. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. WOR Mystery Theater was also brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program was furnished by CBS Radio. On the WOR community calendar, tomorrow is the big day at Bloomingdale's, the WOR Children's Christmas Fun Party. 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 The WOR Children's Christmas
Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Do you ever think of exactly what the word mystery means? Something beyond human comprehension is part of Webster's first definition. The supernatural, the gothic, witches, ghosts, and ghouls, of course. But the word has a wider meaning. It is also defined as an enigma, often used retrospectively of what has been, but is no longer. Unexplained or unrevealed. And this story is summed up in that statement more or less exactly. Our mystery drama, The Hanging Judgment, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Mandel Kramer and Leon Janney. It is sponsored in part by Luden's Medicated Cough Drops and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. greatest and most inexplicable mystery of all. How can one human being ever take the life of another? Bad enough in the heat of anger, but outrageous and sickening when it is in cold blood. Yet that particular riddle of the crime of murder is not the only one. We all know the others. How, where, when. And in so many cases, the most baffling, who... Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I now present to you the problem of solving that in the case of the state against Dr. Samuel Grant and Ms. Cheryl Stafford. tonight to talk over the divorce. You did, not me. Get out of here. Who's that with you? I said I'd bring Cheryl along. You get that slut out of my house and off my property. Barbara, put that gun away. Run, Cheryl, run. Give me the gun, Barbara. I'll give you what you deserve, you cheating, lying... Hello, Lieutenant Kinsella. Mr. District Attorney, I kind of expected to see you earlier. At the scene of the crime, as we say. Want to fill me in on this Grant case? Hmm? Let's go into my office. Looks like uh, murder one. How's she killed? Shot, close range, probably uh, 38. Suspects? Well, don't know. Could have been a prowler. The woman, Barbara Grant, was separated from her husband. Has he been notified? No, we haven't been able to reach him. A Swedish maid was wakened by the shots and called us in. She thinks Dr. Grant might be out of town. Whose maid? His or hers? Her maid. The dead woman. He said they separated. Check. So how would she know about the doctor's comings and goings? Uh, sit down, Al. Hmm. I get a hunch you don't have to be nervous over this one. What do you mean? Well, I looked over a couple of pictures of this Dr. Samuel Grant. <laughs> Lover boy. How do you figure? Well, chaser. Final breakup of the Grants was over a secretary he had, a babe named Cheryl Stafford. Did you pick her up? Yes, I'm waiting on that. Seems Mrs. Grant made enough noise so the doctor fired her and she moved back to her hometown, Las Vegas. Hmm. And if Dr. Grant is out of town, that's where he might be? Figures. Yeah, we should know any moment. <laughs> like maybe right now. Yeah. What? Well, you don't say. Well, how about that? Now, hold it a minute. <laughs> Guess who just walked into the station? Not our prime suspect. None other. The good Dr. Grant himself. And uh, I was out of town on special business when I heard the report on radio. So I flew back here to Los Angeles right away and 
Came straight to the precinct house. Well, we appreciate that, Dr. Grant. Well, you don't... Well, you can't think that I have anything to do with the murder of my wife. I never even suggested that. You're bringing it up. <laughs> no matter what you might suspect, I couldn't have. I parked my car at the airport day before yesterday and flew to Las Vegas for a medical meeting. I didn't return till early this morning. I'm sure the airport parking lot employees can vouch for that. It will be checked. Well, now, may I ask what is being done about whatever prowler or whoever he was who, who murdered my wife? Uh, first off, we're checking on the bullet that killed her. Uh, there was a gun beside her, a thirty-two. It had been fired once. But that couldn't have been what killed her, could it? Uh, we'll have to wait for ballistics to decide that. In the meanwhile, now, just for the record, since you were virtually offered the information... At the time of the murder, which was between 6 and 8 p.m. on the night of August 29th, do I understand that you are out of town to be more specific in Las Vegas, Nevada? Strictly off the record, I think I won't answer that question until I have found me a lawyer. J. Carr Justin and Associates. I'd like to talk to Mr. Justin. Oh, may I ask who's calling? This is Dr. Samuel Grant. Could you hold just a moment, Doctor? Uh, let me check if Mr. Justin is in the office. What is it, Sandy? Oh, a hot one. Dr. Samuel Grant, whose wife was just murdered. And who wants me to represent him, I presume? He didn't say so, but why else would he call? Are you in or out? What else can I be? He needs me. Because he's guilty? Now, who laid down that judgment? Oh, you read the papers, J.C., just like me. You know, everything points against this guy being innocent. Do I? And if it does, he still deserves the best legal defense he can find. That's basic lawyer's ethics. Mm. If he gets you, he's got it. Does he have you? Make an appointment for me to see him as soon as possible. Today, without fail. Yes, sir, boss. But me, I don't think he deserves you. <laughs> I'm Sandy Russell, Girl Friday to J. Carr Justin. I'm 25. I want a home, children, a happy marriage. But that's not what any girl could expect from Justin, especially not his Friday girl. Working for Justin is like 18 wild, exhilarating, exhausting hours every day. You either love him or hate him. No in between. He's tough, tenacious. And in his own way, tender, compassionate. Oh, he has to be. Because day in, day out, people put their lives in his hands. Guilty or innocent, he's their last best defense. So, Dr. Grant, you told the police that at the time of your wife's death, you were in Las Vegas? The attendant at the parking lot... Were you in Las Vegas? I had a speaking engagement. Where did you stay? Hmm? Stay? You spent overnight there. What hotel? Oh... It's silly. I don't recall some motel. It should be... Uh, how did you get to the motel? Well, how does anyone get to a motel? By car. Only yours was parked in the Los Angeles airport, remember? Uh, well, I could have gone by cab or rented a car. Sure, but if you went by cab, the motel would remember if you managed to remember the name of it. And if you rented a car, it'd be a simple matter to check. Whose side are you on, mine or the police? If I represent you, yours. I'm just giving you a little taste of the kind of questioning that you're going to have to face up to, either from the police or prosecuting attorney. I see now it wouldn't hold up. That's better. Now, what is true, Doctor? I was there when my wife was murdered. Was shot. Did you shoot her? No. Who did? I don't know. Were you alone when it happened? No, there was someone with me. Who? My ex-secretary, Cheryl Stafford. The medical meeting was only an excuse to fly to Vegas and see her. You're in love with her? We intend to be married. But my wife won't... Uh, wouldn't give me a divorce. Mm -hmm. How much of this have you told the police? None of it. I used the alibi. I mean, about my car. That was childish. Why? Well... I was afraid of how it would look. If, I mean, Barbara, that's my wife, and I have been having trouble. I didn't want to sue for divorce in California because it might disturb a loan I was negotiating. And there's the problem also of community property. 
But in spite of that, she had started soup. That's why I was there the night before last with Cheryl to ask her to be reasonable and not ruin all of us. If you didn't shoot her, Doctor, who did? Miss Stafford? Good Lord, no. I want you to represent Cheryl. Both of us. We're innocent. Can Miss Stafford testify to the fact that you are? You can ask her yourself. She's waiting in the car downstairs. But you don't have to. Or for me to testify for her. Why not? Because there were two shots. One, my wife fired at me. The other came from another gun and hit her in the back. I swear to you, I'm innocent. Doctor, how much did you say to the police? Nothing beyond claiming the alibi. All right. If you want me to, I'll represent you. But I must warn you, Doctor, that if it goes to trial, I'll be expensive. How much is expensive? Well, if you're not indicted, nothing. If it goes to trial, my expenses and $50,000. You're right. You're not cheap. Neither is life, Doctor. Like you, I hope I'm an expert at preserving it. Jay Carr, Justin, and Associates. Uh, just Jay Carr will do, honey. You can tell him it's District Attorney Herman on the wire. Yes, sir, Mr. Herman. Just one moment. Give. Al Herman on the line. He sounds particularly smug today. Always a bad sign. Put him on. Mr. Justin will talk to you now, Mr. Herman. Thank you. Hello? Al? Well, I just thought you'd like to know the grand jury handed down indictments against your clients, Dr. Grant and Ms. Stafford. I'm just having warrants issued against them both for first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Now, you know that's going to be a waste of time, Al. You don't say. I just did. Ballistics showed that Mrs. Grant was killed with a bullet from a gun other than the one on the scene of the crime. That gun has disappeared, Al. Without it, you have no case. You wouldn't want to bet on that, would you? I'm not a betting man. It's just as well. I've got a nice little surprise to spring on you just for once. See you in court. Al? What's he got, J.C.? Search me. I'm more worried about what I may have got. What? Like they say, a bull by the tail. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the crime is laid out, and you have met all the principal characters, some of them very briefly. Motive is established. Opportunity, in a sense, and a wavering finger points at Dr. Grant and his inamorata, Cheryl Stafford. Or both. Or since the vital link is missing, the weapon, perhaps to someone else as yet unidentified. I shall return shortly with Act Two. The awful suspense of a murder trial has begun. The wheels once set in motion cannot be halted until a jury renders a verdict. A woman is dead, her life snuffed out by unnatural causes. The whole organization of society demands that an explanation or some vindication of her ceasing to live must be forthcoming. Judge Ellen B. Prince presiding, the trial has begun and is in progress. The district attorney is questioning Lieutenant Kinsella on the stand. Uh, Lieutenant... May we return to your description of the crime? Or rather, I should say, what your investigation that night of the 29th of August and subsequent follow-up investigations revealed. Uh, yes, sir. In response to a phone call from a Miss Trenum at 3349 Ventura Boulevard, West Covington, Central sent out a Code 11. Sergeant Barracini and his partner, Patrolman Kaufman, were first on the scene. Responding to a general bulletin on Murder 1... I arrived there myself early in the morning of the 30th, about uh, 4 a.m. And what did you discover, Lieutenant? The body of a woman, identified as Mrs. Barbara Grant, was lying before the garage door, a revolver lying near her right hand. Had this revolver been fired? Yes, sir. Once. Uh, Did the bullet discharged result in the death of Mrs. Barbara Grant? No, sir. What was the cause of death? 
Uh, as a result of a uh, ballistics check, subsequently a slug from a thirty-eight revolver, uh, almost certainly a police positive. Was this gun found at the scene of the crime? No, sir. Has it been found anywhere else since? No, sir. Is it not true, Lieutenant Kinsella, that at your request, the Police Department of Records and Licenses substantiated the fact that two years ago, a permit was issued to a Dr. Samuel Grant. He was entitled to carry a gun? That is correct, sir. Just one more question, Lieutenant. The type of slug which killed Mrs. Barbara Grant did come from a police positive thirty-eight. Oh, Oh, absolutely. And it could have come from this particular weapon. Not you, know, you don't have to answer that. The question was really unnecessary. Your witness, Counselor. Well, let's complete that question, Lieutenant Kinsella. Could the slug have come from this particular weapon? Uh, what weapon is that, Mr. G? Ah, but that's just the point, isn't it, Lieutenant? This particular weapon is only a theoretical one, isn't it? Well, I, uh, I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. Well, I have no tricks, Lieutenant. I have nothing up my sleeve. I'm merely trying to establish that this phantom gun is not established. It exists at the moment only as a speculation, an inference drawn from a bullet that caused the death of Mrs. Grant. Is that not correct, Lieutenant? Uh, yes, sir. It's correct as far as it goes. Substantially, but... what you have in mind, Lieutenant, is that the death bullet could have been fired from exactly the sort of gun that the defendant, Dr. Samuel Grant, was licensed to own and carry. That is just what I meant. Uh, well, we can go into that a little later. Uh, a couple of more questions, if you will, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, the gun that was found by Mrs. Grant had been fired. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Once. What caliber was that? A uh, thirty-two, sir. Was that bullet found? Yes, sir, in the back wall of the garage. And the bullet from her thirty-two was fired in the direction of Dr. Grant, uh -huh. who was inside the garage at the yeah. time? Yes, sir, yes, sir. But there were definitely two shots. Well, of course, sir, there was one right after another. The, uh, <clears throat> the maid in the house heard them. Where was Mrs. Grant shot? In what part of her body? She was shot in the back. In the back? Thank you very much, Lieutenant. That's really all I need. That's what Justin does that is so great. He meanders around, gets everyone cooled off and relaxed, and then whams home a zinger that makes the jury sit up, and that stays planted in their minds. It's like a, a baseball game, a trial, inning after inning, each side striking out or, or scoring, like Justin just did. Uh, doctor, I asked you to describe the events of the night of the 29th leading up to the death of your wife. All right, to the best of my ability. My wife, against an agreement I thought we had, had taken action to sue me for divorce. I called her from Las Vegas and asked her to reconsider, and we had made a date to meet that evening. In your own words, could you tell us what happened when you arrived? Uh, I can try. Cheryl... Uh, Miss Stafford and I had driven there in her car. We parked at the downhill parking lot and walked up the two blocks to my... I mean, to Barbara's house. Why didn't you just drive up and park in the drive? Well, that's difficult to explain. The house is perched on the side of a hill. A cliff, really. The driveway is difficult to maneuver. So I built this parking space on our property just below. Unless you were planning to drive into the garage itself, we usually left our cars there. Your own car? Your own house? My wife and I were separated. Pending a divorce agreement, it was her house. You considered it then? I was willing to grant her that privilege. After you and Miss Stafford had walked up to the garage, what did you find? Well, there was no one home. I had still had my keys, and I had just let Miss Stafford and myself in when my wife drove up. We'd come in the back door, and it was just at dusk, so I didn't bother to put on any lights. Cheryl and I just went through the inner door to the garage about the same time as Barbara opened the garage sliding door. Huh? Who's that? Who is it? It's me, Barbara. Sam. What are you doing here? You don't belong here anymore. Now, you know we made a date tonight to talk over the divorce. You did, not me. Who's that with you? I said I'd bring Cheryl along. You get that slow. 
out of my house and off my property. Barbara, put that gun away. Run, Cheryl, run. Give me the gun, Barbara. I'll give you what you deserve, you cheating, lying. No, you're wrong. Are you crazy? Uh, no. 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 Uh, uh, uh. down behind the lawn tractor and the garden tools. Even with the headlights on, I couldn't see anything. All I knew was there was a, a second shot and that Barbara had been hit. I went to her right away. Was the gun still in your hand? W- w- what gun? Someone shot your wife. If it wasn't you, are you suggesting it was Miss Stafford? What? No. I, I mean, well, I don't... I didn't even know where Miss Stafford was at the time. I see. So you went to your wife and then... What happened, Barbara? Are you all right? And did she reply? Yes, she... She, she said... I, I love you. I should have listened to you. Take care of the children. Your son and daughter? Yes. Who were not home at this time? No, they were away at school. There was no one in the house? Uh, yes, uh, a maid, uh, Miss Trenum. I could hear her moving, and I imagine calling the police. And then what happened? I panicked. I'm sure you did. What did you do in your panic? I ran down the hill to the parking lot. Where you found Miss Stafford waiting for you? Yes. With the gun? What gun? The gun that shot your wife. Cheryl had no gun. Then you had it. What did you do with it? Objection, Your Honor. The district attorney is obviously trying to put words into the mouth of the defendant. Not quite, Mr. Justin. But I do feel, Mr. Herman, you have not established the existence of the gun up to this point. Well, may I say it doesn't matter, Your Honor. The bullet that lodged in Mrs. Grant's heart has established that such a gun existed. Your witness, Mr. Justin. Mr. Grant. I beg your pardon, Dr. Grant. Can I take you back for a moment to the night of May the 14th? Would you be good enough to tell the court what took place at your home on Ventura Boulevard? Uh, Both my wife and myself were away. It was Miss Trenum. The maid's night out. We were robbed. Mm -hmm. Now, I have here a certified list from the insurance company of all the things that were taken. The stereo equipment, uh, TV sets, jewelry, etc. Among those items is one very relevant one. Was a 38 caliber police positive revolver also removed? Yes, sir. And did you immediately, in the course of the insurance investigation, notify the police of that fact? I did. And did you subsequently seek a license for a new gun of any sort? Not for myself. By that time, I... I was in the course of separating from my wife. Since she was afraid of being in the house alone, I arranged to get one for her and have it licensed. The thirty-two, which is an exhibit here, and with which she fired the bullet at me. And you have no knowledge who might have fired the bullet that killed your wife? No, sir. Could it have been Miss Stafford? Why would you suggest that? Your wife was shot in the back. You were facing her, were you not? Yes, but... Good Lord, Cheryl was scared to death of firearms. She didn't know anything about guns. She's the last person who could have been responsible for my wife's death. I have no further questions. Thank you, Doctor. But there were. The DA went after Dr. Grant on redirect, tooth and nail. And worse than that. Oh, I've been around court long enough to know that when Cheryl Stafford got on the fence, she was in for hell. Most of all, I couldn't understand J.C., You work for a man long enough, love him too much, like me, and you know too much about him not to know he wasn't putting out his best effort here. I called him on it. Alexandra, don't ask questions. That's my business. (laughs) I get the put down. Anytime you call me Alexandra. Oh, but I can't let it go, J.C. All right, all right. Now, look, we're skating on a lot of thin ice, and I am supposed to be advocate, not judge. Now, why don't you just leave me be and let what is to be to take its natural course? Okay. If you think your clients are guilty, do you? I have a basic rule to try and consider my clients innocent. Oh, but the way things are going, you're going to lose. Well, that's a very absolute term. It's the way it's going. Like, well, if things go now, one of them killed Mrs. Grant. Well, and since she was shot in the back, it's Cheryl Stafford. 
But it's still collusion, and both of them are guilty. That's the way it may look, my love. But not enough hard facts to pin it down. That should worry Al Herman. But you notice that it doesn't. He still has something big to hit us with in this case. So, let's go grab some dinner and some personal life. Hmm? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder about you. Whether you care. About winning? No. About how you win. And if it's right that you do. Sandy, you have to make your own judgments on that like anyone else. Everything in its time. Let's wait until all the cards are in. As J. Carr Justin knows from experience, there is no drama more tense, more uncertain in its outcome than the arena of the courtroom. And no theater in which the incredible surprise... The shocking factor that follows no law of dramaturgy simply pops up to turn upside down all the facts which have gone before. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it will be with some startling new evidence that I return with Act Three. Everyone in the trial, of course, was waiting for the appearance of the femme fatale, the other woman, Cheryl Stafford. But before her appearance, the surprise witness suddenly appeared on the chair, a witness guilelessly introduced by Cheryl's brother, who was testifying as a character reference for his sister, a witness named William Aloysius Brody. Not often J. Carr Justin is blindsided, but this time he was, and the D.A. had set his trap well. William Brody was a complete surprise to us and to the jury. Just listen to the unflappable muscle man on the stand in the midst of the story he had to tell. Mr. Brody, you actually discussed murder with Cheryl Stafford? You called it, ma'am. And she named the victim? Yeah. Miss Grant, Dame. Well, I must admit that I'm caught a little out of my depth here, but uh, would you describe in your own words just what you mean? Well, it's no big deal. Like I say, I'm at this party, and a kid I know named Stafford gives me the big intro to his sister here. Her. So who's going to back off? She's a real good-looking dame, and one thing leads to another, and I get an invite to come up to her apartment like the next night. Did you go? Why not? What kind of guy pass it up? Please continue your story. Well, I rigged myself out in some fancy threads, figuring this is a score, and I ain't got no reason to change my mind when she opens the door. I mean, she's like you say, undressed for action. And the welcome sign is out. It's a big hello, a big drink, and this kid is yeah, I, I think the picture is graphic enough. Uh, suppose you just tell us simply and directly what happened. Can I get you some more to drink? Uh, no, babe. I'm coasting easy now. Uh, your kid brother told me you want a favor. Uh, that's right. Try me. I deliver. Uh, supposing I was to tell you I want someone... I, I mean, I... I want mm. someone out of the way. Out of the way? <laughs> you mean total? Wiped out? I mean killed. Dead. Okay. You don't have to draw pictures, just name numbers. How much? Say, $2,000. Oh, oh, you got to be kidding. I wouldn't touch it for under a five. I haven't... I, I mean, I, I don't think I could raise that much. Uh, who's a pigeon, anyway? Well, if I tell you, can we make a deal? 3000 is my top figure. It's all I've got. All I can get. Yeah. So we got a deal. Give me a name. Her name is Grant. Barbara Grant. She's married to my ex-boss. But it wouldn't be hard. They're separated and she lives alone. So leave the bread on me. Two thousand advance. Third on delivery. You actually contracted to kill Mrs. Grant? <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> This was all con as far as I was concerned. Did she pay the money? I took the money in blue. 
I was only doing her kid brother a favor. But you took money and promised a killing. Look, uh, her, that uh, Cheryl Stafford says to me, Mrs. Grant has given us a bad time, causing us a lot of grief. Now, if you don't take care of her, Sam will have to do it himself. So I wanted to make her feel better. And when the date came, you were supposed to deliver. What happened when nothing happened? I gave it the wide-eyed act. I said I took her out with a shotgun in the chest and I hid her behind the convent. <laughs> and what was her reaction? Well, I never saw her so happy. Then she calls us Dr. Grant and he levels with her. His wife is still alive and kicking. What was Miss Stafford's reaction? She said, you must have shot somebody else. And you said? Maybe I goofed. If I made the wrong hit, I'll go back and do it again. But I need more money. And Miss Stafford said? There isn't any more money. This time, we'll handle it by ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Brody. No more questions. Your witness, Counselor. Oh, no, Mr. Herman. Not mine. You turned over your own rock to produce this specimen. You know better than to make a remark like that, Counselor. My mind does, Your Honor. My throat just threw it up involuntarily. Are you courting a mistrial by exhibiting prejudice towards a witness? My apologies to the court. Do you intend to cross-examine? I think not, Your Honor. I would prefer to wait for Miss Stafford's side of the story. Uh, perhaps just, uh, one or two questions. The witness is yours. Would you repeat your name, please? Uh, Brody. William Brody. Mm. William Aloysius Brody? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, man, I dropped the middle go-around in high school. You also dropped your other names? What other name? Well, don't be alarmed. If you have any aliases, I don't know about them. I just mean the various public nicknames that people have hung on you, such as Dream Man and the Treasure Chest. Oh, yeah, cool it, will you? Cool it, man. Everybody has his own bag. I like to build up the body, right? Anything wrong in that? To each his own. By the way, what did you say uh, that you do for a living, Mr. Brody? I did. Would you now? Well, this and that, you know, man, I hang loose. No big deal. Oh, I think you're much too modest, Mr. Brody. I have here a list. Dance hall bouncer, shill, candy butcher, beach boy. But I don't mean all of these. I mean your real profession, since gigolo and ladies' man are a little out of style. What shall we call you, a professional stud? Objection, Your Honor. Objection. A sustained... Strike that last sentence from the record. Mr. Justin, I am tempted to fine you in contempt of court. You know you cannot discredit a witness without objective proof. Your Honor, respectfully, it is my contention that the witness has already discredited himself. And when I bring Miss Stafford to the stand, he will be even further discredited. So at last it was the defense's turn. And finally, Cheryl Stafford was on the stand. Small and slight. Very pretty in a quiet way. Somehow defenseless. To try to puncture the obvious effect she had on the audience and jury, the DA tore into her mercilessly. And you were not ashamed to face the woman whose husband you had stolen? No. Sam, Dr. Grant had already left his wife before I... The... Before we fell in love. Why didn't you drive straight up to the house? But Sam, explain that. You didn't use that way to approach the house with the object of surprising Mrs. Grant? Well, why should we? She was expecting us. To discuss divorce? Yes. Then will you tell me why it was necessary for Dr. Grant to take his bag up to the house with him? He wasn't making a house call, was he? No, but... Well, well now, were you aware that that bag contained, along with the expected items you might think of... A hank of rope, rubber gloves, a butcher's knife, and a box of cartridges. Perhaps even a gun, which was missing, of course, by the time the police found the bag abandoned in the garage. Wouldn't you say that was less a doctor's bag than a murder kit? Objection, Your I Honor. withdraw the question. Now, uh, let's skip to the moment Mrs. Grant arrives and takes out a gun and fires at her husband. What did you do? I, I, I ran. Just as hard as I could, the way Sam told me to. And did you stop to see what was happening before and at the moment the fatal shot was fired? Did Dr. Grant run and duck? 
could someone else have approached and fired the shot into Mrs. Grant's back? I don't know. I, I, I don't Only know. Only you admit the possibility, can't you? Perhaps even a probability that it could have been you who returned and fired that fatal shot to protect your lover and to carry out the scheme you were both agreed upon before you went there that evening of the 29th. To kill the only thing that stood in the way of your happiness and your future, since you couldn't hire someone successfully to kill her, didn't you and Dr. Grant, by one means or another, carry out her death sentence yourself? The coil of rope was only some leftover line that Dr. Grant had used to secure a bumper on his boat. Yes. And the so-called butcher knife was a simple kitchen all-purpose knife which Dr. Grant had bought because you needed it to cut bread and prepare salads and so on. Yes. It wasn't even that big. Couldn't be less important. And the rubber gloves, I think, of course, are self-explanatory. Just one question. Why did he lug that bag up the hill? Because when he talked to his wife, she said she was having her migraine headaches again. He thought he might have something to relieve them. All right, let's move to another field for a moment. You've heard the testimony of William Brody... I have. Was he telling the truth? Mr. Brody is a liar. If you want the real truth of what happened in our interview, here it is. Well, here I am, babe. Let's break out the booze and get the party going. This is no party, Mr. Brody. You were recommended to me by my brother. Uh, count on me. I delivered. Uh, I'm embarrassed about this. I, I don't quite know how to say it. Hey, 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 don't run a fever. I'll lay it out. You want a dame compromised enough to make a case for her husband to sue for divorce. Huh? I'm ashamed to say you're right. <clears throat> that could run in a real dough, you know. Well, who's the dame? Her name is Grant. She lives alone. Hmm. It's going to run five big ones. Five thousand? Mm hmm. Well, I haven't got that much. Three thousand is the best. It's the most I could raise. Mm hmm. No, okay, if that's what the traffic will bear, you got a deal. You paid him? Yes. But he just took the money without... Delivering. You hated what you felt you had to do, didn't you? Oh, yes. Then how could you have done it? Attempt to compromise a woman as decent and vulnerable as you are. Because Barbara Grant wasn't like that at all. She was cold and hard and calculating. She didn't want Sam for herself. She was just determined that no other woman should have him. She hadn't allowed him to touch her in over two years. She wasn't a woman, just a machine. And if that was the only way Sam could get his freedom, I was willing to take it. Because he's the gentlest, kindest man in the world. I love him. One more question. Did you shoot Barbara Grant? Mr. Justin, I wouldn't even know how to fire a gun. Thank you, Miss Stafford. The defense rests. The jury's been out three hours, J.C. What do you think? Mostly at a time like this, I try not to. Oh, I wish I could make my mind a blank. Why? <laughs> Because I love you, and I don't know why you took this case. Now, and don't give me the lawyer's ethics line again. Everyone is entitled to a defense. You know he's guilty as hell. Do I? Yes. And how do I feel about her? Well, that's not so easy. Excuse me. Yeah. They're coming out? Okay, we'll be right there. Oh, the jury has a verdict? Yep. Well, what do you think it'll be? All right, ladies and gentlemen of the radio jury. What was your verdict? Was the stolen gun just a cover for Dr. Grant to have a weapon to kill his wife? Did they struggle so that she was shot in the back? Did Cheryl fire the fatal shot? Or did the incredible Mr. Brody decide to earn his money by coincidence that evening? It's your decision. Who killed Barbara Grant? I might add that this was an actual case. Only the names and some locations changed. So you were guessing at an actual result. A hung jury. Oh, then you lost. Well, that depends on the point of view. Now, he conned me into representing both of them. 
I had to fight for Dr. Grant as hard as I could to save a trusting if stupid little girl who gave her love not wisely but too well. Oh, but in saving her, you got him off. No, no. No, no. They'll be tried again. This time separately. And this time I will represent only one. Miss Stafford. Without her as a shield, he'll be convicted. She won't get out of it clean. We all have to pay for mistakes. But at least she won't have to share the death chamber with him. Three months later, Dr. Grant broke on the stand and admitted that he had taken advantage of the robbery at his house to pretend the gun was one of the articles stolen. He had had it with him in the murder kit bag. And in struggling with his wife, as she had turned to flee, he had deliberately shot and killed her. He got life imprisonment. Cheryl was convicted as an unwitting accessory after the fact. She was sentenced to a two-year term, but released on probation. On the basis of the facts, would your verdict have been the same? I'll be back shortly. How does a nice young woman like that get mixed up with a man like Dr. Samuel Grant? One of the oldest questions in the world, which people have been trying to answer since time began. A few of them, love is blind. To a more than woman to be wise, or perhaps to wind things up, a quote from Mr. Thackeray. Every single woman I ever knew is a puzzle to me, as I have no doubt she is to herself. With no apologies to women's lib, it's the way of the world. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Leon Janney, Ken Harvey, E.V. Jester, Joan Shea, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tonight's Mystery Theater was brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program is furnished by CBS Radio. I'm E.G. Marshall, plenipotentiary from that mysterious realm whose major exports are terror, mystery, and the macabre. In silence can man most readily preserve his integrity. Or, to put it another way, no one ever got into trouble by keeping his mouth shut. Test the premise for yourself. What has brought you the most grief? Speech or silence? Our mystery drama, The Framis, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Listerine Lozenges and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. are told, shall inherit the earth, but not, however, in the immediate future. And so, at this point in time, and until further notice, the meek shall have the usual tough sledding. Well, that's how it goes. Today, we shall tell you a little fable about the meek, and because it's a fable, we'll have it take place in a mythical kingdom. Therefore, for your benefit, we have created one called the United Kingdom of Limbovania. Our hero is named Gerard. He is a jeweler. He's very good. 
but he is very poor. Do you know why? Because he is a philosopher. Did you ever hear of a rich philosopher? There is a law that says that not only must philosophers be poor, they must also have cross, querulous wives. Well, it's very late at night, and Gerard is alone at his workbench, holding aloft a magnificent silver cup, which he has just crafted. And he is making a speech to an imaginary audience. Yes, he's that kind of person. Fellow citizens of Limbovania, I appear on this national television network to set your minds at rest and your hearts at ease. Though I have been besieged by envoys from the Louvre in France, the Prado in Spain, the Metropolitan in America, this magnificent silver cup that I have just created shall remain here at home. This does not mean that I support our corrupt and oppressive monarchy. This does not mean that I have now joined the lifeless, bloodless, decadent charlatans at the Royal Academy. Well, you're giving everybody their lumps tonight, aren't you? Oh, I... I thought you were asleep. Uh, what's that thing? This? Mm. It's a silver loving cup. Uh, so, that's what you were working on. I might have known. All these nights, I listened to the hammer. Ah, I say to myself, maybe he's seen the light. Maybe he'll make something he can sell. Why do you make things like this, this cup? Because I find it... Who asked you to make it? No one. Who's going to buy it? Nobody. Then what's the point? What are you after? Immortality. What? Immortality. Oh. In this cup, I make my statement. Oh, forget it. In this cup, I say, look, world, here in precious metal... Forget it. But I want you to understand. I don't want to understand. But when you don't understand a person, you may grow to hate him. Settle for that. Because when you do understand a person, you may want to kill him. Oh, what was that? What was what? That, that, that terrible noise. That... My dear, what is it? Gerard. Look there. What? But what is it? So- Sophie. Sophie, what, what are you? Don't say another word. Look. Look at this. Where did you find that? I, I happened to glance over to the window. That that crack of thunder smashed it a few moments ago, and it was lying there on the floor beside the broken window. It it was lying there, just lying there on the floor. Let, let me have it. Oh, isn't it absolutely the, the biggest, the brightest, the shiniest, most brilliant diamond in the whole world? Yes. I, I must look at it. Oh, look at it. Examine it. Yes, yes. How, how much is it worth? Oh. Tell me, tell me. All right, all right, I'll be quiet. I won't say a word while you examine it. You're the craftsman, the master, the genius. Oh, what do you think? Five hundred? A thousand? What am I talking about? Five thousand? I bet I'm not even close. It's, it's your reward. Your reward for being honest and sincere and idealistic. The good Lord does something like this now and then. He has to. A million dollars. It must be worth a million dollars. Amazing. Fantastic. What sparkle. What light. What fast. What color. What a spectacular configuration. What's it worth? Oh. What's it worth? What's it worth? Nothing. It's a piece of glass. No. I admit it's a remarkable piece of glass, oh, but... But just see how it shines. It's, it's all fire and ice. How can you say it's a piece of glass? Well, let me give you the scientific explanation. No. Glass breaks all the time. I don't want to hear it. And once, just once, every 54 trillion times, does a piece of glass break exactly the way this one did. Wives well, kill their husbands for less. You see, it broke along the full furation of the guideline of serenity instead of splitting in the ordinary way down the altercation of the plumb line of stress. You follow us? Wives shoot, stab, strangle their husbands. And the result is called a framus. With a good lawyer, she's home free. So ask me, what's the remarkable thing about a framus? Huh? I still have enough appeal for a jury. The remarkable thing 
is that only I can tell it's a Framus. Any other jeweler would pronounce this a, a diamond. What, what do you mean, only you can tell it's a Framus? Because only I have done the research. I am the trailblazer, the discoverer, the pioneer in a brand new, so far unknown science of Framisometry. Oh, well then, Angel, were you to put that into a gold or a platinum setting, it, it, it would look exactly like a diamond ring? Well, sure. I don't believe it. It's impossible. <laughs> impossible? You're talking to the man with a finger's watch. Huh? Yeah, see how I do it? Just a touch. Now a tap. Now a twist. Turn. Tighten. Half. And here it is. Fit for the finger of a king. Oh, magnificent. I'll upprint a sign. Beautiful diamond ring for sale. Sweetheart, you cannot sell this as a diamond. Why not, beloved? Because, precious, it's not a diamond. Who's going to know the difference? I will. Oh, it would be so easy to call this a diamond. And I'm tempted. That's why you must help me. Help you do what? Help me withstand temptation. Help me keep my honor. I'll do nothing of the kind. Sophie, every man's integrity is tested once in his life. Well, how do you know this is the test? This is a Framus, and it's a fraud. Oh. Well, in that case, there's only one thing a man of honor can do. Destroy it. Destroy it. Well, as a man whose integrity is being tested, you have no other choice. All around you are the means of destruction. Acid. Dissolve it. Fire. Burn it. Or pick up your hammer and smash it to powder. I can't. After all, it's a, it's a lovely thing. Oh, it surely is. I don't have to sell it. Mm -mm. I can keep it and enjoy it myself. Of course. And so... To bed. Oh, good morning, Gerard, baby. Let's make love. Please, don't talk like that, Marissa. Oh, why not? I'm a married man. Well, that's why you need loving. I haven't looked at another woman since I've been married. Oh, you're overdue. Marissa, why don't you find a nice young man? Why don't you come with me? Come with you? Where? Where all the action is. Let's go to the capital. Let's go to Autoclay City. Marissa. A man of your genius. Well, you're wasted on these peasants. Oh, and so am I. Nobody really appreciates me here either. What a team we could make. You're the fingers, I'm the frame. You could become the king's jeweler. I could become the king's mistress. What? Well, do you doubt your ability? No. Then don't question mine. Somebody gets to be his mistress. Just like somebody gets to be his doctor, his lawyer, his barber. Marissa, I'm busy. Oh, no. I remember why I came in. A cute lieutenant will be in here any minute. Who? No, oh, I don't know who. He's drilling his men in the square. Couldn't keep his eyes off me. I'll, um, sell him that bracelet. I've always liked it. How do you know he'll come in here to buy you something? Am I ever wrong? Marissa, how will you end up? In the same way you will. Dead. Well. Oh, oh, good day, sir. I'll uh, see you uh, later, Gerard. Uh, uh, what's her name? Marissa. Marissa. I tell you, Citizen Gerard, I have fallen madly in love with Marissa. Please, Lieutenant, be kind to her. Have I ever been unkind to anyone? Have I ever used the privilege of my noble birth to abuse my inferiors? Now, what have the two of you arranged for me to buy her? Oh, uh, now you have necklaces, bracelets, brooches, rings, so many old familiar things. And the ladies always sell them back to you, don't they? <laughs> well, my friend, this is my final go-round. You see before you the last Baron Melvin, the final withered branch of the dead family tree. Oh, come now, Lieutenant. The house of Melvin shall be no more. I have squandered the last of the family fortune. And here, these few coins. All that remains for the final thing. It's, uh, it'll have to be something modest. Yeah, yes, I know, I, I know. I have here a, a bracelet. Yeah, Citizen Gerard. They're small, yes, but uh, quality. Citizen Gerard. Uh, that, that, uh, What are you looking at? That ring. 
I must have that ring. But uh, it's not a ring. It's not a ring? Well, yes, it's a it's a ring, but it's not a diamond ring. The stone you see is a framis. A what? A piece of glass. A piece of glass. A piece of uh, That's a lie. It's true. The, the setting, it's genuine platinum. Oh, yes. And real gold. Purest gold. And you always surround a worthless piece of glass with precious platinum and purest gold. Please, I was just... So you were just what? I was just about to destroy it. If it's displayed in your shop, you are required to sell it. That's the law. There's no such law. It's just been passed. It's a piece of glass. Say that again, and I shall run my sword through you. Oh, please, Lieutenant. Tell him to sell me the ring. Oh, sell him the ring. I can't pay for it now, but I will one day. Please, put away your sword. Well, whatever it's worth, a hundred, a thousand, a million. Sell him the ring. But I don't want to cheat him. The ring. He thinks it's a diamond. He'll kill you. The ring. How can I convince him? Give him the ring. But I... Take it, Lieutenant. Here, take it. Now, put away your sword, please. Yeah. <laughs> the ring. Is my ring. Send the bill to the house of Melvin. Hello, citizens. The house of Melvin has risen. The house of Melvin has risen. of Melvin has risen again. Indeed. And Lieutenant Melvin accepts the plaudits of the multitude, as all are blinded with adoration for the brilliant ring on his finger. And the adoring mob carries him on their shoulders into one shop after another, and soon he is costumed in splendor from head to foot, as befits the scion of the House of Melvin. But how high can the House of Melvin possibly rise? You'll be here when I return in just a few moments with Act Two. Well, now, as we proceed with our fable, the principal square in the provincial city has never seen such a celebration. They are lionizing Lieutenant Melvin, who only this morning was a ruined and penniless aristocrat. But now, it's plain to see the house of Melvin has risen again. For on Melvin's finger, there gleams a ring of surpassing brilliance. And so the bells are chiming, and the folk are shouting, and the wine is pouring, and the bands are playing, and all is pandemonium. Except in the shop of our friend Gerard. No. But so Don't you set foot out of the shop. He must know the truth. What truth? That ring, it's only a piece of glass. Oh, mind your business. But he's under the impression that Forget it's... Forget it. It's only a promise. Now what's happening? Where? Look through the window. What do you see? Well, what do you mean, what do I see? I, I see the crowds. But it's quiet. Suddenly it's quiet. No one is saying a word. Yes, it, it is. It, it, it's quiet. And see there. A big, important-looking officer has just put his hand on Lieutenant Melvin's shoulder. Oh, the officer's saying something. Open the door. What's he saying? Lieutenant Melvin. Yes, what can I do for you, my man? You're under arrest. Uh, under arrest? Me? Sergeant. Seize him. Oh, you, you can't do this to me. I've, I've done nothing wrong. Get, get your hands off me. I'm an officer, a nobleman, and a gentleman. I, I have rights. What's the charge? What's the charge? You, you you can't just throw me into prison. No, notify my colonel. I demand to see my colonel. Oh, stop the shouting. Oh, Colonel Ramrod, I'm saved. Lieutenant Melvin, I shall read to you the verdict of the court-martial. Court-martial? Well, what uh, court-martial? Who's court-martial? Your court-martial. The accused, Lieutenant Baron Melvin, having been found guilty as charged, shall be hanged by the neck until he is dead. Signed, Millard Ramrod, Colonel Royal Cavalry presiding. But, but, but I, I, I don't remember any court martial. The court martial was duly convened, legally conducted, and arrived at its verdict in accordance with the law. Yes, but I wasn't there. That's not important. The verdict would still be the same. But that's not justice. If the court had acquitted you, 
Would that have been justice? Well, certainly. Well, and you're not complaining about justice, only about the verdict. But you can't hang an innocent man. I don't want you to hang, Lieutenant. Oh, thank you, sir. I should not like to see you disgraced on the scaffold. Oh, bless you, sir. Here's my pistol. Heaven will reward you, sir. Shoot yourself. Shoot myself. No! No, I, I tell you, I, I, I'm innocent. I have here your confession. I never signed any confession. It was signed for you. Oh, Melvin, stop fighting justice. Now just shoot yourself. Oh, please, Colonel. Look at yourself in that stolen finery. Why, that ring alone, that ring must be worth a fortune. Uh, that ring. Uh... Oh, you... You, you, you like the ring? <laughs> Take it. No, no, uh, no. Uh, uh, go on. I wish to leave. Stop. Stop, Colonel. Or I shall shoot you with your own pistol. I am not afraid to die. That's because you're afraid to live. You're afraid of life. That's why you vegetate here in this uh, provincial post. Oh, shut Colonel up. Colonel Ramrod, military scientist and global thinker. <laughs> and what are you to the brass in Autoclave City? A petty drill master. I order you to be quiet. The most brilliant officer in the army and you'll die without a general star. Buy one. Buy one. With this ring, you'll be able to buy one. Maybe I'll die without my general star, but I'll die with my honor. Oh, dear, Colonel, what is honor? Isn't the highest honor love for king and country, isn't it? Yeah. Doesn't the very life of the nation depend on the armed forces? I would it, say so. Isn't the safety of that country best preserved in your hands? I, uh... Doesn't it make it absolutely necessary, then, for you to become a general? Must well, certainly help. Don't fight fate, Colonel. I was meant to obtain this ring so that you might use it to save our country. Yes. Yes. They're all senile and shut in their ways. It's a such pool of intrigue. I must clean it out. <laughs> That's why you were born, Colonel. May I assist you in your holy mission? This ring. Ramrod? Never heard of him. But what does this bumpkin from the provinces want? Probably been saving his pennies for years, and he'll walk in with them all tied up in his handkerchief. But, uh, all right. I'll see him. It should be amusing. Colonel Ramrod, at your service, madame. I have come here to pay my respect to your husband, our great minister of war. You have come here to buy a general star. What do you offer me? What do I offer? I offer you myself. How dare you make such an offer? No, oh, you've been waiting for such an offer. Your days are spent in yearning for it, your nights in dreaming. For your information, I receive such offers every day. How do you? But when was the last one? When was the last time a man offered you his heart, his soul, his life, his honor, his hope for happiness in this world and salvation in the next? Oh, you expect me to believe that when I know I am no longer beautiful? I find you beautiful, Lurleen. Oh, madame, Lurleen. What interest could I have in love? I, I'm an old woman. No, not an old woman. An older woman. Just as I am an older man. Love was, was made for the young. No, no, no. To the young, love is strong liquor, but to people like us, love is fine wine. Old wine. We do not drink to slake the thirst. We only sip to delight the soul. Oh, all you want is your general star. I have not come here for your tinselly star. I love you. Listen. Ten years ago, you and your husband inspected the garrison of ground bags. I can't remember. Well, I can't forget. You wore a green suit, black shoes, a corsage of white roses. I always dress that way when I review the truth. The most unbecoming costume I ever saw. Oh. But I fell in love with you in spite of it. Oh, and you... You waited ten years to tell me? 
I waited ten years to find my courage. I waited ten years until I could find a gift worthy of the woman I love. This ring. Oh, oh no. No, I, I can't accept this. Take my ring. No, please. Please go. Why are you afraid to be a woman? Why are you afraid to love? I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Then I will place this ring on your finger. Oh, oh my general. My very own general. Oh, general. Oh, do, do, do you like my hair up this way? I wonder what my new assignment is to be. Oh, down. The war committee. And how shall I dress? Green. You, you fell in love with me in green. And my new duties. Oh, love me. Love me. Oh, darling, I, I want to be alone with you, but I want to show you off to everyone. I want you to be my secret, but I want everyone to know. What? Oh, darling, our love is enough for me. Oh, not for me. You shall be presented at court. You'll be a sensation in Autoclave City. Well, my darling, how do you like... Well, all that the king wants to do is listen to rock music. And the queen? <laughs> all she wants to do is find out who his latest mistress is. Ah, oh, that's obvious. Uh, that slim blonde girl. What's her name? Marissa? Oh, she's just his friend. That doesn't count. Do you know who his mistress is? <laughs> I don't think he has one. Well, I suppose he has. And the queen finds out. What will the queen do to her? Huh? She'll have her steamed. Steamed? Yes. That's why this place is called Autoclave City. One little mistake, and things get so hot for you. Now tell me, hmm? dearest Lurleen, why is the queen looking at you like that? Well, I don't know, but... But what? That's how she looks at people just before they get steamed. And now she's whispering to the king. Oh, if only I could hear what she's saying. Look what you quit bugging me, baby. I don't have no mistress. You do, you do. And I know who. I think you flipped your wig. Don't talk to me that way. I'm the king. I can talk any way I like. Oh, some king. This two by four and nickel and dime. Maybe if you spend less time with your mistress... Then you get off my back. I don't have no mistress. Oh, go figure. You go for an old bag like her. An old bag like who? And to my face. She's my best friend. What are you saying? The lady, Lurleen. Oh, you are out of it. I am? Look. Look at what? The ring. The ring on her finger. <laughs> who give her such a ring? Her 98-year-old husband... Hey, that, that ring. And who would dare wear such a ring court? Who would dare outshine the queen? Only the mistress of the king. You gave her that ring. Who the ring? To show me up. I'm going to have her steamed. Levi? Yes, your majesty. Steam her. I, I am going to be steamed. What does that mean? The whole court will turn on me, say things, accuse me, taunt me, bait me, harass me, until they destroy me. But why? I don't know. I do know. It's the ring. The ring? The queen. See? Look at her face. She thinks you're the king's mistress because you're wearing the ring. Oh, but I'm not. Look at the king's face. He can't take his eyes off the ring. Save yourself. Give him the ring. Oh, no. Can't you see the king wants that ring? Give him the ring before it's too late. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Uh, Lady Lurleen has an announcement to make. I have known our wonderful king since he was a child. I have watched him become a great king. And so... As a grateful and loyal subject, I wish to present him with this token of my esteem, this ring. The ring? Oh, thank you. That's 
Some ring, your majesty. Yeah. This ring, Marissa Berry. Hey, 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 hey. Well, well, what do you think this ring is worth? Oh, big, big money. There are diamonds, and then there are diamonds. Oh, oh. Some of them, no matter how big they are, they just lay there. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Oh, but this one, you can feel all that brilliance kind of explode like inside of you, yeah. huh? You know what I wanted to be ever since I was a kid? A king. Not just a king. Not some little scared slob of a king that fell into it. But a ruler. A mighty ruler of men. This, uh, this ring. What do you think it's worth? Oh, a fortune. You, you can feel it, see? You, you can feel the fire burn, the, the ice freeze. It got it appraised. Yeah, by who? The royal jewelers. Ah, those clowns. You know what they'll say? It's a precious gem beyond price. But I wonder... Oh, I wonder what it's really worth. Oh, it must be worth millions. If only I could find a real, honest jeweler. One who isn't scared to tell me the truth, Ryan. I, uh... I know a guy who couldn't tell a lie if his life depended on it. And what good is he to me if he's not a jeweler? He is a jeweler. The greatest jeweler in the world. Baby! What's his name? Gerard. <laughs> should have expected this development. Everything that goes up must come down. We go away only to come back. You knew eventually that we would have to return to our old friend Gerard. You also know the question he's going to be asked. Do you know the answer he's going to give? Want to bet? I shall return in just a few moments with Act Three. Now, uh, while you were gone, here's what's been happening in that mythical kingdom, the United Kingdom of Limbovenia. I can only say that there has been a miraculous transformation. It is no longer a sleepy little country. It has been transformed miraculously into a mighty nation, powerful in the councils of the world community. There has been a surge of energy and patriotism, and right now, the proud and happy Limbos are celebrating the first anniversary of the King's Ring and the apparently magical talisman that has sparked the great resurgence. And even Master Gerard seems to have caught the fever as he works frantically in his shop. What are you doing there? What do you think I'm doing, my dear wife? I'm making anniversary souvenirs. See these medals? You knock them out for a penny and you sell them for a pound. But, but they're junk. Oh, sure. You see how you do it? You line them up, you punch them out. But I... <laughs> and I got our kids out in the street with two big bagfuls. <laughs> we'll sell thousands of them. You, you see what they say? Big limbos on the march. Everybody buys one. Everybody wears one. Because how else can you prove you're a loyal, patriotic citizen? Oh, stop it. Come on, come on. Get your genuine, authentic pledge of loyalty to the emperor. Designed by the super-sensational House of Gerard. I said stop it. Why? You always wanted to be rich. I can't accept this. What's the matter? I, I don't like you this way. Cynical, scornful, sneering. That's successful. No. Hard, cruel, contemptuous. Was it better the old way, when I was stupid and we starved? Oh, please, Gerard, be kind, be sweet, the way you always were. You see the world dazzled by dishonesty, enchanted by incompetence, transfigured by trivia. You say, it cannot, it must not go on forever. But actually, it can. Obviously, it will. And perhaps it must. Why fight? Oh, this junk, what you're doing now, it's not you. It's a lie. I never sold anything in this shop that wasn't genuine. That isn't true. When did I ever sell anything that was a fraud? Pick up a magazine, any magazine. Why? Well, look at the magazines. What's being featured on every cover? Well, there's a king's ring. <laughs> they find out. How can they find out? What can they find out? I'm the only one who can tell. Oh, they have ways. The people with power, they have ways. They'll find out, and they'll hunt you down. Sophie, you must control yourself. A man, a hard-looking, cruel-looking, frightening man, will suddenly walk in here and ask, Are you Mr. Gerard? 
And when you say yes, he'll kill you. Sophie. Mr. Gerard. How did you get in here? Hey, you Mr. Gerard. He, he, he's not in. Are you, Gerard, baby? No, no, you're making a mistake. I'm oh, not... Aren't you glad to see me? It's Marissa. Marissa. Why did you betray me? Why do you want to kill me? Kill you? Honey, I'm going to make you. Make me what? Jeweler to the king. Jeweler to the king? Well, that's why we're here. Right, Leroy? Jeweler to the king. Where's Gerard? Where's my man Gerard? Your, your majesty. Brother Gerard. Hey, let me look in your eyes. Yeah, I see the truth. Eyes, Brother Gerard, are the mirror of the soul. And you simply cannot hide your honesty, your independence, and your integrity. Honesty, independence, integrity. Three reasons, Your Majesty, why I am a ruined man today. But I'm ready to reform. I'm eager to improve myself. I'm willing to learn. Now then, Gerard, old buddy, could you do me a little favor? Try me. Test me. Well, I, uh, I got this little item here, see? I wonder if you might just possibly tell me what it's worth. Uh, Your Majesty, this ring is, uh, it's, uh, absolutely unique. Come on, Gerard. We're not king and subject. We're friend and friend. Huh? The truth. Speak the truth. The truth? Yeah, just among buddies. What's it with? The truth? This is a framus. Yeah. What's a framus? A piece of glass. A piece? I beg your pardon, Gerard. You said... I said it was a piece of glass. You're positive? I'm positive. It don't look like a piece of glass. I know. Well, I'm no expert. But this looks like the world's most valuable diamond to and me. And yet it's the world's most ordinary glass. A piece of glass. <laughs> a worthless piece of glass. Leroy! Throw him in a cell. But, uh, but, I, but I told you the truth. You asked me for the truth. And tomorrow morning, shoot him. Jen. You beat me again, Leroy. Who invented this stupid game? Its origins are obscure. But we're probing the depths of remote antiquity. I have read monographs on the subject in ancient Sanskrit. Are you an historian? No. My doctorate is in nuclear physics. But what are you doing in that uniform? Practically all of us scientists work for the government. That's where it's at. As they say. Is that good? It's neither good nor bad. It's relative. Uh-huh. Now I'll knock. How many? Two. One. Ah, this is a pointless game. In many ways, is the story of your life. Gerard, I fixed it for you. The door is open. Walk out. Marissa, the king is letting me out? He was only joking? Well, all you have to do is say some words. What words? These words. Your Majesty, your ring is worth untold millions. But it isn't true. Well, nobody's asking you for the truth. All you're being asked for is some words. Just words. And the sun keeps shining, the grass keeps growing, the seas keep rolling. Words. Your Majesty, your ring is a precious gem beyond price. Its worth is untold millions. But that ring, it's a framus. Did I say no? Should you say no? Sure, say no. But up your sleeve to yourself. And never, never any louder than this. It's a framus. But you still don't understand. It is a framus. All right. Let me show you how you can even do business on that basis. Instead of, it is a framus. Say it was a framus. Is, was, they're the same word. All you did was change the, the, uh, the, the what, Leroy? The pants. Now, Marissa. It was a framus when you had it. God, let a little tense intervene, and things change, no? The caterpillar was. Butterfly is. And do you know what that humble little framus has become? No. It has become the state. The Royal Federated Union of the United Kingdom of Limbovania. Dig? Do you know what that silly framus has become? It has become... 
What word do I want, Leroy? A uh, status quo. The status quo. But that's it. We must change. We must reject the status quo. We must fight it. Change it. Reject it. Fight it. Change it. Why? It's great. What have you got to gain by changing it? What have I got to gain? Everything. Everything. You mean you'll get something out of it? Yes. Well, I've already got mine. When do you get yours? Later on. Later on? When? After I die. Oh, but then you get nothing. You're wrong. I get immortality. But you'll be dead. Naturally. You have to die to become immortal. So how can you enjoy it? You don't enjoy it. But then why do you want it? I need it. For what? To validate my principles. To prove I was right. Oh, you're a nut. Every man who's a hero in history was once a nut to his neighbors. A troublesome, quarrelsome, meddlesome nut. But I won't crack. I won't break. I'll denounce and defy them to the very end. They'll take my life, but they'll give me immortality. Immortality, yes. There will be a trial, and the sentence, and the execution. But even as the echoes of the shots fade away, there shall be another sound, another voice. And the people will know that they have been deluded and deceived by the frauds that rule them. And my name, my name, the story of my deeds and my defiance shall live forever. My grave shall become a shrine. You think so? And I shall be a legend. I don't think so. Let me tell you how it'll happen. Here, in your cell, you'll be alone with Leroy. And you'll get a thirty-eight caliber slug in the back of your neck. How can you say that? Leroy's a scientist. Scientists don't kill people. You'll never know what hit you. Neither will anyone else. A shrine. Who'll ever find you? They'll flush you down a sewer and poison the water. Or they'll broil you in a furnace and you'll pollute the air. No, oh, Marissa, help me. Oh, you'll die a hero. But a secret hero. An unknown hero. An unheard of hero. <laughs> Hey, would you just hold on there, Brother Gerard? And could you do an old buddy a little favor, huh? Look at this again and see if you can tell me what it's worth. I... I... Tell His Majesty what you see in there. But I don't see anything. Gerard, look again. Don't you see her? Who? Her. Please, Gerard, be kind. The way you always were. What do you see when you look in that gym? My wife, my children. What else do you see? The sun, the sky, the sea. Come on, Brother Gerard. What is this worth? Your Majesty, this ring is precious beyond price. It's worth untold millions. Oh, thank you, Gerard. Thank you. But it's a threatness. It's a threatness. Well, didn't Galileo say the same thing under his breath to the judges of the Inquisition? Nevertheless, it moves. Does this mean there is a time and place for everything in this world? There sure is. And if you don't believe me, check it out in the wonderful biblical book of Ecclesiastes. And wait for me. I'll be right back. A diamond is a piece of carbonized rock. And so is a piece of coal. If you were offered your choice of a sackful of each, which would you choose? Would you, really? Okay. Uh, now suppose you were offered that same choice in an isolated cabin, snowbound in the dead of winter, with the temperature at 30 below zero. Uh, you bet you would. You see, value is relative. And one of the few absolutes in life is the fact that you can depend on us each time at the same hour. 
Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Bryna Rayburn, Joan Shea, Ian Martin, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Listerine Lozenges. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. I don't suppose I'm alone in a fantasy I often have when I look at some paintings. A sleepy, quiet house among trees. A street that turns a corner behind the painted buildings. A dark, mysterious cave burnt like a smoking hole in the side of a bright, sun-drenched Arizona cliff. Well, uh, I could go on and on, but I won't. What all of them have in common is the tempting allure of dreaming that it might be possible to step into the frame and visit that house, round that corner, explore that cave. A tug so strong that it pulls you towards the canvas as though hypnotized. If you've ever had that feeling, or even if you haven't, this is what our story is all about. Watch that old man. He sits there. Like no one is there but him and that screwy painting. Don't leave him alone. The, the guy could be deaf or, or, or a mute. A, a museum is a place for a lot of people. It's like an escape. Uh, I get waves on this one. I think he's got to be watched. There's something eating him about that painting. And it's our job to protect it. mystery drama, Portrait of a Killer, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Wager. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The Fresnick Museum is not one of the world's great art collections, but it is surely one of the most eclectic, by which I mean the rich man who left it and his house to the city was extremely choosy about what he liked or disliked. It contains a wide-ranging potpourri of special and disparate gems, from a Rubens to a Paul Clay, from ancient Byzantine through the most literal of English 19th century painting to the Impressionists, the Cubists, and even a smattering of pop art. And, uh, most important to us, the only museum in the world in which hangs a W.H. Haskell, and thereby hangs our tale. Are you worrying about that picture again, Charlie? Darn thing haunts me. You know what I mean? Why don't they hang it in a better light? Mm, It's just the right light for a chiaroscuro, Charlie. Yeah, what? Uh, Italian word. Hmm. Here we go again. Just because your father was born in Florence, that makes you the big art expert. Cara, or whatever you said. Well, what's the word in plain English? Well, there isn't any. A chiaroscuro means, uh... Well, the arrangement or treatment of the light and dark parts in a work of art, whether color or black and white. Yeah, but this painting here ain't in black and white. No, it's a monochrome. A what? Well, like it's done in different tones of all one color, kind of green-like. Oh, yeah... Now that you mention it, that's what it is. All green and spooky and crawly like cheese mold. Charlie, you don't like the picture. Why do you moon around over it all the time? It ain't me. It's him. Who? The little guy who's been coming in the last couple of weeks. Just around this time, after you go off. And? And nothing. He sits on a bench tail, leaning on a stick, and keeps staring. Staring at this here picture. Like he was waiting for something to move or something. Well, I don't... To move? What could move? There are no figures in it. 
Well, I know what could move. Maybe he expects somebody is sneaking around in all them trees. Oh, come on, Charlie. You know, you're letting the job get to you. Now, I, I get crazy notions sometimes living here in the past, like it was with, with the dead, with the quiet and all. But, but I thought you being older, it wouldn't get to you. I guess I was wrong. Uh, that ain't the deal, Joe. I mean, anybody that gets tied up in something dead and gone at my age eh, gives me goosebumps. I don't think you'll be around so long. You? <laughs> you will bury your nephews and your cousins. Shh, shh, shh. What is it? Here he comes. Here who comes? The viewer. With the scarf and all. Eh, let's make ourselves scarce and you'll see what I mean. Why? Do I come here because somewhere, sometime, a man named John Brown has to be remembered. If not for himself, at least for what he could give of himself. Who would have imagined out of all the seemingly total failure of my life this one last unexpected piece of immortality remains? And how bitter that it had to be this. The visual representation of everything that brought me disaster and tragedy. Just watch him. Charlie, I'm hired by the museum to watch a lot more than a sad gray old man who comes in for lunch and a, and a rest. Uh, look at him. He'll sit there and stare at that painting without moving from now till closing time. Oh, what is it that grabs him so? Well, why don't you ask him? You want to come with me for a minute? I'll show you why. Okay. Hey, nice looking picture, huh? Well, it's one of my own favorites. It really seems to get to you, sir. Forget it, Charlie. Let's move. Yeah, just a second. You happen to know the artist or something? Come on, Charlie. Okay, okay. You see? It's like no one was there but him and that screwy picture. Don't bother him. The guy could be a deaf or a mute. A museum is a special place for lots of guys. It's an escape. Deaf. Mute, how I wish I were and sightless. Or dead. Only I cannot die as long as any trace remains, and this is all that's left. Oh, my sweet God, have I not suffered enough? Can I not at last make the final sacrifice and atone for all my crimes? Is there no way back? Some hope to change the future? I am alone. Nobody watching me. Could I? Step into that frame and back into the past. Could I relive it again? Somehow change the course of fate? How long will I hesitate to try? What am I waiting for? If it is to be any time, has it been now? Joe! What is it now, Charlie? The old guy sitting on the bench. Watching the picture? Ah, we're back at the picture again. He just suddenly disappeared. You know, his, his age, he probably has weak kidneys. No, 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 I don't, I don't mean that. He just walked into the alcove toward the picture. And when I moved around so I could see into it, he was gone. As though he stepped into the frame and out of this world. Hey, look, Charlie, uh, are you all right? Oh, I'm all right, yeah. I know what I'm talking about. Now, come here. Look, Charlie, I... Don't argue. Come here. Now, look. Look at the picture. That picture's an obsession with you. I, I... Look at it closely. Yeah, right there, on the path, moving up towards the front door. Charlie, I think you're flipping out. Now, you know there are no figures in that painting. Just look. I'm looking. I don't see anything. It's a kiss couture, or whatever you call it. It's hard to see in the shadows and the same color and what light there is, but he, he's there. Just the same. Creeping up towards the door. Who's there? The viewer. 
The old guy disappeared from the bench. Oh, you've got to be crazy. There's nobody there. Oh, how could you see without your glasses? Pop on. There aren't enough crazies wander in here from the outside. i got to live with one on the inside. Uh, okay. So my glasses are on. Where is he? Uh, you took too long. Didn't you see? He just went around the corner of the building to the back. You are as nutty as a fruitcake. I didn't see that. Oh, I wish I hadn't. You know what he was wearing? What? A tweed suit with knickers and high shoes with a skip cap. I ain't seen an outfit like that since I was a boy myself. Just before World War One. The Braxton House. That damn Braxton House. From the beginning, it... It both lured me and repelled me. Just the house itself. Long before I'd met and fallen in love with Polly and learned to hate Gilbert Fairley, the smooth, suave guardian her father appointed when he died. Gilbert Fairley. Surely one of the most ironic names for a man who was driven to win, but happiest when he could do it by cheating or hurting or destroying the loser. That summer of 1917, sneaking around the corner of that bewitching if lonesome house... I was bound and determined he wouldn't get away with it with me. Charlie, I don't know if you're putting me on, but if you're not, I'm really going to start worrying about you. Joe, I swear. First off, I noticed the old man had disappeared from where you were sitting. And then, I seen the guy in the picture. Moving. Dressed just like I said. But that wasn't what scared me so much. Mm Hmm. What was it? Right here on the path. You see where there's kind of a spot of moonlight, uh, sunlight, or whatever it is? Yeah. Right there. He stopped for a moment. And he sort of looked back over his shoulder. Just long enough so I could get a glimpse of his face. Right. Mm-hmm. And he looked like uh, Boris Karloff. Uh, no. Mm-hmm. But so help me, I know who he did look like. Or the way he could have looked back there around that time. Yeah, and now you're going to tell me it was your bench sitter, right? Your, what is it you call him, your viewer? That's just what I'm telling you. I'll lay a dollars to donuts. That old bum used to visit or sneak into this house around 50 years ago when he was a young guy. So maybe he did. But what's it to you? What do you care? I don't know. I just sure give a hell of a lot to know what went on in that house that was strong enough to call a man back from today to walk through that frame to yesterday. So, what do we have? An elder citizen filling a job who is slipping into senility without realizing it? Or a valid case of dreams come true. An old man who has come back from Lord knows what to moon over a picture that represents his youth and in some magical way has beckoned him back to it to change the course of events or only to relive them. I shall return shortly. America was racked with the agonizing debate over whether or not America should enter the Great War, which was raging in Europe. But somehow, individuals continued to be as absorbed as ever in their own personal problems. For example, a young man with the undistinguished name of John Brown, an artist with limited prospects and even more limited funds, fell helplessly in love with a young heiress named Polly Braxton, and she with him. I mention this only because if, uh, if, I repeat, it were possible for someone to step back through a picture frame into the past, and that man happened to be John Brown, this is where he would have found himself. It was a long wait, as always, for Polly in the gazebo. But at last she came quickly and silently to my arms and back to my waiting heart. Oh, John, darling, forgive me for being so late. I, I 
couldn't get away from him tonight. It doesn't matter. Now you're here. I love you, Polly. And I love you. I don't understand why he's so dead set against you. Knowing it's what I want. I'm an artist, which automatically means I have nothing. How could I support you? Who cares about money? I have plenty for both of us. Not till you're 21. Oh, I, I couldn't live off you anyway, Polly. Only till you're a successful artist. And everyone realizes how wonderful you are. Well, I'll tell you something. I don't say I'm going to be famous, but I think I found a sponsor. Who? Mrs. Chelton Fresnick. That ancient old grass widow? Oh, grass she might be. Ancient she isn't exactly. Why, Johnny Brown, I'm surprised at you, scarcely 22. She must be all of 30 and beyond. And everyone knows her husband was old enough to be her father or more when they married. All things considered, he ought to have been your guardian instead of... Instead of me, <gasps> Mr. Brown. Mr. Fairley. Gilbert, I, I didn't see you approaching. I made no effort to conceal my approach. I'm even carrying a torch, as you can see. I was not aware you had an appointment with Mr. Brown tonight. A clandestine appointment. I need no protection against Johnny. And I hope you never have cause to regret those words. I intend to do all in my power to make sure you don't. Now, just a moment, Mr. Fairley. I will ask you not to meddle in family matters, Mr. Brown. I'll talk to you in a moment. Polly, take this torch. Mind your way along the path. I'm not leaving. You will do as I tell you, or I swear by heaven I will lock you in your room till your 21st birthday. The torch. It will light you back to the house. Do as he says. You're sure you want me to leave? Trust me, darling. I do. Good night. You are never going to see my ward again. I'm warning you, John Brown... I'm carrying a gun at this moment and consider you a trespasser. This time, I'll let you go. But if you ever show up at Braxton House again, I will shoot you on sight. I I may show up with a gun myself. You won't get very far. From now on, I'm turning loose trained dogs who will tear any stranger within the property apart. I left quietly enough my tail between my legs, but not as far as Mr. Gilbert fairly thought I'd gone. By the front of the house, I doubled back to the trellis and the wisteria and was up on the porch roof in a moment, knocking at Polly's window gently. Shh. Shh. What is it? Polly, do you love me? You know I do. But what? Then, then let me in. We've got to talk about our future. If we're ever going to have any. Hey, Joe. Not the W.H. Haskell again. Yeah, yeah. What is it this time? The guy that was sneaking up the path. No. I just saw him climbing up on top of the porch. And one of the windows was lighted up there. Oh, come on, Charlie. Not only that, but... What happened? Nothing happened, isn't that it? The wind is closed. The light's out. It's just like it was before. Yeah, and just the way it's always been. Elope, Johnny? It's our only hope. I told you what he said. He'd, he'd shoot me or turn the dogs on me if I try to come back and see you. But how... Well, how can we get married? I mean, without his consent. Cross the state line. And you're old enough in that state without consent. How would we get there? What would we live on? I, I have a sponsor, remember? I, I, I'm sure if I talk to her, she'll buy the rest of what I've got. She's all, already brought one of my paintings, and, and I have that saved up a whole hundred dollars. That would pay for the wedding and the trip and all. But couldn't Gilbert have the marriage annulled? Not if you... Well, I mean, not if... Oh... Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, darling. We'll do it. I'll meet you at, at Four Oaks on the way to church. I can borrow a model team. We can drive all that day and make it across the state line in time to be married. By the time Fairley gets back, finds you gone, traces you, if he can, everything will be... Well, I, I mean, it won't be till Monday morning, and by, by then I... Oh, stop stammering, darling. 
I want to belong to you. To be yours. And once I am, he'll just have to accept things as they are. Till Sunday. Till Sunday. You'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. If either of us could ever have dreamed. But at that moment, I was too concerned with another problem that lay ahead of me, which also concerned a woman. My sponsor, Marsha Fresnick. Why, Johnny Brown. Who would have expected you this late? And wasn't it clever of you to pick the maid's night out? Come in. I'm sorry to bother you, Mrs. Fresnick, but... Well, something has come up that I... All right, Johnny. But do we have to talk about it in the hall? Let's go inside and be comfortable. And does it have to be Mrs. Fresnick? Well, now... Uh, Come on and sit beside me on the couch. Now, let's get that unhappy frown off our handsome face and tell Mama what the trouble is. Well, I... Well, you kind of like the sort of thing I do, don't you? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. You haven't exactly started doing it yet. I <laughs> met my painting. Oh, that. <laughs> well, well, I mean, you did say something about helping me. And, and you did sort of promise to be my patron. You... You bought one picture from me. Yes, I did. And let's be fair to Chelton. He recognized your talent. For painting, that is. He thought you had quite a future. But you don't? Well, I'm temporarily interested in the present. Well, so am I. Oh, I'm delighted to hear it. Do you want to tell me why? Mrs. I mean, Marsha. How'd you like to have all of me? Well, now... <laughs> That's quite a proposition. Why this sudden um, capitulation, if that's the word? Well, because I need money. I, I, I paint because I want to. And everything I paint, I, I never want to let go, never want to sell. But it's, well, just now I need money. Oh, is that all? <laughs> Don't be silly. I have plenty for both of us. And you can still hang on to your precious canvases. Plenty for both of us? I, I don't understand. Well, let's not talk about that in the living room. We could make it all much clearer upstairs. Upstairs? Hmm. Oh, now, look. Marsh, I don't... I don't need money. Well, gee, I wasn't suggesting that, gee. But what, what I need money for is to get married. Married? Well, I, I, I don't mean to you. I mean to Polly. Polly? Oh, you mean Polly Braxton... Gerald Fairley would never let you have her. He has his sights on her for himself. Mr. Fairley, he's old enough to be... Now, her. let's not discuss who's old enough to be who's what. And I don't want to talk about that silly little baby like Polly. Let's just concentrate on us. Sure, but what... I... Through my husband's connections, I can arrange a one-man show for your paintings. But that will take time. In the meantime, there's you and me. I... I can't wait for a showing. I, I, I just like to be able to sell all I have to raise some cash. So you can try to marry Polly Brack. Yes. You prefer her to me? Well, Marsh, it's, it's different with us. You're damn right it is. You don't mind letting yourself out, do you? Since in a larger sense, you already have. The first thing the following morning I went straight to Mr. Fresnick's dealer who had handled the one sale I'd made. I laid my cards on the table about needing money. He said he couldn't handle what I want, but he would refer me to the Koppelman Galleries. And that's all you have? Every canvas I've finished, Mr. Koppelman. Mm. Van Gogh or Renoir, you're not... Well, I wouldn't expect to be yet, besides then. Not my style. But my style is to buy what I can sell, so... Buy? No. Handle you, show you. Maybe. But, but right now I need cash. Mm. I'll take it on consignment, the usual percentage agreement, and I'll push it all I can. But that isn't what I need. It, it, don't, don't rush me. I didn't finish. With you, I'll make a special deal. An advance against future sales, 500, and <laughs> I can see that's not enough. <laughs> I'll stretch it a little. A thousand dollars cash. But that is as far as I can go. When could I have it? I have a wagon downstairs. You help me stack these canvases in it. 
And you'll get it right away. I didn't question anything for a moment. Things had gone even better than I could have hoped. Polly and I met that Sunday's plan, crossed the state line by mid-afternoon, and got Polly settled in the hotel. We registered as man and wife, which we were going to be as soon as I found the justice of the peace. Then came the first blow. John, where have you been? What took you so long? When do we get the license? Oh, honey, I... There's something I, wrong. What is it? We... Well, we can't get married yet. Oh, I knew it. God is punishing us. I knew it was too good to be true. We still have to wait two years until I... No, no, take, take it easy, darling. Not two years, just two days, 48 hours. Oh, is that all? Then everything's all right. Sure. Only... I know. This was to be our wedding night. We waited so long. Why does it have to be longer? I guess it's just the way the rules are made. But we are going to be married in 48 hours. We are man and wife already in our hearts. Couldn't we bend those old rules just a bit? Do we have to wait any longer? What harm would it do? I guess, I, I guess, considering how much we both want each other, it wouldn't do any harm at all. I make no moral judgments. I only comment that twice recently, John Brown has made compromises with the two most important things in his life his art, and his love. For some men, in any day and age, this has afforded no problem. For John Brown, marked by fate, or if you wish to call it retribution, it pulled his whole existence down upon him like a falling house of cards, spelled his immediate failure and final doom. I shall return shortly with Act Three. morning, Polly and John woke up together. Man and wife in every sense but the piece of paper that would make it legal. Two things happened that affected their future. The United States declared war on Germany, and Gilbert Fairley, not entirely by accident, discovered where his missing ward had disappeared to. Both of these events set a series of actions in motion which are to bring us back full circle through 50 years to the Fresnick Museum and the haunted painting. But uh, let us leave the future for the future and stay for the present with the past. Are you awake, John? Yes, Polly. Uh, for a long time, I, I didn't want to wake you. Oh, good morning, Mr. Brown. Good morning, Mrs. Brown. Husband? wife. I feel so wicked. <laughs> Me too. And in about 34 and a half hours, it can all be nice and legal. Well, don't sound so bored about it. Well, I'm not, but after all, it's only a matter of form now. You're not worried about making a dishonest woman of me? Well, why should I be? Since I have every intention of making you the other two. The other what? An honest woman. <laughs> we didn't know how short our happiness was to be. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Well, perhaps that's an apt quotation, but I never thought Marcia would have felt that strongly. But I guess she did. I'm sorry if I'm late for lunch, Marcia. So am I. But then that's a habit of yours. Don't be cross. I am going to be very cross with you for many reasons. You intend to marry Polly Braxton. Of course. If I don't, before she's 21, she could bounce me out and quite possibly will. Where is Polly now? Time to find out. That's why I was late for our meeting. 
Do you have any idea? I might. Well, it's damned important to me. Really? Why? Well, you know why. I'm not in the best of shape should my guardianship be examined now. But within a couple of years, with Polly as my wife, I need have no worries. Well, I have a piece of information that's worth your whole empire. What do I get in exchange? What do you want? A continuance of our present relationship. Nobody pleases me quite like you. Granted. Your little pigeon has flown the coop to get married. You have about, let's see, a little over 24 hours to stop it. Would you like to know where to find her? Who? Who is that, darling? I don't know. I'm, I'm terribly frightened. Try not to be. Go into the bathroom, darling. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. Okay, okay, I'm com- com- coming. Oh, it's you. Where is she? Where's Polly? None of your damn business. She's she's my wife now. Oh, no, she's not. I took care to check on that at the registrar's office before I came here. I'm going to have you up for statutory rape. And I have enough evidence on you to make it stick. No, please. I'll go in court and swear that... You could only hurt him. You're 19 and still my ward. And without a marriage license... You've still not reached the age of consent. Now, I'm giving you both one choice. Take it. Or I'll shame you and Polly out of all society, and I'll ram you in jail for the best part of your life, Mr. John Brown. What's the choice? We have just gone to war. We'll need plenty of cannon fodder. I shall expect you, Mr. Brown, to report to the nearest recruiting station today, or at the latest, tomorrow. And Polly? I'm going to do something for Polly that you couldn't or wouldn't do. I'll make her my wife. And an honest woman. I won't go through all the pleading, the threats, the tears from Polly, and the vicious obstinacy of Gilbert... Today, it would seem senseless. In 1917, it was a different world. And I ended up with one of the first cadres to ship overseas to the mud and the trenches as a member of the American Expeditionary Force. I think I prayed that a bullet would find me and put me out of my misery. But with the perversity of fate, since I didn't care about living, I was one of those who came back. Troop ship docked it with delirium. Everyone in transports of happiness. There was none for me. Of all the letters I'd ever written, I'd never had one reply from Polly. I was surprised when Marsha met me at the dock. Surprised that she was there, but surprised more than anything at how she had aged. So good to see you home, Johnny O. Well, I should be glad to be back, or at least grateful. How's Where's Polly? Well, as soon as you can break free, why don't we go somewhere and talk? Where where are you taking me? Back home with me. Are you surprised to see a woman driving a car? Yes, not you, but but in general, yes. Well, I learned while you boys were overseas. The women's auxiliary did what it could. I'm sure it did. What about Polly? Well, she married Gilbert, you know. From all my unanswered letters, I could have guessed. Right after I left? Oh, no. She waited as long as she could, but... You say your letters were unanswered. That's right. Dear Lord, it's worse than I thought. What does that mean? Well, I I guess she could never have received them, John. I don't think she would have married Gilbert if she had. I mean, if you told her that you still loved her. I did. Oh, what's the difference now? I don't suppose anything's happened to my paintings. I mean, anything of interest, I mean. No. Did you do anything over there? You mean painting? Oh, good Lord, no. I hope you will again. Your painting of the old Braxton house is still in my ex-husband's collection. The others? Well, you'd, um... You'd have to ask Gilbert about those. Gilbert? It was a condition Polly made before she'd marry him. They were bought from a dealer named Copperman and put in her name. 
You have quite a sum waiting for you in the bank, Johnny. I don't want it. I, I'd rather have my pictures. Well, they are yours now to claim. What? What do you mean? She left them to you in her will when she... What? When she... When she what, Marcia? Is Polly... Polly dead? Yes, Johnny. Polly is dead. How? How? She was... She was going to have a child. But she... Go on. She committed suicide. Hanged herself before the child was born. Why? Why? That's something else you'll have to ask Gilbert about. He said, and he, um, he had a telegram to prove it, that you had been killed in action. We all thought you were dead. And suddenly it was all crystal clear. That cold fish carrying through his plots at no matter what cost. The child, mine and Polly's, not his. The intercepted letters broke her, thinking I no longer care for her. And then, with that false telegram, the last frail hope crushed and her ghastly escape from his cruelties and demands, taking our child with her. And so half insane with rage, I went to Braxton House for the last time to face the man I felt could shame the devil. I heard you were back in the States, John Brown. And I've been rather expecting you to turn up here. Aren't you afraid? Of what? That you tear me limb from limb? I prepared that. Uh... A German Luger. Yes. I purchased it from one of our brave Yankee Doodle boys like you. You are a fool. I'm not afraid to die. <laughs> My dear Johnny, I have no intention of shooting you. I have better ways of bleeding you slowly to death, making you writhe helplessly as I have this past year. Come with me. And let me give Polly's legacy to you. I followed him from the hall up the stairs to an unused room. We entered and I looked about the room in blank horror and blinding anger. Every canvas, save one that I had ever painted, blotted and drenched with bright red paint and ripped to tatters by knife slashes in their frames. The rest of your children. You must be mad. The destroyed ruin, how could you? My revenge for my humiliation. And now the last... I saved this one letter that I intercepted for you. Read it. I read it all. But the sentences that remain in my mind were these. You must understand, my darling, that I only married him to save you. And he will never touch me. Our child is growing inside me. And when you come back, we will arrange a divorce or an annulment so that we can be married. Please, be careful. You must come back. I love you forever now. And if God should only allow that, in the beyond. And suddenly, I went berserk. You bloody murderer! You killed her! Remember, I'm armed. If you think that will hold me back, damn you! You... You shot me! A lot of us brought Lugers home with us. I had mine and it's bulleted in your gut. Get a doctor, get a doctor, I'm dying. It'll take a long time, though. And it will hurt. Maybe hurt enough to make up for what you did to Polly. And just to make sure, I am going to make an end of this charnel house. I am going to burn it to the ground. It can be your funeral pyre. The police found me at Marsha's. I was arrested, tried, and convicted of arson and murder, and committed to an insane asylum for life where I stayed until I escaped one week ago. Hey, Joe. Joe, uh, come on. Don't argue. Now I can really show it to you. Show me what? 
There's a light. A bright orange-red light in that upper window. Oh, are we back at the W.H. Haskell again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not only that, the old bum, the visitor. He's back, sitting on the bench. Yeah, see? Yeah. Yeah, I see him all right, but... Good Lord, you're right. Yeah, you see? Not only the upstairs window, but the other one over there and downstairs. Yeah. Looks like the house is on fire. Yeah. You damn fool, the whole picture's on fire. Uh, look, hold them till I can get an extinguisher. So, it is finally ended. The last of everything, even W.H. Haskell. Funny. All those years ago as a boy to feel that no painter of note would be just plain Johnny Brown. W.H. Haskell sounded more like it. And in the end, even he had to go. No immortality for any of us. Johnny. Johnny. Polly. Hurry up, darling. We're waiting for you. We? Me. And your son. Your son. I... I'm coming. I'm coming. Time at last to put an end to tragedy and face a new beginning. There, that does it. Oh. Uh, Not that it'll help the painting much. It's destroyed. Oh, you were right about that old boy. He is a vandal. Well, I guess... Well, I guess he'll get what's coming to him. The cops are on their way. Eh, it's going to be a little late, Joe. What? The old fella here. He's gone. Dead? Yeah. Huh. I wonder what he had against that picture. I guess maybe we'll never know. You know something, Joe? I don't think I ever want to. Maybe it's changed my own fascination for the idea of walking through a picture frame, like Alice through the looking glass, just to find out what lay deep in the heart of the forest, or the cave, or the house with the blank windows that showed no light. It's none of my business, really. And maybe I wouldn't like what I found there. I'll be back shortly. If any of you should come across a painting by W.H. Haskell, grab it for what you can, if it can be authenticated. After the incident in the museum, the old story was raked up again. And regardless of what artistic ability Joe Brown had, anything from his hand is, if not priceless, at least tremendously priceworthy. In his own strange way, he did achieve a sort of immortality. Our cast included Michael Wager, Robert Dryden, Joan Lovejoy, Jada Rowland, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You killed a cab driver named Joe Paulson. What? What are you saying? Why would I kill him? You took his cash plus the ring. How did I kill him? With a gun. That, that's impossible. You know me, Lieutenant Davis. I never worked with a gun. Until now. I don't even have a gun. Oh, yes, you do, Eddie. We found it in your apartment. A gun? But how... A how... thirty-two. The gun that killed Paulson. Yeah, but I, I, I don't remember. Uh, if you killed him when you were high, would you remember? Well, no. no. Well, that's it, Eddie. You got the ring and the gun. Now, do you want to make a statement? I don't remember killing him, Lieutenant, but... <laughs> if you've got all this evidence... I guess I did. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater... 
for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Marshall. When death comes, he cannot be denied, and life must depart with him, leaving behind an emptiness and a void. That's for most people. There are a few, a resourceful few, who have been able to get around it. Our mystery drama, Pharaoh's Daughter, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan, and stars Jack Grimes and Joan Shea. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Carpe diem. Seize the day, said the Roman poet. To which we might add, seize the hour, the minute. The second. There are those who, in one great intuitive flash, can see the entire workings of the universe. It is a gift given to great artists, great poets, great composers, and great crooks. We're in a large city. It is rather late at night. The doorman of an exclusive dining place whistles up a cab. Three extremely well dressed people get in. One is a rather distinguished-looking gray-haired gentleman. The second is a stunningly attractive woman, just entering middle age. The third is tall, dark, and uh, he looks extremely competent. You know, Arthur, and I despise taxi, Frank. Benjamin had to have the night off. His mother died. Oh, that was inconsiderate of her. I don't think you should talk this way in front of... Whom? He probably means me, lady. <laughs> Your friendly taxi cab driver. You know, I'm one of the, uh, <laughs> plebeians. <laughs> well, where do you, uh, aristocrats want to go? Take us to number 87 Barclay. Let me help you, Arthur. Thank you. Lenore. Thank you, Frank. Hey. Hey, hey. Ain't you Mr. Drake, the Mr. Arthur K. Drake? Cabby, Mr. Drake is not in the mood for conversation. Oh, Right off. Arthur, darling, are you all right? You haven't said a word. What's wrong? Frank, look at him. He's so pale. He's breathing hard and, and, and sweating. Arthur, you okay? Hey, the uh, the old gent don't, don't look good. Something's happened to him. Arthur, I have your pill. Just open your mouth. Uh, you, you want us to drive to a hospital? The motion of the cab is upsetting him. Pull over to the curb. Uh, but, but do as you're told. Oh. oh, this is more than just an ordinary attack. This guy needs a doctor. Oh, Frank, I'm frightened. He's not responding to his pills. He'll be all right. No, no, he should respond immediately. I still think he'll come out of it. He can't die now. He can't. Not with the Fleischman deal unsigned and the Carruthers merger unresolved. Mr. Drake. Oh, right. Mr. Drake. Arthur. Arthur, speak to us. Lenore, he, he's dead. What do you mean he's dead? He's... He's dead? Wait a second. I, I took a first aid course in, in, in resuscitation. Uh, uh, mister, mister, you get behind the wheel, drive the cab to the nearest hospital. It's down the boulevard to Henderson and turn right. You can't miss he's it. He's not breathing. Move, move, move over and give me some room. I, I don't hear nothing. He needs both compression and mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, what are you waiting for? Either get us to the hospital or find a phone and get an ambulance. Dad. Dad. Uh, now, uh, now, you never say die. Yes, he's dead. What are we going to do, Frank? Go oh, for crying out loud, get help! Will you trust me, Lenore? Yes. Will you do as I tell you without asking questions? Of course. Hey, what's the matter with you two? The first thing we have to do is kill him. Kill who? This cab driver. Is it necessary? I don't believe he's the type who can be bribed. Hey. Hey, are you people crazy? Do you see anybody about? No, the street seems deserted. Hey. hey, what do you want to do with that gun? Are you crazy? Everybody will hear the shot. Oh. 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 What happened to him? This pistol has a silencer, my dear. Oh. Oh. Well, I'm sure he's no great loss to anyone. But did we have to kill him? Yes. Since I'm old Arthur's bodyguard as well as his personal secretary, this is the stroke of luck. It provided us with a weapon just when we would need one. But what are we going to do right now at this moment? Well, both your late husband and our talkative cab driver are safely in the back seat. Hand me the cabbie's cap. Now you get back in there with them. Back in there? What harm can they do you now? Up the street is a phone booth. I must make a telephone call. To whom? To someone I can trust. Frank, My I... dear, the stakes consist of the entire Arthur Drake fortune. You may be apprehensive and uncomfortable for the next 20 minutes, but it'll be worth it. <laughs> Yes? Oh. What's all? Uh, is the, the guy in? Which guy? The, the pawnbroker. I'm the pawnbroker. No kidding. I've never seen a lady pawnbroker before. What did you have in mind? Uh, well, I, I, I got this ring. Oh, everybody's got rings. It's got a diamond in it. Oh, they all have diamonds. Where'd you get it? Where'd I get it? What kind of a question is that? A legitimate question. Where do you think? I bought it. Would you happen to have the sales slip? I bought this ring 20 years ago. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I just remembered. I didn't buy it. Someone give it to me as a present. Excuse me. Hey, uh, where are you going? In the box. Well, what for? Well, I got better life. I got to examine the ring, don't I? Well, Uh, 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 police, uh, uh, this is Mrs. Molly Gordon. I got a shop on East Tenth. You know the ring we're supposed to keep an eye open for? I belong to the cab driver got killed? Well, a fella just walked in with it. Where'd you get the ring, Eddie? I found it, Lieutenant Davis. Where? In my pocket. How did it get into your pocket, Eddie? Oh, gee, I, I, I don't know. You don't have any idea at all? You know me, Lieutenant. I get drunk. Well, I... I, I shouldn't, but I do. I, I get a few drinks in me. Yeah, plus a few pills. Come on, the ring, Eddie. Well, when I get into a certain state... Don't stop now, Eddie. That's all I know. I, I just get high and then... And what, Eddie? I just can't remember what I did. Should we refresh your memory? Why, that, that, that'd be great. You killed a cab driver named Joe Paulson. Well, what are you saying? Why would I kill him? You took his cash plus the ring. How did I kill him? With a gun. That, that's impossible. You know me, Lieutenant Davis. I never worked with a gun. Until now. I don't even have a gun. Oh, yes, you do, Eddie. We found it in your apartment. A gun? But how... A how... thirty-two. The gun that killed Paulson. Yeah, but I, I, I don't remember. If you killed him when you were high, would you remember? Well, no. no. Well, that's it, Eddie. You got the ring and the gun. Yeah, yeah, the ring and the gun. Now, do you want to make a statement? I don't remember killing him, Lieutenant, but... (laughs) 
If you've got all this evidence... I guess I did. Lieutenant, that Joe Paulson case, it's getting very complicated. Oh, no, it isn't, Sergeant Jones. Look, I was down to the taxi garage. It's I... over. Well, how, how could it be over? Sometimes you're lucky and you get something for nothing. What are you talking about? You get a case that solves itself. Oh, and how in the world... We've got it... the killer of Arthur Drake and the cabbie. It's Eddie Judson. Eddie Judson? Oh, you can't be serious. Look, he had the gun. He was trying to hawk the cabbie's ring. Oh, no, no. I, I don't believe it. He signed a statement. You mean he confessed? Well, he didn't, he didn't. Come on, Lieutenant. When he gets into a kind of drunken high, you know? Yeah, I know, Lieutenant. And in that state, he doesn't know what he's doing. Even in that state, I don't believe Eddie Judson would kill anybody. But the gun and the ring. Solid evidence. It's not his style. Look, Al, It's I... a quiet hustle as far as he's concerned. A little con game here and there, some quick flim flam. If he's real hungry, he might shoplift. Sure, all this is when he's himself, but he gets kind of high on booze and drugs and he becomes a complete other personality. He didn't do oh, it. come on, Al. L- Lieutenant, l- like I say, I've been to the taxi garage. Things there don't hang together. Now, look, I'm going to drop a name on you. Now, why don't you relax? Arthur K. Drake. Yeah? So what? A a woman, obviously Drake's wife, and a guy who fits the description of Drake's personal secretary were the last fares to ride in Joe Paulson's cab. Which means what? Things don't add up. Why don't they? Joe Paulson was wearing a ring. This ring plus his cash was taken from him by some hood who killed him with a thirty-two caliber. Well, maybe that's what it looks like. The ring plus the murder gun are both in possession of an old friend of ours, Eddie Judson. Eddie Judson is a harmless nut. Would you forget it? But don't you want to know what I it's found out? It's a waste of time. Oh, okay. But I don't believe you got a confession from Eddie. You want to see it? No. No, I want to see Eddie. Well, how are they treating you, Eddie? Oh, not bad, Sergeant. You know me, I get along with everybody. Hey, uh, when are they going to hold my trial? Eddie, hmm? did you kill that cab driver? Yeah, well, sure. Uh-huh. Tell me how. Uh, how? Yeah, well, I, 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 I don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? I don't remember. Then it's possible you didn't kill him. Oh, no, no. Th- that ain't possible at all. I-, I killed him, all right. If you don't remember, how can you be so sure? Well, they found a ring on me, didn't they? Eddie, would you put your hand on the Bible and swear you killed that cabbie? Everybody says I killed him. I mean, well, you fellas, you've you always been good to me. Could someone be trying to frame you? Well, you guys wouldn't do that to me. I look on you as my friend. No, no, I, I didn't mean cops. I mean, I mean someone else. Well, Sergeant, I got no enemies. Why would anybody want to hang a frame on me? <sighs> okay, Eddie. Okay. Mr. Hopkins? Yes? Come in, come in. I'm a, a police detective. Here are my credentials. Sergeant Albert Gomez. Well, won't you sit down, Sergeant? Now, how may I help you? I would like to speak with Mr. Arthur Drake. I'm sorry, Mr. Drake is out of town. Oh. Well, perhaps Mrs. Drake could help me. May I ask why? I'm investigating a murder. Oh, indeed. That sounds grim. How can Mrs. Drake be of assistance? Suppose I discuss that with Mrs. Drake. Certainly. Excuse me a moment. Lenore? Yes, Frank? A police detective about the cab driver. I thought you had arranged that rather neatly. They do have a confession from the killer. I don't know what this man wants. But what does he say he wants? He wants to talk to you. All right. We shall give him that opportunity. Please, be very careful. Frank, I know how to talk to police officers. I know exactly how to handle him. The web has...
has been spun. Its purpose? Well, the spider weaves it to catch the unwary fly. But at this rather early point in our story, we have not yet established who is the spider and who is the fly. That is the general purpose of second acts. And I shall bring you this one in just a few moments. Money. Say what you like, but money is the great emancipator. Money emancipates you from so many petty worries. And a great deal of money emancipates you from practically any kind of care. Mrs. Arthur K. Drake, Lenore, was born to great wealth and married into fantastic wealth. Wealth, it colors your outlook on life and uh, gives you a certain attitude toward people. Would you like to know how Eleanor of Aquitaine or Catherine de' Medici spoke to their serfs and retainers? The next few minutes should prove a revelation. You are Sergeant Gomez of the police. Yes, Mrs. Drake. My husband was instrumental in choosing your Commissioner Sellers. Uh, Salters, ma'am. Uh, well, whatever. Now, what is it you require of me? Some information. What information could I possibly have for the police? Several nights ago, a cab driver was murdered. Well, they're a surly lot, as you well know. His bad manners may have angered someone beyond all endurance. You, your husband, and another gentleman, Mr. Frank Hopkins, rode in that man's cab just before he was killed. That's impossible. Uh, are you saying you did not ride in a cab driven by Joseph Paulson on the night of... I don't ride in cabs. I despise them. We always use our own motor car. I see. Well, I should like to speak with Mr. Drake. That would not be convenient at this time. I'm told he's out of town. When is he expected back? I was not aware that Mr. Drake is accountable to the police. Are you uh, finished here? Not quite. Good day. I know my way uh, out. One moment, please. Hmm? How much money do you make? It's a matter of public record. You could look it up. How would you like to leave the police force? I never thought about that. And work for me. In what capacity? A confidential, intimate capacity. Oh. Well, how would Mr. Drake like that? No, we needn't concern ourselves about Mr. Drake. And why not? Whatever you're making now, I'll double it. I don't think so. Isn't the offer attractive enough? Oh, oh it's, it's very attractive. You know, now, now I know who you remind me of. Yes? Pharaoh's daughter. Really? A legend says that Pharaoh's daughter became enamored. Enamored? An unusual word for a police officer. Now, some of us are fairly well educated. She, she fell for, does that make you see it more clearly? A Hebrew slave. She summoned him to her tent. And after he left, he was immediately speared to death. How exciting. Thank you for your most generous and exciting offer. Will you notify us when Mr. Drake returns? Oh, uh, certainly. As I said, I know my way out. Lenore, why did you talk to him like that? He amused me. You shouldn't have. I thought you told me everything would go smoothly. Why did you deny we were in that cab? Well, it seemed like the smart thing to do. Who could have told him that? The doorman. The doorman at Luigi's restaurant. Oh, Frank, will we have to kill him, too? Or we cannot depopulate the city. Yes? This is Mr. Hopkins. Now, I'll speak with Mr. Townsend. Yes, Mr. Townsend, Mr. Drake was called out of town on a sudden emergency. But he authorized me to tell you to go ahead with the merger. Thank you. Goodbye. It worked. We can keep doing this. For how long? Indefinitely. Arthur always tried to pose as a man of mystery. Well, he's going to become more and more mysterious as time goes on. I just wish... What do you wish? I wish you hadn't irritated that detective. Well, if he bothers you, kill him. Lenore, you just don't go around killing people. The daughters of Pharaoh do. What are you talking about? You may have to. He may become very, very bothersome. 
Well, why don't we wait and see? I would do it now. He will pry and probe, disturb the doctor. But you have no way of knowing that he intends to. I have a woman's way of knowing, Frank. These things are best done early. I'll just get David to move on this. I'll get the evidence and just dump it into his fat lap. Hello? Hello, is Jim there? Yes, yes, Jim. He was the doorman at Luigi's restaurant? Yeah. Yeah, well, I want to talk to him. What do you mean? Is that a fact? Uh, no, 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 never mind. Thank you. Well, 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 what do you know about that? Well, I don't know why I should be impressed. The doorman, Lieutenant, the doorman at Luigi's. He said to me that he remembered putting Mr. Drake, Mrs. Drake, and this Mr. Hopkins into a cab that night. Yeah? Yeah, so I got to see Mr. Drake. You went to see Arthur Drake? Uh, Mr. Drake is an ordinary citizen. Look, a guy with a quarter of a billion, give or take, is not an ordinary citizen. I was under the impression that this was a democracy. Well, it is and it, it isn't. Anyhow, he wasn't in. Huh, that's a relief. I spoke to the wife. So what did she say? She said she wanted me to become her boyfriend. Oh, don't go flaky on me, yeah. What she said that I found interesting was that they hadn't taken a cab that night. All right, so if she said that, then it's true. But it can't be true. Why not? Because that would contradict the testimony of the doorman, Jim Perry. Jim told me he put them in a cab. Well, he might have been wrong. So I called back there this afternoon, and guess what? He's gone. What do you mean, gone? He took off. To where? I don't know. He told Luigi he came into some money and could afford to quit. So why couldn't that be the truth? I called his rooming house, and the landlady said he left, like that, and no forwarding address. Now, you want to tell me this is all coincidence? Hell, my boy, all this messing around with the Drakes can only embarrass you. But I'm investigating a murder. What murder? The murder of cab driver Joseph Paulson. The case is closed. We already have the murderer. I don't believe it. Sergeant, what's gotten into you? Do you really and truly and sincerely believe that poor Eddie Judson is the killer? Yeah. Why? Why should Mrs. Drake deny that she and her husband and this other guy were in that cab when Jim, the doorman, told me otherwise? Well, there's all this matter. Look, I got an assignment for you. Uh, now, l Lieutenant, Lieutenant, give me a little more time on this case. What case? There is no case. It's all right. All right, but be advised. I'll work it on my spare time. Oh, well, why don't you let well enough alone? No, no, Mr. Drake does not approve of that acquisition. Well, not at this time. Oh, yes, he will certainly let you know. Mm, goodbye. Who else is on the line, Norton? Oh, very well, put him on. Yes, what did you say your name was? Oh, yes, yes. No, no, Mr. Drake has a policy about publicity. He shuns it completely. Now, under no conditions would he agree to an interview. Well, sir, there's no law that compels him to, is there? Good day. Yes, Frank, you're doing very nicely. He did die at the right time, didn't he? Considering that he intended to divorce me and fire you. He had no intention of firing me. He would have found out about those bonds sooner or later. Why talk about that now? Uh, have you arranged for my little matter? Lenore, are you sure that... What is the point in having power if you can't use it? Well, power, power is to decide the fate of a company, an industry, perhaps the economy of the nation... But what you want is just some personal thrill. That's what power is to everybody. Personal thrills. It all depends on what thrills you. I want that detective killed. And it's more than a whim. He's dangerous. Well, if I can't convince you... I'd like to give him another chance. Oh, I wish you would. Forget... Oh, no, no, no. You see, Pharaoh's daughter has her slave killed after he leaves her tent. 
What are you doing? I'm calling Sergeant Albert Gomez to give him another invitation. Hello? Is this Sergeant Gomez? Yes. Well, this is Pharaoh's daughter. Well, hi. The job is still open. Really? I thought we might even triple your salary. Uh, I'm afraid I'll just have to refuse. Why? There's no future in it. On the contrary, it's a beautiful future. It's not quite the one I had in mind. Well, no harm in asking. Uh, by the way, is uh, Mr. Drake back in town? No. I'll keep trying. Goodbye, Mrs. Drake. Why did you do that? It amused me. You did it because you want to be in a position where we have no choice but to kill him. That's possible. I can put off reporters. I can put off clients. I can say Mr. Drake is indisposed, but I can't keep stalling the police. Eventually, I will have to produce Mr. Drake, and I can't do that. Sergeant Albert Gomez is your problem. He's the only curious policeman. Get rid of him. Just like that? I'm sure you can devise something plausible. I'll have to. Oh, hi, Sergeant. Oh, hello, Jerry. Fill her up, huh? Yeah. Uh, how's he take the business, Albert? <laughs> it's like everything else. Yeah, well... Ow! Ow! What's the matter, Jerry? Across the street, them guys with masks and loose grocery store. It's a stick-up. Jerry, run inside to your office, phone the precinct, quick. Officer needs help, armed robbery in progress. Yeah, yeah, I've got you. Be careful, Al. Halt! Halt! I'm a police officer! Help! Help! No! No! I, uh, I seen them guys, Lieutenant. Uh, two or three maybe in loose grocery. They, they were holding up the joint. All right, what'd they look like? Uh, well, they were wearing masks. Uh, I said to call you as he stepped out of the car, and well, all of a sudden they start shooting at him as if... Uh, well, as if what? I, I don't know. It might sound crazy. Just tell me. As if they were waiting for him. Wait. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I like... They were waiting for him because well, he no sooner stepped out of his car when it seems like they they shoot from all over. What do you mean from all over? You said the stick-up guys were in the grocery across the street. Yeah, yeah, might have been my imagination, but it seemed to me the bullets was coming from every which way. You know what I mean? No. Like uh, they were waiting for him. Why would anybody be waiting for him? I don't know. It looked like he'd been set up. Why would anybody want to set up Al Gomez? I said I don't know. I just say that's how it looked. You know what I say? I say you've been watching too many movies. But even as he says it, a tiny ache of doubt begins to gnaw at Lieutenant Davis. First, there was a holdup and a killing of a cab driver, which Sergeant Gomez insisted was not really a holdup. Now... A holdup of a grocery store in which Sergeant Gomez is killed and might not be a holdup either. The lieutenant is a hard man to convince, but once you get him in motion, well, uh, that's the concern of Act Three. When I return in just a moment. Habits of a lifetime, how little we realize that they hold us in virtual servitude. For an entire career, Detective Lieutenant Davis has been strictly a book officer. Go by the evidence. Be guided by what exists, not by what might. The ultimate conservative, you could call him. Completely relaxed, comfortable, portly. But now, something bothers him. He's not sure what. Lieutenant Davis. Oh. Yeah, what does he want? Okay, okay, I'll go over there. <laughs> As if I don't have enough trouble. Oh, thanks, Lieutenant. Uh, nice of you to come by. Now, uh, what do you want to see me about, Eddie? That's awful about Sergeant Gomez, huh? Yeah. I heard it on the radio. 
radio. I keep remembering what he told me. About what? He said to me, Eddie, would you swear on a Bible that you really killed that cab driver? Well, what about it? Well, you, you know, Lieutenant Davis, when somebody, when a friend of yours is killed or dies, you, well, you, you kind of feel very close to, to God. And? And? Well, I, I couldn't put my hand on a Bible and swear that I killed that cab driver. Eddie? You mean you want to change your story? I don't want to make it inconvenient for you, Lieutenant. There isn't a person I admire more than you. Come on, come on. Get to the point, Eddie. A friend of mine was in to see me. Oh. I'm not a pigeon, Lieutenant. That's something I never done. And she says to me, Eddie, how could you have killed that cabbie when you were with me? You mean you got an alibi? Well, not exactly. What do you mean, not exactly? If she's got to take the stand to clear me, the DA is going to check her out. And you see... She's on the lam. Yeah, but if she can put you in the clear, she... I told her I got friends on the cops. We are friends, ain't we, Lieutenant? Well, sure. Uh, I, I mean, there's nothing personal in this. We we need each other, so I figure you can get me clear as long as I'm innocent. Oh, Eddie, Eddie, what am I going to do with you? And so since I found out I didn't do it, I've been trying to think. Maybe, maybe Sergeant Gomez was right. Maybe I am being framed. All right, Eddie. I'll look into it. Lieutenant, we've already spoken to a police officer. Only unfortunately he's been killed, Mrs. Drake. Oh, really? The other night, trying to prevent a holdup. Oh, how awful. Oh, Frank, that nice young detective, what was his name again? It mm. had an ethnic ring to it. Gomez. Oh, yes. I'll, uh... I'll have to make sure I have everything right. Now, you say you didn't ride in Joe Paulson's cab. We rode in no one's cab. That's a fact, Mrs. Drake? Oh, yes. And Mr. Drake could corroborate it if he was here. Well, of course. But he's out of town. Uh, yes. Is he expected back shortly? Well, one never knows with Mr. Drake. Well, just for the sake of the record, do you suppose Mr. Drake could send us a deposition? A deposition? To what effect? Well, just a signed statement saying that he either did or didn't ride as a passenger in Joe Paulson's cab, or any taxi cab, on the night of October 28th. Oh, that's easily accomplished. Uh, is there anything else we can uh, do for you? No, I don't think so, Mrs. Drake. I'm, I'm afraid the police have taken up too much of your time as it is. Sure nice of you to get me out of jail for a breath of fresh air, Lieutenant. We're here on business, Eddie. I want you to think. About what? Here. Right under this lamppost is where Joe Paulson was killed. Uh-huh. Do you remember being here that night? I told you. I, I, I got on one of them highs. I, I don't remember a thing. Eddie, that's not good enough. you got to remember. Please, Lieutenant. If you killed him, you killed him here. Now, if you want me to go out on a limb for you, you'll have to cooperate. Otherwise, it's the rest of your life in jail. You're going to remember, Eddie, everything about that night. I'll try. Honest, I will. I was over to her apartment. Yeah, where's that? I told you, she's on a lamb. I'm not a rat. Where's the apartment? It's around here, but don't ask me exactly where. I'll stay in jail first. Come on, Eddie, come on. She's one of them college kids. We're up in her pad. They're turning on pretty good. I guess she goes for all the guys and account of her old man. She never even spent any time with her. Eddie, tell me what happened right here. Yeah, right, right here. I'm, I'm trying to hold on to it, Lieutenant. I'm trying to capture it. Uh, yeah, well, we, we were sailing pretty high, she and I, and it, there was a shot. We hear a shot. A pistol shot? A, a shot, you know, and she says... Get out of here, Eddie. Don't get mixed up. And she pushes me out of the pad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, Eddie? It's, it's, it's kind of hazy. Hey, I, I'd had too much. I, I remember walking down the street, and there was it, this cab near the curb. And I says to myself, oh, maybe I better take it home in my condition, you know. And a guy says... A guy? Who? A guy says, excuse me, sir, did you drop this ring? Who was he? 
I don't remember. It's, it's all so mixed up. So for absolutely no reason, somebody gives you a ring and then takes you home. Yeah. I think that's how it happened. Why, Eddie? So they could hang the frame on me. Somebody said, don't you worry about a thing, Mr. 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 Who? Uh, like Sim Simpkins. No, uh, uh, Hop Hopkins. Hopkins. Yeah. Okay, Eddie. Time to go home. Oh, you, you mean you're taking me back to jail? For just a little while, Eddie. I hope. You the dispatcher? Yeah, but we don't need no driver. Police. This the garage Joe Paulson drove out of? Yeah. Funny, the cop will come by a couple of days ago to talk to me about poor Joe. Well, I read where he gets killed in the stick-up, too. Joe Paulson. What do you know about him? Oh, Joe's kind of a regular guy. Family man. And the night he was killed. Well, what can I tell you? Only what I told the other cop. According to his trip ticket, he picks up a fare at Sheridan and Madison. Sheridan and Madison? He's hit a cab line there every night. That's for Luigi's restaurant, you know. Okay, okay. So he picks up his fare. Where does he go? Uh, 87 Barclay. 87 Barclay? I was just there. That's where they live. Yeah? Who? Yeah, never mind. Yeah, but, but he never got there. How do you know? Because of what it said on his trip sheet. He makes the pick up at 10.30, Right. You're telling us. From Luigi's to 87 Barclay is a good half an hour. Even late at night with no traffic. So? So, the cops, you guys, you say he was killed at 1045 or thereabouts. And he's found at 499 Sheridan, just not quite halfway. You got that trip sheet? You know I got it. Law says we got to keep him at least a year. They're all far away in this cabinet. I remember his by heart on account of what happened. That was his last fair. Mm. So the thing had to happen while they were still in the cab. Hey, that's funny. What's funny? The trip sheet. It's gone. How can it be gone? Well, it ain't here. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That figures. Well, what are you saying? Well, why does it figure? Why would anybody want to steal a trip sheet? Because that trip sheet is worth maybe a quarter of a billion bucks. Oh, hi, Lieutenant Davis. Eddie. You want to get the people who killed Sergeant Gomez? I'd do anything for Sergeant Gomez. Okay, I've been through it all with the commissioner and everybody. We have evidence, but it doesn't exist. Huh? A witness who disappears. A taxi cab driver's trip sheet that's missing. A deposition with a signature that might or might not be a forgery. The experts can't agree. Oh, them guys never can. So all we have is you, Eddie. And I want you to make a phone call. You're going to speak to a Mrs. Arthur Drake. Who? Mrs. Arthor Drake. The, the, the wife of that uh, billionaire big shot? Yeah. Why do you want me to talk to her? Because, Eddie, you were framed to cover up the murder of Joe Paulson. And he was killed to cover up what I can only figure out as another murder. That's why nobody's seen him. Arthur Drake, that's Judy's old man. Eddie, Judy Drake? Now, wait, she, she, she's really a sweet kid, Lieutenant. Look, wait a minute. My, 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 my head is clear. It's coming back to me, clear as a bell. Drake, Drake. Oh, man, that's the broom that sweeps the cobwebs clean. I, oh, now, 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 listen, I ran out of Judy's pad down the street. There's a cab. A guy stops me. He says, hey, you dropped your ring. You're sick? Let me take you home. Yeah, yeah. I says, I'll take that cab. He says, you can't? It's taken. And he's right. I look inside. Two guys are asleep on the back seat. One of them is Mr. Drake. Asleep or dead? I don't know. I know they're on the back seat. Are you sure one of them's Mr. Drake? I'm positive. How? Because I just seen his picture in Judy's place. That gray hair, the white mustache. I'd know him anywhere. Okay, Eddie, you have to work for us now. Me? Work for the cops? Yeah. Well, here's what you have to do. Well, Mr. Judson, you said on the telephone that you were a witness to a certain event. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was. Hmm. Uh, please, be seated. Oh, thank you. And, uh, continue. Has the gentleman arrived, Frank? Yes, he's about to begin. Oh, please, don't let me interrupt. 
Well, about 10 to 11 on the night of October 28th, I uh, turned the corner onto uh, Sheridan near Desmond, and I uh, seen his cab with a bunch of people around it. Now, so many at that hour of the night ain't usual for the neighborhood. Yes, continue, Mr. Judson. Well, I was supposed to be the one who killed the guy that drove that cab. Haven't you been in jail? No, I've been let go. The D.A. says he don't have a case against me. But the gun, the ring. Circumstantial evidence. But I seen the cabbie dead on the back seat. And also Mr. Drake. And you folks standing around. Oh, this is a ridiculous accusation. Who would believe it? Okay, you got rid of the cabbie's trip sheet. You bought off the doorman at Luigi's, but you can't take care of the whole restaurant. People know you were there. How did you get home? Benjamin, my regular chauffeur, drove us. Now, you bought him off, too, plus the hoods who knocked off Albert Gomez. But it's no good. Uh, do you wish to be bought off, too? Soon you'll be buying off the whole world. It won't help. You're going to have to produce old Mr. Drake. And you can't do it. How much do you want? Nothing. I just think you better give yourselves up. He's mad. This gentleman is very dangerous. Kill him. <laughs> what a pharaoh's daughter you would have made. Evidently, he's seen through everything. There's no other way. Oh, yes. Oh. There is another way. It's that police lieutenant. Lieutenant Davis? That's right. And I think we got it all down. <laughs> you know, it's as great the other way would have been for you to laugh at him. Deny everything. But I guess it takes more to being a real pharaoh's daughter than just being born rich. <laughs> no, they don't make them like they used to anymore. Even then, bravado, true bravado, could have saved them. But the plot was too far flung. Too many people, too many conflicting interests. And, of course, Lenore claimed she had fallen under Frank's malignant influence. And he made exactly the same counterclaim. Thieves, as you know, must always fall out. But we shall stick together, always. And I shall return in just a few moments. who feel it's their privilege to rule the earth and everyone on it. Ancient kings and even modern dictators have held the absolute power of life and death. But their success depends on how judiciously and cleverly they do it. Our cast included Jack Grimes, Ian Martin, Joan Shea, Nat Colan, and Jordan Charney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Listerine Lozenges. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> I'm E.G. Marshall. There are noises in the night. Noises that are only heard in the stillness of the night. Sighs and groans and creaks and moans. And they are made by no human voice. And they issue from no human throat. What are they? Why does the floor squeak when no one is stepping on it? Is it the house itself? Are there times when a house can become tired and restless and frightened, just like a human being? Our mystery drama, How Quiet the Night, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars William Redfield. It is sponsored in part by Listerine Lozenges and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. So 
society, said someone or other not too long ago, is becoming terribly democratic. Why some of the most vulgar people are in it. Yes, society has gone down in recent years. But if such things bother you, take heart. One place where society is still society, where breeding and position still matter, is in the home of Aeneas Malone, whose blood is of the most cerulean blue. And yet, Aeneas understands the implications of noblesse oblige. His daughter will marry Mr. Russell Porter, the young man of most humble origin. As a matter of fact, the party at the Malone mansion this evening is for the purpose of announcing the engagement. <clears throat> my, my friend, may, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. <clears throat> I have a most happy announcement. My daughter, Sybil, has informed me that she is in love with Mr. Russell Porter. And I see no reason why they should not be married in the spring. Oh, how <laughs> Congratulations, my boy. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, Daddy, I'm so happy. Oh, come on, Russ. I want you to hold me in your arms. <laughs> and the only way you can do it right now is to dance. Well, now, now, this simple, my dear, so many people are waiting to wish you well. Don't neglect your guests. And besides, I want to talk with Russell. Oh, now, Daddy, you're not going to be the stern town. Oh, no, 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 no. It's too late for that. Uh, may I borrow Russell for just a moment? Only for a moment. Russell? Yes, sir. A glass of champagne, Russell? Oh, yes, yeah, thank you, sir. Well, I'm very happy for Sybil. At first, I was, uh, well, apprehensive, Russell, after all. Your family. Well, what about my family, sir? Well, it was one we'd never heard of. What you're trying to say is you were afraid Sybil would be marrying beneath her station? Precisely. Uh, baby, don't, don't be insulted. Why not? Because these prejudices of mine really do no one any harm. Uh, what really counts is the man himself. I uh, had you investigated. You... Now, see here. Now, 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 now. Don't get into a temper about it. One day you will have a daughter, too. <clears throat> well, you come from very poor but very honest, hard-working stock, which is what my stock was five, six generations ago. You're hard-working, ambitious, and sincere. Well, thank you. I want you to quit your job and come in with me. Oh, no, no. I'm doing very well at Kennedy and Company. Well, you do better at Aeneas Malone, Incorporated. I don't think so. Why not? Well, you call all the shots. I'd be nothing but a glorified office boy. That's true. You, you admit it. Oh, yes, yes. But meanwhile, you'd learn every facet of the business. My answer is no. Well, you're a fool. The business has to go to you eventually. Why not learn how to run it now? Well, I... Oh, I'll get on your nerves a great deal of the time. But one thought should be enough to sustain you no matter how rough the going. And what's that? Well, just keep reminding yourself, after all, <laughs> I can't live forever. <laughs> They've all gone home. How alone at last. May I have this dance? What did Daddy have to say to you? He wants to take me into business. How wonderful. I guess I'll just have to outlast him. Oh, he's not really so bad, my darling. How bad would you say he is? Not bad at all. You see, he's... Well, he's obsolete. Why? Because he's a man of principle. Such people are rare these days. Yes. I suppose so. You're a man of principle, too. A man of deep convictions, and that's why I fell in love with you. Ah, now the truth is coming out. You're a man of ideals, and that's what I dreamed of. A man who can be trusted, a man of his word. Oh, now I know why I get these headaches. My halo is on too tight. <laughs> no, you know what I mean. Oh, Sybil, I'm just an ordinary guy, and I hit it lucky. It's like winning a sweepstakes ticket. Oh, I love you so much. And I love you, Sybil, darling. Ah, look, I have one request to make. Anything. I'll work for your father. 
But we won't live here. Oh, of course not. We have to be on our own. I have an apartment. I love your apartment. All right. Then it's settled. Oh, you see, that's a forecast of our life together. That's how quickly and completely and happily we'll solve every question that comes up. Oh, oh, they stopped playing. What do you mean? The music has stopped. What are you saying? I hear it. Oh, and it's so beautiful. How can you hear the music? You see, they're putting away their instruments. Oh. You heard them playing? Well. Darling, do you hear things? Sybil, this is our music. Played at our engagement party. I think I'll hear it for the rest of my life. Hello, Russell. Cora Jean. Yes, Cora Jean. Well, what are you doing here? Didn't think I'd find you. Well, I... I, I... And that's why you went to New York. No, 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 no. It's just that You were I... supposed to go to Chicago, remember? Well, I couldn't find a decent job in Chicago. Oh, oh. And that... Why, you went to New York? Yes, sure. Why didn't you let me know? I, uh... I intended to, but, uh... It's been four months. Cora Jean, I... And now I see. You're engaged to marry someone. Well, it... Do you it... think I'm a... No, no. You took the money so you could go on ahead and find a job and get an apartment and send for me. And we'd be married. You never went to Chicago. You went straight to New York. You had a job all lined up, a fantastic job, and you never told me. Look, I'm sorry. You were I'm here sorry. three weeks, and you ran into this society girl, and now you're set for life, aren't you? Cora Jean, I'm sorry. You've already said that. You better find something else. Well, it happens. You fall in love, you fall out of love. You don't control it. No? No. Why, it's... You could have met someone, suddenly. Oh, tell me more. Well, I... Well, what can I tell you? The truth. Well, you see the truth. I'm here. I'm here in New York. And why am I here? Because I hate Benton's Corners. I hate everything it stands for. I, I hate small towns and small town people and small town horizons and, and small town attitudes. Oh, right. I get the point. I had to get out of there. Out of there to a place where I could become somebody, realize my potential, and and so I, well, I used you. I, I pretended to fall in love with you. Well, I didn't pretend to fall in love with you. I'm sorry. I played for keeps. I'm sorry. You say you're sorry. One more time, and I'll scream. All right, you asked for it. I needed money, money, so I could get out of there. Money so I could establish myself here. So you took mine. I'll pay it back, Cora Jean. I'll pay it back with interest. Oh, I see. And and will that make us even? What do you want? Call me a cheat, a scoundrel? Whatever you call me is true, as far as you're concerned. Cora Jean, I, I, it's hard for me to say this, but it's over. It wasn't hard for you to say it. I thought it came out rather easily. I'll give you your money back. I don't want the money. What do you want? You. I just told you. I don't love you. It doesn't matter. I want you whether you love me or not. Oh, that's crazy. I'm also going to have a baby. What? You want me to repeat it? No, no. No, that, that... No, but that's impossible. No, it isn't. Well, Russell... Look, you... You can't have a baby. You, you should No. Have... I'll pay for no. it. No. No. You can't hold that baby as a sword over my it's head. your baby. I'll deny it. Oh, yes, I suppose you would. But everyone in Benton's Corners knew about you and me. You couldn't prove a thing in a court of law. Oh, Mommy. I could only think of this kind of talk as something that would take place in a nightmare. I pray that's what I'm having now. A nightmare. And maybe I can wake up and we'll be back home. And that nothing has happened. Cora Jean, look. It's over. Now, I'm not happy about it. I'll pay whatever I'll have to. It's your baby. He'll need his father. How many times have I told you you could never prove that in a court of law? Oh. Hello. Darling? Oh, is something the matter? Oh, no, no, no. I just, uh, nothing. Oh, I called to see if you got home safely. Yes. 
Yes, yes, I did. Just fine. Oh, I love you so Give him my regards. What was that? Uh, what was what? Oh, darling, now you're the one who's hearing things. Tell me you love me. Oh, I... I do. Say it, Uncle Darling, say it. I do. Go ahead and say it. It comes so easily to you. Did I hear a voice? A voice? No, I... Oh, uh... Oh, it must be the radio. Will I see you tomorrow? Well, why, why, sure. Are you sure that you're all right with Oh, me? I'm first rate. I, I, I'm first rate, Sybil. Just, uh, I don't know. Maybe a little tired. So am I. Well, you get your rest. Good night, my darling. Good night. Well, Russell, what are you going to do about me? I'll see that you have all the money you need. I told you I want you, Russell. But it's impossible. No, it isn't. You still haven't answered my question. Cora Jean. What you... are you going to do about me? What? What is he going to do? He's engaged to one of the richest girls in the country who is madly in love with him. He has an opportunity to take over one of the wealthiest corporate enterprises in the world. And suddenly, a face from the past arrives to crumble this glorious opportunity to dust. It's quite a problem. A typical problem for a second act, which I shall bring to you in just a few moments. They say that only the truly ruthless can achieve real success. To win requires an intense single-mindedness a complete dedication to one's own interest and a willingness to move forward regardless of what the price might be to others. All his life, Russell Porter has yearned for success. And now that it is within his grasp, we're about to find out how badly he really wants it. What are you going to do about me, Russell? I'm offering you a practical way out. I'm being reasonable. Reasonable? Look, what happened between us happened. It never would have happened if, if, I, if I didn't believe you were in love with me. You lied to me. It wasn't a lie. I meant it at the time, but, but, but time passes. Four months? People can change in four seconds. You are going to marry me, Russ. I keep telling you, you can't prove it. And I keep telling you, I don't have to prove it. If I take you to court, there'll be enough publicity, enough scandal... Do you think Mr. Blue-Blooded Aeneas Malone is going to hold still for it? No, no, no. No, it doesn't matter. She'll stand by me. Sybil will. Oh, I don't know the old gent, but I've seen his picture. He cut her and you off without a cent. Well, you know that's true. And there goes the whole thing. You're only after her for her money. That's a lie. That's all you want from a woman. That's all you wanted from me. It's just that she has more. Okay, okay. Let's cut through it. Look, just settle for what you can get. And I'm going to be generous after... After all, I... I do like you, Cora Jean. Oh, really? How do you behave towards people you hate? You can be a rich woman. You can raise the kid. Oh, don't use the word kid. All right, all right. You, 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 you could raise the child easily, without problems. You, you'd have servants. You could send him to the, to the best schools. I, I'd see to it that he had the best opportunities. And as for you, you'd have money. You could move around, attract a terrific guy. You could get married to someone who would really love you. Oh, Cora Jean, the more I think about it, I... You know, it's strange. I, I I think it's all happened for the best. You... You are incredible. You mean... You mean you'd throw all this away? I want you. Okay. Take me back with you to Benton's Corners. Take me back to where I'll suffocate to death. The air is like wine. And I'll go back to my job, teaching school to ignorant, vacuous little... When are we going home, Russ? Are you out of your mind? No, but you are out of yours. Do you want to live with a man who hates you? It's a temporary madness. It will pass. It was. The way she said it. The way she looked at me. 
in that calm, quiet manner of hers. That schoolteacher pose, as if I were one of her unruly students. And I saw my whole life before me. We would be together day and night. Days we would teach school at Benton Corners High, where at least part of the time I could avoid her. But at night, we'd be home. Home in one of those suffocating tract houses on a suffocating half-acre plot with a suffocating mortgage. I couldn't breathe in Benton's corners. And then, without even thinking, I knew what I was going to do. Why, why had I suddenly decided without even going through the thought process? Why was the answer right in my mouth before my brain even had time to formulate the question? Let's go home, Gorgine. What? Well, that's what you came here for, to convince me. All right, you convinced me. It's a temporary madness. Let's go. Get your coat. Now? This minute? Yes. We'll get in the car, drive all night, and be back in Benton's Corners by noon tomorrow. But don't you want to say goodbye to her? No. I I know what it is to be left. Oh, Russell, I, I feel sorry for her. It can't be helped. But you can't just disappear. I'll write her a letter. Come on. Let's go. If we're going... I heard the news on the radio about the engagement. And you know what I did? I didn't say a word. No, not to anyone. I just packed an overnight bag and I walked to the bus stop and I got on and left. I don't think anyone even saw me go. Russ. Yes? You're not listening to a single word. I am. You'll be happy. I'm happy now. No, I mean really happy. Oh, Russ. You really are. Small town boy, it's what you want. That's right. It's what I want. And I love you. I love you too. No, no, you don't, Russ. Not, not now. Right now you hate me. Right now you're like a little boy who's being punished. But in a while, you'll see I'm right. She kept on babbling, and I kept driving. I had no intention of going back to Benton's corner. I had no desire to marry her. All I needed was a lonely, deserted stretch of road. I didn't even have to think it out. It was all in my head. It was in the books I'd read, the great classic books. An American Tragedy by Dreiser. The Red and the Black by Stendhal. I was one of their heroes. The young man whose path to success is being blocked by a woman he no longer loves and no longer wants. There's only one thing he can do about it. Only one thing. Stopping here, Russ. Oh, I'm uh, worried about that knocking sound in the engine. I hope it's just a loose fan belt. <laughs> this is really the middle of nowhere. Well, you might as well get out and stretch your legs. All right. It'll be hours before we come to a place where we can stop. Now, just let me get at that hood. Oh, the air is so pleasant. Ah, uh, yes, yes, just when I thought. The belt's loose. I think I've got a wrench in the back. So quiet the night. So still the stars. So silent the world below. So... You say the rest of it, Russell. Go ahead. Russell! Yes, it was a quiet night. And she was dead. I was rather surprised at how easy it is to kill someone. How fragile. Just a few sharp blows and, and it's over. It was wild country. I dragged her body into the woods. Dug the hole. And I buried her. And then, well, what else can I tell you? I went home. And when I got home... I began to worry. The whole thing had been done without thinking. Suppose someone had seen us. But no, no one had seen us. I knew everything was going to be all right. I just knew it. Darling? Russell, darling? Hmm? Oh, uh, yes, dear. What? Well, what is it? 
Well, first of all, shall I pour you another cup of tea? Oh, no. No, thank you, dear. Secondly, you must give me your list. What list? The list of people you want to invite to the wedding. Oh, oh, that list? Yes, dear. Oh, well, Sybil, I, I was thinking about... I, I don't want to invite anyone. But this is your wedding, too. Well, darling, my folks are all dead. I I, I have no real friends. I, I haven't been here long enough to make any. Oh, but surely back home... Oh, is... I had no real friends there either. It's one of the reasons I left. Be someone you like, someone who was kind. Well, yes, yes, perhaps one or two. But you see, I'm, I'm sure they'd... Well, they'd feel awkward and uh, out of place. Russell, may I ask you something? Anything. Why did you stop teaching school? Oh, I don't know. I suppose I wanted the adventure and the excitement of business. Oh, I'm not so sure you do, Russell. At heart, you're a romantic, a teacher. You're wrong. Well, if you ever change your mind... Change my mind about what? Well, about being a stockbroker in Daddy's office. If you should ever want to go back to the classroom... Never. Well, even if you should want to go back to Benton's Corner. What are you saying? Whatever you want is all right with me. Darling, don't ever say another word about going back to to the sticks. Oh, but life is so peaceful, so enriching there. So quiet the night, so still the stars, so silent the world below. No, wait, wait. What are you saying? Oh, it's a poem. Where? Where did you... Oh, it's so sad. I I was reading in the paper. A girl was murdered. Oh. Murdered? Who? Oh, I, I don't even remember. Oh, it's such a terrible thing. Someone had killed her and buried her body in the woods and some hunters. Oh, I don't even want to talk about it. Uh, what about the, uh... What about the poem? Oh, I guess the reporter was looking for human interest. It turns out that the girl was a poet. Yes? Well, I, I mean, she taught school, but she was a poet. And they printed the poem. So quiet the night, so still the stars, so silent the world below. Um, dearest, I'm, I have to be going. Well, so soon? I thought we'd play golf. I know, I know, but I, I, I have things to clear up at the office. Well... Yeah. See you tonight. Tonight and every night. All right. They found her body. Maybe I should have dug it deeper, but what's the difference? There, there was nothing that could tire to me. No evidence, no proof. Right now is the crucial moment. Right now is the time to remember that I must not panic. I must be calm, relaxed, and in complete control. I have nothing to fear. Nothing. Nothing at all. Just a moment. Evening, Russ. Maybury. Sheriff Maybury. Mind if I come in, Russ? Oh, well, sure. I, I, I mean, of, of course. Yes, of course. Come in. Thanks. Um, sit down. Thanks. Well, how are you, Sheriff? Oh, about the same... Russell, Corjean Buxton's been killed. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, I read about it in the paper. Oh, shame. She was a lovely girl. Oh, yes, yes. Weren't you two uh, sort of engaged? Well, not really. It was just one of those things. Which things? Well, you know how it is. I was the only single male teacher in the high school. She was the only woman teacher who was single, and we both liked each other. We certainly got along, so... People thought... To... Yeah, people sure did. Well, it's like, you know, a situation seems logical, so you kind of take it for granted. I mean, so many people thought it would make sense for Cora Jean and me to get married that they that they honestly believed it was going to happen. And uh, wasn't it? Oh, no. Well, wasn't there talk Cora Jean had given you her life savings to go to New York and get established and then send for her? I can't imagine the basis for any such talk. Well, the fact is, she did withdraw all her money from the bank the day before you left town. Well, that doesn't mean she gave it to me. No, I guess it don't. Sheriff, what is it you want to see me about? I want to talk to you about Cora Jean's murder. 
Well, what would I know about it? Oh, why, you know more about it than anybody else in the whole world, Russell. Why do you say that? Because you killed her. They're a plain-spoken group, these folks from Benton's Corners. When they've got something on their minds, they say it. But how does Sheriff Mabry know what exists to link our man Russell with the crime? He was careful not to leave any clues. Well, I'll give you a hint. Perhaps it's not something he left with her. It could be something she left with him. And we'll examine that when I return in just a moment with Act Three. Life was so simple and yet so rewarding for young Russell Porter. One of the wealthiest heiresses in the city of New York fell deeply in love with him. She not only has money, she is breathtakingly beautiful. So, suppose he did have to commit murder to protect his investment. Wasn't this worth it? And what could have gone wrong? He was so careful. Sheriff Mabry, how can you say I killed Cora Jean? It's the truth, Russ. You don't have one single shred of proof. Oh, no, there's plenty of proof. Such as? Well, for one thing, she was going to have a baby. It wasn't mine, and no one can prove it. She gave you that money. No, no, wait. She may have taken it from the bank, but no one can prove that she gave it to me. As a matter of fact, that's why she might have been killed. Don't you see? For the money. $5,000 is a lot. How would you know it was $5,000? Oh, well, well, she told me. She told me once. Yes, yes, that's what she had. She came here to New York to see you. But she wasn't killed in New York. She was killed way out in the country, halfway between... Yeah, halfway between here and Benton's Corners. Okay, all right, well... So she was coming to New York for, for whatever reason. And, and someone killed her for the money. No. How can you say no? Because she was coming from New York when she was killed. How can you hope to prove it? She was riding in a car with somebody. Okay. Then that's the somebody who killed her. She had already been to New York. She'd come here to see you. You said you'd take her home. You told her some kind of lie. You were bound back for Benton's Corners. And the reason I say that is her body was found on the north side of the road. That's the way you were headed. You wouldn't have killed her and then carried her across the highway to bury her. Where is your proof for all this, Sheriff? The kind of proof do I need? Facts, evidence, witnesses. Russell, you know you did it. Now it's up to you to do the manly thing and confess. You're crazy. Russell, I'm giving you a chance. A chance? A chance to know peace. You'll never have any as long as you live. You'll see her face. You'll hear her voice. Sheriff, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. You are not going to railroad me for a murder I never committed. Tell that to Cora Jean, Russ. Cora Jean is dead. You'll see her, Russ. Like I said, you'll see her and hear her. She was quite a girl, Russ. Why did you kill her? But I didn't, Sheriff. I did... It's oh, like what's the you use? say, Russ, I don't have the evidence and the witnesses, but any time you want to come back and take your medicine, just give me a call, eh? Well, I gotta be going. Think about it, Russ. What was there to think about? Mayberry. What did he know? What could he know? Nothing. He was only making some shrewd guesses. He had no evidence. He's trying to frighten me and get me to lose control. I won't. I'm in the clear. I must not panic. Russ? Russ? What? What is it, Cora Jean? After you went home last night, I wrote a poem. Would you like to hear it? Sure. So quiet the night, so still the stars, so silent the world below. Cora Jean. Cora Jean. Oh, it was a dream. Just a dream. Oh, 
for a moment, I thought... What did you think? Cora Jean? Yes, Russell? Cora Jean, it... It can't be. I hear your voice. Yes. But you're dead. You're dead. I always wanted you, Russell. Because you and I are so right for each other. No. No, this is mad. This is mad. I, I'm dreaming. No, I'm dreaming. Russell. You're awake. Let me read you the poem. I don't want to hear it. So quiet the night. So still the stars. So silent shut the world. Up. I said, shut up. I've got to get hold of myself. I've got to keep tight control. Can't let my mind go. I know, I know. I'm, I'm going to have a little trouble with my conscience. Now that's to be expected. After all, murder. And that's what it was. Of course, I had no choice. I, I had to. All right, I'll, I'll have some bad nights. It, but it'll go away. The thing to remember is not to panic. Take a deep breath. Collect your thoughts and... Uh... Rafa. Yes. Yes, Cora Jean. I'm ready for you. I can handle my conscience. I can handle you. Children, excuse me, I have to mingle. Yes, Daddy. Oh, how he'll ever top this, I don't know. There have been benefit performances and benefit performances, but never one like this. Are you enjoying the show, darling? Oh, sure. Sure, of course. It's just that you seem so distracted. Do you think so? Uh, maybe I'm distracted. By what? Oh, that poem just keeps running through my head. So quiet tonight. So still the stars. Um, now, why should that poem... Well, I think of that poor murdered girl. Darling, you can't let your mind dwell on morbid things. Oh, you're right. You're right. But why can't I forget? Look, the intermission's almost over. Let's go inside. Let's enjoy the play. <laughs> it's really funny. Really funny. So quiet the night. So still the stars. Yes? I wrote a new poem. Do you want to hear it? Of course, Cora Jean. I always want to hear you. No. No, no, no. This is the same dream. Why do you say it's a dream? Because, because... Because I'm dead? You're dead. Yes. You are dead. That doesn't matter. I don't have to be alive for you to hear me. I won't crack. I won't. Cora Jean, what do you want? I want you. Hello. Hello, Russ. Sheriff Mayberry, do you know what time it is? Just about midnight. I want to tell you I'm heading back home and wondered if you wanted to come with me. Now, Sheriff, I... Look, whatever you're doing, it isn't going to work. What is it you think I'm doing? You're trying to destroy my mind. No, Russ. I'm trying to appeal to your better nature. That's all. All right, all right. Whoever you are, whatever you are, regardless of what this is all about, I'm wise to it. I won't crack. I won't break down. And soon, all of this, whatever it is, will be gone. So quiet the night. So still the stars. So silent. Go ahead, go ahead. It's all in my imagination. It's all in my imagination. Go ahead. Why didn't you tell me? Tell you what, Sybil? About the poem. The poem? Why didn't you tell me that well, the girl who wrote it comes from your hometown? Oh. Benton's Corner. Well, it's just a coincidence. And that you knew her. You knew her very well. Oh, I wouldn't say I knew her very well. But you must have. I'm, I'm so fascinated by that poem. I, I wanted to get a copy of the whole thing, and so... Well, I called the newspaper editor in Benton's Corners. Oh. Such a nice lady. She talked to me for hours, and she said that the poem was printed originally in her paper and that the title was To Russell. <laughs> you must have known her. Well, yes, I knew her. Were you in love with her? In love? You can tell me. It doesn't matter. 
It all belongs to the time before you met me. Were you in love with her? No, no, but she... She was very romantic. Well, tell me about her. What was she like? Well, I don't know. She was just, she was just some girl. I, look, I'm, I'm sick of talking about her, Sybil, and that, and that silly poem. Now, you remember you wanted a list from me. A list? Yes, of guests I wanted to have for the wedding, and I said I didn't want to. Well, you reminded me, the uh, editor of the Benton's Corners Chronicle, the one you spoke to, she's a lovely lady, uh, Margaret Hennings Witherspoon. I, I'd like to invite her. I, Sybil? We'll talk about it, Russell. Darling... Are you all right? Oh, well, I'm just a little bit tired. I, I'd better get to bed early. Oh, Sybil, you're angry. No, I'm not angry. But I, I, I don't want to leave like this. Like what? Well, as if, as if something's wrong. I mean, you're annoyed because I, I, because I didn't want to talk about that silly poem. I'm not. I say you are. Well, suppose I am. Tell me why. Well, that's just it. I don't know why. Oh, Russell... Please, please, everything will be all right in the morning. Oh, I could have kicked myself. It was that poem, that poem, that stupid bit of doggerel. How quiet the night. How still the stars. How silent the world below. How mute the breeze. How calm the tree. Poor Jean. Why are you always so alarmed, so surprised to see me, Russell? I don't believe it. I don't believe you're here. You must believe it. I'm all you've got now. Say what you like. I won't lose my grip. Your grip? On what? Reality. <laughs> What's reality? Reality is a girl named Sybil Marone. Forget she has a hundred million dollars. She's a girl of many moods. And she doesn't love you anymore. That's... That's a lie. You mean it doesn't happen? <laughs> Your own words, Russell. You fall in love, you fall out of love. You don't control it. She is all gossip. And when you shouted, I'm sick of that silly poem, you broke the spell. That's not true. Oh, Russell, it's over. In your heart, you know it's over. <laughs> you killed me for nothing. No. No, I didn't kill you. You see, you're still alive. You killed me, Russell. I killed you, but you're not dead enough. I buried you, but not deep enough. I'm dead, Russell. Dead. No, you're alive. Still alive. Hi, Russ. Ah, Sheriff. Yes, yes. You're just the man I want to see. You mean you want to come back with me? I don't have to. You see, I didn't kill her. Russ. No, listen. No, listen. You see... I'll admit it. I wanted to kill her. I drove her out to the spot, but I didn't hit her hard enough. She's still alive. Come on. Come on. I'll show you. I'll show you. Sure, Russell. Sure. <laughs> I'll get that for you. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Oh, I wanted to speak to Russell. Who are you? An old friend, ma'am. Uh, just a minute. Russ? <sighs> Russ? <clears throat> Hello, ma'am. I guess he can't talk right now. Can I take a message? Well, just tell him that I... I was acting silly and that we should never part with a quarrel and that I love him very much and... Oh, I'll tell him myself tomorrow. Goodbye. Goodbye, ma'am. Russ, that was... Oh, quiet the night. It's Cora Jean. She's talking to us, reciting her poem. So still... The star. The poem she wrote for me. Don't you hear? Sure, sure, I hear. How silent the world below. Well, the world didn't remain silent when Russell confessed. There was a clamor for a trial, and there was a verdict. And Russell was declared hopelessly insane. However, Sybil stood by him. She visits him every day and recites poetry. Most of it from an anthology of the poems of Cora Jean Buxton, who, as it turns out, has become quite famous in death. I'll be back shortly. The 
the sounds in the night, the voices in the night, the songs of the night. How can we hear, how can we see what isn't there? Well, it's a question that deserves to be raised, but it certainly should not be dismissed as the imaginings of the neurotic or the demented. After all, if you see what eludes me, who is to say which of us has the firmer grip on reality? Our cast included William Redfield, Patricia Elliott, Marion Seldes, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Listerine Lozenges. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. That's the top of the news as it looks from here. New York in the 1890s. Mr. Louis Sherry's New York, a city of elegance. If J.P. Morgan wanted to dine in the style to which he was accustomed, he'd go to Mr. Louis Sherry's celebrated restaurant. Good evening, sir. The highlight of dinner at Sherry's was the ice cream dessert. Louis Sherry's ice cream still has that old-fashioned flavor, yet none of today's additives. It's made only from real cream, milk, pure cane sugar, egg yolks, natural flavor, no artificial anything. You'll see that we haven't lost our taste for old-fashioned elegance. Mr. Louis Sherry's ice cream, the natural flavor of the 1890s and the 1970s. the attainment of fame, money, and the love of women, about running faster, reaching out further, and grasping more. The running and the reaching and the grasping are supposed to bring success. But now and then, perhaps more often than we know, they can also bring horror. So perhaps this is not a success story at all. Perhaps it is a tale of horror. Our mystery drama, The Image, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Norman Rose and William Redfield. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Listerine Lozenges. I'll be back shortly with Act One. No one in this tale is poor or sick or obscure or friendless or unloved. Our central character, Evan Elliott, is rich. He is famous. He is in perfect health. He is loved by a beautiful woman and treasured by a loyal friend, which is where our story begins. My friendship with Evan started a long time ago. Before he'd had anything published, he brought me his first book because nobody else, frankly, would touch it. I said I'd handle it because I didn't have much of anything else to do. And I sold it to the first publisher I sent it to. And it was a smash. Not just a hit, not just a bestseller, a smash. Everybody that could read bought a copy. Well, the rest is history. He was my client. I was his agent. And together we made money. But over and above and beyond all that, we were friends. For 15 years, the day he busted into my office. Billy. Hi, Ev. Oh, buddy, have I got news for you. You finished a new book. Huh? I'm getting married. You're getting... Well, how about that? Congratulations. Billy boy, I am marrying Christine Dewar. 
the, the Christine Dewar? The one and only. The one they call the richest girl in the world? That Christine Dewar? That's the girl. Beautiful, too. I saw a picture of her once. Well, she doesn't like publicity, but I'll change all that. We'll get married the day before the new book comes out. That'll give authenticity to everything I've written about the ultra-rich. You know, the way they live and conduct themselves. Everybody will believe it because they'll figure that I know. They'll eat it up. You'll ask Doris and me to the wedding, I trust. I want to talk to you about the wedding. Um, would it be better to have a big cathedral type of wedding, you know, or just to sneak off to a justice of the peace? Well, that's up to the lady, isn't it? Well, she's so infatuated with my machismo, she'll walk down any aisle, road, street, or cow path I choose. Yes, I don't know how you do it, I swear. Really, this book's got to be a blockbuster, the biggest yet. You can't afford to slip in this business. You have to top yourself every time. And that is hard, very hard. What's that got to do with getting married? Billy... Billy, I am not just a writer. You see, by now, I'm a celebrity. People aren't just interested in what I write. They're interested in me, what I do, how I live. Uh, yes, I suppose. And I think that we'll... Yeah, we'll run away and get married, so it'll come as a complete surprise, and the press will pick it up and sensationalize it. Now, you'll set up the interviews, and later on, maybe we can arrange for a picture spread. Yeah, sure. Ev, wait a minute. Do you... Do you love this girl? Love her? <laughs> Certainly I love her. What a crazy question. It all went off just the way he planned it. The book hit the stores. The next day, Evan and Christine were married in a broken-down office across the river with Doris and me for witnesses. I leaked it to the media, so they turned out in full force. Evan wore the old familiar blue jeans. Christine wore blue jeans, too. But Doris said they were custom-made and cost a mint. Why do I feel like she's living underwater? Like she's got a mouth full of seaweed. As time passed, Christine began to look as though she'd been left underwater for a long time. I don't know, she got thinner and thinner and paler and paler. The way she talked or didn't talk got stranger and stranger. Billy, I'm worried about that girl. Oh, come on. Chris is all right. I think we should keep an eye on her. She loves him. She worships him. That's a whole different thing. You put somebody on a pedestal the way she's put him, you're always looking up. Not at. Up. And to look up, you have to be down. Must be nice to be looked up to. Worshipped. I look at you. And I love you. Well, Ev loves Chris. Love. She's part of the image, and that's all she'll ever be. What image? Oh, good grief, Billy. You've known Evan Elliott longer than I have. Don't you know he's building an image? First, it was just the successful writer. No, that's not an image. He did that. Then it was the big man about town. Go to all the parties. Then sell a book to the movies. Do the whole Hollywood scene. Have a big publicized thing with a gorgeous movie actress. Then he got engaged to a duchess. Well, I don't see what's so wrong with any of those things. The reasons are wrong. He's so scared, he won't make it. But, darling, he has made it. If anybody's made it, he has. Why don't you ask him? I will bet you he'll say no. Not yet, he'd say. Not quite yet. Just give me a few more years, just a few years more, and I'll have it all. Then everybody will worship me, and I can start feeling good about myself. Oh, Doris, come on. You just don't know him at all. Oh, I know him. And I know you. You've put him on a pedestal, too. Where would I be without Evan? I owe everything to him. He's my best friend and I'm his. There's nothing could bust up our friendship, Doris, so don't try. Now, I'm warning you. Don't try. Well, anyway, we'll have them over for dinner. All right? All right. Sure. It was never too comfortable having them for dinner. Or going to their place either. I never knew just why... Doris didn't always use too much tact talking to Evan. And Christine, well, Doris was right about that. There was something strange about Christine. And whatever it was, it was getting stranger. Conversation was rough going all through dinner. And afterward, having coffee in the living room, it didn't get any easier. Well, brandy, anyone? We have cognac. Cointreau, creme de menthe, uh, both green and white. Oh, I think I'd like... You wouldn't like anything. Well, I, I just thought... Uh, don't, don't, don't think. Just sit there and look beautiful. 
I guess I don't want anything. Um, making progress on the new book, Ev? Mm, some. Oh, he's done a lot. How would you know? Well, I saw... You read what I've written? No. You I... sneaked in and read it? No. I don't let anybody do that. I didn't read it. I just saw a lot of pages with typing on them. I didn't read any of it. I really didn't, Evan. You know I wouldn't do anything like that. Well, what if she did? I mean, what's the big deal? My wife is not a critic. I love what you write. I do. I do. I love what you write. There you are, you see. You are a critic. <laughs> uh, Chris is very emotional tonight. Uh, she's going to have a baby. Chris! You mean it? Oh, that... That is oh, great. Oh, it's wonderful. Hey, aren't you happy about it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Come on. We're going home. Oh, not yet. Right what? now. Chris, get your things. I will. I will. Hey, wait a minute. You plan a bomb in our laps and then you run off. What for? I want to get her home. Chris, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. I'll see you tomorrow, Billy. I'll drop around to the office. Yeah, good night, Chris. It's wonderful about the baby. Thank you both. Come on. C Chris, I'll talk to you. T t well, that was what you might call an abrupt departure. Yeah. I don't know. Ev was kind of rough on Christine tonight. Don't tell me the pedestal is beginning to rock. Don't tell me the image is getting tarnished. Now, Doris, don't be crude. Evan is my friend. As long as he stays on the pedestal, Billy. Once he comes down from there. Oh, oh watch out. Doris does get feelings about things. You know, the first ten years we were married, I used to make fun of her and her feelings. The last few years I've stopped because most of her feelings turned out to be right. But I drew the line at what she said about Evan. I felt... I felt I was privileged to be Evan's friend. Being his friend was the most important thing in my life. The most... Well, I, I mean, next to Doris, of course. Well, anyway, next morning, Ev came to my office. Boy, you certainly took off in a hurry last night. Well, I had to get Christine home. When's the big event? Huh? Well, I mean... When is she going to have the baby? Oh, well, that's what I have to talk to you about. Now, look, Billy, I want you to arrange it for me. What? Arrange what? What do you mean, arrange? Because we don't seem to be able to create one of our own. That's why. Oh. Are you sure? Oh, we've been trying long enough, so there's got to be something wrong. Well, well, what? I mean, have you been to doctors? Christine has been to that gynecologist of hers who gives me the creeps. Well, what did he say? He says there's nothing wrong with her. Well, have you seen anyone? Me? There's nothing wrong with me. Yeah, but I don't see why. I mean, Evan, look, how do I come into this? If you're both all right, it's a problem you can solve in time. I don't want in time. I want a child right now, a child. Now, what do you want to do, let me down? Can't you understand plain English? I want you to help me to arrange it. But I can't do this. Oh. Oh, 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 you mean you want to adopt? Me? Adopt the child? No, no, no. I want this child to be mine. Now, now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Evan, that's not fair to the kid or or to adoption, which can work... I mean, it can work beautifully for anyone. Well, let it work for them, not for me. I want mine. And most of all, I need it right now. Need what? For Chris to be pregnant. Why? Why do you need it? Why? Why? Because there is interest in me. Billy in me and everything that I do. Don't you know that? Good Lord, after all those years with me, don't you have the slightest idea what it means to be a celebrity, to have celebrity status? Well, I, I'm i sorry. I, ne I, I, I never thought about well, it. Well, think about it. I am the country's foremost writer. But that is not all that I am. I am a public figure. Millions of people are fascinated by me and everything that happens to me. And right now, what I need is to be a father... Yes, it'll be a whole new thing. You mean like a... a kind of image? Yes, if you want to call it that. Well, I don't know, Evan. You got me going. I don't quite see what if I had to spell it out for you. Doesn't Doris have a doctor? Yes. Well, then, maybe you or she could introduce Christine to him and have them work it out. Fine, work out what? But... Timing, the making it happen. 
Look, this is the space age. If it can't be natural, there's an artificial way of having a child. But still a child of my own. He's got to be mine. Have you discussed this with Christine? Is it what she wants? You want it. You leave that up to me. All right. If you're sure you want to go through with this, I'll I'll, I'll ask Doris and see what she can suggest. If you're sure. I told you. Can't you understand how much I need it? Well, I have to tell you, I I was shocked. Doris and I had never had any children. I, I don't know if we really wanted to. Of course, when we didn't, we just, well, we accepted it. And went on the way we were, which had always been a pretty good way to go. We loved each other. We were happy. We were willing to leave it to fate. Why couldn't Evan, I wondered. Still, I, I was Evan's best friend, and I'd, I'd promised to speak to Doris, and... I did. No, I won't have any part of it. Do you understand? And you shouldn't either. Uh, Doris, darling, I'm his friend. I'm his best friend. You are not his friend. You're his satellite. He's the sun and you revolve around him. You live in his light and you walk in his shadow. You're just like Christine. That's not friendship and that's not love. You're followers, the both of you. He's the prince and you're his humble attendant. That's not fair, darling. It's fair and it's accurate. Look... Just leave me out of it completely. I am not going to help him do his dirty work. I'm not going to promote this image of himself he's building. Let him work on it by himself and leave me out of it. What is an image? Offhand, we should describe it as the appearance we would like to present to others. The way we would like to be perceived. Having little or nothing to do with what we are. The dictionary puts it more concisely when it says, image is an imitation of a person. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. We were discussing the word image, and we picked the simplest of definitions, an imitation of a person. But follow the dictionary... And its meanings reach deeper than that. For example, at random, a counterpart. For example, that child is the image of his mother. Or, more importantly, a symbol or an emblem. Or finally, an embodiment, such as God created man in his own image. All of which serves to explain why a reluctant Billy friend, agent, and alter ego of a man he considered a towering genius, went home at his master's command to seek his wife's assistance. I am not going to help Evan build his image. Darling, wait a minute. You keep saying image, image. What image? The one he has been working on all of his life. And now he's decided what the image needs is a child, and he wants it now. Well, he's, he, he's getting pretty well past 40. He is well into his 50s, and you know it. Oh, all right, I'm sorry. I forget the years are passing, and I, 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 but I can understand him better remembering. Are you trying to tell me you're sorry we didn't have children? Oh, no, 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 honey, no. We're, we're fine just the way we are. But look, Doris, you won't help me out on this. I mean... Find out how you get a thing like that done. I don't have the foggiest, do you? Not the remotest. You won't call uh, Dr. What's-his-name? No, I won't. Well, all you'd have to do would be to get the information, then you give it to me and I give it to Ev, and that's the end of it. No. Okay, well, give me the name of your doctor, then. No. Doris, I promise. No, no, and no. All right. He's not the only doctor in town. I'll find somebody else. I don't know why you won't help me out. Maybe I'm jealous. Jealous? Of what? Of who? Of you. And the way you feel about Evan. Doris? Jealous? Ridiculous. I must certainly be, if not the most, as faithful a husband as any woman ever had. I mean, Doris and I weren't just married. We were friends, companions, as well as lovers. We had a true togetherness. Oh, except with someone that's out of the mold above and beyond everyone as a genius like Evan, you can't rationalize a Dylan Thomas, a James Joyce. You either accept them or reject them. Doris rejected him, but 
Evan, I could not reject. So, well, anyway, it wasn't hard. I found him as doctor and called him to tell him. Good. You're a good guy, Billy. I'll have Chris in his office tomorrow. With you? Oh, not me. No need for me. You mean you won't go with Chris? My presence isn't needed. For what? It's her problem, not mine. Oh, Evan, won't she expect you to go with her? Well, I, I thought about that and decided no. You see, it uh, might get out to the press. What? That we're planning a child. It's not time to release that yet. Later, much later, I might do a piece on it. Why? You're my friend. I take your word for everything. You take Chris there tomorrow morning. Now, oh, come on. Let's get it over with. I don't know why I went along with him, but I did. If I'd have known, but I didn't. All I knew was he was my friend. So I made the arrangements, and sure enough, the next morning, Chris showed up. Chris. You know, you don't have to go through with this. Yes, I do. Evan said you wanted to. Did he say that? Well, practically. Well, I'm, yeah, yeah, he practically said that. But, but you don't have to do it. It's your life. My life is with him. I don't have any other life. Evan is the one big happening in my whole dumb existence. You're very loyal, aren't you? Well, of course I am. And besides, I'd like to have a baby. It would be the second big happening in my life. Oh, I... Chris, I just wish you looked, well, happier. Maybe later I'll get happy. Let's go, shall we? If you say so. I say so. The baby was born nine months later. And they named him William after me. Well, that pleased me because I'd gone through a lot with Evan. Doris was kind of difficult about the whole thing. She was getting to really hate Ev, calling him a, a fake, a phony. But she'd always liked Christine. And we used to babysit with William now and then, and Doris got really fond of the boy. And then came the bombshell. Doris and I were sitting at home one evening... Ev! Well, hello. Who is it, honey? Uh, it, it's Evan. Uh, come on in, Ev. I'm not disturbing you, am I? No, no, no. No, no. We're just sitting around. Well, uh, what brings you out on Hello, the... Doris. Hello, Evan. Um, do you want a drink or anything? No, thanks. Well, sit down, why don't you? I've got something to tell you. Um, want me to clear out? You better stay. I don't mind. No, no. Stay. What's up, Ev? Christine told me something tonight. She said she never went to the doctor with you, Billy. But she did. I drove her there myself. She never went through with it. She said that? That's what she said. Maybe you better tell us the whole thing, Evan. We were sitting around after dinner, and I got curious all of a sudden about the whole procedure. You mean you'd never asked you before? I never wanted to know before. You'd think she'd want to tell you. Well, she brought it up once or twice, but I wasn't ready to hear it. But if she wanted to tell you... Tonight, I was ready, so I asked to plain out how it was. Why do you want to know? You never wanted to know before. Well, I'm thinking of writing about it. I need to know the details. Writing about it? Publishing? Oh, not right now. Maybe never, I don't know. But it would make a fascinating piece. All the psychological ramifications. Whose ramifications? Whose psychology? Knowing I wasn't the father. Who said you weren't? You mean it worked? What we couldn't achieve together was made a reality in a lab? You asked me to go. I went. I did what you told me to do. I got pregnant. I had the baby. The baby's here. I love the baby. I love you. Yeah. But to write about it, I need all your thoughts, your feelings. You never wanted to know my feelings before. Why now? I'm a writer. Feelings are what I deal in. Anybody's feelings? Anybody that I'm interested in. And right now, I'm interested in yours. But it's as though you're feeding off me. 
eating me up, little by little. <laughs> Nonsense. Now, come on. Tell me what happened. Start at the beginning. A year ago, you went to the doctor's office. Billy drove you. When I got there, Billy said I didn't have to go through with it. If I didn't want to. But I said I wanted to. Well, that's right, Ed. That's all true. We had quite a talk about it, and when we got there, I told her again that it was up to her. It was her decision, her life, that she didn't have to do it if she didn't want to. I mean, she must have told you all about that. She did. And she said she wouldn't let you go inside the building with her. She didn't even want me to wait for her. She said she'd take a taxi home, but I knew she wouldn't really want that, so I waited. And then what happened? What I did first was to buy some cigarettes. Cigarettes? You don't smoke. I was nervous. Oh, yes, sure. Naturally. I lit a cigarette and I started to smoke it, but it made me feel sick. And somebody came over and asked me, was I all right? And I said, yes, but could I go to the ladies' room and where was it? And they told me, and I went there, but but I never smoked a cigarette. I just stood for a long time and looked at myself in the mirror. And you know what I thought? What did you think? I thought, I'm married to the greatest writer in the world, the most wonderful man, and I'm not worthy of him. But I'll never let him down. I know every curve of his body and the warmth and the drive of him. And I cannot accept anything programmed by a machine. If I cannot produce a baby for him, I'll die. And I should die. Because it's the only thing I have to offer as a woman. To make him immortal. And uh, I was ashamed and I, I, I ran out. I ran to the nearest bar. A drink was more important than what you had to do? It gave me courage for what I had to do. Not one drink. Quite a few. I... I brought you a child, as you asked for. You mean... I mean... uh, There was a man at the bar. I suppose there's always a man at the bar. And I used him far more than he ever dreamed he was using me. How could you? He was a human being. At least he was... A human being. Do you mind telling me who he was? I would mind very much. One of your society boyfriends, huh? You don't know anybody else. Yes, that's that's who it must have been. All right, which one? Come on. Tell me. Christine, tell me who it was. No, I won't. I'll never tell. Uh, oh! Chris? Christine? I... Billy, I, I hit her. Not... Not very hard, really. More of a slap, but but she fell down. She hit her head against something. She... Billy... She's dead. Of course, they convicted him. He didn't put up any defense. He really didn't have any. He didn't seem to want any. He said his wife had told him the child wasn't his and he'd hit her. Nobody blamed him. Everybody sympathized. His books sold like crazy, even the early ones. They gave him two to five years for involuntary manslaughter. The last time I saw him before they led him away, he said, They tell me I can have a tape recorder, Billy, in my cell. All right, I'll bring you one. I may do a book on prison life. Oh, it'll be a smash. He was still my friend. I felt sorry for him even though he didn't act like he needed my sympathy. All Doris said was... His whole problem, he couldn't produce a child. That sure didn't fit into the image. Yes, a tale of horror. Tell me, have you ever been alone and depressed in some public place, a restaurant, a park? And have you looked around at the other people and felt certain that they all, all of them, were happy and content 
and leading exciting, wonderful lives. While you... Be very careful of such feelings. They are most unreliable. We'll return shortly with Act Three. Evan Elliott has gone to jail for two to five years. Involuntary manslaughter. He struck his wife when she refused to name the father of her child. We continue our story as Evan is visited in his cell by his agent and closest friend. Hi, Ev. Hi, Billy. You look great. <laughs> I do, don't I? Yeah. yeah. I was just looking at myself in the mirror when you showed up. I look better than I've looked in years. It's amazing. You feel good? Marvelous. You? Oh, fine. fine. Doris? Great. Uh, the baby's fine, too. Good. Uh, Christine's folks were perfectly willing to have the boy live with us. Why shouldn't they be? Trophy snob? No, 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 no. They were really concerned uh, the, about the baby, I mean. Snob's just the same. I know him. You don't. Oh. Uh, have you tried out the tape recorder? No, not yet. Uh, let me know if it works okay. If not, I'll get you another one. Well, I haven't had anything to write about. I thought you were going to do a book on prison life. Well, you see, this is a minimum security prison. Nobody wants to read about model prisoners and all that. They want vicious convicts, rotten food, foul language. Here you mind your manners, and they mind theirs, and everybody gets along. Might be interesting at that. I doubt it. Ev, can I ask you something? Sure, ask away. Uh, Doris was wondering, and not that it's any of her business or mine either. Wondering what? Well... At your trial, you left out the part about the possibility that the child could have been produced medically by artificial means. Oh? Uh -huh. Did I? Well, what difference? Well, without that, it looked as though Christine was a girl who played around. Huh. You know, I, I never thought of that. And we all know she wasn't. Well, why didn't you mention it at the time? Well, tell you the truth, I didn't think about it till Doris brought it up. Pity she didn't bring it up sooner. By that time, the trial was over. Yeah, well, just as well. It wouldn't have fitted into the scenario. It would have been a false note, all wrong. I guess so. What you just said, making it look like Chris was some kind of a tramp, you know, that didn't occur to me. You may be right. I might do something about that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks, old buddy. Well, I just thought I'd mention it. Dollars thought I should. I'll tell you what. Um, I'll do a book. A book about what? About Christine, dummy. Her whole story, start to finish. She told me the story of her life practically from the day she was born. And some miserable life it was, too. Talk about your poor little rich girls. She never had a moment that wasn't dull until she met me, yeah. And I put in all her problems about having a child and how she was incapable with me. She had to go to a doctor to have it done. Oh, Billy, it'll play. I know it will. Now, look, uh, clear out, will you, kid? i I, I got to get this on tape. I watched him get out the tape recorder, set the cartridge, and turn the thing on. He'd already forgotten I'd ever been there. All the way home, I wondered if I should tell Doris what had gone on in the cell. I hadn't even told her I was going to visit Ev. Because, frankly, it was very hard for me to talk to her about him. By now, she... Well, she really hated him. Not for any one specific thing he'd done. She just hated him for what he was. She called him the image maker. I'm home, Doris. I'll be right there. Baby all right? Mm-hmm. Fine. Still had a hard day? No. No. Not really. What'd you do? I saw Ev today. How is he? Well, Dollar, she wouldn't believe it, but he looks great. When I walked in, he was looking at himself in the mirror, and he said so himself. He never looked better. Not bragging or anything. He just... <laughs> he really did. He just looked great. Yeah? So? Well, we got to talking. He asked for you. That's nice. I said, how's the tape recorder working? And he said he hadn't tried it out yet. Then I brought up... You know, what you said about his leaving out everything about trying to have a child artificially. I bet he never even told his lawyer. Well, I don't know that, but he said he hadn't brought it up at the trial because it didn't seem like the right place for it. Or the right time. 
But then I said maybe people would get the idea that Chris was a... Well, you know, that she played around, and that got him interested. Oh, well, of course. He's not going to have anybody thinking any woman would be unfaithful to him. No, darling, no. I, I think he was really concerned. Is, um... Is he going to mention anywhere the name of the child's father? Well, he doesn't know who the real father is, so he can't very well put it in the book. I guess not. He thinks it was some old bow of hers. But we know better. Don't we, Billy? What? We know better, you and I. <laughs> Doris, what are you talking about? We know who the real father is. We do? Who? You. What makes you say a thing like that? Oh, we've been married almost 20 years. Doris, please, I never, never... Do you want me to tell you what happened? If you think you know. When... When Christine came out of that building, she got into your car, didn't she? And she was crying, right? Go on. She cried all the way home. And you tried to tell her Evan would understand she couldn't go through with it. Am I right? I said that, yeah. But she said no. He expected a child from her. He'd make her go back to that place. Am I still right? Yeah, yeah. That's about uh, what she said. And when you got to her house, she begged you to come inside with her. Didn't she? Dara, she... Uh... Uh, I... Yes. And at first you said no. Well, I, I, I didn't really want to. I, no? I swear. Doris, I swear to you. But she was crying and carrying on. And I... she was Evan's wife. What? That was the thing that finally got you upstairs. That she was Evan's wife. That this was one more way to get close to Evan... As close as possible without actually... Now, hold it. Hold it right there. Don't go saying things you'll be sorry for. In a crazy kind of way, you've been in love with Evan for years. Now, you're out of your mind. I mean, I I, I admire him, sure, you but I... You admire him. You'd like to be like him. You'd like to have his talent, his money, his fame. You couldn't have any of those things. But you could have his wife. And you did. For two weeks, I hated Doris. I didn't talk to her. And then, one day... Doris? Yes, Billy? You know, uh, with Christine, that one time, that was the only time since we got married. I know that. I don't think I could go on living without you. I don't think you'll have to. Next day, I went to see Evan in his cell. I didn't know what I was going to say to him or how I was going to say it. Hello, Ev. Oh. Hi there, Billy. I was just looking to see if I need a shave. <laughs> Looks like I do. I've been working so hard, I forgot to take time out. Working on the book about Christine? Yeah. Oh, it's a winner. I know it. Look, I, I, I want to play you the opening. Wait till I rewind this thing. Evan... I've got something to tell you. Yeah? I'm the father of Christine's child. You? I waited and drove her away from the doctors. She was upset, shaky, shattered, really, because she felt she'd failed you. She she wanted a drink. I, I wasn't averse myself. We uh, went to a bar. We had our drinks. Too many. We, uh, well, we... We commiserated with each other in a way you could never understand, and and uh, and then I drove her home. And that's all? No. There was a moment of... N now, look, laugh if you want. There was a moment of truth when we got there, when nakedly she was terrified of facing you and, and admitting what she had failed to do, and, and when I... Well, don't stop now. 
All right, if you will have it, when I wondered after all my years if I could just for once do something originally by myself, if not for myself, and somehow it happened, and I did. Well, what do you know? I... I thought I should tell you. You? I, I hope you won't put it in the book. Doris hopes you won't, on, you, you know, on account of the baby. Uh, I'll have to think about it. We thought we could adopt the baby someday. Billy, listen to this. Ev, do you have to? Shh. Now you listen. She wore her money like a shroud. She was immobile inside her huge fortune, as though entombed in it. How's that for an opening? Ev, please. Well, it gets better. She looked helpless and quiescent, like a chrysalis within a cocoon, taking no nourishment and seeming to need none. Ev, really, listen, I wish you... will you? She'd been born into this pupil state of opulence. A man absolutely absorbed in his own words. He didn't seem like a man at all, more like a freak. A monster building an image of himself to put on display. I couldn't believe in him at all. And I knew I couldn't be his friend anymore. I wasn't sure I ever had been. Inside the thick membrane of her enormous wealth, she had never stirred or made the least movement to free herself. I don't think he noticed when I left. Fateful day, the tape droned on as I walked, and the sound of his voice was the last thing I heard. thought about him, looking at his own face, listening to his own voice, absolutely indifferent to other faces, other voices, other lives. He built a cell within a cell, and he seemed content. where he manipulates people and events solely to aggrandize himself. And what is more horrible than his fate? To live quite apart from his fellow men, doomed forever to study his own face, listen to his own voice, feel no pulse but his own. That is to have no life at all. I'll be back shortly. warning. Beware the image makers, those who carefully construct imitations of themselves for you to admire and adore. The Bible says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Yes, and most particularly, when the image you make is the image of yourself. Our cast included Norman Rose, William Redfield, Terry Keene, and Marion Seldes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Listerine Lozenges and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Marshall, keeper of this little lighthouse that casts its feeble flicker into the awesome darkness all about us. This time we are concerned with time itself. Time. Elusive time. Time is never the same in two distant places, never the same for different people. For some, time goes slowly. For others, time goes quickly. Some use time. Others pass it. And yet, isn't time the staff of life? Time is really all we have. Because when time runs out... Our mystery drama, The Murder Market, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Rosemary Murphy. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Arnheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. People have investments in stocks and in businesses and all sorts of enterprises. But these are investments involving money. The most important investment someone can make is the investment in another human being. Because this is an investment in time. After all, lost money can always be regained. But lost time? Our heroine's name is Theodora. Theodora Lewis. Significant might be the fact that no one has ever called her Thea or Teddy or Dora or Dory. It's always been Theodora or Miss Lewis. That's because she's such a sensible young lady. That's the word that broke the camel's back. Sensible. It's a word I've hated all my life. And what did it ever get me? Finally, I did something about it. Something wild and crazy. Yes, me, Theodore Lewis. I had no way of knowing it would be that kind of day. It me started, prosaically enough, the way all my days did. Good morning, Mother. Morning, dear. Your breakfast is ready. I'm not hungry. Oh, be sensible, dear. A solid breakfast is the foundation for the entire day. Is Stanley coming to dinner tonight? No. He has to study. Oh, poor boy. He works so hard. But it'll be worth it, you'll see. Yes, Mother. In just a few years, he'll have his Ph.D. In another few years, I'll be 40. Darling, what the two of you are doing now is difficult. Don't worry, Mother. I'll wait for Stanley. I have to. There isn't anyone else around who wants me. Theodora, what a thing to say. You're in love with Stanley. Yes, Mother, I... I was only joking. Well, never do it again. Do what? Tell jokes. Why not? Men don't like it. All this women's live to the contrary, notwithstanding. Now, mother... Femininity is a fragile essence that a woman must carefully preserve. I understand. And I've preserved mine for 36 years. Stanley worked in a bank. I had a job in an insurance office nearby. At noon, we'd meet in the park for lunch. Each of us brought a sandwich from home. Well, it was sensible. Stanley estimated that between us, we saved over $20 a week that way. Our savings went into our joint bank account. We already had enough of the down payment on a house. Well, at this rate, by the end of the year, we'll have enough for the furniture. Stanley. Yes, Theodora? On our itemized list, I notice a down payment fund, a furniture fund, a contingency fund. We have to have one. Suppose one of us gets sick. Shouldn't we also have a separate fund for a honeymoon? A honeymoon? Well, shouldn't we go on a trip? Oh. Well, actually, if we did take some time off from our jobs... Yes? We should put that time to very good use. How? Oh, make the new house shipshape. We, well, I could do the painting and you could do the planting and... But aren't we entitled to a honeymoon, even a small one? Ah, oh, yeah, right. After the ceremony, we should go to Atlantic City for a day or two and then come back and get started on the house. Hey, it's, it's five to one. We'd better be going back to our jobs. Uh, see you tomorrow, darling. Uh, call me tonight, Stanley. Uh, listen, I just had this thought. It isn't as if we don't see each other every day, huh? And it's late night call. Well, it's 17 cents a night, and over the year, that adds up to... Oh, Stanley. Uh, 
Forget it, darling. Sure. We are entitled to a few luxuries. We said goodbye to each other, and I started back toward my office. A little boy who was chasing a big yellow and red ball ran into me. He was about four years old, but very well mannered. He apologized with a shy smile. He had the bluest eyes I ever saw. I looked at the sky and noticed a perfect match. And looking at the sky and the bright sun and the green, green grass, I said to myself, why do I have to rush back to that stuffy office? In 15 years, I've never been as much as 15 minutes late. I I would just enjoy this day for a little while. If they didn't like it. Well, if they didn't like it... You do talk to yourself a lot, girl. That's a fact. I beg your pardon. Do you want to be late to your office? Well, go ahead and be late. Are you a mind reader? No, I'm a lip reader. You mean after 15 years, they'd fire you if you walked in late just one time? No, they wouldn't do that, but they wouldn't like it. What do you do? I, I'm a secretary in an insurance company. Who? Bailey and Witherspoon. Do you have to work for a living? I have to support myself and my mother. She's been a widow for over... I yeah, see how lonely and insecure you are. What did you say? Here I am, a perfect stranger. If I ask you two or three more questions, you'll be ready to pour out the story of your life. Uh, where are you going? Let go of my arm, please. I think it'd be better for you if you listen to me. That's a police officer just down the end of the path. What about it? What about it? I- I'm going to... You're going to do nothing, and you know it. <laughs> you see, you're even too timid to call for help. You're afraid there might be publicity, something in the morning paper, an item in tonight's newscast. And somehow it might even be interpreted as your fault. After all, I'm a very dignified old gentleman. Please, let go of my arm. Will you stay? I'll stay. All right. Let's get back to your job. You worked there 15 years. You must be pretty good. How would you know? Well, would they have kept you if you weren't? It so happens I am very good. The only reason I spoke to you in the first place is that you remind me of a girl I used to know. Oh, I see. What do you think you see? The prologue to a proposition. Oh, don't be cavalier about propositions, girl. How many of them did you ever get in your life, anyway? You, you'd be surprised. Don't play woman of the world with me. I know you too well. How would you know me? You only started talking to me a minute ago. I come here every day. I see you sitting on the bench with him. I say him because he dresses like a man. Well, personally, I doubt it. Stanley is the finest man I know. Then you're in a bad way. Why does he sit here and munch peanut butter sandwiches? Why didn't he take you out to lunch? Because we can't afford it. When I said you reminded me of a girl, that wasn't the start of a proposition. What was it? No, just an old man and nostalgia. But now I see you're not like her at all. Well, on the surface, perhaps, but uh, you don't have her fire, her ambition. Who, who was this girl? Well, somebody I knew almost... 50 years ago. Doesn't matter now. Well, it's costing me too much money just to sit here in the sun. Right, girl? It's hidden. What's hidden? It's hidden under a layer of fear and lack of confidence, but I think you got the basic stuff. Go out. Do something with your life before it's too late. down. You'll be late to work. Theodora, I'm talking to you. Yes, uh, yes, Mother. You know how annoyed they are at the office when you're not on time. Yes, Mother. What are you staring at? This picture. Look. Oh, that J.P. Carson. I've heard of him. Everybody's heard of J.P. Carson. Not a finger in almost everything. It says he's acquired another company. So that man was J.P. Carson himself. Which man? The man I met. 
You met J.P. Carson? Where? When? Yesterday on a park bench. What would J.P. Carson be doing on a park bench? Better run along, dear. I wonder if he'd remember me. All the way downtown on the crowded bus, I kept trying not to think about it. I even refused to face what it was. I got up at my stop, as usual, went up to my office, as usual, and maybe I wasn't concentrating on my work, but Mr. Peterson came by and warned me about being careful. And his tone of voice was even nastier than usual. And before I knew it, I was on my feet and I was looking down at this mean, vicious little man and... Was this me? Was I actually saying, Mr. Peterson, I have put up with you and your nasty temper for more years than I care to remember. Take your frustrations out on someone else. I shall no longer pay the price for all your personal inadequacies. I quit. Well, I'll be... You'll be what? How'd you get in here? I, I got off the elevator. The receptionist was busy, so I just... Sneaked by her. Ah. We must never tell her. It'll break her heart. Then I stopped the girl. I said I was new here. Where's the boss's office? (laughs) She told me. And? I want a job. You got a job? I quit. Well, after 15 years? Well, why do you want to work for me? Because you make me feel I'm somebody. I can learn from you. And I'm a good secretary. Will you give me a job? I have two secretaries now, and they complain about overwork. Uh, answer the phone. You're working. Oh, Mr. Carson. Answer the phone. Mr. Carson's office. Is he in? This is Al Ferris. Are you in for Mr. Al Ferris? Ask him what he wants. Mr. Carson would like to know what you want. You tell that bandit. You tell Mr. Carson that I'm going to kill him. He says... He says he's going to kill you. You tell him... He's not man enough. Mr. Carson says you're not... Um, Mr. Carson says, don't be silly. Yeah, you'd better believe it. And Carson had better believe it, and the whole world had better believe it. Before Carson drives me to ruin and disgrace, I'm going to kill him. How's the new job? The first time she answers the phone, did you hear what happened? What kind of operator is this J.P. Carson, anyhow? Maybe Theodora will hope she was back in the insurance office when I return to you with Act Two in just a few moments. We're told that certain primitive tribes taught their children to swim by tossing them into the water. In this manner, they developed some excellent swimmers. They also lost quite a few kids. However, there are those people who deliberately provoke a sink-or-swim situation. For example, our heroine, Miss Theodora Lewis. Did you hear what I said? Yes, Mr. Ferris. You tell Carson. You tell him I intend to kill him. Hand me that phone. Ferris. Listen, Carson. Now, you listen. Don't force me. I'm ready for you, Ferris. Instead of weeping bitter tears, you should be out raising the money. But, Mr. Carson... Oh, if I had a dollar for every threat on my life, I'd have retired 20 years ago. Uh, what's your name? Theodora Lewis. Oh. I knew a girl named Theodora once. I met her in Shanghai, 1934, when I was with the Marines. She said she was a Russian princess. <laughs> That's another story. Now... I have a business meeting at the Lake Forest Resort Hotel in New Hampshire. I have to straighten some people out. Uh, what time is it? Ten o'clock. Uh, you'll have to rush. Take a cab home, pack enough things for four or five days, and be at the airport in time for a 12.30 takeoff. But, Mr. Carson... You'll see a sign that says private aviation. Ask for my plane. You mean you want me to go with you? Uh, you're my secretary, aren't you? But, but it's such short notice. When you work for me, you're on the alert 24 hours a day. But... I have to meet my fiancé at noon. Not in the park? For lunch? I want to break that up as the last thing I ever do. Uh, take a tennis racket and some swimsuits, and uh, the dinner is always formal. 
I can borrow a dress. No, you can't. You buy something up there and put it on your expense account. I can't afford to have a secretary with a hand-me-down look. Well, don't just stand there. We don't have all day. What? What do you mean you're going up to New Hampshire? Mother, I, I don't have time to go into it. Uh, let me have your suitcase. Oh, what will Stanley say? I'll call him at the bank. Theodora, you know how they frown on personal calls. Then you'll have to go down to the park at noon and explain. Explain what? Theodora, I strongly disapprove, and I suspect Stanley will too. You had such a good, secure job. And this man, Carson, is no, notorious. He's always involved in a lawsuit. Mother, I only have one life, and if I wait too long, I'll never get a chance to live it. Theodora, you used to be so Sensible. What's gotten into you? I don't know, Mother, but it's wonderful. I thought it was a dream at first. Only yesterday, I had been bored with my life. And today, I had an exciting, thrilling new job. Suddenly, I was staying at the kind of luxurious resort I had only seen in the movies. In my briefcase, you'll find a folder marked United Merchandising. You got it? Yes. Now, uh, type up copies of all papers in the folder. Do it in your room in the morning before breakfast, and then you can have the rest of the day off. I'll be in a meeting most of the time. Is there anything else? Well, that's enough for one day and one night. Oh, a uh, pretty dress. You do have good taste. <laughs> Pity Stanley can't appreciate it. Mr. Carson, I'll thank you not to discuss my, my personal affairs. I don't like that shade of red. Matches your hair. Now, there are some very interesting, unattached men you can meet up here. Mr. Carson, I happen to be engaged. Yeah, I know. To, what's his name? Stanley. <laughs> Please. How could you even consider him? Mr. Carson, I, I must... Oh, consider... be quiet. Why do you think I brought you here? Because I figured you could do yourself some good. Good? Come in. Carson. I have to talk to you. See me tomorrow, Ferris. Now, look, tomorrow's too late. I'll be frozen out. You should have thought of that before. J.P., let's make a deal. Don't make me laugh. You'll... You'll regret it. Please, close the door gently on your way out. Won't you give me a break? Will you have to give me a break? I don't have the money. You know how to raise it. All right. I warned you. The trouble with you, Al, is that you don't know how to lose. And the trouble with you, J.P., because you don't know how to win. That was the same Mr. Ferris who called you at the office? Oh, yes. Al Ferris. He looks desperate. They all do. All? Mm. They all get over it. See you at breakfast. Good night, Mr. Carson. Now, wait a minute. Check the folder and see if you have a paper marked options. Options? Uh, no. No, I don't see it. Well, I must have forgotten to place them in the folder. Uh, look through the briefcase. Yes, sir. Here it is. It says options. Good. Put it in the folder. And now, tell me what's wrong. Wrong? Yes. What's wrong? Nothing. Uh, you have to learn to lie better than that. Especially if you want to get along in this world. Well? Why do you carry a gun in your briefcase? My dear Theodora... You obviously refer to my forty-five caliber Colt automatic pistol. Whatever it is. I never know when I might need one. Have, have you ever needed one? On occasion. I never knew anybody who carried a gun around with him. I mean, except policemen. Well, I play a rough game for high stakes. You talk about a game and, and, and rough. But those men who are here... They look like wealthy, important business leaders. Well, it's all a game. And in games, you have winners and losers. Some people lose hard. They say things like Al Ferris did. But uh... none of these characters has the guts to follow through. I expect to die of a very ripe old age. Actually, I'm going to fall off the tree. Uh, you got that option paper? Yes, sir. Right here in the folder. Guard it with your life. I will, sir. Uh, actually, you might take the forty-five. Me? I wouldn't even know how to hold it. You speak around with me and you might have to learn. Besides, I am morally opposed. Ah, uh, to... you get that from Stanley? 
Mr. Carson, I want one thing understood. Yes? I... I love Stanley. I doubt it. You may not approve of him, but you don't have the right to... That's where you're wrong. I can't have a secretary whose life is being ruined by some anemic imitation of a man. Stanley is is kind and considerate and sincere. You're scraping the bottom of the barrel. I hate you. I inspire that emotion in people. All right, getting back to Stanley. Don't you say another word about Stanley. You you make me so mad, I I could kill you. All right, close the door gently. Oh, oh I beg your pardon. No, no, it was my fault. I, I should have watched where I was going. I was just sweeping the hall. Excuse me. It's all right. Uh, hey, listen. You look like a nice lady. Can I give you a word of advice? About what? I'm an expert. Because I also married a guy more than twice my age. Never fight with them. They can get a heart attack. Oh, oh we're not married. Oh, oh, you're not married. Okay. Well, at least take the old buzzard for all he's got. Oh, oh no. I, it's nothing like that. Yeah? Nothing like what? Like, you know what? I, I, I'm just his secretary. Oh, sure. I mean it. And that conversation I just overheard, that didn't exactly sound like a business talk between a man and his secretary. If you'll excuse me. Look, I'm just trying to do you a good turn. Just a little bit here. I've been around. You look kind of new at this. New at what? Ain't going to be just fresh looking and pretty forever. I don't have the faintest idea Go what... home. Marry that nice guy. That his name is Stanley. Stanley? How do you know about Stanley? What's the matter? I never went to the movies. I never seen the story before. What story? Your story. You want to do something for your guy, Stanley. So you figure you'll go away for the weekend with sports. That's the most ridiculous... I heard the whole thing. You were telling him all about Stanley, and he laughed at you. And that got you so mad, you said you'd kill him. Now, did you deny that... I don't know why I'm standing here listening to you. I'm only saying this because I'm a little older than you. I'd like to help you. Straighten you out. Don't kill him. But I have no intention. Don't. You can't get away with it. And second, Stanley has got to stand up on his own two feet. You know what I mean? Thank you for your advice, even though none of it was necessary. I was amused. I was more... I was even flattered... To think that I, Theodore Lewis, could be mistaken for a seductive woman of the world. The kind who who went away with rich men for weekends. Hello. Oh, it's Mr. Ferris. You're, uh, Carson's secretary. Yes. New, aren't you? Very new. Well, then, let me, uh, let me buy you a drink. Thank you, I, I don't drink. Well, you have to drink something. Well, I... Let's just, uh... Step into the bar. But I... It could be worth your while. What did you wish to talk about, Mr. Ferris? You're his secretary. We've established that. Oh, you know all the papers he has with him up here. Where is this leading us, Mr. Ferris? I'd like to have a certain paper that's in his possession right now. Why don't you ask him for it? Oh, I know what his answer would be. Then you know what my answer must be. I'll give you $5,000 for it. Good night, Mr. Ferris. Miss Lewis, don't force me to do something desperate. You ever in your entire life, I, who had never experienced even the slightest semblance of intrigue was now just about immersed in it. And don't think I wasn't enjoying every single second of it. Well, I finally fell asleep. I had a very strange dream. Although none of it was as startling as reality or the reality of the past 12 hours. It seemed my dream was interrupted by a loud explosion. And did I wake up? I, I don't know. But I became conscious of a loud, insistent knocking. And now, I was wide awake. It, it, it was still dark outside, but I thought perhaps, well, it was Mr. Carson. Some important emergency. 
No rest for the weary on this job. I slipped into my robe. Just a minute. Oh. Uh, Miss uh, Theodora Lewis? Yes. W- what are you staring at? Well, I guess I'm staring at you. May I come in? Why? Oh, uh, my name is Frank Harmon. I'm the sheriff. The sheriff? Uh, yes, the sheriff of this county. Well, come in, I, I suppose. Is something wrong? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, there's been a murder. A murder? Who? Uh, Mr. Carson. Mr. Carson? N- no, no, it, it can't be true. He was found shot to death about an hour ago. Oh, that, that's terrible. Uh, do you know who did it? Well, we have a prime suspect. Who? You. You talk about action. Here's what we gave you in rapid succession. She meets Mr. Carson on a park bench. She gets a job as his secretary. She is accused of being his mistress and now of being his murderer. How much deeper can she fall? For that, you must wait for Act Three, which I shall bring you in just a few moments. All of us walk close to the brink. And most of us are unaware of it. For life is usually predictable, despite the poets and philosophers. We do know what tomorrow will bring. It will bring us whatever it brought us today and yesterday. For in the main, we cling to the security of the tried and the true. It's only when we attempt to break the mold. Well, look at what happened to Theodora Lewis. I... you... Accusing me of murder, Sheriff? Well, let's say you're a prime suspect. But I, I would have no... When was the last time you saw Mr. Carson? Uh, just, just after dinner. Where? In his suite. And you didn't shoot him? No, of course not. Why should I have killed Mr. Carson? Well, someone heard you threaten him. But I never... You have a witness. <laughs> you say, you get me so mad, I could kill you. And did you say that, Miss Lewis? Not, not in that, not in that context. But you did say, you get me so mad, I could kill you. I was standing there right outside the door. Why aren't you telling the truth? I am telling the truth. The truth being that you went away with him so you could help Stanley get a promotion. This is, this, Stanley doesn't work for Mr. Carson. All right, thank you, Betty. We can talk to you again if we need you. You should have listened to me. Now get yourself a good lawyer. Uh, Miss Lewis, would you mind telling us why did you come up here with Mr. Carson? I came up here because he asked me to. Well, that doesn't really answer the question. Why did he ask you to? Because I, because I was his secretary. Oh, That should answer the question. Well, I'm afraid it doesn't. Why not? Because you were not his secretary. But he hired me. Well, I checked with the company, and there's no record of an employee named Theodora Lewis. He only hired me yesterday. Well, even so, you should have been on payroll. Well, no, because... Yes? You see, I... Oh, I know how this is going to sound. I... I sneaked into his office without anyone seeing me. And I was hired then and there, on the spot. Yes. And he never had a chance to say anything about it to anyone because two hours later we were headed up here, you know, on a matter of business. Mm. You sneaked into his office? To ask for a job. Uh, Yes. Uh, Well, what made you do that? We had met the day before. Oh. Where? On a park bench. And he told me I was wasting my life. Yes. Which I was, but now I wish I'd never listened to him. Well, if you didn't kill him, who did? Who did? Oh, I know. I know a man who had the motive and who threatened him. 
The murderer is Mr. Al Ferris. You threatened Mr. Carson twice. Once on the phone at his office. Oh, that is not true. And again this evening in his room in front of a witness. And who's the witness? Me. Oh, Sheriff, I'm afraid this poor young lady is uh, clutching at straws. Do you deny that you threatened Mr. Carson? Why would I threaten Mr. Carson? Because he... He had you at a disadvantage. Some sort of business disadvantage. That's why you threatened him. Oh, now, that is an absolute lie. J.P. Carson and I were the best of friends. But I heard you say... Uh, that will have to be all, Miss Lewis. But... You can go now, Mr. Ferris. But like everyone else, you'll have to remain here at the hotel. Why, certainly, Sheriff. And I, uh... I'm sorry, Miss Lewis. I tell you, he killed Carson... Carson had him in a bind. What sort of bind? I don't know. Well, you were his secretary. You don't know? I told you, I just started working for him. You just started and he took you up here? He wanted me to meet interesting men. Oh, really? Why? Because he disapproved of my fiancé. Stanley. Stanley. I know Betty Halverson. She's a busybody and a gossip. But she doesn't lie. If she says she heard you threaten to kill Carson, she heard you. I was exasperated. I resented his attitude about Stanley, and so I, I, I just... Well, don't you ever get angry? Not often. You meet him on a park bench, and he becomes your fairy godfather. You go away with him for the weekend. He promised. You delivered. He reneged. Do you believe that? Do I believe it? No. Thank you, Sheriff. But I'm just about the only one who doesn't. To everyone else, it's open and shut. Why don't you believe it? Uh, because I guess I'm not very good sheriff. I think you're a marvel. No, no. If I were any good, would I be up here? And besides, I... I don't want you to be guilty. Oh, why? What am I to you? I wish I could say I had a strong clue or line of investigation, but the truth is I find you attractive, and I, uh... Sheriff, what are you saying? What am I saying? I'm repeating what my old man said to me. Son, one day when you least expect it, you're going to run into a woman... And it can be under the craziest circumstances. But you're going to know then and there, straight out, that this is the woman. Sheriff, is everybody crazy? Probably. Sheriff, I'm engaged. That doesn't alter the case. Sheriff, am, am I going to be accused of this murder? Yes. But if you think I'm innocent... Now, you listen to me. A lot of people had motives. Not me. If everybody thinks we've already got the killer, then the real murderer might relax. That doesn't sound like a foolproof plan to me. Well, that's the best one I can come up with. I got all these people confined to the hotel. I can only keep them a couple days where I can observe them. And once they scatter, I lose them forever. And you're going to announce that, that I'm the prime suspect? Let's have some lunch. I'm not hungry. Well, it's noontime. You've got to be hungry. Please, I, I, I'm too upset. Uh, Mr. Sheriff, I'm Miss Lewis' room. What you got? Well, when in doubt, try them out. And send up the steak and the lobster. Yeah, the two. With everything. I'm not used to big lunches. Well, if you're going to live up here, you'll learn to appreciate them. Who says I'm going to... Now, listen, if I'm going to be considered the prime suspect, then... It'll have to be in the papers. Yes, I guess so. And everybody will read it. Most likely. But... Yes? Maybe he won't read about it. Well, how are you today? Never mind about me. Have you found anything? How about lunch? Frank, you're not getting anywhere, are you? Well, these are big and important guys up here. And they're putting on the pressure to be allowed to leave. 
state's attorney says we can't hold them indefinitely, and so... Yes. Thanks. The evidence against you is strictly circumstantial. I mean... I understand. And even if they decide to go ahead, you have every chance of being acquitted. And for the rest of my life, people will suspect that I... Excuse me. Yes? Who? Hold it. Stanley Prentice wants to see you. Stanley? He read about it. You want to see him? What must he be thinking? Is he in love with you? Yes. Well, then tell him the truth. And he won't think anything. You don't know Stanley. You know something? I think you don't know Stanley. Theodora, the reports in the paper, are they true? No. But, but, but everyone says... I don't care what everyone says. I'm but, innocent. But the papers say the police have a strong case against you. I want you to know I'm innocent. Well, I had to run up here and see you. I told them at the bank that I was sick. That was foolish. Everyone at your office knows we're engaged. They'll figure you came up here to... Well, we, we have to be sensible, Theodora. I need the job uh, for the time being. And so when Mr. Dittmar, the president, came over to my desk with the newspaper, he wanted to know if, if it was the same Theodora Lewis who was my fiancée. And, and, what did you tell him? Uh, well, he's so straight-laced and conservative and all. I, I, I had to say it was another person by that name. Stanley. Oh, Theodora, I believe you uh, privately. I think you better go back to New York. Yes, I, I can't afford two days off in a row. But I came here to tell you I'm in back of you. I, I believe in you, dear. Thank you, Stanley. I believe in you, too. Goodbye, darling. I, I'll write to you every day. Please do, but uh, don't use the bank stationery. Goodbye. I uh, didn't mean to eavesdrop. It's all right. You feeling okay? He was right. Mr. Carson was right about Stanley. And that's why I was so furious with him. Because he was right. Isn't that ridiculous? Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Yes? Hold it. It's J.P. Carson's lawyer. He's just flown up here. He's asking if you know about papers that are missing from Carson's briefcase. Yes. Uh, tell him I've got... Hang up. Of course. That's it. The United Merchandising Options. I've got them right here. Carson wanted copies. Then why don't you give them to his lawyer? I will. As soon as Ferris is arrested for murder. Ferris? The room. Uh, Mr. Carson's room. Was it in disorder, as if someone were searching for something? Yes, it looked that way. Ferris killed him, ransacked the room for these papers. Well, how do you know? Ferris was caught short in the stock market. Here, his agreement entered into last year. He has to deliver 100,000 shares of United Merchandising to Carson at 25. That's because he thought the stock would go down. But today is delivery day, and the stock is selling for 60. Now, now you know why Ferris wanted to kill Carson. But these papers aren't enough to convict Ferris. Suppose we see how anxious he is to get them. I know why you killed Carson. I, I don't know what you're talking about. He had you in the ringer. You can't prove that. Why should I? If I turn the options over to his estate, you're still in trouble. If I gave them to you, you could burn them, couldn't you? Keep talking. Isn't it your turn to say something? All right, how much do you want? 250000 too high. To save you $4 million? Poor Mr. Carson. Pay my price, or you'll have killed him for nothing. Don't make me kill you, too. What good will it do you? You won't have the option. Oh, yes, I will. <laughs> you gave yourself away. You've got them, which means they have to be in this room somewhere. Well, Mr. Ferris, how many people are you prepared to kill? You'll have to kill me and Deputy Adams here. 
Get to get Hollis. Oh, look, Sheriff, I, 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 I was desperate. I, I had everything at stake. Well, what could I do? I... Well, right now, you have to go to jail. Jim, well, will you escort this gentleman? If he'd given me the option to behave like a gentleman, he'd, he'd be alive now. He, he could... Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Do you realize this is the first murder case I ever solved? Well, it's really the first murder case we ever had. And you solved it. Thanks for believing in me. You were the only one who believed I was innocent. Up here we get mostly poachers, speeders. Frank. Nothing serious. Frank. City folks get lost in the woods. Frank. Uh, what? What is it? Kiss me, please. <laughs> The transformation of Theodora Lewis, who is now Mrs. Frank Harmon, and doing nicely up in the mountains of New Hampshire. And do you remember what J.P. Carson said about Theodora's engagement to Stanley? He said, I'll break that up if it's the last thing I ever do. He had the gift of prophecy, that man. But like all prophets, he could see other people's futures, but not his own. I'll be back in a few moments. Pieces of paper. Fragile, perishable pieces of paper. This is what so much of life is all about. A piece of paper says you're wealthy. A piece of paper says you're a pauper. A piece of paper places you in a royal palace. A piece of paper puts you in a prison or a scaffold. Is your life just so many pieces of paper, too? We have pieces of paper on which we weave these fables seven times a week. Our cast included Rosemary Murphy, Robert Dryden, Anne Petoniak, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Listerine Lozenges. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. W.O.R. Mystery Theater was also brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program was produced by CBS Radio. This is Barry Farber. Join us immediately following the 8 o'clock news. Farber, join us immediately following the 8 o'clock news. Farber, join us immediately following the 8 o'clock news. Farber, join us immediately following the 8 o'clock news. Farber, join us immediately following the 8 o'clock news. Farber, join us immediately following the 8 o'clock news. Farber, join us immediately following the 8 o'clock
was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Ralph Bell. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Now, People's Year End Double Issue is here with the 25 most intriguing people of the year. From Betty Ford to Dolly Parton, from Woody to Cher, Patty Hearst to Jerry Brown. They're all here in this special double issue of People, the winners and losers of 75, and people to watch for in 76. Jacker and Streisand, Catherine Hepburn and Audrey too, Doris Day and Rudolph Nureyev, plus a squad of Olympic hopefuls and a line of first ladies in waiting. It's the biggest, most exciting issue of People ever. Pick up a copy today. Henry Clay Cortland is what they mean when they say distinguished looking. Henry Clay is tall, no longer young, but middle age, which ravages so many of us, has only enhanced him. The few strands of gray serve to make the rest of his hair seem thicker. The very few lines in his face lend him a kind of attractive maturity. His deep, pleasant voice, his kindly manner, are great assets to his company, which deals in that arcane area known as public relations and marketing strategy. Well, Henry Clay is sitting in his office, and he is displaying a side of him that his clients very rarely get to see. Tell me why I'm being pessimistic, George. I didn't say you were being pessimistic. I said you were being unduly pessimistic. I think I'm the only one around here who's facing reality. Henry, we have this new account. What new account? The, the Dutchman. They're not Dutch, they're German. What's the difference? It's a fortune. And we don't have them as an account, not yet. They want you to come over and sign a contract, don't they? No. If you read the letter, you'll see. I did read the letter. They want me to come over and sell them on the idea of letting us handle their American marketing strategy. Same thing, Henry. Once you get there, once you get a clear shot of the client, it's in the bag. We're going to have to make a major effort to land these people. Henry, when are you leaving for Munich? Oh, I have to remind you, George, these are not the best of times. It's worth a million bucks clear the very first year. And from there, the sky's the limit. Well... You've got to go for it. The long bomb, the big play, we're rolling the dice, partner. I know. Three years ago, we're sitting pretty. Then a scandal hits Continental Engines, and poof, they're out of it. Jollis and wire and cable collapses. Everybody else starts pulling in their horns. That's why we need those Belgians. Germans. Whatever. Uh, Neues Welt, is that how you say it? Neues Welt. All right. New world. That's close enough. They got products that don't quit. They got everything from sports cars to diapers. Yes. I'm not sure I want to go back to Germany. Back? When, when, when were you ever there? During the war. The war? For crying out loud, Henry, that's a hundred years ago. Forget it. You're right. I have to bring this off. They're a logical client for us. We're a logical agency for them. We know it. They know it. We need each other. Ah, uh, so? So I'm going. I'll leave tonight. That's my man. I really didn't understand my reluctance. Neues Welt was made to order for us. And actually, they had sought us out. And we needed them. And so, why wasn't I jumping up and down with joy at the opportunity? Well, the truth is, I'm not by nature a man who jumps up and down with joy. But I could have shown a little more enthusiasm. I asked the question, but I have no idea of the answer. I think I really don't know myself very well. I'm 54 years old, and it seems that I learn more about myself every day. Won't you sit down, Mr. Cotton? Thank you, Frau Volker. Your German is flawless. Oh, thank you again. But uh, your facts are incorrect. Oh? I am not Frau Volker. I am Fräulein Volker. Oh, I'm sorry. Does an unmarried woman always move you to sorrow, Mr. Cortland? <laughs> well, I... In any event, we should dispense with Frau, Fräulein, Herr, and Mr. I should like you to call me Marlena. Marlena? That's a very pretty name. And I shall call you Henry. I have strict orders for my brother to be completely at your service until he arrives. Your brother is Dietrich Walker, who is listed as president of New World, and uh, you are the vice president, M. Walker. I, I didn't know that stood for Marlena. <laughs> is this uh, 
this your first visit to Germany? Well, no. I see. Well, may I ask what it is that you see? That is the sort of answer given by people who were here during the war. Well, so much has happened since. It's, <laughs> it's been so long ago, I think it's all been forgotten. You are to be our guest for dinner. Oh, I don't want to inconvenience anyone. Not at all. I've heard so much about you. About me? Oh, yes. We had you investigated quite thoroughly. That is, we analyzed the work you did for other companies in America. We're very much impressed. Thank you. And I'm very much impressed. It was then I noticed her for the first time. That is, really noticed her. I had been aware of the fact that she was about 40, very attractive, charming. But now there seemed to be something personal in it. Something directed at me. Something womanly. When I walked in there, I'd been somewhat surprised to discover that the executive I was to report to was a lady. And now I sat there and faced the fact that I could very well have fallen in love with her. What basic strategy do you think will be effective in marketing automobiles in your country? Her questions were the questions I was fully prepared to answer, and so I could answer them without thinking. In a real sense, we think America is joining the rest of the world when it comes to size and economy of operation. Is it possible that you can walk into a room, confront a woman, and fall in love at sight? But there is still a mystique about the American-made automobile. Of course it's possible. Didn't it happen so many years ago with Carolyn? Uh, it's been ten years since I lost Carolyn. I'm lonely. I have been from the very moment I lost her. Oh, goodness, it's much time. I hope you have no plans. Yes, I have plans. I have plans to take you into my arms. We have a dining room for all our executives. This will be a splendid opportunity for you to meet everyone. I've already met the most important person in the world. They say it can happen this way, suddenly, without warning. I'm in love, and with a girl I don't even know. You can see the entire city from here. Of course, it's been considerably rebuilt. Yes. That's right. You said you had been here. During the war. Were you in Munich? Well... I was over Munich. Oh, you were a flyer. I was. Flight crew. Huh. I remember. I was just a child. We would hear the sirens and there would be the desperate surge to the shelters. It was... Well, we were over London and Rotterdam and other places, so... Why complain? Why should we talk about wars? It's another world today. A better one. Yes. I complimented you on your German... And everyone here is amazed that you speak it so well. Where did you learn? In college. Ah, but you have an ease. A kind of flow that can't be picked up through formal study. You acquire it through conversation. Were you a prisoner? How did you know? You were a flyer. So I could assume you were shot down. Well, not all flyers were shot down. I could be wrong. But I also recognize that your German is, um... Well, it's dated. Dated? Well, it's the same with English. Style and pronunciation and idiomatic things change. Now, couldn't you tell immediately if someone was using the kind of English spoken 30 or 40 years ago? Well, if somebody said hubba hubba, I guess I would. <laughs> I remember that. I was a little girl. And this big American soldier gave me a stick of chewing gum and he said hubba hubba. I could never find out what it meant. Well, neither could I. So, you were a prisoner? Yes. Where? Well, somewhere around the Baltic. Uh, and I had to serve as interpreter. Mm. Well, if you're finished with your coffee, I should like to have you meet some of our local marketing people. She had won me over completely just the way Carolyn did. And yet she was unlike Carolyn. She was blonde and bright, while Carolyn was dark and subdued. But in each, 
there was a sweetness and a perception and a way of making me feel comfortable. And once again, I was answering the questions automatically from the top of my head while my mind was completely absorbed with her. What is considered a viable cost per thousand in American print media? And now, the problem. How do I go about this? I see you on here as a rather interesting reaction. His idea is to expand our appeal in every age group. Can I be accused of making a play for her to ensure landing the account? Is it true that emphasis on quality alone is not enough? I know what I have to do. I have to get her alone, away from all these people, and just tell her I love her. Because until I do, I'll never know a moment's peace. We had a message while we were out at lunch. My brother Dietrich has been detained, but he'll be here as soon as he can. He's anxious to meet you. So, um, is there anything you'd like to talk with me about? Anything else I can tell you about the corporation? Not really. We are a large and complicated firm, and you've been exposed to a great deal. More than enough for one day. There is something I... I'd like to tell you. Yes? Well, as I think about it, I don't know how this is going to sound, and I'm not even sure this is the time to say it. <laughs> One of the basic principles of New World is absolute frankness. <laughs> That's good. Everyone is encouraged to speak his mind. Well, then I shall speak mine. Marlene, I love you. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said it. No. I'm glad you did. Because it gives me the courage to say something, too. I... I also love you, Henry. And that's how it can happen. One day, without any warning whatsoever, in a strange country, a woman he doesn't even know. I love you is generally what people say at the end of a story. But in ours, why does this declaration of love occur at the beginning? Well, you know what they say about the course of true love. I shall return with Act Two in just a few moments. Can we say that the person we fall in love with is the one we happen to meet at a time when we happen to be most vulnerable. Is all love, love at first sight? And do we merely delay announcing it because we pretend we are getting to know the loved one better? These are personal matters of taste and temperament. All we know for sure is that Henry Cortland and Marlena Volker have fallen in love within hours after their meeting. What are we going to do, Marlene? Do? Yes. And what are we going to say? <laughs> to whom? To everyone. For instance, if your brother were to walk in here right now... I would say to him, Dietrich, Henry and I have fallen in love. But I've only just arrived in this country this morning. We have known each other for three hours. How could we explain it? <laughs> That's the wonderful thing about love. You're not required to explain it. Were you... Were you ever in love before? Yes. Once. Who? Hmm? Yes. Once. <laughs> See? We're so much the same. I don't know how to account for it. <laughs> I don't either. I... I didn't want to come here. Why? Because of the war? Yes. Did something bad happen to you? Yes. I can't tell you. Why not? Because I don't know you well enough. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? <laughs> yes. I can tell you I love you, but I can't. <laughs> if anybody heard us, they would really think we're crazy. But it was because of the war you did not wish to return to Germany. Yes, and then I realized I was practically alone in my thinking. No one remembered the war seriously anymore. A new generation had grown up in my country. And in mine. And the minute my plane touched down at the airport, I saw how different it was. 
It was no longer the gray, drab place I remembered, filled with silent, brooding people. It's become a country just like my own. Tall buildings, bustling crowds, and... Well, I even fell in love. Love? Love? Uh, who fell in love with who? Ah, oh, teacher. This is Mr. Cortland from the United States. Ah, finally we meet. I'm sure we would be able to do business. Uh, was someone talking about love? It happens to be my favorite pastime. Oh, pastime is right. You know Dietrich has been married four times. They're starting to call him the Bluebeard of German industry. Typical journalistic license. All my wives received the most generous settlements. I never killed any of them. Did I ever kill anyone? <clears throat> Did I ever kill anyone? I had heard those words before, pronounced exactly that way, back in the Stalag, by the SS intelligence major. His name was, I don't remember his name. I was always too tired when he spoke to me, too tired, and everything hurt too much. Let me look at this man's face again. Let me listen to his voice. Let me concentrate. What are you saying, Marlene? I'm saying we're in love. Who is? Henry and I. We are in love. But he just... We ca- both know everything you're going to say. We know how it sounds. It sounds marvelous. <laughs> then you don't think we're crazy? Henry, Marlena, what has happened to the two of you? That sudden, spontaneous recognition of love. One sees a face, and instantly one is overwhelmed. I have been seeking this all my life. I've never found it. Volker. Major Volker. Was that his name? Is this his face? Yes, it must be. It has to be. The way he just said... Did I ever kill anyone? Did I ever kill anyone? Did I ever kill anyone, Lieutenant Cortland? I never killed anyone. I never have to kill anyone. My prisoners kill themselves through stupidity. What do you want, Major? A German officer in this camp is an American agent. Who? You know him. Who? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I just have to get some sleep. Tell us his name and you can sleep. Plenty of time for sleep. Americans, I... He doesn't get sleep. You're killing me. No. No. You are only killing yourself. Hasn't this been a wonderful dinner? Thank you, Dietrich. I never knew when I made the reservation this morning that it would be a dinner to celebrate my sister's engagement. And now where shall we go? What do you say, Henry? Darling? Oh. Oh. Unless you're tired, Henry, and you'd like to get some sleep. Well, sleep. There's plenty of time for sleep. <clears throat> plenty of time for sleep. That was the way he said it. He had to be that major. He had to be. Those scars just above his right eye. Oh, he's the one. How could I ever forget? Plenty of time for sleep. Well, there is such a thing as jet lag. Oh, 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 that is an old wives' tale. And since when do those old wives fly in jets? A man needs to rest. Listen to the way she talks now that you're hooked. Pay attention to this, Henry. It's still not too late to break the engagement. Who's sad are you on, Dietrich? You fell in love with her because she appears to be glamorous, beautiful, mysterious. And once she has got you, she shows her essential nature. She becomes a housefrau. If you think an American housewife is something, 
Wait till you experience a German house frau. And who should know better than you? <laughs> Maybe you are right. Besides, I must be getting older. Time was when I could party all night and still be at the office bright and early. We must all be at the office bright and early. And hear Henry tell us how to sell New World in America. <laughs> George. You know what time it is here? Yeah, well, I can't help it. I have to know how things are going. George, I've got to get some rest. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. About what? Everybody knows we're pitching this account in New World. And if we don't get it, it's going to look like, like we... I understand. What you did was tell everyone we had the account. Well, Henry... And so now we can't afford to lose it, okay, huh? Okay, okay. So I was hasty. I made a mistake. Henry, we must have that account. We gotta have it. All right. All right, goodbye. Ah, we must have that account. We must. I was dreaming before that phone rang. What was I dreaming about? Or was I dreaming? Am I living through it again? Are we there again? Back there in that damp, stinking cellar in the Stalag. Are we back there? Frank and I? Back there? Henry, you give me some, some water? I... I can't, Frank, I can't. They don't let us have anything unless we can get it. Yeah, it doesn't matter anyhow. I, I'm as good as dead. Oh, no, Frank. It's bad. Bad. It's dead. Let me put my jacket over here. No, no. You freeze to death. Try to sleep, Frank. Maybe rest will help you. I, I, I can't sleep. I, I busted up inside. I, I didn't tell him anything. I took everything, but I, I didn't open my mouth. Frank, Frank, don't try to talk. That's... That's about all I can do now. There's only something I could do for you, kid. There is. Live. Get get that SS major. That oh, what's his name? Volker. Volker. Whoever, whatever. Get him. Get him for what he did. Not just to me, but to everybody. Yes, Frank. He's the worst kind there is. Never gets his own hands dirty. Get him for me. I will. Swear to me, Henry. Swear you'll do it. I swear. Say it. Say, I swear I'll kill that SS Major. I swear I'll kill that SS Major. I, I can't. You've got to kill him for me. 
You're asking me to throw away my life. I'm asking you to keep your promise. What promise? Something I said when I was black and blue and freezing and starving and half crazy. Kill him. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't make any difference anymore. You killed him. Sure, sure, you can say kill him. What have you got to lose? You're dead. He killed me. I can't help that. You have no choice. But I do. I'm sorry, Frank. I'm not a hero. I'm just an average, everyday person. I... I can't do what these fellows do in books and pictures. I take the world as I find it. I live in the world as it is. Is that supposed to be living? You're dead. Are you better off? I'm beginning to wonder. When they got to work on you, did you tell? Is that why you're still alive? I cannot see a single flaw in this presentation. Then we are to award the account to Mr. Cortland's firm. You mean your future husband isn't entitled to special consideration? <laughs> Only at home, during business hours. <laughs> isn't she the most remarkable woman you have ever met, Henry? Henry? Henry, darling. The man's in a daze. No wonder. Look what's happened to him. In a single day, he lands a major account and a wife. And what would you do? Confront Dietrich and have it out? Mm, sure you would. Sitting there in your comfortable chair. But Henry has a great deal to lose. But you say, we listen to these tales because we want heroes. Heroes who are not afraid the way we are. Well, we still have a third act. We may come across a hero yet. They say heroes are born, not made. And this seems to be true from Henry Clay Cortland's viewpoint. Oh, Henry looks like a hero. He appears to be the kind of person who can certainly take care of himself. But he has a chance for heroics, and evidently he has chosen to turn it down. Something no true-born hero would ever think of doing. Hello? Darling, how are you this morning? Oh, wonderful. Do you still love me? Do I still love you? Well, how am I to know you're not a person of uh, material temperament? You may fall violently in love with one day, just as violently out of love on the next. Well, I might say the same about you. Well, I still love you today. As much as yesterday? No. No? I love you twice as much. And it was true. We loved each other even more. I put everything else out of my mind. The past, the present camp, Frank, the Major. I lived a new life in a new world, and there was nothing I could do about what may or may not have been a lifetime ago. I decided to walk to the office. It was such a glorious day, the kind of day lovers are entitled to. And I didn't see the speeding automobile that seemed to be bearing down on me. If a wide awake youngster who happened to be crossing at the same time didn't trust me, I would have been killed. Hey, watch where you're going, you half-wit. And the boy who had pushed me to safety smiled at me. I had shouted my anger at the driver in English, and I looked at his face closely. I owed the boy my life, and his face became familiar. But it seemed older. It was, oh, good Lord, it was Frank. Frank, am I going crazy? You've got to kill him, Henry. I, I... It's him or you. What are you talking about? The car. The driver tried to run you down. It was just some nut, you see. Henry, you recognized him, and that's why he has to kill you. What are you talking about? He's afraid of you, Henry. Why should he be afraid of me? What can I do to him? Kill him. But how can he be sure I'm the one who... He can't take the chance. So he's trying to buy you off. You're crazy. Am I? First, he's giving you his sister. He isn't giving me anyone. She'd never marry you if he said no. She loves me. Second, he's giving you this fantastic account. 
everything to shut you up. All right. Suppose it's true. Then why should he want to kill me? Because he's afraid. You keep looking at him when he talks to you. You can't help yourself. You keep looking at him in a certain way. He figures you're playing cat and mouse with him. He's afraid. So he knows he has to kill you. I don't believe it. You don't want to believe it. You've got no choice. Kill him before he kills you. <laughs> Out here. Yes, darling. It reminds me of the mountains back home. Henry? Yes? Had you ever met my brother before? Dietrich? Mm-hmm. Well, why do you ask? Well, it could be my imagination. What could be your imagination? Whenever, whenever we've all been together, it seems to me that you've been staring at Dietrich. Oh, uh... I wasn't aware that I was staring. But you really didn't ever meet Dietrich, did you? I, uh, I don't know where I could have. Uh, has he ever been to America? No. Well, I've only been here during the war. Uh, what, uh, what was Dietrich doing during the war? He was in prison. Prison? Yes. He had been sentenced to death. Oh? Why? He was a member of the underground. The resistance. The what? Many people are not aware of it. But we had an anti-Nazi underground here, too. Well, you say he was sentenced to death. Uh, how did he get out? They really didn't know what they wanted to do with him. And they thought maybe they could get more information out of him by keeping him alive. And finally, his friends helped him escape. Oh. So... I don't really think you ever might have seen him before. I suppose not. Perhaps someone who looked like him. Perhaps. <sighs> Those were such bad days. Bad days for all of us. Why are we even talking about them? <laughs> we should be talking about us. I have asked all of you to attend this meeting to become acquainted with Mr. Henry Clay Cortland of the United States. And Mr. Cortland is not only joining our official family, but he will also be a member of my personal. No, it was not my imagination. He's looking at me. He's looking at my face as if he's trying to read something. Tell me something. But what? What? He's trying to make a deal with you, Henry. But don't trust him. Don't trust him. He wants you off guard so he can kill you. Let me alone. All these people are looking at me. Some other people are looking at you too, Henry. Guys from the camp. Guys from your bunk. Look at us, Henry. Shut up. A man's asking me a question. It's Joe Turner. Bobby Moretti. And Harry. Look at us. We're all here, and we're all dead, and we're all asking you one question. When are you going to kill him? How, how can I be sure? You don't want to be sure. You want the girl, the money. How can I kill him if I'm not sure? We're sure, each one of us, and you've got to kill him. You have to kill him, Henry. You know that, don't you? Yes. I know. When? When? Tonight. Tonight. You heard me. I said tonight. Marvelous. This is what we call action. We ask Henry Clay Cortland when we can have his overall plan of action, and he says tonight. <laughs>
Your glass is empty, Henry. I've had enough, thanks. How do you want to do this? I just sketch out some notes and then have them headlined on charts. No, I didn't mean that. I meant the other thing. What other thing? You know, Lieutenant Cortland. So it's true. You were this Major Fulka. I'm forgotten. And you were Lieutenant Cortland. I had forgotten, too. Your sister said... Yes. I know. I had to tell her something. After all, she wanted to believe her brother was an underground hero. She was half right, my sister was, and that's because I told her a half-truth. I had been in the underground. Is that so? Oh, yes. And they caught me. And they worked on me. You know how well they could do that. Oh, yes. And so, after a while, I decided to join them. Well, that's all that matters. You became one of them. You were one of them. No human being can hold out against clever and controlled torture. I did. No, you did not. You talked. I never talked. You told us how to uncover the agent. How could I? I didn't know. But you told us who among your comrades could tell us. Frank Watkins. I never... Oh, yes. You didn't know... But at the end, you screamed and shouted his name. I actually I... It didn't matter because, you see, he was already dead and of no use to us. And now? And now, there's only this way out. I will have to kill you. Not if I can kill you first. Ah, but I have the opportunity while you don't. My Luga automatic, an intricate and sophisticated weapon. In all the years I have owned this gun, it has never taken a life. Well, there is a first time for everything. You're going to kill me. Oh, yes. It's murder. How do you propose to get away with it? It will not be murder. What will it be? An accident. Two old soldiers get together over a glass of wine. We talk about weapons. You ask to see my lure. You examine it. Unfortunately, there is a round in the chamber. Neat? Very neat. I'm sorry it has to be this way. But you would tolerate no other ending. I don't intend to sit here and let you kill me. I'm afraid there's nothing you can do. Oh, oh yes, sir. sir. No, drop it. Come on, drop you it. Drop fool. it. You are a dead man. Drop it now. I can have you killed anywhere in this country. All I have to do is... <coughs> well, I guess you will have the last word after all... Was that a shot? Dietrich! Oh, what, what, what happened to Dietrich? Henry! Henry! Darling. Darling, he wanted to show me how the Luger automatic pistol works, and he didn't know there was a live round in it. <laughs> How much did Marlena hear before she came into the room? What did she know before she came into the room? Who knows what takes place in the heart and mind of another? All we know is the outside of what we see. And what we saw was that Henry and Marlena fell in love. What I can tell you is that they got married. And as far as I know, they are still quite happy. And you'll be happy if you wait to hear what I tell you when I return shortly. Who were Dietrich Volk?
Stoker and Henry Clay Cortland. They were two people out of millions whose lives and fates were formed by forces beyond their control. At one time, a man could choose to die for his beliefs, but no more. There are ways to make all of us see another light, a different light. But here, we have the same light seven times each week, and you are invited to bask in the glow. Our cast included Ralph Bell, Patricia Wheel, Robert Dryden, and Nat Poland. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. I shall be back shortly. In an effort to interpret ourselves to ourselves, I offer you the words of a Roman poet named Catullus, who lived 2,000 years ago. I hate and I love. Why I do so, I do not know. But I feel it, and I am in torment. Perhaps when we comprehend a little better our own torment, we will better understand the torment of others, and in consequence be a little kinder to one another. Is that not possible? I leave it up to you. Our cast included Christopher Tabori, Terry Keene, Russell Horton, and John Beale. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I can't wait to meet your daughter, sir. Well, I'll call her. Evie! What? C come here, would you? This better be good. She's got a lot of spots. Yes. What is it? Evie, I'd like you to meet a nice young man. Oh, no! My hair looks dirty. Daddy, how could you do this to me? I want to die! <clears throat> I'm afraid her cream rinse makes her hair a little greasy. May I suggest agree? Of course you'd agree. All you have to do is look at her. No, no. Agree cream rinse and conditioner. It helps stop the greasies. Really? Sure. After I shampoo, I use agree cream rinse and conditioner and... And it, it helps stop the greasies. Right. Gee, it sounds like I would like agree, too. Well, agree cream rinse and conditioner is 99% oil-free. Evie, stop crying. I'll go get some agree. And after you use it, I'll drive you to the movies, okay, Evie? No. Why not? Because you got a creepy car. What? It's a brown station wagon. I hate some conditioners contain oils that can cause the greasies. But Agree Cream Rinse and Conditioner is 99% oil-free. And try Agree Shampoo. It helps stop the greasies, too. I'm glad you decided to come to the movie. Your hair looks great. Thank you. And I love your station wagon. Was our story one of deep remorse or inexorable fate. I don't know. I leave you only with another quote from Omar Khayyam. The moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on. Nor all the piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all your tears wash out a word of it. Our cast included Jack Grimes, Belika Gray, Court Benson, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.